It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ah, it is a joy to me heart to be hearing the voice of me lover boy. Big McCarthy. Faith, and how could you tell from so far away and so long ago and I answer me that? Oh, Meg, I'd recognize that soft, dulcet voice of yours anywhere. How are you? Oh. Johnny, boy, I've got trouble. And where are you, by the way? Port Hopeful is the name of the place. Port Hopeful, huh? You just can't stay away from the sea and ships and sailing men, can you? And whose leg would you be after trying to pull now? <laughs> Port Hopeful, Nevada. Nevada? Right out in the middle of the desert. Well, what are you doing there? And why do they call it a port? Then were the very same identical things I'll be telling you when you get here. And if you take to my advice, you won't waste no time along the way. There's trouble out here. Insurance trouble. Oh, what company? Western Life and Trust, they call it. The very same identical company that's insured the life of this blessed man what's laying dead at my feet. Dead at your feet? Meg, you... You don't mean... Just a minute. If you're by way of implication that I done him in, you're just an evil-minded, suspicious young... Oh, forgive me, sweetheart boy. Huh? Well, you was worried about me, wasn't you? Well, certainly, of course, God but... love you, but me skirts are clean. Now, will you get moving and come out here? Uh, well, it kind of depends. Oh? Right? And just what kind of fancy double-talking is that supposed to... Oh, no, you don't. What? Get your dirty, filthy, conniving hands off. Meg, what's the matter? Take them braces Meg. out of here and you... Meg! Well, I... I guess I was wrong, Johnny. I guess I am in trouble. Now. I'll grab the first plane. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Insurance Company, San Francisco office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Alkali Mike matter. Expense account item 1375, telephone call to Bill Kemper at Western Life and Trust, who talked only long enough to order me onto the first plane for the coast. Item 2, 153.50, transportation on a late evening flight to San Francisco. Item 3, the next morning, 425, cab from the airport to Bill Kemper's office in the Lawson building. Ever hear of Alkali Mike Murphy, Johnny? Yeah, sure, Bill. Well, at least I think so. Isn't he the kind of legendary character who found so much gold somewhere out here? Over in the Black Rock Desert, Nevada. Yeah, a place called Port Hopeful? That's right. The original Alkali Mike had been the skipper of a sailing ship before he got the lust for gold back in the last century. Yeah, well, what about him? Finally found it. Plenty of it. Out there in the desert near the little town of Winnemucca. And? Built himself a regular palace out of rocks from the nearby mountains, named it Port Hopeful. Settled down to spend the rest of his days enjoying his money. But then he died. Legend says it was suicide. Yeah, well, what's that got to do with you or me or the company? Alkali Mike Murphy Jr., his son, who spent the last 40 years living there. But now he suddenly died. And how he died affects payoff on the insurance policy we wrote him. Oh, how much? 200000 straight life. Ah, we. Beneficiaries? Two nephews, one niece, and an old housekeeper, all sharing equally, provided, of course, that one of them didn't help him on his way to the great beyond. And you think maybe one of them did? Fifty thousand apiece is a lot of money, Johnny. Which one? I'll grant you it's only a hunch. But if I were you, I'd make a pretty careful check on that housekeeper. Meg McCarthy? She's an old... Oh, yes, what do you know about this McCarthy woman? Oh, funny, Bill. Then you think my hunch is right? No. What? Because if it is, I'll handle this case for nothing. But according to the police officer... What's more, I'll quit the insurance business. Item 4, 1320, cab to the airport, plane fare and incidentals to Reno, Nevada. There I rented a car, that's item 5, and headed north and east on Route 40. After about 165 miles of nothing but sagebrush and cactus, I pulled into the town of Winnemucca. 
I dropped off my bags at the motel Winnemucca, then headed for the local police headquarters. I was introduced to a Sergeant Otis Framley. There's no point in driving out to Port Hopeful, Mr. Dollar. We've got the number one suspect right here. Picked her up last night. Her? Meg McCarthy? Right. And you suspect her of what? Murder. If she didn't poison old Alkali Mike, I'll eat my shirt. Then you'd better decide right now if you want it baked, boiled, or fried. Where is she? In her cell. Come on. You mean you've got some reason for thinking she didn't do it? I know, Meg McCarthy. Yeah, but don't you see she's the only one who was anywhere near him? Besides, look at the motive. Yeah, suppose you tell me about it. Well, she's only been out there at Hopeful taking care of him about six months. Yet she gets under the skin of the old codger enough to make him turn over a big hunk of his insurance money. And that takes care of motive, huh? Well, doesn't it? Let's go talk to Maggie. Now, look, she's a pretty tough customer when she yes, wants to be, so... Right. Yeah. She's a pretty tough customer. And if you still need stupid income, poop sergeant... All right, Meg, take it easy. Oh, take it easy, is it? If you blink an idiom, think you can keep a decent self-respected lady. I said take it easy. And I say, and I... Oh, Johnny darling. Me ever loving boy. <laughs> Hi, Meg, you oh, old rascal. Sweetheart, I know you'd come to save me out of this horrible place. Yeah, well, that pretty much depends on you, on what you're able to tell me about this whole thing. You bet I'll tell you. Only... Only Johnny. What's the matter? Sure, I'll tell you. All I know is it'll be the honest truth, Johnny boy. But don't you see? The only evidence I can give is enough to hang me. Meg. Oh, Johnny, I need your help. I need it bad. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Alkali Mike Matter. The sergeant left Meg McCarthy and me alone there at the jail in Winnemucca, Nevada. And she told me all she knew. Johnny had just plain got fed up with all the noisy, roistering, drunken sailors that used to come to me fancy cafe back on the East Coast. So when I heard that Alkali Mike Murphy was looking for a nice, quiet, respectable lady to be his housekeeper out here in the peaceful, quiet desert where I took the job. You were not here about six months? Yes, Johnny boy. And me and Alkali, we just got along fine. I cooked good meals for him when we played cribbage together in the evenings. And I got me a real bang out of keeping that old palace of his all neat and tidy for him. Yeah, sure. But now, Meg, I understand he named you as a beneficiary of his big insurance policy. I told him I didn't want it. And besides, I have plenty of money of me own from sending out me cafe back east. Do you know the other beneficiaries? Huh? Do I know them? Them nephews and that me. Just hanging around waiting for him to die these last 20 years. That's all they've been doing. Except maybe Edgar. Edgar? Edgar Murphy, the oldest nephew, the nice one. He has a fine job over to the bank in Lovelock. Uh -huh. The others? Margaret! Oh, she's a disgrace to me fine old name. Playing around with every Tom, Dick, and Henry she can get her hands on. Looking for the one with the most money so she can snag him and live the easy life. Where is she? It's for Danny. Well, he's another no count. Spends all his time horsing around and gambling. Where are they now? Out to Port Hope, but where else? Each of them trying to chisel the others out of all the fine furniture and old silverware and lovely china. You know... When the estate gets settled, the sneaky, snivel... All right, Meg, all right. If I'm going to try to help you, there are some things I have to know. I'll tell you everything, Johnny boy. How did Alkali Mike die? Poison, the doctor said it was. In something that he ate. And who could have given it to him? Uh, there's the trouble, darling. Huh? I was the only one with him. I was the only one ever touched his food. Could it have been poison before it was brought into the house? No, never. Everything I bought for him and me come from the markets right here in Winnemucca. Besides, Johnny, I always had the same things he did. Even the day he died? Yes. Yeah. Even that same fateful morning. Well, did the doctor say what the poison was? Yes. Uh, Quintanogen? Quintanogen? Uh, yes, that was it, sulfur or something. Quintanogen sulfonate? Yes, it's a chance to sulfonate. Now, that's strange. 
because if I remember correctly, that's related to one of the old Indian arrow poisons. Ah, uh-huh, but, Johnny, there ain't been no Indians around here for years. At least the wild ones. Look, Meg, I want to go out to that so-called palace, Fort Hopeful, but I want you with me. Well, of course, lover. Only how can I get out of this jail? Let me worry about that. <laughs> It took the help of a local attorney that sent him 500 bucks. But I managed to get Meg out of the clink. As long as Sergeant Framley stayed with us, that is. We headed out across the desert over a road that should have been traveled only by jeep. And finally, after about 60 miles of it, we came into a bare, rocky valley. And there in the middle of it sat the palace, Fort Hopeful. Only it should have been called Fort Hopeful. Ain't it a beautiful spot, Johnny boy? There was an atrocity, a huge rambling jumble of native stone badly cemented together. There were almost as many doors sagging on their hinges as there were windows. As though the whole place had been put together one room at a time. Windows were set in at cockeyed angles and most of them were dirty. Three fairly new cars were parked out in front. Uh, the relatives, Dollar. They've been here ever since the old coot died like a bunch of buzzards. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, come on, let's go in. Yes, and see how they've messed up our lovely palace whilst I've been languishing myself away in that hoose car. Hey, look, Sergeant, if old Alkali was murdered... Of course he was. How else would he get that poison? Well, how about these relatives? That's what I've been trying to tell these hair brains. All right, all right, Meg, please. These bird-tailed idioms around here seem to think I'm the only one... Meg, that... shut up. Yes, dear. You know I love you when you talk to me like that. Just like my dear departed husband, God. Yes, yes, all right. Well, what about it, Sergeant? Oh, you mean his own kin? No, no, Mr. Dollar. People out here in this part of the country have too much respect for their own kin. Even when there's a lot of money involved? Yes, I even go so far as... What do you mean, to... Sergeant, bringing that killer back here? Well, it's, uh, it's this way, Edgar. Yes, Sergeant, I'll dare you. Now, look, it's all perfectly legal. Legal? This woman killed our uncle. Now, look, will you? Mr. Dollar here is an insurance investigator. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Oh, I haven't heard about you. Well, I haven't. I'm Margie. And believe me, Edgar, everything will be all right with him here. Won't it, Johnny? Will it? I'm sure it will. Well, uh, we'll see. Uh, you want to come in? What do you mean, do we want to come in? You think we're going to stand out here on our feet all day? Why don't you drop dead? Oh, better, Scott. All right, Meg. Come on, come on. Sit down, Johnny. Here. Yeah. Incidentally, where's the other nephew, uh, Danny? I'm Danny Murphy, Dollar, and I agree with Ed. You've got no business bringing that old witch that murdered our uncle back into this house. Oh, that's so? She had no business ever being here. Chiseled her way into his affection so she could cut in on whatever dough he'd leave. And then to make sure he'd leave it in a hurry, she knocked him off. Uh-huh. Wouldn't that same reason make all three of you want to see him out of the way? Now, just a minute. Now, just take it easy, Danny. Well, what do you mean, take it easy? He's practically accusing us of killing Alkali. If the shoe fits, Danny boy. Why, you dirty... You lay one hand on Johnny Dollar and I'll tear your eyes out from limb to limb. I'll okay, Meg. Meg! Meg! Yes, darling, Mr. Dollar's right, Danny, Margie, and you know it. You know it as well as I do. Sure, we wanted him gone. We wanted his money, that insurance. If Danny here hadn't talked him into that insurance, we wouldn't even have that to look forward to. Well, can you blame us, Johnny, for not wanting her to share it? But she will, unless you can prove she killed your uncle. What she ever done, knowing him for only a few months, to make her deserve a share. Margie, I suspect Meg is the only one who showed your uncle any kind of care and consideration in years. Well, what did you expect of us? Mr. Dollar's right. Why kid about it? Heaven knows she deserves his money as much as any of us, whether we like it or not. The fact remains, Dollar, somebody killed our uncle. And you've all carefully made sure that Meg would be suspect. Well, yes. Johnny. Look, I'm going to play a hunch that maybe he wasn't murdered at all. But the evidence, Dollar... What evidence, Sergeant? He was poisoned. Yeah. All right, we'll accept that. But I'm still going to play that hunch. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Alkali Mike Matters. Now, look here, Dollar. We know that old Alkali Mike was poisoned. If that isn't murder, what is it? Have you ever thought of suicide, Sergeant? 
suicide. Oh, of course not. This money-grabbing old biddy here did him in. Now, just a minute, Margie Murphy. Uh, sure. Why would old Alkali ever commit suicide? I don't know, Danny. Disappointment over you three, his only relative. He paid no attention to us. Or was it the other way around? You paid no attention to him. He didn't want us around. Except maybe Edgar. Well, offhand, I can't say that I blame him. But he did welcome the care and whatever affection Meg may have given him. Yes, Mr. Dollar, that's true. She was after his money, that's all. I told him I didn't want his money. And if you don't shut up, you little squirm and conniving... Meg! All right. Johnny, bye. What are you looking so thoughtful about, Edgar? Suicide. Old Alkalide's father chose to go that way. Yeah, I know. No one understood why. He had everything he wanted, money, even this so-called palace, this atrocity that he named Fort Hopeful. You mean he had no more reason to take his life than your uncle? Well, that's what I mean, Sergeant. How did his father take his life? By drinking poison, an old Indian poison. Quintanagen sulfonate. Oh, oh yes. no. Oh, the cup. What? The old cup that his father used. What are you talking about, Meg? Come here, all of you. Come here in the dining room. What for, Meg? In here, where he keeps all the old silver and china and rickety brack. Here. Now look here in the china closet. There, you see. That cup or mug on the top shelf, Dollar. Is that the one his father used to drink the poison? Yes. But it's never been used since. Oh, no. No, Mr. Edgar, that's where you're wrong. What? Oh, saints preserve us. This is terrible. What is it, Meg? Get oh, to the point. Yes, Tony, but it scares me. Well? Every night after his dinner, Alkali got rest his poor soul. He'd have his whiskey from one of the clay mugs on that shelf, a different mug every night. Yes, that's Except true. Except that never would he touch that one. The lavender one. Oh, so what? Called it the death cup. Only he joked about it. But then the night before he died, he... He talked about it again. Let me see that mug. Well, I'll get it for you. He said it was making a superstitious old fool out of him. Uh, here. He said his father drank from it and died. But that he would drink from it and live. That he'd show he weren't superstitious about it. Oh. Good heavens, oh, look here. And I poured the drink for him. What is it, Dollar? Yeah, what, what is, is it? it? A heavy deposit in the bottom of this mug. Hard as a rock. But still the poison? Yeah. The same deep purple color of quintanogen sulfonate. Oh. After 40 years? Oh, I tried to wash it out, Johnny, before and after she used it. Oh, water wouldn't touch that stuff. Oh, that's why I thought it was part of the clay. But the alcohol in this whiskey would. Oh. It released enough of that poison to kill him. Oh, if only I'd have known. <laughs> took a long time over this one, but they finally reached the same conclusion I had. Accidental death. So, the relatives will collect the insurance and make, bless her heart. But I'm afraid that mere money will never take the place of a friend, Alkali Mike. Expense account total, including incidentals and fare back to Hartford, $525 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is, this is George Reed. Well, nice to hear from you, George. Especially when I have no assignment. That, uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pay it means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? Well? Uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh, well, a few weeks ago, you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll, uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you... Well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. 
Okay, Georgie. Say no more. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, a dollar ten taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. This thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I? It was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What did he do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured does. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insurer doesn't die. $250,000? Yes. How under the sun can a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course, I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And, Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense account? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen. If you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't even... Unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Floyds of England insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, (coughs) well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny. From the bottom of my heart, I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes. Now, here. The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Uh, Yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Uh, Pretty fancy address. Yes. Okay. Now, tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now, wait a minute. You... Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather, death? Yes. Holy. Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on. Who is... I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. 
I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Well, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, Harry? Back All right, now look. Times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. Yeah, let me see. According to this, he lives at... Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner, C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L.? Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with... Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. Expense account item 2785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself... Dollar? Why, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though who doubted it. Oh, I know, that filling in for him while he was away. Well, I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did sell one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, oh, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I issued the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well? Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to do, to, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal cause? Furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, you know, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a... Very close personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. No, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Hi, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look I here now. Goodbye. Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that's what I meant, Mr. Dollar. As a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let George do it. I'll call him back. <laughs> Item 4, 65 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may 
Leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Martin. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And it was so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter. Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. It's the very best. Now, now, what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that, well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die? Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes. My 50th birthday. You mean to say you The reason... The reason is so. Yes? I'm sorry. You, you mustn't. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. But just one more thing. Your doctor... The doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? The same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now. Now you must leave. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy, now a double-barreled one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course. Apologize? For After all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last I learned what the CL meant behind his name. It was an abbreviation, for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for Europe. Pretty smart. 
You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Now, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. But sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now, you're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50... She would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy. On her death rather than on her life. I see. But... Why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, whatever... I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then he knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... This offbeat way to make sure you get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... A great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty... Doctor, my duty as I see it... is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well, Harry came back from Europe, and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. <laughs> Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Savings Deposits Program. Brings you 
Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that brilliant detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, while you lend an ear to the good doctor... You'll get a lot of pleasure out of a glass of rich, ruby-red Petri California port. Just sit back and sip that Petri port leisurely. There's a wine that's just perfect after dinner. A wine that really goes with storytelling and conversation. Petri port is as rich in flavor as it is in color. And what a flavor. Full, hearty, and delicious. I can't think of a better way to express your hospitality than to offer your friends a glass of good Petri port. Serve that Petri Port alone or serve it with fruit or nuts or with cake or sandwiches. No matter how you serve it, you can serve that Petri Port proudly. Because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. Well, here we are once again keeping our weekly date with Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come in and join me. As you see, the puppies have been keeping your chair warm for you. <laughs> here, shove them off. <laughs> no, nah, Doctor, I don't want to disturb them. They look much too comfortable. I'll sit over here, thanks. There's tobacco in the jar beside you, cigarettes in the box, and some excellent pot on the sideboard, so make yourself at home. Thanks, Doctor. Are you all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell, though I'm afraid after all these years, it's going to be a little hard for me to recapture for you... The spirit of the story. Uh, last week you told us that a band of gypsies played a prominent part in the adventure. Yes, they did indeed. And it was amid that colorful atmosphere that my story begins. It was in the autumn of 1890, my old friend Sherlock Holmes had persuaded me to leave the comforts of my domestic fireside for a few days and to accompany him to the tiny village of Bragston on the Marsh in the heart of the Norfolk Fen district. What took Sherlock Holmes up there, Doctor? I'm afraid that at the time we left London, Mr. Bartell, he concealed his true purpose from me, saying only that he wanted friendly companionship and a strong right arm. Not until later did I learn that he was then on the track of one of the last clues that led to the confining of the Moriarty gang. But uh, to get on with my story. We arrived at Bragston on the Marsh and settled ourselves in the village inn. And after an early dinner, we strolled across the fields to the gypsy fair that was in camp nearby. It was a colorful sight, Mr. Bartell. Naphtha flares lighted a group of tents and caravans dotted round the edge of the marsh. And as gold earring gypsy girls told fortunes and danced, swarthy gypsy men played on their violins the haunting melodies of their ancestors. We watched the sideshows for a few moments and then strolled towards the center of the gypsy encampment. It seems only like yesterday, Mr. Bartell, as Holmes turned to me and said... Far cry from Baker Street, isn't it, Watson? Yes, indeed. Just the same, Holmes. I'm convinced that you're not here purely for a holiday. You're on the trail of, of some criminal. No, chap, I'm on the trail of a clue. A clue, if I find it, may lead to uh, the confounding of the Moriarty gang. Holmes, can't you be a little more explicit? After all, I left my wife and my practice without asking any questions. Surely now we're up here, you could let me know what's afoot. Very well, old fellow. I'm searching for a young gypsy by the name of Pyramus Hearn. He disappeared recently from London, and it's vital that I find him. I know that he can give me some essential information on our old enemy, Professor Moriarty. And you're expecting to find the gypsy here? I hope to get news of him, at least. His father, Jasper Hearn, is um, head of this particular encampment. Well, why don't you ask if you can see him? That's what I'm about to do, my dear fellow. Well, here comes the gypsy. Now, I'll ask him. All right. Oh, uh, excuse me. You speak to me, Corcho? Uh, can you tell me where I may find Mr. Jasper Hearn? What you want with Jasper Hearn? I have a message for his son, Pyramus. That is different. Jasper Hearn stands in the booth yonder. He is the Timber Langro. Timber Langro? Yes, sir. Uh, he's the gentleman engaged um, in an interesting exhibition of skill involving three thimbles and a pea. Uh, what our American cousins refer to, I understand, as uh, the old shell game. Let's stroll over there, shall we, Otto? If you would wish to talk to Jasper, it would be better to wait until he is finished. A Timber Langro needs all his wits about him. But, Joe, look at that stunning girl in the tent over there. Who, who, who's she? Her that is penning the rice tuckering. That is Lydia. Lydia Pentelangro. Excuse me, I shall tell Jasper to expect you later. 
I can't understand a word they say, Holmes. Heading the what? <laughs> at last, my dear fellow, you can appreciate how I have felt at times. But at least their words are clear, even, not, um, even if the sense is not, uh, to someone who is unfamiliar with the Romany language. I don't know why you keep hinting that I'm hard to understand. No one else ever complains of it. <laughs> In any case, what does penning the thing about mean? Uh, well, if I remember rightly, penning duckerin is telling fortunes. And from the sound of things, Lydia Pentelangro is uh, not greatly pleased with the doctor and she pen. No more. Lydia can tell no more fortune. Come on, Watson. Let's see what the trouble is. What do you mean? You must finish it. That's all it, my dear. If the young lady doesn't want to tell my fortune... Rubbish. You crossed her palm with silver. She's taking money under false pretenses. Here, I give you your silver back. Lydia has never taken money under false pretenses, nor has she told the future when she does not wish to. Goodbye to you. The insolence of these gypsies is intolerable. If I had my way, they'd be run out of the county. Now, now, my dear, don't get so excited. The poor girl's probably... Good evening. Uh, Major Trendold, isn't it? Huh? I don't think I have the pleasure of your... Oh, dear me. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, sir. Well, bless my soul. Haven't seen you since that last meeting of the Geographical Society. Oh, I I'd like you to meet my wife. How do you do, Mrs. Treadgold? How do you do? And uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, how, how do you do? do? And what brings you up to this part of England, uh, Holmes? Are you hot on the trail of some desperate <laughs> criminal? Oh, dear me, no. Dr. Watson and I are taking a little holiday, and uh, you and your wife? We live here in the manor house. Well, you're very lucky. It's a beautiful part of the country, Mrs. Treadgold. I hate it. I was born and brought up in London. I'm never really happy outside the city. Yes, Oliver's is not one for the peace of the countryside, I'm afraid. Well, well, perhaps we'll get back there. It's a little difficult these days, you know. We've got the boy to consider. Boy? Your, your son, sir? Uh, my dead brother's son, Doctor. We have no children. My little nephew's only four years old, you see, and I'm his guardian, as well as being executor of his estates up here. So you can understand it would be difficult for us to get back to London. It's only difficult because you put the child's happiness before mine, Arthur. Oh, now, now, Olive, you know I have to watch his interests up here. After all, when he comes of age, he'll be one of the richest young men in Norfolk. Yes, and with money that should have come to us. In any case, Arthur, if we do have to live up here, I'd find it more tolerable if you'd keep this gypsy scum off the estates. You seem to have taken a, a violent dislike to the gypsies, Mrs. Tritgold. May I ask why? Oh, they persecute us. They steal our sheep, they break our windows... And just the other day, they wantonly led our prize pig into the Bragstone quagmire and let the beast perish. Why should they single you out for persecution like this, do you suppose? Oh, I can't imagine. I've always tried to be nice to them. Too nice, Arthur. That's your trouble. Well, I have a very good reason for humoring them, my dear. You see, Holmes, I've always been afraid they may carry this feud so far that they'll even hurt the baby. Uh, Olive, my dear, I, I wonder if you'd go ahead and wait for me in the carriage. It's getting rather chilly. I'll join you in a moment. Very well, Arthur, but don't keep me waiting long. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Good night, Mr. Uh, 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 let's stroll away from the camp, shall we? Uh, I've got something very important to tell you. Something I didn't like to say in front of Olive. The gypsies have threatened to kidnap our boy. Great Scott, how, how shocking. Uh, what form did their threat take, sir? Uh, this letter. I found it pinned on the frame of my dressing room mirror when I went up after dinner tonight. Let me see it, will you please? Well, what does it say, Holmes? A Romany rye... A Romany rye... Won't take your insults forever, Major and Mrs. High and Mighty. Watch out for the Treadgold air. The Bragstone quagmire would make a nice finishing school for him. Romany Rye? What, what, what's that mean? Well, it's their own term, meaning gypsy. Mr. Holmes, what shall I do? Uh, Major Treadgold, I... Oh, great heavens! That shot just missed me. Where the blaze did it come from? I can't see a soul. Yes, they have come from behind any one of those caravans ahead of us. If you wanted direct evidence, gentlemen, this is it. That is the first open attempt on my life. Holmes, what extraordinary luck for me that you're in the neighborhood. I'll pay you any fee you name to handle this it business. It seems to me that this is a job for the police. I don't want to go to them. Oh, well, why not, sir? Well, I'm afraid that these attacks may stem from some injustice to the gypsies committed by my late brother. If that were so, I wouldn't wish to expose the fact. I want this kept private. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Very well, sir. I'll accept the case. It shall be kept private, and I promise to do everything in my power to protect the safety of the Treadgold heir. Uh, we are staying at the Rose and Crown in the village. Uh, please get in touch with me if there should be any further developments. <laughs> The affair seems to be closed down for the night now, Holmes. 
They're turning out the Napfer Flair. Yes, let's stroll over to Jasper Hearn's caravan, shall we? He should be free now. Well, if he's head of this tribe, he ought to be able to tell you something about this Treadgold business. Yes. Though I shall first ask him about his son, Pyramus, the man I'm looking for. I think the fact that I know his son will inspire confidence. Here we are. This is the caravan. That girl, Lydia Petrolenga, sitting outside. The one that was telling fortune. Yes. Uh, good evening. Who are you? And what do you want? I wish to speak to Jasper Hearn. He is not here. He's gone to the marsh. Uh, when will he be back? I do not know. To bring trouble to Jasper? No, 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 my dear. This is a personal visit. visit. <laughs> We're not after him for being a simple engro. Or for uh, spending duckerin. Oh, for a gorgeo, you speak a Romany well, brother. Oh, you are a true lavengro, master of words. Where did you learn it? From Jasper's son, Pyramus. Ah, oh, you know Pyramus, then. <laughs> a fine boy. Oh, sit down on the grass, my friend. You may wait here for Jasper. He will be back soon. Thank you. Is that your violin lying on the steps, young lady? No, that is Jasper's boshog. Uh, Jasper's boshog, one knows, sir. That is the Romany word for violin. You play, sir? No, no, but my friend does. So? Oh, then take it, brother. The stars are bright. The night is warm. Music will be sweet. <laughs> to a Romany Chai, I'm afraid uh, my violin playing will sound rather poor stuff. Play on, brother. Oh, brother, you play well, but Sarasati Zigorneweisen is not the true gypsy music. I, I've heard it in London and in Budapest. They call it gypsy. But what can a gorge or know the true heart of Romany? Wait here. I will get my own violin. Mm, charming girl, charming. But why do you keep on talking about gorgeous? Is that more of their confounded gibberish? A gorgeous old chap is uh, the term they use for anyone who is not a true gypsy. Now I will play for you the real gypsy airs. Thank you, I should appreciate it very much. But uh, before you begin, I wonder if I might ask you a question. A friend of Pyramus may ask me any question. What uh, is it? I observed you telling fortunes earlier on tonight. You refused to tell a certain gentleman's hand and gave the money back. Did you know who the gentleman was? No, brother. Nor the noisy woman with him. I refused to pen the docker in... Because I saw blood and violent death in his hand. Violent death it is soon to come. Violent death? Now, Watson, old fellow, I want you to do me a favor. Yes, of course I will. Uh, what is I it? must remain here until Jasper Hearn comes back. I should like you to return to the inn. It's more than possible that we may have news from our, uh, our client before the night is out. I'll be back later. Oh, well, it's nice of you to give me the best job. Uh, good night, uh, Mr. Petrino. Good night. And now, please play for me. A true Romany air. Very well, my friend. Listen. Now you must play, brother. I shall make a true Boshamanger of you. Come, see if you can follow me. You have taught him well. You have made a true bushman grow of him. <laughs> he is an apt pupil, Jasper. Well, with such a teacher, it's hard to be otherwise, Mr. Hearn. That is, if one has a spark of music in one's soul. Call me Jasper, brother. You have spoken well of my son. You have talked wisely to me of things that I have not understood. Come, we shall drink wine together underneath the stars. I shall get glasses and a flight on. Jasper has taken a great fancy to you, brother. And I to him. He's a fine man. Chulako. Yes, Lydia? May I read your hand, brother? Oh, yes, of course. A strange hand. And a beautiful one. A long lifeline, and yet... I see sudden death and violence surrounding you. Now, at this moment. And in the future, I see a journey for you. 
Across the seas. Within a year. Beware of water that runs in the mountains. Near death will befall you there. More travels. More dangers. Oh, you must be careful, brother. Oh. What is it? Our paths are destined to cross but once. We shall not meet after this night. That makes me sad. Oh, but we shall meet again. I shall be here for some days yet. No. It says in your hand that we shall not meet again. And a hand cannot lie. Who is this that comes toward us through the moonlight? My friend, Dr. Watson, I think. Yes. Hello, Watson. What's wrong? Wrong, wrong. Everything's wrong. Mrs. Treadgold's waiting in the carriage. She wants you to come at once. Indeed, why? The child has been kidnapped. Major Treadgold has gone for the police, and Mrs. Treadgold is threatening to rouse the local inhabitants and come out here and burn this camp to the ground if you don't find the you child. You tell Mrs. Treadgold to return home. She can do no good here. But home, Tell her, old chap, that I have the case well in hand. But how can you have? You've been out here all the time, playing your violin. Have faith in me, please, old fellow, will you? And deliver the message. Then come back here and join me, and I'll explain everything to you. Very well, I suppose you know what you're up to. Violence and trouble, brother. It is all there in your hand. Well, what must be shall be, and I wouldn't have it otherwise. But for the moment, the sky is starlit, the air is still, and the melody you played haunts me. Let's play it together again, shall we? I should like that. I should like that very much. Dr. Watson will continue his story in just a few seconds, during which time I'd like to talk specifically to the ladies, if I may, and tell you about Petri California Muscatel. Just as Petri California Port has long been known as the wine of gentlemen, Petri Muscatel has been known as the favorite of the ladies. That's because Petri Muscatel is a golden-colored wine that looks like captured sunshine and tastes as... Well, did you ever taste big, plump muscat grapes? picked when they're still misty and dew-covered? If you have, you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. The flavor of Petri Muscatel comes right from the very heart of luscious, hand-picked Muscat grapes. You couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Muscatel. Petri Muscatel. Well, Dr. Watson, I, I must say this is a strange story you're telling us. You mean to say that the heir to the Treadgold Estates had been kidnapped and yet Sherlock Holmes paid no yes, attention? that's what it seemed like, Mr. Bartell. I couldn't understand him. I'd never known him to be so indifferent to a case. There he sat until the early hours of the morning as he and that girl scraped away at their violins and never said a word about the kidnapped baby. Finally, as we walked home across the field a few hours before dawn, his mind seemed to return to the matter at hand. He spoke quietly... And yet there was a note of suppressed excitement in his voice. What, my dear fellow? You're angry with me, aren't you? No, no, Holmes, I must say, but I, I'm, I'm confused. That girl seems to have bewitched you. Have you forgotten that you accepted the job of guarding the tread gold heir and that the child was kidnapped tonight? No, I'm fully aware of the fact. Holmes, for heaven's sake, stop being so infernally matter of fact. What's come over with you? Oh, possibly it's the mood of this mild autumn night. It is indeed a St. Martin's summer. <laughs> so much so that I've... Uh... I've left my coat and dear stalker cap behind me at the encampment. Let's go back, shall we? And incidentally, when we get there, I can set your mind at rest by showing you the kidnapped child. You mean you know where it is? Certainly. It's, uh, in the camp. Then the gypsies did steal it. No, my dear fellow. I did. What? This is one of those occasions when you absolutely infuriate me, Holmes. If you must keep me up half the night while you have a fitting contact with a gypsy girl, at least of all you can do is tell me what's going on. You say you stole the child yourself. In heaven's name, why? Because the threatening note to Major Treadgold was so obviously a fraud. Oh, why do you say that? You will remember that the letter began, A Romany Rye will not take your insults forever. Now, a Romany Rye, despite what Major Treadgold said, does not mean a gypsy, but a man who knows about gypsy law. It is a term no true gypsy would apply to himself. He would use the expression, Romany child. So it was obvious from the beginning that no gypsy threatened the child. Now, uh... Who else had a motive for harming it? Well, Major Treadgold, because he stood to inherit the estate. Yes, or his wife. It's quite obvious. She has no liking for our present life, and the child is an obstacle to a new one. 
With the child kidnapped and later made away with, obviously they both stood to gain a great many of the things they wanted. Yes, right, Joe, you're right. And whoever the culprit is took the precaution of pinning the blame in advance on the unfortunate gypsies by writing the false kidnapping note. Wait a minute, but... How about the shot that was fired at us tonight as we walked with Major Treadgold? Probably fired by an accomplice to the plot in order to give authenticity to the supposed danger. And the child is now in the gypsy encampment. Yes, I, um, I promised that I would protect the Treadgold heir and so I arranged with Jasper Hearn to have the boy kidnapped for his own safety. But if anyone should find the child, they'll say the gypsies deliberately stole him. Oh, I'm quite certain that uh, before that occasion arises, old chap, the criminal will have shown his or her hand. Come on, old fellow. Put your best foot forward. It's a long way back to the camp yet, and it's nearly dawn. You have come back, Butler. You wish to spend the remainder of the night in the encampment? No, thank you, Jasper. I just came back from my cap and coat. It was <laughs> so warm tonight, and I forgot about them, and I started to walk home without them. I will find them for you. Oh, we found this message for you soon after you had left. It was pinned to the door of the caravan. I do not know how it got there. I will search for your coat and cap. Another message? What does it say, Holmes? Never trust a Romany Rye. Uh-huh. The same mistake again, Watson. Your plans have been betrayed. For proof, meet me at the Bragstone Quagmire at dawn. It's a trap, Holmes. Obviously. We must spring it with caution. I cannot uh, find your coat or your cap, Rutter. It has vanished. Vanished? May I speak to Lydia? That is a strange thing, too. Lydia has gone also. She's gone. Tell me, Jasper, did she read this note? Yes, she did. She could not help reading it. Then she, too, realized it was a trap. She went out in my coat and dear stocking hat to keep the appointment for me. Holmes, who's come after her? Jasper, call out the Romany Charles. There's a devil waiting to be caught in the Braxton quagmire. <laughs> How, how much further to the quagmire, Jasper? Two hundred yards. No more. There's the dear. There she is. And she's dressed in my dear stocking hat and coat, walking into the trap that was set for me. Lydia! Lydia! <laughs> they got her. Look, look. She's stumbled. She's fallen. I'll go to her, Watson. Jasper, get that devil who staged this fiendish plot. I have a score to settle with him. Do not worry, brother. The score will be settled. Follow me, Doctor. Right you are. I'm right behind you. Lydia! Lydia! Sherlock Holmes, I was wrong. We do meet again. Your hand lied to me. Oh, Lydia. You're wounded. What can I do for you? There is nothing you can do, brother. No one can help me now. There is little pain. There is little time. Please, hold my hand. There. Tell me, Lydia. Did you see who fired the shot? Yes. It was the man whose fortune I told today. The man with the noisy wife. Major Treadgold. Jasper and the men will take care of him. <laughs> there is one thing I wish to tell you, brother. Yes? Our short meeting has brought me happiness. I should like to think I can leave you something so that you will not forget me. I shall always remember you, Lydia. Always. You gave your life for mine. There is one thing of mine that I wish you to have. It will remind you of me. What is it? My violin. It brought us together. I should like you to have it, brother. <laughs> Lydia. Do not be sad. It is good. My life for yours. You will give help to many people. It is in your hand. Goodbye. Oshimengro. <laughs> It was dreadful. Dreadful the gypsies surrounded Major Treadgold. They forced him back into the Braxton quagmire. I tried to pull him out, but I couldn't do it single-handed. I'm not sorry, Watson. Jasper, you know that Lydia is dead? Yes, I know it. The gypsies knew it, too. That is why you were a single-handed doctor in your attempts to save the murderer. No Romany child would raise a finger to help him. Yes, I can understand that, but great Scott, man, if you'd seen his face as the quaking mud sucked him under. Lydia's death was less dramatic, but equally moving, I assure you. 
Sherlock Holmes. I am Metro less than five hours ago. You have saved my tribe from a devilish plot that would have blackened their names. A plot that would have driven them from the countryside. What can I do in return? Two things. First, uh, tell me where I may reach your son, Pyramus. His address is in this sealed envelope, Rutter. Thank you. What else may I do for you? As Lydia died, she willed me one gift for remembrance. And what was that gift, Arthur? A violin. Of course. Here. Here it is. Huh. She told me I might become a true Boshomingro. Let's see if I can recapture the melody once more. strange story. A very fascinating one. But tell me, do, do you really believe that gypsies can tell your fortune by reading the palm of your hand? Oh, frankly, I don't know, Mr. Bartell. Perhaps they can. Perhaps it's a coincidence. And then again, maybe some gypsy women have a heightened sense of intuition. You know, a woman's intuition can be an extraordinary thing. Yeah, so my wife keeps telling me. Uh, of course, I have a kind of intuition myself. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Every time I see a bottle of wine with the name Petri on the label, my intuition tells me I'm going to like it. And I always do, too. Just about tell if ever I saw a man with a one-track mind, you're that man. Thank you, Doctor. As long as my one-track is Petri, I can't miss. Because nobody can miss with Petri wine. What other wine has such tradition, such a story behind it? Petri wine is made by a family. The Petri family. They've owned and operated their own business ever since its inception, back in the 1800s. The Petri family has been making good wine for generations. And they've been handing on down in the family, from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that sure adds up to a lot of experience. You can just bet your last dollar that no matter what kind of wine you want, when you ask for a Petri wine, you're asking for good wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had in the east end of London. It concerns five nephews, an eccentric will, and a dead man's watch that gave us the clue to murder. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Red Circle. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures. They are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcast. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring good wine, invite you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you about something you ought to share with your family before dinner. And that's Petri California Sherry. Because Petri Sherry can make that time before dinner uh, a high spot in your day. That Petri Sherry is a truly fine wine. Its color is a deep amber, rich and inviting. And the wine is wonderfully smooth and full-bodied. Flavor? A swell. Honestly, I mean it when I say the best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri Sherry. 
Oh, and look, if some of your family like their sherry dry, you know, not sweet, they'll really like Petri Pale Dry Sherry. So to be sure you please everyone, don't buy one, buy two. Buy the regular Petri Sherry and Petri Pale Dry Sherry. And be sure you look for those letters P-E-T-R-I. Because they spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Petri. And now I know our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Barker. Say, how are you feeling, Doctor? All over that attack of flu you had? I'm feeling very much better, thank you, my boy. I'm still a little weak. <laughs> We old fossils take much longer to get over that sort of thing with the new young fellows. Well, you take good care of yourself, Doctor. You've got a lot of friends, you know. Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Bartell. And now settle yourself down and I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Where did it take place? You may not be familiar with the names of Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, and Sark. But those are the four principal islands that make up the group known as the Channel Islands. Oh, yes, Doctor. I have heard of them. Uh, somewhere in the English Channel, aren't they? Between the southern coast of England and the northern coast of France? That's quite right, my boy. Though I very much doubt if you ever heard of the tiny island on which this story happened. It was the island of Garth, a minute but self-contained spot with a population of just under a thousand inhabitants, subsisting, and from what I saw of the island in those days, subsisting very well on its dairy products. Was it under the rule of the British government, Doctor? No, Mr. Bartell, not exactly. You see, the island belonged to a family by the name of Horn, the head of the family, who was known as the Seigneur of Garth, was an independent ruler owing nominal allegiance to the King of England. That allegiance was expressed by one of those traditional ceremonies in which the Seigneur annually presented one pound of freshly churned butter to a representative of the British crown. The times haven't changed much, have they, Doctor? A pound of butter is still worth a king's ransom. <laughs> but uh, tell me, what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing on the island of Garth? Well, just come into that, my boy, if you'll give me a minute. It was in the summer of 1896 when, to my utter amazement, Holmes informed me that we were going to the island of Garth as the official representatives of the British Crown to accept the annual presentation of butter. At the time, I must confess, I couldn't see why Holmes wanted to accept such a ridiculous mission. It was only as we approached the island in a small fishing boat that he told me a great deal more was at stake than a pound of butter. Unfortunately, Mr. Bartell, I'm not much of a sailor, and as the wind was blowing hard and the sea racing, I'm afraid I wasn't a very intelligent companion. Shut up, Watson. We'll soon be there. I hope so. I feel wretched, Holmes. I must say, the whole trip seems utterly ridiculous to me. Plunging and bobbing about in a little boat in a raging <laughs> torrent just because somebody wants to give somebody else a pound of butter. Dear old Watson, you don't really think our mission is so innocuous, do you? Then why are we going to the island of Garth? We're going to the island of Garth at the express wish of its present ruler, Martha Horn. Martha Horn? I never heard of her. Extremely spirited old lady. And the only woman who dared tell a certain resident of Windsor Castle that she looked devilishly dowdy for an empress. Great Scott, you mean that... I mean, like... uh, Watson, that uh, Martha Horn's behests are not likely to be guarded. Obviously, she wishes to see me urgently. Also, my brother Mycroft put pressure on me. He reminded me that a, a visit to Garth might be closely allied to this emerald tie pin I wear. Of course, you recall the origin of this pin. Well, naturally, that idiot Windsor Castle gave it to you after our little trouble last year over those stolen plans for the Bruce Partington submarine. Exactly, my dear fellow. But remember that uh, the spy Oberstein had put those plans up for auction in all the naval centers of Europe. Some hint of their nature must have leaked out. It's even possible that other powers may be able by now to duplicate the pride of our submarine fleet. And whoever controls the channel, Watson, controls England. Well, they're dropping anchor, and yet we're still a quarter of a mile out from the island. Why, why do you think they're doing that? Here comes the skipper. He'll tell us. Here is as close to the island as we may approach, monsieur. We have already sent signals. A smaller boat is putting out for you. It will be here in a little while. Thank you. A smaller boat. Good Lord. Holmes, you were hinting at the naval significance of the island of Garth. Yes, old chap, I was. Well, what good would it be as a port if even a small boat like this can only come within half a mile of it? For a surface vessel, no, but we were speaking of submarines. Garth, I learned from the encyclopedia, 
boasts a magnificent interior cavern accessible only through underwater channels. Great Scott, an ideal natural harbor and dry dock for a submarine fleet. Precisely. And on the control of the island of Garth Watson may well rest the foot of the British Isles. Now, old chap, perhaps you see why Mycroft was so anxious for us to collect a pound of butter. Doesn't it seem wonderful to, to be on land again? First the fishing smack, and then that wretched little rowing boat. Then the bucket swinging us up the, the face of the cliff. <laughs> now at last I can stretch my legs. <laughs> steady, old chap, steady, steady. Let me give you a hand. You'll soon get your land legs back again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a bit shaky, I must confess. Hello? Who's that couple walking towards us? Ah, uh, welcoming committee, no doubt. How do you do? Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Permit me to present myself. I'm Dr. Hugo Oberwald. How do you do, sir? How do you do, doctor? And this is Mrs. Reeves, the housekeeper at Horn Castle, where you will be staying. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Reeves? Welcome to the island of Garth, gentlemen. We were deputed to come and greet you. Go back to the castle. We can walk there across the cliff tops. It isn't very far. Ah, splendid. I think my friend will appreciate traveling on Terra Firma once again. <laughs> Dear me, Herr Doctor. You are not a good sailor, perhaps? No, perhaps about it, sir. I had a miserable crossing. I am sorry to hear it. I trust your short stay at the castle will be some recompense for the journey. The formal presentation of the butter will take place tonight. There will be no reason why you gentlemen cannot return to the mainland tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Reeves, but it's more than likely that we shall stay on for a few days. Oh, it will be quite unnecessary. I'm afraid that is a matter for Mrs. Horn and ourselves to decide. I'm afraid that Mrs. Horn is incapable of making any further decisions. Oh, what do you mean, madam? Uh, obviously, you have not heard, but the news is slow in reaching the mainland. Uh, Mrs. Horn died yesterday. Died? Good Lord, a natural death, I suppose. But, of course... I attended her myself, in case of heart failure. The poor lady died in her sleep. Uh, shall we begin our walk to the castle? My dear Holmes, this changes things. You suppose it was a, a natural death? I suppose nothing, old fellow. But in almost 20 years of practice, I can recall precisely three clients, actual or potential, who died natural deaths. Come on, let's follow them. Dr. Watson, this is Mr. Christopher Horn, grandson of Mrs. Horn and the new ruler of Garth. How do you do? Uh, hello. How do you do, sir? So very nice of you fellows to come over here. Too bad you had to arrive just as the poor old gal kicked the bucket, though. Allow me to uh, offer my condolences on your grandmother's death, sir. Yes, yes, indeed, Mr. Horn. Thank you. It was a ghastly business. I found her, you Christopher. know. Christopher. Frightful sight. There was an awful, an awful silly grin on the old dear's face and... Don't you think it would be more to the point if you were to explain the ceremony in connection with tonight's presentation? Oh, you're right, Reeve. Reeve is a terrible tyrant, but she is efficient. Don't know what I'd do without her. Always ran everything for poor old Granny. Why, when the old girl was ill, she... Uh, Christopher, I gave you a schedule of the ceremonies this morning. What did you do with it? Dash it, Reeve, I don't know. Must have stood. Well, I have my own copy in the study. <laughs> I swear I don't know what I'd do without you. Excuse us a moment, gentlemen. I'll be back in a jiffy. Holmes, what in thunder is going on here? That boy is completely under the thumb of Mrs. Reeves. He was trying to tell us something, but that frightful woman kept changing the subject. He spoke of an awful, silly grin on the dead woman's face. Didn't that suggest something to you? I sure. That's one of the characteristic symptoms of strychnine poisoning. Exactly, old fellow. And perhaps he was going on to mention the equally characteristic arching of the body. We've got to get Mr. Horn to ourselves for a little while. And you've got to examine the body of the dead woman. But it's going to be difficult. Hmm. Is that a balcony outside the window? Yes, it is. Come along. Let's see what it leads to. The balcony seems to lead right round this particular <clears throat> wing of the castle. Must have served as a lookout in the olden days. I wish the balcony were a little wider. Must be a sheer drop of a couple of hundred feet down to the, the rocks below. Yeah. Hello. These must be the windows of the room adjoining the one we just came out of. Let's go a little closer, shall we? We may be able to find out something. 
Can you see anything? Yes. They're in there. Mrs. Reeves and the boy. She's leaving the room. Now's our opportunity. I'll tap on the window. He seems he's coming to open it. What are you two doing out there? Admiring the view? Yes, my boy. It's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, Mr. Horn. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I was a great admirer of your grandmother. I was interested in what you were telling me of her death. She had a a grin on her face, you said. Yes. It was it was awful. Her her body was all hunched up like like a croquet hoop. Really? Of course, uh, Dr. Oberval said it was perfectly all right, but I must say it seemed dashed odd to me. Yes, it was far from all right, I, I assure you. And you started to say something else. What was it? Let me see. You said, uh, when she was ill... Oh, yes, that was a silly business. When she was ill, she thought she was in danger from poisoning, so she, she made Mrs. Reeves taste all her food and drink. Did she really? Uh, uh, where is your grandmother's body now? In the West Wing. The funeral's to be tomorrow morning. I see. Uh, where did Mrs. Reeves go? I am well, here on the balcony behind you, gentlemen, listening to your conversation with the greatest interest. Christopher, let me warn you. These men are the emissaries of the British government. They would stop at nothing to take the island over. These men are trying to influence you against me, against Terevi, who has looked after you ever since you were born, and who tries to protect you now that your grandmother has gone and you are alone. Yes, I know, Reevee, but after all... That is your pride as the head of the Horn family, the Seigneur of Garth. The Garth that I am trying to save for you. This man is completely unscrupulous. He was about to accuse me of murder. Weren't you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? The thought had occurred to me, Mrs. Reeves. Of course it had. Because you wished to poison Christopher's mind against me. Well, Mr. Holmes, we have no police on the island of Garth. Our only law is the word of the seigneur. And Christopher now holds that title. Seigneur, what do you say? Will you allow an... Englishman to blind you by accusing me of being a murderess? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I shall meet you at the ceremony tonight. Beyond that, I I don't care to speak to you again. Good day. A shame to spoil your plans, isn't it, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> well, upon the soul, magnificent, Watson. Magnificent! A murderess who seeks to defeat me by accusing herself. Superb. It's a new game, my dear fellow. And one that must be played to a finish. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that right now is one time you'd really enjoy a glass of Petri California Port. You couldn't ask for a more delicious wine... Petri Port, with its deep, rich red color and its heart of the great flavor, is one of America's all-time favorite wines. Petri Port is wonderful after dinner and perfect to serve when company comes. Try it. But just remember that when you want the kind of port I'm talking about, you've got to make sure it's Petri Port. Because all Petri wines are good wines. Dr. Watson, this is certainly an unusual story you're telling us tonight. Oh. What happened after Mrs. Reeves left you and Sherlock Holmes standing on the balcony? We retired to our rooms and had a quiet and lonely lunch. Though the great man said little, I could see that he was deeply excited and that his keen brain was evolving some plan that would enable us to solve the mystery of Mrs. Horne's death. After lunch, we started to descend the stairs leading to the main hall of Garth Castle. As we did so, Holmes said... Uh, what? Uh, there are no danger ourselves. Mrs. Reeves knows that we are here as emissaries of the British government. Yes, and if we didn't return with the butter within a few days, there'd be a British dreadnought here looking for us. However, uh, I am in danger uh, of one of my worst defeats. My professional pride is peaked. If only I could... Ah. Uh, Watson. Yes, huh? If at any time today I slip you a note, don't read it at once, but... Here comes Mrs. Reeves. Uh, precisely, Watson. I entirely agree. If I do not make the test on Mrs. Horn's body within 24 hours of her death, it will be useless. I must make it by 3 o'clock this afternoon. Mr. Holmes. Oh, 
Oh, yes, Mrs. Reeves. I want to apologize for my behavior before lunch. I was intolerably rude. Oh, please, no. Whatever my quarrels may be with British politics, I at least owe to both of you the duties of hospitality. Oh, that's very gracious of you, Mrs. Reeves. Uh, I wonder, uh, would your hospitality also include a, a personally conducted tour of the subterranean caverns for which this island has become internationally famous? Wouldn't they really interest you? Well, I'm afraid that my friend and I won't have the time Oh, yes, not at all, Watson, not at all. We have plenty of time. Well, as long as we're back here by three o'clock. I'm sure Dr. Oberwald would be delighted to join us. He has made quite a study of the unique rock formation. Oh, that's splendid. Um, it should prove a most interesting excursion. But, Holmes, why do we want to go stomping around a lot of damp and smelly caves? Well, the exercise will do us good, old fellow. Uh, uh, will you lead the way, Mrs. Reeves? And please remember that it's most important that I return I here... I remember, Mr. Holmes. You must be back here by three o'clock. A little further, Mr. Holmes, and we shall reach the giant cavern. Ah, most interesting. Uh, Watson and Dr. Oberwald seem to have lagged behind us somewhat. They will be here in a moment. There. This is the giant cavern. Ah, magnificent. Truly a miracle of nature. It's a natural submarine dry dock hewn out of the rocks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. And in the olden days, only the smugglers who inhabited this island knew the entrance that leads to this cave. The first seigneur of Garth found a cache of untold wealth hidden here. Really? Silks, jewels... There are still the remains of some of the finest Calvados brandy stored among oh, these rocks. Indeed. <laughs> An incomparable drink. Would you care for some? It is our custom whenever visitors honor us with their presence to offer them a glass. Oh, I should be delighted. There is a natural shelf here in the rocks. Perfect hiding place. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. And here is a glass. Oh, this is a rare privilege. I imagine that very few people have been offered it. Only our most distinguished visitors, I assure you. <laughs> this uh, cavern is completely inaccessible from the outer sea, I presume? Completely. Unless, of course, ships could swim under the sea. Which, as you know as well as I, they can, Mrs. Reeves. Even outside the imaginings of Jules Verne. Indeed. Uh, would you care to explore a little deeper? The others will be with us soon. <laughs> Dr. Overvall, the others seem to be some way ahead of us. Yes, they do, don't they, Doctor? Uh, Holmes! Holmes! Where are you? Dear me, I'm afraid we cannot follow them. Huh? What do you mean? The next cavern is already cut off by the rising tide. Great Scott, you mean that they're cut off? I am afraid so. But do not worry here, Doctor. In a few hours, the tide will recede. They are in no danger. Just, uh, shall I say, uh, temporarily marooned. <laughs> Uh, I'm getting confounded with sleep here. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid that we stayed here longer than I intended. I fear that we are cut off by the tides. Cut off? By the tides? We're in no danger. In a few hours, we should be able to return. But uh, I'm afraid I cannot get you back at three o'clock, which was the time I promised. Uh, but it's vital. Uh, absolutely vital that I could get back. I'm so sleepy. <laughs> but please, keep talking. I must keep awake. Dr. Tober, I, I must get to Sherlock Holmes at once. I am sorry, here, Doctor. But we are not able to control the forces of nature. We cannot force the water to recede. Your friend is in no danger. No, no, but he's got a most important test that he must make by three o'clock. I am afraid that will be impossible. I've got to do something. I should have come to these blasted caves in the first place. What on earth I want to do? By Jove, that note that Holmes gave me, he told me to open it if... Uh, where did I put it? Ah, here it is. A note for Mr. Sherlock Holmes, eh? Vital make medical test. 
great Scotch I'd overrule. It's absolutely necessary for me to enter the castle at once. Indeed. A note for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And now it is most important that you return to the castle. No, my fine English friend. I am afraid I cannot allow you to. Oh, I don't know how you propose to stop me, sir. You see this revolver? And do you see this stick? I warn you, Herr Doctor. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't hear me, Dr. Overville, but when Sherlock Holmes gives me orders, I carry them out. Ah. Uh, Mrs. Reeves, are we still trapped by the tide? <laughs> what time is it? Five o'clock. I'm afraid that you'll be a trifle late for your important appointment. What a pity. You deliberately trapped me here. You drugged the brandy and kept me a prisoner. Did I? Now, why should I do that, Mr. Holmes? Because you're greedy of power. That's obvious in your domination of that pleasant, the weak young man who is now Senor of Gath. I'm sure your beliefs would find support in certain ideologies now arising in Germany. Your choice of a German doctor as an accomplice in your plans would support that theory. And what might my plans be? I should say that you're determined to give Gath as a submarine base to Germany. With this island in their power, they could control the channel. Very interesting. And I suppose, as well as being a spy, I am responsible for Mrs. Horn's murder. You and Dr. Overbell between you. She was too strong for you. You had to get her out of the way. You probably made subtle attempts on her life at first, the origin of which she did not realize, but uh, which caused her eventually to send for me. My arrival forced your hand, and so you and Dr. Oberwald resorted to the quite unsubtle expedient of, of poisoning her. All pure supposition, Mr. Holmes. The only law on this island is Christopher Horn. Do you suppose he'll believe you? No, I suppose he won't. You've outwitted me, Mrs. Reeves. I walked into your trap just as you intended me to. Then in that case, you may collect your pound of butter tonight and return to the mainland tomorrow. Mrs. Reeves, sir. Uh, how much longer do we have to wait for the tide before we can make our way back to the castle? <laughs> we can leave now. We could have left at any time. There's another secret entrance that is above the tide level. I merely had to make you overstay the hour of your test. I could not risk Christopher seeing definite proof. Come now. I shall lead you back. You fool. <laughs> Holmes, where have you been all this time? Mind that, Watson. Did you open the note? Yes. You followed my instructions? Yes, it was, as you suspected. Thank heaven, old chap. Then now we can hoist her with her own baton. Here she comes. I'm glad to see, gentlemen, that you have assembled here in the seigneur's room. The ceremony of presenting the butter traditionally takes place here. As soon as Christopher arrives, we will explain our customs in this matter. Uh, Dr. Watson, I trust that Herr Oberwald proved an interesting companion on your excursion this afternoon. Yes, indeed, most interesting. We had a discussion of the relative merits of the walking stick versus the revolver. I think I was able to make my argument fairly convincing. Where is Dr. Oberwald now? I imagine he's lying down. He had all the symptoms of impending headache when I, I saw him last. Why are you smiling, Mr. Holmes? What's been going on? I'm afraid, Mrs. Reeves, that your plans have misfired rather badly. As soon as Mr. Horn arrives, I expect you will be under arrest for murder and high treason. Christopher would never believe you. Wouldn't I? Mrs. Reeves, you poisoned my grandmother. Christopher, what lies have these men been telling you? You're the one that's been telling me lies. I believed you when you said you'd been tasting the old lady's food. But when Dr. Watson showed me the results of his test this afternoon... It was as clear as daylight. But the tests could prove nothing after 24 hours had passed. You said so yourself, Mr. Holmes. A deliberate lie, Mrs. Reeves. I'm afraid that I invented that mythical 24-hour test. I knew that as soon as I mentioned it, you would attempt to prevent my carrying it out. So I was delighted when you fell into my trap. You thought that you were shanghaiing me, whereas in reality I was shanghaiing you. My job is to prove your guilt to the senor. With your dominant presence away from the household, it was easy for Dr. Watson to make his test. You devil! You knew all the time! Oh, of course I did. But I had to deceive you. I'm glad my performance was sufficiently convincing. By the way, Mrs. Reeves, the drug brandy was dreadfully clumsy. You didn't drink it, huh? Oh, of course I didn't. But it was very unflattering to me that uh, Mrs. Reeves thought I might. Mrs. Reeves, you realize what this means, don't you? I'm going to ask these gentlemen to take you and Dr. Oberfeld back to the mainland with them tomorrow. And stand trial in a British court? Never! I was born on the island of Gar. I have lived here all my life and I shall die! What are you up to? Stop! She's going 
out on the balcony. One day, Gaza will belong to Germany. One day, the whole world will belong to Germany. Goodbye, you meddling fool. Goodbye. Great Scotch is gone. It must be a couple of hundred feet to the rocks below. What a dreadful thing. I still can't believe she was a murderess and, and a traitor. No, oh, it's shocking. Oh, shabby finished with shabby business. Mr. Horn, I suggest that we make sure Dr. Oberwald does not escape justice. And that we then perform the ritual presentation of the butter. Yes, Mr. Holmes. The island of Garth will still pay tribute to England. And I think it always will. <laughs> Doctor, that was some story. So Germany didn't get the island of Garth after all. No, Mr. Bartell. In fact, in after years, the island proved to be an invaluable submarine base for England. Say, um, what about the pound of butter? Did Holmes get it? Oh, yes, yes. But why are you so interested in the, in the butter? Are you kidding? In our house, butter is our second most favorite topic of conversation. Your second most favorite? Well, what's your favorite topic of conversation? Remember, you ask me. Petri wine. Oh, as if I didn't know. Doctor, that Petri wine is something to really talk about. You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Why, the art of making fine wine is their heritage. Handed down from father to son, from father to son. Believe me, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, the Petri family really knows how. And they're proud of their wine, too. That's why the name Petri on a bottle of wine really means something. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of that wine is good wine. It ought to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that took place on the Sussex Downs many, many years ago. It concerns a young girl... A painter in watercolors and a very wise old lady. I call it The Adventure of the Living Doll. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story... The Adventure of the Bruce Partington Plan. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcast. In the dark, fearsome days of 1939, when the British Empire stood at the threshold of total war with Germany, no mind could withstand the impact of impending disaster without seeking refuge in some escape. In a moment, you'll hear the strange story starring Ruth Warren. A story you'll remember for its weird implications of an obsession.
London to Southampton, the swirling fog and mist seeping through cracks and crannies like the sulfurous vapors of something poisonous and evil, the strange glaring lights on the docks illumining a casket being hoisted aboard a ship, a ship destined to sail this night into the shroud of darkness toward the west. A girl, Judith Webster, also destined to sail the ship into whatever port the fates may decree. But then, let her tell her own story of her voyage through darkness, of an apprehension she could not escape, a complete and overwhelming obsession. It happened in 1939, shortly before England and Germany were at war. I was in London, serving as traveling companion to Mrs. Edna Prescott, a wealthy, quite elderly American woman. She wasn't a pleasant person. The city's practice blackouts were a particular source of annoyance to her. I remember thinking how ironic it was that she should die during one of them. I even thought of the cause, till the doctors assured me that her death was due to a common heart ailment. I was very busy the next few days, arranging passage to America, getting my train ticket down to Southampton, and, and carrying out the promise I had made to Mrs. Prescott. I didn't relish any part of it. Miss Webster, oh yes, the young woman who's escorting the casket. Here's your ticket. Gate five. The young woman who's escorting the casket. He said it so, so matter of fact, as if such things occurred every day. I suppose they do. And yet, every minute on that train, I felt uncomfortable. On edge. It seemed as if the trip to Southampton and the steamer docks would never end. I remember how glad I was when it did. And how cheerful the steward's voice sounded as he greeted me at the head of the gangway. Evening, miss. Welcome aboard. Might I show you to your cabin? Oh, yes. Please do, steward. I'm very tired. Oh, uh, I'm in uh, 12A, Deck B. 12A, Deck B. Uh, this way, miss. I followed the steward along the deck, down the companion ways. Everything seemed all right again. I didn't even mind the weird cries of the newsboys in the steamer dock. They were shouting something about a blackout killer and how the London police were on his trail. Blackout killer? Oh, what a horrible thought. <laughs> but the newspapers, horror stories. Oh, they belonged to the shore. I was safe in the ship, about to sail. Here we are, miss. You have it all to yourself this trip. Very nice quarters, too. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Oh, uh, here you are. Uh, thank you, miss. Good night. Good night. Call if you need anything. My cabin, perfectly safe. I, I realized how jittery I'd been. How upset. I... <laughs> Suddenly I began to laugh at myself. <laughs> My fears had been so foolish. <laughs> so foolish. <laughs> later, I went up on deck. I no longer felt tired. And I wanted to watch the lights of the coastline fading away from it. I was standing near the aft rail, quietly, looking out across the water. When... Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I frightened you? Oh, yes. I, yes, you did. I, I didn't realize there was anyone near that lifeboat. Oh, I thought sure you saw me. Oh, I never oh, It's all right, really. I, I, I've been nervous tonight anyway. I, I'm not usually so jumpy. What you need is an ocean boy. Yes, yes, maybe that's it. Were you watching the shore lights? Uh, oh, yes, I was. I, oh, I never did answer your question, did I? They are beautiful. Very. And the sea alone is beautiful. She has moods, you know, just like a woman. Gentle sometimes and soothing. Then suddenly flying into a rage and dashing things to pieces. Then quieting right down again. That's right. I see we feel the same about her. Does she frighten you sometimes? The same way women frighten me. Oh. I mean, when I don't understand them. I thought it was the general male consensus that we weren't supposed to be understood. Only loved. Isn't that the rest of it? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, it's a philosophy I disagree with. Oh, how refreshing. Oh, but the lady is amused. Oh, not at all. It's just that 
the lady detects a bachelor. <laughs> because I have a mind of my own. Oh, that's one good clue. And that... <laughs> What am I thinking of? I'm lecturing to you as if I... <laughs> well, I believe that bit of triteness ends up as if I'd known you all my life. Now, wait a minute. There's another which makes it perfectly all right. It's that shipboard friendships last forever business. <laughs> yes, of course. However, my name is Alan Bruce. Yours? Uh, Judith Webster. Miss? Miss. Good. Well, we got through that. Quite nicely. You suppose we could get through a dance? There's music in the salon. Well, there's no longer any view of the shore light. Uh, however, you did say the sea alone was beautiful. Oh, I was so wrong. There's nothing as monotonous as all that water. Mm, it is kind of, uh, flat. Let's trade it for champagne, shall we? Be with you in a minute. Oh, where are you going? Just over here. Want to do the skipper a little favor? But what is it? I can't... Oh, for well, the lifeboat cover. How do you suppose it got so loose? Don't know. Noticed it a while back. There. That should do it. Strange. It was almost as if I... <laughs> oh, no. What were you going to say? <sighs> Leave it to me. I... I was going to get melodramatic and suggest that someone might have been hiding in there. You mean a stowaway? Yes. <laughs> of course, it's silly. Well, I wouldn't say so. You're joking. Not at all. It's quite possible someone could have slipped on board and hidden that light bulb. That's why I think we shouldn't mention this to anyone. What? It would only cause an alarm, Judith. But uh, I don't understand. If you really think there might have been someone... Someone... I shall never forget that moment. The thoughts that went racing through my mind. My nervousness on the train. Those horrible headlines the newsboys were shouting from the pier. Alan's strange attitude about the lifeboat. The whole unpleasant nature of this voyage and my... My promise to Mrs. Prescott. I wanted to turn and, and run. I wanted to cry out, but somehow I couldn't. It was like a dream when you can't move. And then the darkness was swept away. I was no longer dreaming. I was in Alan's arms, dancing. There were laughing, carefree people all around us. And the ship's salon was so bright and friendly, I, I was ashamed of myself for even thinking there might have been anything wrong. Had enough? Hmm? They just brought our champagne. Oh, well, in that case, yes. I'd about given up. Oh, a fine way to talk about my dancing. Oh, you know perfectly well what I mean. All right, let her go, Stuart. There we are, bubbling champagne, gay as life. Well, what should we toast to? Shipboard friendship? Hmm? Yes, shipboard friendship. You know what? Oh, what is it? Something wrong? No, no, nothing at all. I just thought I saw someone. Will you excuse me a moment? Of course. I won't be long. Excuse me, miss, but the gentleman, he dropped this bill for Oh, thank you, Stuart. I didn't notice. Oh, just leave it there on the table, please. Very good, miss. The billfold fell open as he placed it on the table. I couldn't take my eyes from it. There was an identification card in plain sight. The name on the card was not Alan Bruce. It was Charles. Sorry to run off that way. Didn't know the fellow at all. Well, say, you haven't touched your champagne. You'll let all the kick go out of it. I'm afraid all the kick has gone out of it. Well, we'll soon take care of it. Oh, my billfold. Where did you find it? The steward picked it up. Steward? Well, we found an honest man. Have to remember it. Hadn't you better look to see if you found an honest woman? I'll take a chance. On my honesty, yes. What about a woman's curiosity? Very good point. But you know, I'm sure you wouldn't tell anyone anything. No? No. I knew from the very first I could trust you, Judy. I knew I could trust you. Implicitly. Attention! Attention, everybody! The first officer has something to say to us. I'm sorry to break in on the dancing this way, but this won't take long. You received a wire from London, and I must ask your cooperation. Wire from London? Oh, something's happened. Or maybe it's war with Germany. No, no, it isn't war. Nothing nearly as alarming as that. However, the London police suspect we're carrying a stowaway. They've asked us to search the ship and report back to them. Go oh, away. be a criminal if the police were after a blackout killer. Fancy a killer on uh, Wait, please, if you please. It won't help to get excited. The ship's being searched. You'll never get off. 
All we ask is that you keep your cabins locked. I was afraid this might happen. How long did you expect to keep it from them? Well, naturally, I was hoping they'd never... Oh, Judith. Judith, what's wrong? Where are you going? I say, sir. What's the matter with the lady? Is she ill or something? I don't know. I... Please, let me pass, will you? Of course, sir. I'm sorry, but she certainly did run off, didn't she? <laughs> she almost acted as if you were the blooming killer. <laughs> Stowaway, a killer, hiding somewhere in the dark recesses of the ship, or is he hiding? In the mind of Judith Webster, certain pieces of the puzzle seem to fit into place. What was intuition now becomes apprehension, an apprehension that builds and spreads like a slow stain into that fragmentary realm of imagination where deeply sink the twisted roots of obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. Journey Through Darkness, starring Ruth Warwick. Somewhere on the deep black waters of the Atlantic, a ship flies her way toward the haven of New York. But a ship on which lurks a nameless terror. There is a murderer on board, a killer, not listed on the person sheet. But in the mind of Judith Webster, there is a mounting suspicion of his identity. But strangely, she has little power to reveal the thoughts that are tucked away in the closet of her mind. For try as she may, she cannot dispel the forces of a powerful obsession. I'll never know why I left the dining salon without telling him. Certainly there could no longer be any doubt. It was all too clear. That loose canvas covering in the lifeboat. The way he'd been standing there. Even the name he had given me. Alan Bruce. I saw it later. The regular passenger list. He must have killed the real Alan Bruce and thrown him overboard. Taking not only his name, but his stateroom and his clothes. But also fantastic. Worse than anything else. I'd almost fallen in love with him. He knew that, I'm certain. That was why he was so confident that I wouldn't tell anyone. And I didn't. Not even when I spoke to the first officer about... About my promise to Mrs. Prescott. I wanted to... I'll arrange it for early tomorrow morning, ma'am. And most of the passengers will be asleep. Thank you. I suppose it's rather unusual, but... Then Mrs. Prescott was an unusual woman. Uh, I haven't conducted a burial at sea since the last war, ma'am. However, I'm not entirely unprepared. The company official spoke to me about this before sailing. Hey, don't worry, Miss Webster. The ceremony will be in order, ma'am. Thank you. Good day. I wish you hadn't done that. Oh, I'm sorry. I seem to have a habit of startling you. What do you want? How long have you been here? Long enough to overhear your conversation with the first officer. You had no right to... Please. I know what you're going to say. I had no right to listen. However, it's fortunate I did. What do you mean? I didn't know Mrs. Prescott was to be buried at sea. No one knew it. It was her last wish. I promised her it would be carried out. And tomorrow morning you're keeping that promise? Yes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I don't feel very well. I'd like to... Uh, wait. Please, Judith. You've been avoiding me, haven't you? Yes, I have. I hope it's only because you've been upset. About Mrs. Prescott, I mean. That's one reason... I'm sorry. I, I almost thought we, we were beginning to become very good friends. You know, you're the only person on board I can trust. You're very sure about that, aren't you? Of course. You know who I am and what I'm doing on this ship. And yet you've told no one. I've wanted to. I know. Women were never meant to keep secrets. However, I'm going to ask you to keep one more. I'd rather not. I'm sorry, I must include you in this. You see... It requires a change in your plans. So they'll fit in with mine. 
I'm afraid I don't understand. It's very simple. Judith, this may upset you, but I must ask that you tell them you've changed your mind. That you don't want Mrs. Prescott buried at sea. What? You remember what they said. Even if they couldn't find the stowaway, he'd never get off the ship. He could get off. Very easily. If you'd allow him to take Mrs. Prescott's place in that casket. In the casket? Yes. Clever. Clever? Well, not every man would think of it. Simple as it may seem. Everyone's searching the ship, questioning each passenger. And all the while, the man they were seeking would be safe inside the casket. He'd have only to wait patiently until the ship docks, then be hoisted from the hold, lowered to the pier, and be taken away in a funeral car. When he was discovered by the funeral attendants? Oh, I'm sure they'd be so shocked at the dead coming to life, he'd have little trouble. Stop it. Stop it, do you? If you haven't any respect for the dead, I'm afraid I have. Oh, Mrs. Prescott, you mean. I should have told you that part of it. Her last wish has already been carried out. You see... Her body was removed from the casket the night we sailed. Mrs. Prescott is already buried at sea. You've thought of everything, haven't you? In my position, one must. I remained in my cabin all that day. The next, I was afraid to see him again. I can't explain the strange fascination he held over me. I remember how, how surprised the first officer looked when I told him I'd changed my mind about the burial. It was as if he sensed the truth. As if he knew Mrs. Prescott's body wasn't in that casket. It was empty. Of course, it was only my imagination. My sense of guilt for this terrible wrong I was doing. sailed into New York Harbor. I went out on deck. He was standing there, near the port rail. I went up to him. He turned and, and smiled, as if he'd been expecting me. Oh, there you are, Judith. I've missed you. I haven't been under the weather, have you? No. I've been perfectly well. You've had me worried not showing up for dinner. You know, I've come to depend on you. Yes, I know. I've decided not to let you get away from me. After this is all over, we must... You haven't much time. No. And this may not be easy. Wish me luck. Haven't I done more than that already? Yes, of course. Only... I mean, like this, Judith. Oh. Suddenly, as he had taken me in his arms, he released me. And I remained there by the rail. He hurried away. I watched as the ship moved on into the harbor under the guidance of the tugboat. The shrill, insistent little whistles. I listened to the shots of the crew, the longshoremen. Soon we were alongside the pier, and the steward was shouting from the head of the gangway. Then, then I saw it. The casket. We were lowering it toward the pier. There was a car waiting. A long black car. And suddenly I, I realized what I'd done. What a fool I'd been. What a cowardly, frightened little fool. Wait! Help them! Don't let them do it! Don't let them! Wait! Please! Please, you mustn't touch that casket. There's something wrong. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you, lady? Get out of the way, will you? Oh, please, there's a man in there alive. He's hiding. Sure, sure. Hide and go seek his plane in a coffin. Go on, lady. We've got work to do. Slam those doors tight, Eddie. Please, you must listen to me. If you want, I'll call the police. Someone has to stop him. Did I hear you call the police? Oh, yes, please. These men won't listen to me, but there's a man hiding in that casket. Of course there is. We put him in there, Judith. What did you say? I said we put him in there. Or rather, we let him walk right into our trap. Are you trying to tell me there's someone else in that casket? Well, surely you're not trying to say you thought I was in there. Well. Who else? Why, the killer, of course. The killer? 
Oh, the blackout, Josh. But then he's getting away. You're letting him get away. No, Judith. Those men know who's inside that casket. And they know right where to take him. They're detectives. Detectives? You know, Judith, for someone who helped plan this entire thing, you're acting very strangely. I'm acting strangely. It's almost as if you didn't know who I am at all. But I... I don't. What? I said I don't know you. I still don't. But the night... I dropped my billfold. I, I thought surely... All I learned that night was your real name. Charles Drew. Oh, oh, would you mind telling me what's going on? It's all quite simple, Judith. I thought you'd learned of my affiliation with Scotland Yard when you had my billfold. This, all this time you've been trailing the killer. Right. We had a tip-off. He might be on the ship. When I discovered the loose lifeboat covering, I was certain of it. Then Alan Bruce... He wasn't murdered at all. He never existed. You know, detectives never travel under their own names. It just isn't done. Oh, no. No, so everything has to be done the hard way. I suppose that's why you couldn't just find the killer and arrest him on board. Oh, no, hardly. You see, I couldn't find him. Searched the ship from top to bottom. I guess he really would have given me the slip if I hadn't looked in the casket. He was hiding there all the time? No, at that time it was empty. Well, I, I don't get it. Neither did I at first. And I began to wonder why he would remove Mrs. Prescott's body from her casket... Unless it was part of some plan. And? And I decided that it was. A weird yet thoroughly clever plan. Remember I told you not every man would think of it? Yes. Yes, you did say that. He had only to wait patiently until the ship docked. Then at the last minute slip into the casket. And be hoisted out of the hold onto the pier and be taken away in a funeral car. Oh, it's fantastic. And you think I... Oh, John. I nearly wrecked everything. I thought you were the killer. <laughs> no wonder you avoided me. I was so darn mixed up. I, I thought I knew so much. That's oh, my fault, darling. I overestimated you. Oh, kiss me, child. Will you? Oh. Hey. What was I saying? I underestimated you. I wasn't so mixed up after all. How do you mean? That kiss, darling. That kiss. Oh, you may not know it, dear, but in some ways you are a killer. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and combined with a sharp knife of suspicion, it destroys all logic and clarity. But how odd it is that one obsession may quickly turn into another. That the killer looking somewhere in the shadows has now become a lover in the bright light of day. The stowaway that was one obsession is now Charles Drew, who will, we hope, forevermore remain in the mind of Judith Webster as an entirely different kind of obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story. Next week's story, a story of a murder that took place only in a man's mind, a nameless dread from which there was no escape. Each moment of next week's thrill-packed story starring Philip Terry will hold you breathless in anticipation of the strange outcome when you listen to... Session. 
This story, starring Ruth Warwick, was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charters and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. You know something, Simon, darling? Some things, Anne. Among them, the fact that you're a very disturbing person. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Perhaps that's my answer, then. Answer to what, may I ask? Why you phoned me the moment I returned from Bermuda. I've been wondering why you're going to ply me with a football game, a dinner, and a play. Oh, why not just relax and enjoy it? I'd like to. (laughs) Particularly when I remember that last evening we spent together in Bermuda. Before you had to fly back to the States on some nasty murder business or other. Yes, that was quite an evening, wasn't it? Quite. Mm. You know, you're very beautiful. I've always enjoyed your thinking so, Simon. Well, inasmuch as I have a tremendous distaste for murder interfering with moonlight, I now intend to take up where we left off. Is a football game? Oh, well, it'll be a good game. As a matter of fact, it had better be the trouble I had digging up tickets for it. <laughs> Well, here we are, Anne. My, how things have changed since I was in Bermuda. Imagine they're now holding football games in cigar stores instead of stadiums. If it happens to be Tony Cartago's little establishment, there's an office inside where Tony conducts his main business, which consists of handling bets and scalping tickets. Oh, you do know the loveliest people, Simon. Yeah, for which you should offer thanks. We couldn't get any seats to today's game otherwise. Tony has a couple for us. Oh! Oh. Well, didn't your mother ever tell you that it's not polite to go running into people that way? Oh, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't see you. My apologies. Mm, not bad. Nice manners, too. I wonder why she came tearing out of Tony's that way. Oh, if you're interested, Tony can probably tell you. I wonder where I've seen that girl before. Oh, in some harpy's huddle, I imagine. Oh. <laughs> Come on, let's go in. <laughs> Some place. I bet you couldn't buy cigars in here for love of money. Well, I'm not sucker enough to lay odds against that. Uh, the real business is conducted right in here. <laughs> Hiya, Tony. I want you to meet... Simon. You better stand back in. My old grandmother would often say, yikes. Yes, I see. He's been shot, hasn't he? I'm afraid so. He's still alive, though. Hey, Tony. Tony, who did it? Can you hear me, Tony? Who gunned you? No, I didn't. Joker, he knows. It's me, Tony. Temper, who shot you? I don't know. Bones effect. Brain dead. Uh, uh. Oh, Simon, is he? He is. Well, there's nothing to do but call the police. Why, Simon, the saint calling in the police on a case? What's happened to you? It's very simple, Anne. I'm much more interested in a beautiful woman. Oh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, why don't you call them? Oh, a visitor. Two visitors, darling, a man and a gun. That phone's getting kind of heavy, ain't it, Mr. The phone? Oh, yes, yes. Come to think of it, it is kind of heavy at that. I'll take care of it for you. Uh, that's better. 
You know, you're the second person we've met today who should read Emily Post. Don't you know it isn't polite to point at people, particularly with a gun? Shut up. And it's also impolite to tell me. Shut up. Uh, you see what he means, darling. He wants you to shut up. Oh, is that it? Yeah. I wondered what he was driving at. That's very fun. I'm so glad you liked it. Though I have a better routine that goes like, give me that gun. Oh, you know, but he was big enough. Oh. Simon, get up, Simon. Get up. You killed him. Oh, no, he's just sleeping. Maybe that gun over his head will learn him a thing or two. But you... Sh and if you're smart, you won't kick up any fuss. They just as soon kiss you, too. Kiss me? Yeah, with the butt of my gun. Now relax, baby. Simon, wake up, Simon, wake oh, up. Oh, oh, come shit. on, Simon, wake up. Now let's leave a later call. Oh, Simon. All right, Anne. Hey, what goes on here? We're tied up. Yes. Pete thought we'd be more tractable that way. You know something? He's right. Where are we? How'd we get here? Uh, Pete, he's the guy who conked you. Yeah. And a buddy of his named Louie brought us here. It's a warehouse of some kind. We're in one of the storage bins on the first floor. Uh, nice. Are we stored away for the winter? No. No, with a little luck, we'll be out of here in five minutes. A mistaken identity, and I'm not Superman. And these ropes are pretty tight and strong. Darling, yours may be, but mine aren't. I've had them loose enough to throw off for 15 minutes. I was just waiting for you to wake up. Well, now, don't tell me you're a superwoman. No. No, I owe it all to dear, sweet Louie. When I looked at him piteously out of my big blue eyes, he just couldn't tie me up too tightly. I worked myself free while you were sleeping soundly in the corner. Never again will I underestimate the persuasive powers of women. <laughs> now, see what you can do about getting me loose. All right. uh, there's a little knife in my vest pocket that might help. Uh, this pocket? Right, oh, be careful. I'm ticklish. Oh, I've got it. You know, Simon, I just remembered who that girl was we saw running out of Tony's place. Yeah? Who is she? Betty Streeter. She... Ah, there. That fixes up your hands. Thanks. Now, let's have the knife. I'll get my legs loose myself. Here. Betty Streeter. Mm-hmm. The luscious lollipop whose picture's been in the newspapers lately over an engagement or something? Yes, that's right. She's engaged to Jack Landers, an old boyfriend of mine. Oh, Oh, lucky girl. Jack is so handsome and fascinating. That's very interesting. There. Now the legs are loose. Now let's see if I can stand up. There. How do you feel? Outside of that bomb burst in my head and the fact that my legs are apparently cut off at the knee. I... Simon, someone's coming. Get those ropes over you and lie down on the floor quick. Okay, okay, Simon. When he comes in, make with those baby blues and attract his attention for a minute. I'll be behind the door. And then what? Well, I won't be dealing a hand of canasta. Quiet now. Well, hello, Petey. How do you feel? Fine, baby, fine. I just come back to... Hey, the boyfriend, where is he? Here I am, Pete, with a peachy key. Ha <laughs> uh ha! -huh. Now that's what I call more like it. Come on, on your feet. Yes. I'd better pick up Pete's pop gun. Right, now let's get out of here. Now that's the first sensible thing you've said today. Let's. What's that noise, Simon? I don't know, but it sounds like my head feels. There's no time to delve into strange noises now, my sweet. Come on, let's go quietly. You know, I wonder if Louie, the other mug, is hanging around. No, no. After Pete searched you and didn't find anything, I heard him say he was going to report to the boss. I guess he's still reporting then. The place seems deserted. Oh, look, there's the front door. Let's head for it. Well, oh, it's certainly nice to be out of there. Yeah. Hey, what was the name of that girl again, Ann? Girl? Oh, Betty Streeter. Why? Look at the sign on this building. Sign? Simon! It says Streeter's Warehouse. Yeah, that's what it says, doesn't it? Come on, Ann, let's find out what this is all about. Uh, Simon, darling, I thought you were going to call the police. Ann, darling, that was before Petey hit me over the head with his gun barrel. Oh, I was afraid of that. Okay, what's our first stop? Well, first, we find ourselves a nice telephone directory. May I ask why? To find out what street the streeters live on. <laughs> Yeah, 
guess who it Ann. Hello, Jack. Remember me? Remember you? Oh, Ann, sweetheart, if you don't think so, get a load of this. Mm. Oh, Jack. That's a rather warm <laughs> greeting after all these years. <coughs> oh, oh, yes. Uh, Simon, I, I want you to meet an old friend of mine, Jack Landers. Jack, this is Simon Templer. Glad to see you, Templer. Mm, but not as glad as you are to see Ann. Yeah. Uh, well, not quite. No. Come on in. Thank you. Uh, what are you folks doing here, anyhow? We came to see Betty Street here. Uh, this is where she lives, isn't it? Betty? Mm-hmm. Yes. Remember the girl you're engaged to? <laughs> sure. Run along. She's in the living room with her father. Uh, say, by the way, Landers, uh, have you got a handkerchief? Handkerchief? Yeah, of course. Why? Well, I have heard that misplaced lipstick is a better detonator for atomic blast than plutonium. And before the two gals oh, meet, well, I... Maybe you're right, <laughs> Templar. Well, Betty... <laughs> Holy smoke, what was that? Well, either Betty's involved in a premature explosion or they were shots. Come on, let's see. The living room, Templar, to the left. I'm with you. Stay back, Anne. Betty! Betty, what? Oh, Jack, someone shot at us through the window. Dad's hurt. He, he Look was... after Mr. Skeeter, Jack. I'll take care of the guy at the window. Well, be careful, Simon. He may still be out here. Now she tells Let me get a crack at him, Templar. Did you get him, Jack? I think I got him in the leg. He stumbled after the first shot, but he got away in that car. Well, now that quiet has descended once again, it might be pertinent to inquire as to the state of Mr. Streeter's health. Oh, it, it's nothing serious, just a slight flesh wound. A slight wound, is it? Feels like my whole dad blasted arm has been torn off. Do you any idea who was so interested in perforating the Streeter's skin, Mr. Streeter? Yeah, I'll say I have. It was one of the... Dad, Dad, there's no need to talk like that now. Blasted Betty, there's no reason for me to hide things. That crook's been trying to chisel in on my warehouse business for over a year. He's taken one of them over already. You couldn't possibly be talking about uh, Duke Raymond, could you? That's right, Templar. He's threatened Mr. Streeter before. Looks as though he sent one of his gunmen around to enforce that threat. Oh, you've got to give in to him, Dad. The next time you won't be so lucky. You ought to realize now that he won't stop at anything. Give in? Nonsense. I hate to sound mercenary, Mr. Streeter, but uh, how much would it be worth to you to get your skirts cleared of Duke Raymond? How much would it be worth? Mm-hmm. Who are you? My name's Simon Templer, if that means anything to you. A saint? I'll confess it. Does that startle you, Miss Streeter? Oh, why, 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 no, not at all. I I just didn't expect it. Of course, after all, only sinners need be frightened by saints. Well, Mr. Streeter, what do you say? Uh, All right, I'll make you an offer. Ten thousand dollars if you get Duke Raymond out of the way. Nothing if you don't. You've just made yourself a deal. Simon, you taking money for a case? The juries award damages for broken hearts, Anne. And you have no idea how badly I feel about letting Cupid down. Miss Morley, this is our famous riverfront. How do you like it? I don't. Now, there's the spot we're heading for. Do you see it? Well, I see some speedboats moored at a dock, if that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Any particular reason for coming here? Mm, The usual reason. We're going for a little boat ride. Uh, How much for the ride, buddy? Uh, Twelve miles south, twelve miles back for a buck. That's fair enough. Come on, Ann, let's get in. You know, the more I think about this, Simon, the crazier I think you are. Why would anyone want to travel 12 miles out into the ocean? To see Duke Raymond, of course. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's playing Father Neptune on top of a wave, I presume. Not exactly. You'll see when we get out there. And I'll expect a great big apology for those words when we get back. You mean, if you get back, don't you, Tim? Simon. I see. That man's here again. Tell me, Petey, my friend, what are you doing here? Are you coming along for a ride? That's right, huh? Uh, You know, after paying a buck for 12 miles out and 12 miles back, I think I've got a right to be particular about the kind of company I have. Well, don't let it bother you, pal. This gun in my hand makes us equals. Besides, you better pay only half a buck. Why only half a dollar, Petey? Because it's cheaper by the dozen, right, Petey? Yeah, yeah, you'll get the idea, pal. You may be going 12 miles out, but I don't think you're ever coming back. In 
Now, Pete, this ride hasn't been very comfortable so far. That gun sticking in my back irritates me. Yeah, it's too bad, isn't it? You're a sympathetic soul, aren't you? Oh, well, the ride's nearly over. There's Duke Raymond up ahead. That's funny. I don't see anything but an old freighter out there. That's it, lady, the Black Duke. The Black Duke? Wait, man, isn't it? It's a quaint ship. Gambling is the special thing. And I always thought that was against the law. That's when you're 12 miles out and you're Duke Raymond, it isn't. You see... Simon, there's not a cabin cruiser coming up behind us. Yeah, it's coming up fast, too, and no lights on. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. Oh, don't worry, Pete. It's just pulling ahead of us. Yeah, uh, I guess... Hey! Hey, what do you think you're doing? Simon, the boat's turned toward us. It's going to run into it. Take it easy. Look out! You're going to ram us! You're going to... How are you doing, Ann? Oh, all right. So far. But not much. Just a couple of more strokes will do it. There we go. Just two more now. There. Oh, I thought we'd, we'd never get here. Must have been telepathy. Oh. Wait a minute, I'll, I'll climb on board. Uh, okay, now that does it. Okay, now give me your hand. Okay, sir. Easy does it. Uh, oh. Well, quite an experience, I'd say. Oh. Where are we? We're in a speedboat moored to the Black Deuce. Which reminds me, it's time to go to work. Oh, yeah. You're not actually going aboard that ship, are you? That was my original intention, wasn't it? Besides, Pete and his boyfriend will drown if I don't get help out to him. Oh, and you've got to earn that $10,000. As I know. Yeah, right as usual, Angel. Now, listen closely. Do you know how to run a speedboat? Yes, yes, I do. Why? Well, I've got a funny idea you're going to have to run one in a very few minutes. Duke. Who are you? I'm Simon Pemper. The man Pete was supposed to bring in. Pardon the wet clothes, this damp sea air, you know. Where's Pete? The last time I saw him, he was hanging onto a wrecked speedboat a couple of hundred yards away. Hanging onto it? Uh, Come on, get down to cases, Templar. What's the racket? Uh, Duke, I have a funny hunch you're going to lay off Streeter's business. Am I? What makes you think so? It's a possible murder rap? Keep talking, Sapper. Tony Cartago was bumped off. Why? You're so smart, you ought to know. Maybe I do. I'd guess it was because he knew too much about bonds. Bonds? Yeah, you know, securities, negotiable ones worth a lot of dough. Where'd you get that idea? From Tony. He talked before he died. He mentioned you and bonds. Tony always talked too much. You talk too much, too. Mm, yeah, I'm beginning to get what you mean. I thought you would. You know, Duke, there you are, sitting behind that desk with a gun in your hand. I wonder. You wonder what? I wonder how you'd look with that desk on top of your... I'm too bad, Duke. You missed me. Sorry, I can't do this thing. Oh. Well, imagine that. Duke Raymond sleeping during business hours. <laughs> You'll never get ahead that way, old boy. Horatio Alger would positively frown upon you. Nice going, Anne. Thank you kindly for picking me up out of the water. If I'd known what was going to happen, I wouldn't have. When I saw you dive off that rail and all those people started shooting at you. Oh, just a necessary unpleasantness, my sweet. I had to get some information from Duke about bonds. Bonds? You going to play the market? Right now I'm playing the field. There's a murder in it. And I'm going to start at Mr. Streeter's warehouse. <laughs> Hmm. The warehouse is over to the left side. Sure, but we're going next door. And just what do you expect to find there, Sherlock? A printing press, of course. 
There, you see. The Travers Printing Company. Well, I see it, but I can't understand it. How did you know this place was here, and why look for a printer? Tony Cartega told me to look for one just before he died. And as for this place, do you remember the thumping noise we heard as we were leaving the warehouse? Why, of course. It was made by a printing press. Sure, that's what I thought. Well, shall we go in? At this hour? But it's so dark, nobody will be in there. Two facts would impress me no end. Now, let me see. I should have some keys in my pocket. Why bother? That door's already partially open. Well, you're right. Oh. It's as black as pitch in here. I mean, you can't risk a light until we're sure it's empty. There's a crack of light over there. Yeah. It seems to come from a doorway into another room. I wonder if... Oh. What's the matter? I, I hit my foot against something. Something soft. You don't say. Suppose you look up at the ceiling while I shine this pencil flash down. <gasps> oh, Simon. Perfectly expressed. He's dead, isn't he? Well, if he's not, he ought to be. He's been tied up, gagged, strangled, and shot in the leg. Who is he? I think he's the gentleman who tried to kill Mr. Streeter. Well, how do you... Because Jack shot him in the leg, remember? He's probably Mr. Travers the printer. He... What is it, Simon? Why'd you turn off the light? Because that light in the other room just went out, and I hate to be a nonconformist. Where are you going? I'm going to step over there and see what's up. Oh, be careful. Simon! Simon, are you all right? I'm not sure, but I'll risk it. I'm going after him. Oh, look out, Simon. He's a killer. <laughs> What is it? Oh, What's wrong? Whoever it was locked and bolted this door. I'll have to kick it down. Watch you. Someone may still be in there. You have the most pessimistic thoughts. I'll wait till I find the light switch. There. Well, nobody's here. He must have gone out that window. Yeah, and if I hadn't been idiot enough to bump into something in the dark, this case might have been over by now. Either that or you'd have been dead. I... That... Funny hissing sound. That? Oh, it's the flame under that lead pot over there. What's cooking? Oh, printers use them to melt their old linotype slugs in. Yes, but why would that be going now? Do you think the killer left... There was a reason I wanted you along tonight. You've just hit it. Look, there's the type. Yes. You see those engraved copper and zinc plates on that work table? Mm -hmm. If we'd come in a few minutes later, they'd have been in that lead pot. But what are they? Oh, I'm not so good at reading upside down and... Backwards, but six uh, percent debentures, state of secured highway taxes. Oh, so that's it. What would you mind explaining, Simon? Later, darling. First, I've got a little surprise party to prepare. Surprise party? Yeah. As soon as I remove the handkerchief gag from Mr. Travers, send a message to Duke Raymond, and make a few phone calls, we'll go to the scene of the party. How nice. Now, what's going to happen then? What usually happens at a surprise party? Oh, don't tell me. I know. One very foxy murderer is going to get a great big surprise. <laughs> So the surprise party is going to be at Tony Cartago's place. Right you are, Ann. There it is now. What's going to happen, Simon? All I know is that you called a lot of people in a disguised voice and told them something about Barnes and Tony's. Why? Well, if you'll look inside the cigar store, what do you see? Why, there's a light inside. Correct. And that must mean one of the guests has arrived. But quiet as we go in. I want to see if that's an early bird or a worm. Seems to be awfully busy looking for something. Let's help the poor soul find it. Hello, Betty. Oh. What's the matter, Betty? Looking for some bonds? Bonds? Uh, the ones you were called about this morning? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Not that, Betty. That'll never do. However, I wasn't the one who called you this morning. How did you know about that? Hey, we you join the party? Jack. Hello, dear. All right, Templer, what's this all about? Hello, gentlemen. Nice of you to come, Mr. Streeter. Uh, Jack, I was just talking to Betty about that phone call of this morning. What did your caller say, Betty? Something about your father's life being endangered over some bonds and that you'd better get down here fast to save him? My life in danger? 
What kind of nonsense is that? It wasn't nonsense to Betty. She came down here all right. We walked in right after Betty left and found Tony Cartago dead. Now, just a minute. You're making a pretty dangerous accusation there, Templar. Happens to be true. Mr. Streeter, Duke Raymond forced you to sell him that warehouse next to the Travers Printing Company, didn't he? Yes. And it took a lot of force. He ruined the business by destroying merchandise, wrecking trucks, the usual racketeering methods. I had to sell to stop losing money. Maybe you better not talk so much, Streeter. Yeah. Maybe won't be healthy. Well, 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 more guests. Duke Raymond and Pete. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Sappler. What gives here? Well, now, that's a rather silly question, Duke. You came here looking for bonds, didn't you? So your message was a frame, huh, chum? Only in a manner of speaking, chum. Someone in this room owed you money from gambling, didn't they, Duke? And promised to pay in negotiable securities to be left until called for here at Tony Cartagos. Sure story, Templar. Keep talking. But when Pete came to pick up the bonds for you, they were missing, and Tony was dead. It's lucky for you, too. If you tried to sell those bonds, you'd have been arrested. They were forgeries. Tony's? You sure about that? I know it, and I can prove it. Surprise, surprise, surprise. What do you think of your gambling friend now, Duke? That dirty double crosser. With all that dough in the family, too. Oh, loud well, down, Rat is going to get No, you. you don't, Duke. Okay. Stop right there. Tell him he's got a gun. Isn't that strange, Jan? I was thinking the same thing. Jack. Oh, no, Jack, not you. Pretty sharp, aren't you, Templar? Got it all figured out. Oh, I've been known to get around, Landers. Anyway, it was rather obvious. Particularly after you kissed Anne. After he kissed me? What did that have to do with it? Well, you see, Anne... I got something to say first. <laughs> Thanks for keeping him busy while I went for my gun, Temple. Oh, think nothing of it, Pete. And to show my appreciation... Here. What? What's the big idea, Ah, uh, Duke, let's not be hasty, shall we? I've got a gun, too. The one I borrowed from you aboard your ship. Get on the phone, Ann. Call the police. You bet, Simon. Right away. As for you, Mr. Streeter, get out your checkbook. The amount is 10000 payable to your favorite charity. Your friend Duke Raymond won't bother you again for a long, long time. <laughs> Like another drink, Anne? No, thank you, Simon. I suppose I should thank you for a lovely day. Mm, it had its points, but the football game might have been more exciting. I doubt it. But I still need some answers. But don't you see, Anne? Jack was terrified when he couldn't pay Duke the huge gambling debt he owed him. So he hit on the idea of forging bonds. He had Travers print them. But I still don't understand why he killed Travers. Well, he had to make sure that Travers wouldn't talk. So when Jack went to the print shop to destroy the evidence of the forged plate, he destroyed Travers, too. Yes, but why was Tony killed? Tony held the bonds for Duke. But when he discovered they were forged, he called the streeter home. Yes. Betty got the message and hurried down to see what it was all about. She thought Tony was talking about her father. And Jack was there, overheard the conversation, and beat her to Tony. Right. And he tried to kill us with a cruiser to stop us from getting Duke's store. Mm-hmm. He was a busy little man. Okay, mastermind. I guess I've got it. Except for that crack about the kiss. How come you knew Jack Landers was guilty because he kissed me? Lipstick, Aunt. What? Lipstick? Yeah. yeah. You see, after you kissed him, he had lipstick all over his face. Yeah. When I called it to his attention, he wiped it off with his handkerchief. And the handkerchief that gagged Travers had lipstick on it, too. Oh. And to think that just because he kissed me, he, he's dead. Mm, well, I wouldn't feel that way about it if I were you. Your kisses wouldn't kill anyone, and I can prove it. Can you, Simon? Sure. Why? Oh. There, you see? I guess you're right. Oh, please don't agree so quickly, Anne. Why not? I'm seriously considering making a lifetime work out of proving it. You've been listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here's our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, in tonight's cast, you heard Shirley Mitchell, Barbara Eiler, Jack Moyles, Tom Brown, Edmund McDonald, and Anthony Barrett. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure 
of the saint. Good night. Countdown for a blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. If you wanted to take over our world with a minimum amount of resistance and trouble, how would you go about it? Tonight we'll tell you how, with a strange and chilling story by George Lefferts, The Parade. You are Mr. Sid Ryan. The same. My name is Lucha. I am a Martian. Ah, pleased to meet you, Mr. Lu... Uh, what was that again? A Martian. As in Orson Welles? Precisely. <laughs> I'm a Rotarian myself. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Lucha, what can Publicity Associates do for you? I am interested in obtaining publicity. It has been my observation that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lucha. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client... The client, of course, will be the Martians. You don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Lucha. Oh, how do you Mr. do? Mr. Lucha claims to be a Martian. Take him outside, will you, Oliver? I'm happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I guessed it would. I believe we can do business. I have here cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand... Oliver... Take a look at that wad of lettuce. It's the real stuff, Mr. Ryan. And my client is prepared to spend many times that amount. Oh, sit down, Mr. Lucha. Oliver, get the client a cigar, the 50-cent bar. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign. A very large and important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Something quite new. Now... What would you judge the most effective type of campaign? Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying, Watch this space. Then about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Then finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. Excellent. We will conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire and the whole campaign is kafloppo. Quite so, quite so. The utmost secrecy. Ah, uh, you realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would, say, one million dollars cover expense? Hey, come again? I said, would one million dollars cover it? Why, well, yes, I am at... You did say, uh, a million. I understood that you have handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... No, no, not all, not all. I... As a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, oh, oh of course, that's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right. Mm. Yes, sir. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, the streetcars with a very simple statement. Uh, what's that? I will write it on a card. Here you are. The... Martians are coming. Say, that's not a bad teaser. We got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. And the next ad will read, June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. Uh, what happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the Macy Parade? Exactly. 
except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow, the Martian world. My client would like it to be a gay affair. Balloons, clowns, pennants, pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Luchard, just uh, what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? Oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy, remember? Yeah, but after all... Mr. I... Ryan, all will be revealed to you in good time. For the moment, let us say that we are selling a concept. A concept? The concept of invasion from Mars. <laughs> Sorrel Talent Agency. Uh, Sammy Sorrel, please. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Sammy, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine. I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40. June 1st. And listen, Sammy, I want them dressed in little space suits. In little... Uh, you, ah. you know, like men from Mars. Mars. Okay? And I want some movie extras. Uh, maybe 50 of them. 50. Also rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome. Got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with pretty girls on top of them. Uh -huh. Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the one we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. I'll try, Sid. Never mind the expense. Just get me the talent. It sounds like you landed a big client. Uh, who is it? <laughs> it's a secret. I got to hang now. Call me back, Sammy. Uh, how you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan. Just fine. I got a hundred small boys paste and little stickers. The Martians are coming on the subway platform. Good. We got full page ads on all the dailies. Good. And ten second spot announcements on every local station. Good. It's costing a fortune. Good. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you were going to the electric chair, Oliver. Yes, sir. How are you making out in the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Bonham invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbals, and Sacks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them and funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. Well, that sounds fine, only... Uh... Only what? Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. Oliver, my boy, do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not putting two and two together? You mean you know who Luchar represents? Just by accident, understand? I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. One of those expensive pictures they make in secret and then spring on the public because they don't want the other studios to get the jump on them. What's the picture? A space opera titled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh. Oh, I begin to see. Also, by mere coincidence, it's supposed to have its premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? Yes, but... Uh... Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Features Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no, so they have to get around the contract. A man named Luchar, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. <laughs> Need I go further? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Ryan. Sounds pretty far-fetched to me, but I don't know. That's what I like about you, Oliver. You're so innocent. <laughs> Now, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello. Commish, Sid Ryan. Oh. How are you, Ryan? Fine. What is it this time? You want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water? The answer is no. <laughs> also, we're not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade. June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Now, look, Ryan. I... Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the wearing of the green. Oh, don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. I have the 5th Avenue Merchants Association behind me. <sighs> okay, Ryan. And fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. By the way, what's the occasion for this parade? Well, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. How is the campaign going, Mr. Ryan? Like wildfire, Mr. Luchar, like wildfire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I got some of the merchants doing World of Tomorrow displays in their windows. Every big novelty manufacturer in town is climbing on the bandwagon. They want to get into the parade with floats, giveaways, anything. Everybody smells a buck to be made. 
I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor himself declared Martian Day. I've even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the policeman's benevolent fund from the man from Mars. Oh, it's terrific, terrific. My blood pressure's up to 200. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, uh... I understand Century Pictures spent over a million bucks making that space opera. I beg pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucha. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? <laughs> Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Daly speaking to you from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York, a perfect day for a parade, and the streets are packed with thousands of spectators all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of shrill expectancy. Some of the kids and their parents have been camped on the curbstone since early this morning to be sure of ringside seats when the so-called Martians pass by. I've, uh, I've just had word from Saul Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, now while we're waiting for the arrival of the parade... We brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this most spectacular of all publicity stunts. Please turn out what that's right. Come on. Uh, what's your name, madam? Uh, Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. Uh huh. And where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Columbus, Ohio. I see. And I, I see you have your family with you too. Uh, two little curly-headed blonde boys. Uh, are you in New York on vacation? We came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Uh, well, uh, what do you think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here two hours. I, I can't make head or tail of it. Well, uh, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley. But judging by the thousands here today, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, folks say. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. Mr. Ryan. Uh, yeah, which is, yeah. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan. Right. And uh, this is Mr. Sid Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity man who's the brains behind the Martian Day stunt. Hello, Sid. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, easy, easy. Not so close to the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Sid, you've certainly lifted the lid this time. Looks like it, doesn't it? Sid, there's been a great deal of speculation as to exactly what all this is leading up to. I've heard some folks say it's a big war bond drive, uh, Others think it's just to stimulate local business. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand in the trade itself, the smart, smart money says you're building for the premiere of Century's forthcoming extravaganza, Invasion from Mars. Now, come clean. Can you tell us what the real story is? Ah, I can. I'd like to, but honestly, I can. Oh, man of mystery, eh? Are you going to watch the parade from the stand here? No, I can't. I can't stand noise. I'm going out to my office and watching government. <laughs> well, thank you, Sid Ryan. And good luck. And here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade. Swinging down Fifth Avenue with fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the traffics of a Mardi Gras. in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits, carrying blue Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. See, I, I can read one which says, Atomic Blaster. Oh, another one has a placard reading, We're, uh, we're Martian through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns, laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of the great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. This is promised as the climax of the show. 
And now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. And now here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The Martians. Marching in booted, helmeted ranks. Row after row of them. My, this is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen. And a rather serious contrast to the rest of the joyous slapstick parade we've witnessed. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each is holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position. They're marching in absolute silence, keeping step perfectly, as though some mute, unspoken command were marking time for them. The, the crowd seems rather grim and serious now. Perhaps they're reminded of the actuality of war and possible invasion. They stand solemnly, silently, watching. Even the children are awed. And now the first ranks of the Martians are dead faint. I tell you, I've never felt such mass tension in a crowd as we're experiencing here right now, today. All sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the audience. There are excited whispers of she's dead, she fainted, and now an undercurrent of... What? They're really Martians. This is an example of how a single incident can precipitate mass hysteria, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's a mighty reassuring sight to see the blue uniforms of New York's finest spaced every ten feet or so along the avenue. Somehow, I, I can't explain it, this incident has begun to work on what was a moment ago a happy, carefree crowd. And the complexion is changing. Did you see that? A woman fainted. Of course I saw it. What do you suppose she saw? Oliver, old man, did I ever tell you you were too naive for this business? But that young woman ran out into the streets to get a close look at the Martians, and then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver, the stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. Yeah, for my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Uh, shut the window. Don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucha? I haven't seen him. Well, he'll be around. Boy, those Martians sure look like the real thing. How would you know the real thing if you saw it, Oliver? Well, gee, I, I don't know. Uh, close the window, Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan. Charles Talent Agency. Sammy, this is Sid Ryan. Say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. No, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Well, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in the bag? Never felt better. Well, you mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, but Sid, under the circumstances... Sid. Well, what is it? Sid, don't you know? I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. I was going to call you, but I figured... Hey, wait a minute. I... Where'd these guys come from if you didn't hire them? I don't know. Uh, maybe Oliver... Oh, hold on. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? No, sir, I... Sammy, this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... Okay, Sammy, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. I just don't know. I've got to locate Lucha. What's Century Pictures number? Mr. Ryan, this is Sunday. Oh, yeah, well, get me their publicity director, Marty Sanford, at home. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Three, two, four... Hmm. Here you are. Thanks. Sanford. Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the... Uh, fine, What's fine. Uh, listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucha. Uh, Lou who? Lucha, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. Invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you, Batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. Too expensive and too fantastic. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. And I never heard of a guy named Luke. Mother of heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. 
Well, that's too fantastic. What's too fantastic, Mr. Ryan? Is something wrong? Open that window. I want another look at those Martians. Yes, sir. Look at them. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that and say... 24 hours? Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one other step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi storm troops marching through the streets of Paris. See those chests on That's pride. Sheer, arrogant pride. Look at those chins. That's contempt. Nobody could act like that. Mr. Ryan! Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who fainted. Her name's Gloria Montex. Get her up here. Make it fast. Sense, however, but... Stay away from me. Gloria, it's me, Sid Ryan. You don't kid me, you're a Martian. Gloria, settle down. <laughs> now you're wearing a mask. Baby, it's me, Sid. And underneath, it's, it's awful. It's all big green eyes and those, those feelings like, like a cat thing. Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you, but the fainting, that wasn't the act. Oh, go away, please, go away. what you see? Oh, no, please. It's too awful, please, please. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what'd you see? <laughs> You won't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver, I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. we got to stop this parade before things begin to happen. Okay, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. you got to stop that parade. Uh, I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front page spread on every paper in town. Honest, you publicity guys give me a pay. This may be a matter of life and death. Oh, sure, sure. Look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where these Martians came from, who they are, anything about them. All I want you to do is stop the parade and make sure they're on the level. Uh-uh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. Now, if you let the sergeant show you well... You won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection and you refuse it. I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than a fried egg. Go ahead. I'm sure his honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. You heard me, Ryan. You cannot see the mayor. Adolf, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guy, something horrible is already happening. A couple hundred little kids are in the hospital with tomaine poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. Or didn't you know? I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure, sure, you'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people would get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space that would get you and your product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. You won't have to, because you're going to get out of here right now. Go on, beat it, get out. You and your publicity stunts make me sick to my stomach. Oliver? Oliver, where are you? Uh, Oliver! Oliver! It is useless what? to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucha. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him? You stinking murderer! Now, now Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled, now would it? Look, just start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? But surely you know, Mr. Ryan, after all, you've been publicizing it for months. Listen, you... Please do not interrupt. You see, before colonizing your planet, we Martians sent advanced scouts to study your habits, your weaknesses. We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity. And so, we conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. Clever, huh? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plan? Holy jumping catfish. You've done very well. Then... 
There was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is death. What are you trying to do, Lucha? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundreds would suffice. In exactly two minutes, our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucha. But not if I can help it. You take, take. Good. Yes, please. Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry. Reviewing stand, Sergeant Cassidy. Get me Commissioner Patrick. Hello. 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 You'll have to talk loud. I want Commissioner Patrick. Oh. Patrick, Patrick. Wait, wait a minute. Th things are quieting down. Uh, now, what was it you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to but, him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. What? Stop him! Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. You idiot, the worst is going to... This is the operator. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan, you've been cut off. I can't seem to get them back. Doesn't matter, operator. Nothing matters now. Tonight... X-1 has brought you The Parade, an original story written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Joe DeSantis as Luchar, Alexander Scorby as Daly, Agnes Young as The Woman, Ellen Deming as Gloria, John Thomas as Oliver, Arthur Anderson as Sammy, Wendell Holmes as The Commissioner, and William Keene as Sanford, your announcer Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way. And it's a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Next week, the tables turn. Instead of Martians invading Earth, we bring you a tale of men invading Mars. Ray Bradbury's brilliant short story entitled, Mars is Heaven. Suppose you were a member of the first rocket ship crew to land on Mars, but instead of seeing Martians, you find that you've landed in a town that looks just like home, that all your dead relatives and friends are there to greet you, so that as incredible as it may seem, you think you're really in heaven. That is, you think so, right up to the fatal moment. The moment of X minus one. Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire! Far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years. On a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X... X, 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 X minus... 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 minus one... 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 one. Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life... Intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine. Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? 
Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now I hear this. Now I hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. Steady as she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. Four. 350. Three. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. the power. Masters, fight battle stations. I said, all secured, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars, April 20th, 1987, 4.33 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, masters. I said. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first manned ship from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers that we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story. And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. Inspection, Captain. Now? Mr. Lustig... We've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now I hear this. Landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time, minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Come on, let's get in the lock. Hingston, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. 
What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I offer your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you uh, find light. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? Mm -hmm. The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way up? After all, we are invaders. Now I hear this landing time minus two. All right, all right, we heard this. Oh, and I'd like to find outside that airlock. Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Lustig? Uh, only Chicago. Well, you ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Oh, tough. No, oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. I, I said... Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not rewarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters. Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Aye, sir. It's fresh air. Let's go. All right, now, take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground this time. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the quiet? Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Kingston. Hi, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Hi, sir. What do you make of the ground, horse? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mist's thinned down. What the... Kingston, hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain! What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that, that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars... Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that porch swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. Yeah. It can't be, sir. Horst... Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that porch swing of the piano and, and beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like the town I was born in. Well, it, it looks like my hometown, too. 
I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe, maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lester. Oh, how else can you explain it? Uh, suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lester. Men's space travel, it couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. Aye, sir. All right. Come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, horse. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What what town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand Mars? You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I told you I'd call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Of course, is it possible that we got fouled up, made, made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone, gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, it, this won't hold water. It's, it's not logical. We've, we, we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Lustig out at point. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. I sir. Horst, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain! What? That, 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 that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought of... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! Lustig, come back here! He's running for that house. That crazy fool after him, quick! Lustig, stop! Come down off of that porch! Emma! 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 Lustig, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! Grandma! Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig! Oh. Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfather. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. <laughs> How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I... I want to talk to my grandpa... Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now, let's go! Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration of abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You! You masters! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not a bad guy for an orc. Up on Hingston! Uh, uh, what, sir? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hingston! I'll be right back, Captain Uncle George. Uncle what the George. devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. Uh, they're, they're all here. You're right, Captain. I found it. The whole crew is out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Yeah. Give it an order. You don't understand, Captain. I understand mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. John! Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun. It's you. Edward. Yes. It can't be. Oh, of course it is. Johnny, Johnny, Ed. you old... <laughs> Ed, what? Dr. Horst, this is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to, to see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've... 
I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? <laughs> How's that, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed! Ed! <laughs> we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst, Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> Bye, George. 35 years. So don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, eh? Huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? <laughs> What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will. When does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. Well, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Horst. What? Oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Well, I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, well, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there. She must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any, Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you have to stay over. Yes, well, but that settles it then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you're used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the daybed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. <laughs> yes, I, I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed, security check. What, why do you have to do that here? I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, eh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. 
<laughs> Green-skinned Martians. All the time there was only Mom and Dad and, and Edward waiting. That's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose there were Martians, no. and they saw us land. And suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? Oh, I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, hmm. suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images stolen from our own memories by Martians, created for us by telepathy, hypnotism. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory, no real loved person, not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to recreate. How about that phone call? Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, sick, delirious, I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care well, of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her, by reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? The whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but... It... If there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house. Sleeping. Trusting. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother? His grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But we've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen. The crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ahead. We, uh... We wanted a drink of water, that's... That's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a His drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marshal! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John! This way, horse! Can you hear me, Earth? This this is Captain John Black, the XR-53 calling for Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now. The Martians! I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hinkston, Lustig, Dr. Horst. Poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen! Listen! They're trying to break through the hull. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks. But, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? Martians, not men. They, they made us think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Wayne and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. One. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. 
G. Marshall. From time to time, we come across a story so unexplainable, so incredible, that we just cannot pass it by. So today, no mystery to challenge your powers of deduction, for there is no rational explanation of what happened. However, if you care to accompany me into the land of the uncharted and unknown, I think it will be well worth your while. Certain things that occur have no explanation, but that makes them no less worthy of repeating on Mystery Theater. Dr. Kingsley, you're suggesting I take art classes, but I'm an airplane pilot. Alan, you are a grounded pilot. That is quite different. But, Doctor, I wouldn't want anyone to know I'm undergoing psychiatric care. But nobody will. You have no choice. Now, there's one thing you must have to get back into mental shape. Now, what's that, Doctor? Peace of mind. Our mystery drama, Second Sight, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agat Jr. and stars Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you're traveling across the country, business friends or relatives coming in from out of town. Put them up under the sun at a nearby Quality Inn. They'll find a warm welcome waiting and all the comforts Quality Inns are famous for. Make an out-of-towner feel right at home. Call your local Quality Inn or call us toll-free for reservations at the most comfortable place under the sun. Quality Inn, the most comfortable place under the sun. in a receptive frame of mind for today's mystery theater, let me ask you this. Suppose you looked into the mirror but didn't see your own reflection. Or suppose you opened a newspaper and there was your own obituary. Or suppose you saw in a flash something that had not yet happened. Would you feel you were responsible if the following day it did come to pass and it was a murder? Questions like these are not answered easily, if at all, by scientist, doctor, or psychiatrist. Certainly not by Dr. Marvin Kingsley. Dr. Kingsley, it's good of you to see me on such short notice. Well, I'm happy to work with your Air Pilots Association. Your full name, please. Alan Harvey. And you're an airline pilot, correct? I was an airline pilot, but... Uh, you don't have to say any more. I'm aware of your problem. But I want to say more. If you're going to help me, Dr. Kingsley, I've got to tell you everything as I see it. Not as my airline sees it. Go ahead. I've been on international flights for ten years. I've flown around the world I don't know how many times. I'm a million-mile pilot several times over. And then... One day on my flight to the Caribbean, it happened. I'll never forget it. We were making good time. In spite of headwinds and visibility zero... Are you still on automatic, Alan? What'd you say, Charlie? I said, are Charlie, you still... look out there. Do you see what I see? Yeah. Nothing. No, that object flying across at 3 o'clock. Come on, Alan. There's nothing out there. Check the scope, will you? Nothing. Nothing's on the scope. Not a blip? Not a blip. It's gone. Alan, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. I don't know. You're seeing things I don't see. That was the first time, Dr. Kingsley. You thought you saw an object in the sky. I didn't think I saw it. I know I saw it. Uh, during the month of September, you reported sighting various objects in mid-flight which made no impression on the electronic monitoring gear. That's why I was grounded. I was just as glad. You know, Doctor, you can take just so much kidding about seeing unidentifiable flying objects. The UFOs? I never saw any UFOs. I saw men in the sky, standing upright, holding flags, 
national colors which I couldn't identify. I saw mountaintops with cows grazing on them. A skyscraper a hundred stories high in black marble. I saw... I saw too much. What do you think, Doctor? Well, what you saw in the skies is obviously very real to you. Now, for starters, I'm going to recommend a complete rest. But I mean complete. Rest? I'll go crazy doing nothing. Oh, I neglected to ask you, Alan. Are you married? No, I'm not. I was once, but that was a long time ago. I live by myself. Here in Greenfield? Right on North Chatham Street. No, I'm not suggesting you just sit and vegetate. Do you have any hobbies or uh, interests other than your job? Well, let me see. Years ago, I was interested in becoming a painter. Even now, I've sort of kept up. Sometimes I'll, I'll take a sketch pad and draw. Oh, good. Uh, what kind of things? Lately, I've been drawing the objects I've observed from the cockpit. Well, why not enroll in some art class? That would occupy you and challenge you. You know, the university I teach at has a very fine art department. Would that appeal to you? What good would it do me? I'm a flyer. I'm never going to make it as an artist. Well, it would give you another outlet for your energies. Let me put in a call to Jacob Greer, who runs the department. He teaches a few classes also. See, I know Jacob personally, and I'm sure he'd take you in. I don't know. How, how long should I do it? Well, let's not set any limits for the present. See, there's one thing you need more than anything else, and perhaps drawing in a class with other people will help you achieve it. What one thing? What do I need? Peace of mind, Alan. I'm happy to meet you, Mr. Harvey. I'm Jacob Greer. Marvin Kingsley tells me you'd like to join one of our art classes. Have you ever drawn a live model before? No, I haven't, Mr. Greer. I, I've brought along the kind of sketches I've done. Mostly in my spare time, you understand. Uh-huh. Wow. Well, extraordinary. Most imaginative. Uh, these people standing about in the clouds... Oh, it's very imaginative. Most of what I do is what I've seen. You have a good feeling for... I hope this wasn't drawn from life. What is it? It looks like the fuselage of a big airliner with a lot of bodies strewn about. Yes, that's what it is. I, I did that one yesterday. That's gruesome. Well, I think you have some talent, and if you'd like to join our class, it's Tuesdays and Fridays from 1 o'clock until 4 in the studio. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, let me uh, hang on to some of these drawings of yours, may I? Sure. This airplane crash is certainly powerful. Now, I'll be seeing Marvin Kingsley tonight. We have a running chess game on Monday evenings. I've for years. I'll tell him you're joining us. Checkmate, Marvin, old boy. <laughs> I saw it coming, Jacob. <laughs> you know, you're going to qualify as a grandmaster one of these days. Ah, you're off your game. I know you, Marv. Yeah. And you're right, you're right. I wasn't concentrating. Marv, that fellow Alan Harvey you sent me, a strange sort of man, quite gifted. I've seen his portfolio. Have you uh, known him for long? Well, as a matter of fact, I haven't. See, he came to me because he was having some problems in, uh, in relaxing. Oh, I didn't ask you what his problem was. Uh, you know, I don't discuss my patients, Jacob. Let's say he may have some guilds, and I prescribe your art course as a vacation from those guilds. Well, I'll say this. He has a lot of talent. There was one drawing he showed me that... Hey, do you mind if I turn this set? I'd like to catch the evening news. No, no, no. I'll go make us some coffee. Oh, I forgot to get cream, darn it. Uh, don't worry. I can take it black. A jet airliner carrying 200 people crashed into a corporate plane at 6 o'clock tonight after traffic controllers radioed conflicting instructions. This is the scene behind me. One of the worst air disasters to strike this area in the history of aviation. According to... What is it? What happened? Oh, something with the TV set. They've still got the picture, but there's no sound. Do... Do you see that shot of the field? Wait. It 
can't be. Good Lord. Hello. Turn it off if it upsets you. It's all those bodies. No, no, that's not what I mean. Turn it off. No, 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 they'll get the sound back in a minute. They, they still got the picture. Turn it off, please. Okay, okay. I want to show you something. Here. This is one of the drawings your Alan Harvey left with me. Mm hmm. What do you see? Hmm. A grisly, almost photographically detailed drawing of a smashed airliner. And smashed people. Well? Well, what are you trying to tell me, Jacob? Doesn't this drawing look exactly like what we just saw on the tube? But exactly? Uh, yes, I suppose there is a similarity. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You see, Alan Harvey was an airline pilot, so I suppose he drew that from some experience he had. Marvin, my mind deals in pictures. I would say there's not just a similarity, the real accident and what this man has drawn are identical. Oh, but how could they be? You said you saw him this morning. He couldn't have drawn it at the airport. It just happened at 6 o'clock tonight. He said he did it yesterday. Well, I'll bet if you went through the files and matched the photographs, there's a sameness about most air crashes. Mm, I hope you're right. I don't understand why you're so upset, Jacob. What else could it be? It got me to thinking, that's all. Well, what's your problem? If Alan Harvey can draw a future occurrence before it happens, I'd say we all have a problem. Welcome today, a new member to our life class, Alan Harvey. Uh, Miss Johnson, we'll have two minutes of warm-up poses, and then we'll begin the longer poses. Arthur, uh, why don't you put your easel beside Alan so that if there's anything he doesn't know, you can fill him in? All right, Miss Johnson. I'm uh, I'm new to this. W what are warm-up poses? Uh, you'll see. Those will be action poses Miss Johnson does up there. You know, poses that, that no model could hold very long. Uh, that one, see? One leg up and hand extended, sort of uh, sort of like a dance pose. I'm supposed to draw that? W what's she doing? You certainly are, Alan. That's it. Use your charcoal. Fine. Good, good. Just a few action lines. Alan, that's very good. Contour is excellent. Oh, what, oh fine. I what like did that. he say your name was? Uh, Arthur Lewis. Excellent. I'm Alan Harvey. Say. Hey, you're not bad. That's good. How can she hold that pose? Leaning over one hand way down and the other way up. Because Miss Johnson is a professional model, Alan. And now suppose we have less talk and more drawing, okay? Good. Yeah. Just a couple of contour lines, Alan. We're not projecting the model's complete form. You uh, mind if I stand behind you, Alan? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not at all, Professor Greer. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Let me see that one you just turned over. Oh, it's nothing, really. I, I didn't even know what I was drawing. Alan, one of the things you've got to learn about our work, yeah. no one can afford to be shy or modest. Looking, appraising, it's the only way for me to gauge your progress. Oh, it isn't anything. Let me be the judge of that. Now pull that page back. You just sketched this? It took me all of two minutes. I told you it wasn't any good. It's very good. It's just that uh, I'm a little taken aback at what you drew. Taken aback? Isn't that a drawing of our model, Miss Johnson? Lying across that bed, bruises on her neck, eyes staring open as if she'd just been strangled to death. I warned you, didn't I? This would be a story hard to explain. If you like, let's begin by believing some events are coincidence. Or, as the phrase goes, a strange coincidence. However, the model Miss Johnson isn't dead yet. And as we know, Alan Harvey's wings were clipped for seeing things that weren't there. Did I say foreseeing? Just a coincidence. I'll be back shortly.
remember the old story of the three blind men who were asked to describe an elephant? One felt the big wide body and said, it's a wall of leather. The second put his arms around one of the animal's legs and said, it's the trunk of a tree. And the third blind man felt the elephant's tail and said, it's a snake. All were mistaken, for none could really see the elephant. Are we perhaps also limited in our vision? And what we think exists may not? Is Alan Harvey able to see what really is with a special second sight that is not ours? I'll be frank with you. It disturbed me to discover I'd been drawing our model, Miss Johnson, as a victim of a murder. I'd never given it a second look. The truth is, I didn't even remember drawing it. Professor Greer kept looking at what I'd done with this horrified expression. So I was pretty shaken when I came back to class on Friday and set up my easel next to Arthur Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today Miss Johnson will skip the warm-up poses. The pose she will now assume will be the one held for the entire session. 20-minute poses in the first hour and a half with the usual five-minute rest periods. All right, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Greer. Miss Johnson? It's a little chilly in the studio this morning. Could I have a heater placed near me? Of course. Arthur, would you be good enough to get the electric heater out of my office? Can't afford to have our Miss Johnson catch cold. My progress that day was as halting as the first days had been speedy. I, I didn't know what to make of it. Miss Johnson was the model as before, but somehow I could not get her down on paper. For the first time since I'd begun the classes, I was relieved when Jacob Greer pointed to the clock. That'll be all for today. Class dismissed. Oh, uh, Alan, would you uh, stay on a bit? Yes, Professor Greer. I noticed you're having a little trouble today. Some of those lines just not forceful enough. I was aware of that, too. Something seems to be holding me up now. May I have a look at what you've been doing? Of course. What? Is this all you've done today? I'm afraid so. I, I tried. I couldn't even get the simplest action line. Uh, what's that supposed to be? Where? In the corner of that page. A table set for two people at the... I know where that is. Yes, it is. That's the Chinese restaurant right here in town. <laughs> I hope by next Tuesday you'll be taking a more serious approach to your work. I am serious, Professor Greer. I just don't seem to be able to concentrate on what I see. What's in my mind's eye is so much clearer to me than what's in front of my real eye. I can't think how you happen to know I just love Chinese food. I just guessed, Miss Johnson. I wasn't doing anything particular this evening, so I took a chance you might be free. It so happens this is my one night off in the week. You mean you've got a regular job as well as modeling? Well, I just model for extra money. I'm studying piano at the music school. You're a musician? Well, I hope to be. Every day but today and Sundays, I go to class from 4 to 7. Then I have a little supper at my place and then back to the school where they let me practice as late as I like. That's quite a schedule. Is, uh, is painting all you do, Mr. Harvey? Right now it is, Miss Johnson. <laughs> What's your first name? Peggy. Mine's Alan. It's a funny thing, but I... I don't associate the girl who stands up in class and poses uh, with you. <laughs> well, I'm a little more formally dressed now. <laughs> you, you're not married, are you? I was a long time ago, but my wife didn't like my being married to an airline. I'm a pilot. I don't believe it. I was married to a pilot, too. Oh, but it didn't take. Take? Take as long to discover it was a big mistake. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Anyway, seeing Jacob is much better. No strings and outside of the classroom. He's, he's very amusing. Jacob? You're, you're dating Professor Greer? Yes. Well, is that so crazy? There's not that much difference in our ages. No, I'm not saying there is. It's just so uh, <laughs> unexpected. Oh, I see younger men, too. Like Arthur. Arthur Lewis, who... Sits next to you in class with, with the red beard? Yeah, sure, sure, I know. He's awfully nice, too. Not nearly as possessive. In fact, in many ways, I think he's more mature than Jacob. Say, aren't you getting hungry? Oh, 
famished. I tell you what. You order from column A and I'll order from column B. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems our Miss Johnson isn't going to be with us today. And Arthur has volunteered to model for us, so we shan't be losing any time. You all ready, Arthur? Uh, ready when you are, J.G. All right, please begin. Now, I want you all to loosely suggest the action of the pose before you actually sketch the form. Very good, Alan. <laughs> you don't seem to have any block when it comes to drawing the male form. <laughs> it was only that one time, Professor Greer. I'm, I'm sure I could do Miss Johnson next time. Keep drawing. Good. Uh, what are you doing now? Putting in a face. Well, that's not Arthur's face. It's more like mine. And, Alan, what's that you're drawing in the subject's right hand? Right hand? I, I don't know. I wish you'd stick to what's before you and not try to dramatize things as though you were doing an illustration for a mystery magazine. You've got me holding a pistol. Now I see a doorway and some other body crumpled up against it as though he'd just been shot. Dr. Kingsley, I really appreciate you seeing me on a Sunday. What I want to say is... How can I say it? I I don't think these life classes are doing me any good. Uh, well, why do you say that, Alan? I went nearly crazy yesterday, Saturday. I, I tried to get out of the house, take a walk, but I, I found myself always coming back to my drawing board. Well, I think that's a good sign. But it's not. Nothing's changed. It's, it's all as it was before. I, I'm seeing things that nobody else sees, only now I'm drawing them. Here, look at these, please. Some I've done in class and, and, and some at home. Hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. Do you? Do you really? I, I'm terrified. Oh, you, you draw very well, Alan. It's what I draw. Here, this... This one, for instance. Now, um, now look. You, you will work your way out of this. Um, don't worry. It's the mind's way of healing itself. Doctor, I think you've got it all wrong. Here, look here. I, I drew this just this morning before I came to see you. I... I sat myself down, and this happened, like like automatic writing. Well, the drawings are for Jacob Greer to criticize. Now, what do you expect from me? Just just tell me what you see. All right. It's a young man, about uh, 25, I'd say, stretched out off a slab in the morgue. Uh, when were you at the morgue last? Never. I've never been there. But, well, you've seen pictures. I tell you, I haven't. But you must have. Then you've forgotten that happens to be the morgue attached to our hospital, exactly the way you've colored it. You don't understand. You simply do not understand, do you, Doctor? I don't know what or how I draw. Uh, my, my dear Alan, you must have been there. The detail, the glare of that green shade, the hexagonal tiles, uh, that one broken tile near the door. Now, now, face reality, Alan. Forget it. Do you know the young man you've drawn? That corpse with the red beard? That's the horrible part. Yes, I, I know him. His name is Arthur Lewis. He's another student in my class. What what shall I do? Uh, when do you go again? Uh, to your art class? Day after tomorrow. All right. Now, right after class, come back here to my office and bring what you've drawn that day, and we will try again. Now, we'll sit down quietly, calmly, and talk about it. Uh, this sort of thing happens more often than not, Alan. We transfer and transpose people we know into the most unlikely situations. See, most of us do it in dreams, but you're doing it on paper. You, you don't think it's any more than that, Dr. Kingsley? Just bear in mind, Alan, you and I are mortal. We can do no more, see no more, know no more than our five senses tell us. You mean there's no such thing as a sixth sense or a second sight? Well, arithmetically, perhaps. But in fact, no. Marvin! Well, come in, come in. What are you doing here in the afternoon? You haven't stopped in to see me on a Sunday for I don't know how long. But I hope this isn't a bad time for you, Jake. No, no, not at all. Only if I'd known, I... You see, I have a standing date with the young ladies Sunday evenings, but, 
Well, that gives us an hour. Yes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to the point. That young pilot I sent over to you, Alan Harvey, well, he came to see me today and he brought some sketches. Oh, macabre, aren't they? But splendid. He has a flair. As well, he's done it again. Well, at least I hope he hasn't. What has he done? It seems he's drawn one of your students, a chap with a red beard, lying on a slab in the morgue. Then he showed me another he'd done of a girl, your life model, strangled. He's also drawn me, holding a pistol. Claims he doesn't know what he's doing, has no control. I've put it down to wild imagination. Well, I've also told him it was ridiculous to attach any significance to it. Well, I certainly won't. The very young lady he's strangled on paper, I've been seeing quite a lot of for almost three months now. I'm taking her to dinner tonight. You're not serious. Oh, I am, Marv. Very serious. I know she's been seeing a younger man, but I don't know who he is. But so what? Jacob Greer, you... I just (laughs) may ask Peggy to marry me. What? Imagine keeping this from me. I really didn't feel that serious about Peggy until, I don't know, it just grew on me. (laughs) Well, congratulations. (laughs) I I, I'd better go. It it was only about Alan that I dropped in. You know, one of these days I'll figure out why he is so preoccupied with death. But I'll give it a thought, Jacob. I'll keep tabs on him. So will I. I'm very interested in that young man. He has an enormous talent. I feel so wicked, I can't begin to tell you. Why, Peggy? Half of America goes to the movies on a Sunday night and has a soda afterwards. Oh, it's not that I'm having a soda in a drugstore at ten at night with a man I've only known for a few days. It's because I've stood up the two guys I usually date. Who, Jacob? And Arthur. I generally see Jacob for dinner Sunday night. He gets me home about this time, and then half an hour later, Arthur stops by, and we go listen to music somewhere. (laughs) You're going to get yourself into trouble. They enjoy themselves. So why did you go out with me? Because I love going to movies, and nobody ever asks me. Well, you'd better beat it home. At least you can keep one of your two dates. And that's our weather for tonight. Here now is the Midnight News. We have just received word of a triple tragedy on the north side involving a young music student who had been doing part-time modeling, a young man who is an art student, and an art teacher. All are dead in what appears to be a double murder and suicide. For a report from the scene of the tragedy, here now is... My Lord, I can't be hearing this. It can't be true. Did Alan Harvey unconsciously set into motion these extraordinary events, or is he cursed with second sight? More often than not, when our second act curtain rings down on Mystery Theater, all of the clues are in, all the evidence presented, and you have an equal chance to solve the mystery. Not this time, for we appear to be dealing in an enigma wrapped in a secret, contained in a sealed book, written about a strange, uncharted land. Come back with your compass when I return shortly with Act Three. I like pickles, but they don't like me. Send your stomach some I like pizza, but it doesn't like me. Send your stomach some Digel. Digel's special combination of antacid and anti-gas ingredients gives you fast, gentle relief from acid indigestion, heartburn, and gas in just minutes. I like hot dogs, but they don't like me. For occasional use only as directed. Until I began to host Mystery Theater, I thought of myself as pretty realistic. I believed what I saw and drew conclusions from known facts. Well, I've come quite a ways since then, and now I suspect there's an awful lot to be said for the unknown. What we thought was impossible yesterday is possible today. 
couldn't the same be true of tomorrow? In our world, anything can happen and probably will. It's that same evening. Fearfully, Dr. Marvin Kingsley keeps listening to the news. We repeat the first bulletin. Police are investigating three deaths on the north side in the apartment of a part-time model found strangled. Also dead, apparently shot, is a male art student and a male art teacher. The woman has been identified as Peggy Johnson and the young man as Arthur Lewis. The police have not yet released the name of the art teacher other than to say... It can't be. It can't be. Not him. Jacob, please. Be home. Please, please, answer the phone. Please. Please. Today is Monday. I feel peculiar. I keep trying not to think of tomorrow in another life class. I sit at my table and look out the window. All the little houses... Ours is not a big town. All the capitals of the world I've flown to, Rome, Paris, Amsterdam, London, it it all seems like another lifetime. I look down at my drawing pad. I've drawn a heavy set man standing in a courtroom before a judge. I better call Dr. Kingsley right away. Alan. Alan, I'm glad to hear your voice. I've done another one of those mysterious drawings. Have you sketched someone you know? Not this time. Someone I've never seen before, I know that. A big hulk of a man standing in front of a judge. From the look I've drawn on the man's face and the look on the judge's, I'd say the judge was about to pass a sentence of death. Uh, I'll tell you what you do, Alan. Why don't you walk over here? It'll take you no more than three quarters of an hour, and uh, by the time you get here, I will have cleared the decks. Bring that drawing of yours, Alan, and we'll talk. I've lived in Greenfield all my life. Every time I'd come back from some round trips for my week off, I'd find the town pretty much the same. So why I got confused going across town to Dr. Kingsley's, I can't imagine. But I did. Turned up the wrong street, and before I knew it, I was lost. So I cut through an unfamiliar alley, and there it was. A fence about nine feet high. I couldn't see over it. Over the gate was written J. Murty, Tombstones, Monuments... I opened the gate and looked inside. A yard full of gravestones. Come on in, young fellow. Don't stand out there. Oh, thanks. And may I? I'm glad to see you. You're very expert chipping words into that stone. Marble. I also do granite. This is quite a large place you've got here. I bet you keep busy. Well, the work gets kind of lonely. Not many people like to be around gravestones. Makes them think. Oh, let me introduce myself. Julian Merte. Oh, yes, I saw your sign. I, I'm Alan Harvey. You looking for someone? I'll tell you the truth. I turned down the wrong street. D- did you say your name was Merte? Yes. Why? Do you know me from somewhere? I don't know. M- Mr. Merte, have we, have we ever met before? Mm, I don't think so. Of course, I have seen a lot of people in my day. Why? You think we have met? Well, everything about you, I... I don't know how to say it. It's... It's uncanny. Hey, look at this, will you? A a drawing I did today. Ah, that is quite good. You did that? This morning. I have always admired the man who could sit down and draw straight off like that... Now, uh, why did you want me to see this, Mr. Harvey? The man in the drawing, it it just came to me. He looks just like you, Mr. Murty. Oh, that man there standing in front of the judge looks like me, you say? Ah. Oh, I saw he does, Mr. Harvey. So he does. Julian? Julian, where are you? Here, my dear. Oh, you have company. Uh, Mr. Harvey, Mrs. Merte, my wife. Oh, please. Uh, did you? Uh, Mr. Harvey is an artist, Mary. Uh, Julian, go along and wash your hands. It'll be time for supper shortly. Supper? I had no idea it was that late. I 
I must be going. Ah, no, sir. Please don't go. I've got something to show you. Or perhaps some other time. I- I'll come back. No, no, it wouldn't take long. Five minutes, I promise you. Just five. <laughs> All right. Certainly. I'll be right back. Young man, I don't know who you are, but I advise you to leave right now. There's a storm coming up. I should go. I'm late as it is. Someone's expecting me. Then go. I'll explain to my husband. But he seems so anxious to show me something. It's only those gravestones. He's so proud of them, but they won't run away. I advise you, young man, for the sake of your well-being and health, leave now. My health? And your peace of mind. Does the name Julian Murta mean anything to you? Julian Murta? Yes. Yes, I have heard that name. Arizona? No, no, California, the Rock Bridge. And the Wyoming Stone Faces. Is your husband that Julian Murty? Yes. Well, he's one of the great sculptors. What, what's he doing in this back alley making gravestones? He fell out of fashion. It's as simple as that. But, he but... He broke his heart. He has never been the same. You mean no one commissions his works anymore? For 20 years, no one. And that isn't the worst of it. You had better go. Well, can't you tell me why I should go? Because sometimes he is not responsible. Not anymore. All washed, all clean. Oh, say, we are in for a storm, Mary. I am taking Mr. Harvey into the studio. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go right away. What? In all this rain, you will get soaked. Come along, follow me. Let's run for it. This is quite a place. Never seen so many different kinds of gravestones. Yeah, these are mostly samples to show people what they can have to commemorate their loved ones. I like to keep my epitaphs light-hearted. You do? On a gravestone? <laughs> what better place? After all, death is the ultimate joke, isn't it? I never thought about it that way. Well, you think about it. Think about it. This headstone here is the tallest I have done. It may be more to your liking. It's a sample which I completed only this morning. He flew high. He flew low. Now to heaven may his spirit go. Alan Harvey, requiescat in pace. That's... That's my name. This is what I wanted to show you. My name? Well, you must believe me, Mr. Harvey. Pure coincidence. I don't know where the name come from. Just uh, entered my head. But the date's under my name. The first one is exactly when I was born. Really? A further coincidence. And the date of death? Today. Well, I was just making it topical. You go right ahead, Mr. Harvey, and use the telephone. Supper will be on the table in a moment. Oh, thank you. I had this appointment, and I... I just better call... Hello, Dr. Kingsley. Uh, this is Alan Harvey. Oh, yes, yes, I, I was wondering what happened to you. I, uh, I got lost, believe it or not, and, and then it started to storm, so I'm staying with some people I met. Uh, I can't quite hear you, Alan. Can you speak louder? Uh, no, no, I can't. This man insisted I stay for supper. Uh, are you all right, Alan? Alan? I hear you. Yes, I'm all right. I'll, I'll try and come by later, Dr. Kingsley. Goodbye. You know, I told you, Harvey, I don't get many visitors, especially people from the world of art. And that is why, after supper, I asked you back here in my studio. Mary, uh, Mrs. Merte, funny thing, but uh, she is not that interested in art. I really ought to be on my way. Ah, nonsense. I wouldn't hear of it. You know, when it rains like this and I can't go outside and work on the new stones, I'll spend an evening sharpening my chisels. And you see, 
I've got my grinding stone here. I put my foot on the treadle, give it a twist, and there she goes. Ah, a lot of these chisels are due for sharpening. If you will look under that table where you are sitting, Mr. Harvey, you will find some drawing paper. There are pencils and charcoal in a little box down there. Go help yourself. I know what it is like to have thoughts and ideas just screaming to be put on paper. It's a compulsion. I wonder what time it is. <laughs> Later than it was, but one always hopes not too late. Ah, I see you have begun to draw. Mr. Harvey, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to meet you at last. You were right about compulsion. I wish I could leave. Oh, I'm not keeping you. No, not you, Mr. Murphy. What I'm sketching. The pencil, it, it won't stop. My hand has to keep following it. Ah, uh, you have that problem, too. It's a shame that all your great works are now only tombstones. Great works. <laughs> I was great once. And now nothing but a letterer and a numberer in stone. I wish you had not said that, Mr. Harvey. You are like all the rest. <sighs> This is the sharpest I have ever honed a chisel. Do you know that, Mr. Harvey? Hmm? We're all failures. That is why we die. I wish you would not keep saying that, Mr. Harvey. I am still sketching at this table. And Julian Merte keeps turning his grindstone... All I can hear is the whirring and buzzing of the wheel and the drumming of the rain. The air is close in this studio. I'm rooted to this chair, to what I'm drawing. It's almost finished now. I can see out of the corner of my eye Julian Merte sharpening his chisels and watching me. He's staring at me. Daring. They found the sketch Alan Harvey was making. It depicted the supreme moment of agony, the final gasp of a man in the last throes of life. The figure in his picture lay sprawled across a table where it had been drawn on a sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper was a sketch of still another man. Identical. Then, another picture within a picture. Each successive figure had been stabbed in the back with a long bladed chisel embedded to the hilt. Killed exactly the way they found Alan Harvey himself. I'll return in a moment. accept certain rules of existence on our planet. The pull of gravity, the rising sun and moon, that rain is wet and snow is cold. We feel wind, which we cannot see. You accept the sound of my voice, although you know I am speaking from miles away. We accept from experience and habit. But there are other facts of life and death for which we have no explanation. Yet, can we disregard them? They, too, must be faced. And perhaps you, too, will experience them. All you need is a little second sight. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Joan Shea, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant
Broadcasting System presents... Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Sentence of death. Yes, we have that story for you. Come right over. Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is, Sentence of Death. The very intriguing story of a conflict that proved that justice was not blind. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. Paul Remsen was elected to the Supreme Court bench by the people of his county in November. He was sworn in in January. And by April, he was already one of the most popular judges in the county. It was late afternoon. Court had adjourned for the day, and Judge Remsen was in chambers, putting some papers into his briefcase. Homework, he called it. When Senior Judge Graham Palmer walked in and sat down in the chair alongside Judge Remsen's desk. Uh, What's the matter, Graham? I'm glad you're still here, Paul. Have you heard the news about Sam Howard? Why, no. He had a stroke. Oh, good Lord. How bad was it? The doctor believes he'll be all right, but he'll have to rest a long time. Oh, naturally, the longer the better. Yes, but in the meantime, we have the problem of what to do with Sam's calendar. I phoned Allerton County to send us a judge, but, well, nothing doing until the middle of next week. Well, now, if there's any part of Sam's work you'd like me to take over... There is, Paul. A matter that's scheduled for tomorrow morning. Of course. What is it? The People versus Martin Rivers. Martin Rivers... Oh. I know how you feel about such matters, and I do it myself, Paul, but the governor has appointed me to a special board of inquiry. I know, I know. We start hearings the first thing in the morning. Uh, yes. Graham, I... I don't know if it's in me to send a man to his death. Even if the law says you must? But it's capital punishment, Graham. I've always been against it. But it's the law, my friend. And you've taken an oath to uphold it. Yes, but... Uh... Martin Rivers was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. The sentence of death is mandatory under the laws of this state. I know that, Graham. It's our duty to impose that sentence, whether we like it or not, until the law is changed. Uh, give me a chance to think about it, will you? Of course. And if you should find that you can't go through with it... I'll resign from the bench. Nonsense. We need you. No, Graham. I'll either do it or quit. Paul? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Martha. Hello, darling. Hello. <laughs> Did you have an exciting day in the court? Uh, yes, yes, pretty exciting. A big day, too, if those bulges in your briefcase mean anything. Homework? Maybe. Maybe. You sound like a very tired judge. Uh, let's go into the living room, Martha. I'd like to sit down. You're worried about something, Paul? Yes. What is it? Tomorrow morning, I've got to sentence a man to die. You? But you didn't have a murder case. It's Judge Howard's case. Howard's sick and Graham Palmer's going to be tied up with that special board of inquiry, so... Oh. Martha, I don't know if I can do it. Why? Send a man to his death. Tell him when and how he's going to die. Is this the man who was convicted last week? Martin Rivers? Yes. And you're worried about him? Uh, now, look, Martha, He killed another man in cold blood, dear. His victim never had a chance to defend himself. I know. But the state gave Martin Rivers every chance to defend himself. Martha... Didn't it? He was given a fair trial and convicted. Now, there's nothing for you to be concerned about. No, no. Nothing except my conscience. I order a man's death, and then I have to live with myself. But, Paul, the man was a professional gangster. Heaven knows how many other people he's killed. Don't you think he should be punished? Yes, I do. Send him away to prison for life. Take away all his rights and liberties. But what right have we got to take a life we didn't create? 
What right did Martin Rivers have? Well, he lived by another code, the underworld, the law of the jungle. Take what you want, kill or be killed. You don't mean that, Paul. No, no, I guess I don't. No one has the right to kill, no matter what his code might be. But where does that leave me? What do I do? It's very simple. You have a sworn duty. Yes. Maybe I took on more than I can handle. What do you mean? Becoming a judge, deciding for other people. Oh, I, I don't know. I'm too confused right now to even guess what it's all about. Of course, dear. Why don't you go upstairs and lie down for a while? No, no. Dinner won't be ready for an hour. And a little rest will do you good. I couldn't rest, Martha. Well, try it anyway. I'll call you when dinner's ready. Listen, dear, I Go ahead now. All great men have to make important decisions, Mr. Justice Ramson. You're no exception. Paul. Hmm? Oh, what is it, Martha? Stop thinking about Martin Rivers and finish your... I can't, Martha. How can you feel pity for a cold-blooded killer? Pity for Martin Rivers? As far as I'm concerned, he's finished. But he's a man, a human being. And I cannot pronounce a sentence of death. I cannot do it. But... Very well. What's the alternative? I'll have to resign from the bench. Paul. I know what the judgeship means to you. Mm -hmm. I know how hard you work to be elected. Please, please, Martha. How can you think so little of your life? Or of mine? Don't you realize you'll be called a quitter? Uh, Martha, I... I don't know anything anymore. I'm going out for a walk. Do you mind? No, dear. I don't mind. I've got to work myself out of this dilemma. I've got to know what I'm going to do, and I've got to know tonight. Judge Paul Remsen walked for a long time without giving a thought to where he was going. Then, as he went across Main Street, he had an idea. He got on a bus, and ten minutes later, he was entering a small cigar store in one of the less pretentious neighborhoods. Yes? Oh, uh, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, let me uh, have one of those cigars, please. Uh, right you are, sir. Uh, nice weather we're having, isn't it? Yes. I always say give me the spring. Not too cold, not too hot. It's better for business, too. Yes. Yeah, that'll be 30 cents. Thank you. Yep, not too cold, not too hot. Uh, anything else, sir? Are you Mr. Herrick? Yeah, that's me. Say, I thought you looked familiar. You wouldn't be a Judge Remsen, would you? Yes. Well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, I was one of the majority that put you in office. Well, Mr. Herrick, <laughs> you were the foreman of the jury that convicted Martin Rivers of murder in the first degree. Yes, sir. That no good gangster. Uh, he's coming up for sentence in the morning. The uh, death penalty. That's what the law says. Uh, yes, I know. How do you feel about sending a man to his death? How? I'd like to know. <laughs> That's a funny question, Judge. Uh, coming from a judge. Uh, forget that I'm a judge. We're talking man to man. I uh, don't get this, Judge. Tomorrow morning, a human being will be sentenced to die. In anywhere from six weeks to six months, depending on whether he appeals to a higher court. He'll be dead. Yes. Yeah. You're partly responsible for doing that to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Are you trying to make me feel like a murderer? Oh, no, no, you're not a murderer. But do you feel now, a week after the trial, that you had a right to condemn another man to death? He was a killer. All right, but suppose, Mr. Herrick, you'd met Martin Rivers right after he'd committed the murder. Would you have killed him? Say, what are you after? Would you or wouldn't you? George, would you mind Please, telling me... Please, Mr. Herrick, I've got to know. Okay. The answer is no. I wouldn't have killed him. Uh, that is, uh, not unless he tried to kill me. Oh, but he didn't try. Now, look, Judge, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm a member of society, a decent law-abiding citizen, and I pay taxes to see that lawbreakers like Martin Rivers get what's coming to them. 
I don't want him around. Well, life imprisonment would have done the same thing, Mr. Harris. No, not to my way of thinking. The fellow that killer shot didn't get a life sentence. He's dead. Now, maybe he was no good either, but that's got nothing to do with us. The law says that anyone who premeditates murder is... What, what am I doing telling you about the law? <laughs> oh, that's rich. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Judge, but it, it just struck me funny, that's all. Me telling the judge about the law. Mr. Herrick, it may not be as funny as you think. All right. You want to know how I feel? I think I can tell you. I've got no regrets about Martin Rivers or any other killer that's got to die. When I took the oath as a juror, I promised to keep an open mind and to bring in a verdict based on the evidence. Yes. That's exactly what I did. And I voted guilty on the first ballot. Now then, does that answer your question, Judge? Yes. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, good night, Judge. Uh, drop in again sometime. I promise I won't start telling you about the law. <laughs> Me telling the judge about the law. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening. Hello, uh, Dr. Benjamin. Paul, Paul Remsen. Uh, forgive me, I didn't recognize you. Uh, that street lamp behind you and my old eyes. Uh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Uh, uh, how have you been, Doctor? Oh, as well as an old man can be. But you, Paul, I'm proud of you. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, come into my study. I was just in the midst of writing Sunday's sermon. Uh -huh. uh, but that can wait. A sermon can always wait. So few people take it seriously. So, make yourself comfortable, Paul. Yes, thank you. It's been weeks since we had a real visit. Being a judge keeps you pretty busy, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, does it also leave you uh, no time for happiness? Hmm? You seem depressed, my boy. More uh, confused than depressed, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, tell me about it. I, uh... I've been given an assignment... A man's life. A criminal. He was found guilty of murder. I see. Oh, it's my duty to sentence him tomorrow morning. But I... F you find that you can't do it? I can't make up my mind. Well, it's difficult. I know it's my duty to pronounce that sentence. The man committed murder, cold-blooded, premeditated murder, and the law is explicit. But still, I can't get it out of my mind that in sentencing that man tomorrow, I'll be sentencing myself. Why? My principles, the code of a lifetime. What right have I got to order the death of another man? Well, the law gives you that right, Paul. As a man, Pastor? Do you uh, want me to answer that? Uh, no, no, it's something I'll have to decide for myself. Then why did you come to me? I, uh, I want to talk. And I don't know where I can talk more freely than before you. I want to expose both sides of the case to myself in words that I can hear. There are two sides, Doctor. You know that. Well, there may be. Now, I'm a judge. I took an oath to uphold the law. The whole body of law, including the criminal code... The code of crime and punishment. By man and to men. Yes. But where did that law come from? Yes. It came from the Bible. Our whole concept of criminal law is based on the premise of an eye for an eye, a life for a life. Yes, that's true, Paul, unfortunately. But there's a higher law, a moral law. And that too comes from the Bible, my son. Yes. Thou shalt not kill. That's what I mean, Dr. Benjamin. Which law do I follow? No, oh, I, I can't answer that, Paul. I am a minister. My way of living is different from yours. I've taken an oath, too. But it's an oath to uphold the laws of God. If I had chosen another way of life, perhaps the laws of man would be more important to me than the word of God. I, I don't know. But I admire you greatly. You have mercy in your heart for a man who had no mercy. Mm -hmm. That's good, my son. Whatever you do, whatever decision you make, I'm sure you won't be less of a man. Oh, I'm sorry I can't do more to help you, Paul. But your soul is your own. No one can keep it for you while you're on this earth. I know. 
thanks, Doctor. No, no, no. No thanks to me, son. Well, I uh, think I'll be going now. There's one more stop I've got to make. It might be the last. What do you want? Excuse me, I'm sorry to trouble you at this hour. What do you want? I'm Judge Remsen of the County Supreme Court. I'd like to come in for a moment, if I may. Judge Remsen of the Supreme Court, but I... Please, Mrs. Dover. Oh, sure, sure, come in. I'm sorry, you see, I wasn't expecting you, and the house is in an awful mess. Oh, please don't apologize to me. My daughter Mary went out and left everything for me to clean up. She always helps me, but tonight she... Judge, what do you want? Your son, Frank, was killed by Martin Rivers four months ago. You've come here to talk about Frank? No. I've got to sentence Martin Rivers to die. To die? Mother of... Well, do you think I ought to say no? You can't stop it, Mrs. Dover. The law makes it compulsory. If I don't do it, another judge will. He killed my boy. If... You could say no. If you could stop the sentencing, would you do it? You're asking me, Frank's mother? I'm trying to make up my own mind, and I must know how you feel. I... Oh, what good will it do me if that man dies? Will it bring back my son? Will it help me to sleep at night? Is that, uh, is that how you really feel? Well, will it? You would keep him alive, wouldn't you, if you could? Let him live? If you could. Well, why didn't he let Frank live? He killed him. But... but... All right, all right. Frank was no good. He told lies. He beat people. He was a gangster with a gun in his pocket. He slept all day and all night he was out. Oh, no, I... Lord. I'm... I'm sorry, Mrs. Dover. Oh, well. Maybe he was a thief, too. But for that, you don't deserve to die to be murdered. No one has a right to kill. No one, Mrs. Dover. Is that what you really feel? Oh, how can I say what I feel, Judge? I brought up two children. One's gone. One night he said to me, So long, Mama. And he went out. And the police came. Told me he was dead. A bullet. How do I feel now, Judge? Oh, who can say when there's so much pain? But do you want revenge? Do you want Martin Rivers to pay with his life for what he did to your son? Martin Rivers, he doesn't mean anything to me, whether he lives or dies. I don't hate him, though. He killed my Frank, but I don't hate him. I'm sorry for people that kill. That's how I feel when I'm not mixed up. I've lost my boy, but... Oh, no, no. I don't want to kill. I think that's how most of us feel when... We're not mixed up. Good night, ma'am. You've been a great help. Judge Paul Remsen went home and he went to bed. But he didn't sleep. All night the words he had heard, the opinions expressed by the different people, kept running through his mind. He couldn't sleep. The sentence is mandatory, Paul. It's our duty to impose that sentence until the law is changed. He was given a fair trial and convicted. That's more than the man he killed, God, Paul. He was a killer, Judge. I pay taxes to see that killers like Martin Rivers get what's coming to them. I did my duty as a juror and a citizen. My duty. Yes, Paul. An eye for an eye, a life for a life. But there's a higher law, a moral law. And that too comes from the Bible. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, what good will it do me if that man dies? I've lost my boy, but I don't want to kill. That's how I feel when I'm not mixed up. Your career. Now you want to throw it away because of some silly notion. How can you think so little of your life? You'll be called a quitter. It's your duty, Paul. The law, Judge. Our duty. Your duty, dear. Duty? Duty? What am I going to do? What? <laughs> Well, Paul. I, uh, I don't 
know yet, Martha. Are you going to court this morning? Uh, yes. Well, that's something. It may be the last time. I'm going with you. Martha. Don't you think I should go? I'd rather you wouldn't. It's my problem. And mine? I promise not to interfere, Paul. Whatever you do will be all right with me. Will it? Don't you believe me? You understand, then? I think so. I hope so, dear. Now, let's go downstairs and have some breakfast. Uh, uh, come in. Excuse me, Judge. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, what is it, Henry? I just looked in to see if everything was all right with you, Judge. It's pretty near 11 o'clock. Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, come in, come in, Henry. Uh, close the door. Yes. The courtroom's kind of crowded with lawyers waiting for things to get started, Your Honor. Uh, yes. Not that I give a hoot and holler about them, but we're an hour behind schedule, and that, that means we finish up late this afternoon. Uh, did you see Mrs. Remsen out there? Oh, yes. Right in the first row with the spectators. Uh, do you want me to send her in here? Uh, where's Martin Rivers? Ah? Uh? Martin Rivers. Well, they've got him in the detention room. He's he's waiting, too. Uh, well... Of course, he's in no hurry. <laughs> What's the matter, Judge? You worried about him? It's about him. And about me, too. Yeah. I sort of figured it was that business that was keeping you in chambers so long. Henry, how long have you been a clerk in this courtroom? Well, pretty near 40 years. Uh, you've seen many judges and many murderers. You've heard the sentence of death pronounced many times. Enough. Have you ever thought how you would feel if you had to pronounce that sentence? Uh-huh. Could you do it? Well, maybe not so long as I was me. I see. But if I was a judge, it, it wouldn't make any difference. Oh? Why not? Well, a judge isn't a man, Your Honor. He, he isn't human. Oh, Henry, is uh, this something new? Well, no, sir. It's as old as history. A judge has got no right to be human. And that means he's got no right to work with his heart. I see what you mean, but where would you draw the line between the man and the judge? That black robe you're wearing, that does it. Hmm? When you put on that black robe and go out there into the courtroom and get up on that bench, you stop being a man. You become that robe. The law. The symbol everybody respects or is afraid of. Mm. Why do people have to stand up when the judge comes into this courtroom? The uh, symbol? The black robe? It isn't because they respect the man that's wearing that robe. Maybe they do and maybe they don't. That's a personal matter. But they stand up for the robe. They've got to. It's the will of the people. The black robe. And that's how you've got to look at it, Judge. There's nothing personal in what you do when you're wearing that robe. Why? Because you're not in it. Uh, what's that? Not you as, as Paul Remsen. What's in that robe is a book that was written down at the state capitol a long time ago. The law. That's the will of the people too, Your Honor. But a man must be sentenced to death. Did he sentence another guy to death? Yes. And did he execute that sentence? Yes, but... Well, then there's no two ways about it. The book says he's got to die. And the book says the robe's got to tell him so. That, that's all there is to it. Yes, I know, but is it right? Is it? Well, ask the book and the robe. Yeah. Book and the robe? Well, <clears throat> Judge, are, are you ready? Ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let's go. Uh, the, the, uh, the clerk will call the business of the day. The people versus Martin Rivers. Bring the prisoner to the bar. Uh, would the counsel for this man like to say a few words? No. 
But the court realizes that counsel cannot say anything to affect sentence. But, Martin, I would like to say a few words to you. Uh, what, uh, Martin, I'm about to say isn't easy for me. I hope you'll realize that. And I hope you'll do me a personal service, and yourself too. There's a chaplain at the state prison, a fine, understanding man. I've known him for a long time. Let him counsel you. Let him talk to you. And please, Martin, listen to him. He can do you a lot of good. He'll give you peace. Peace of mind and perhaps peace in your heart. What is it, Judge? Simon from the bench? You trying to soften me up? <laughs> okay, give me the work, so let's get out of here. I know it's coming to me, and there's nothing you can do to change it. So throw the book at me. <laughs> Wise guy. Martin Rivers, you have been convicted by a jury of murder in the first degree. The sentence of this court is that you shall be delivered into the custody of the sheriff of this county at once, and by him delivered into the custody of the warden of the state prison, where one night during the week of May 14th you shall be put to death in the manner prescribed by the laws of this state. And may God have mercy on your soul. And may God have mercy on my soul, too. And so closes tonight's story, Sentence of Death. Stedman Coles wrote the radio script. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played the part of Judge Paul Renson. And the... Cast included Helen Shields, Maurice Franklin, Irene Hubbard, Bill Smith, Ed Latimer, and Murray Forbes. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is a crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a nightmare that was as real as murder. It's called Cupid Can Be Deadly. In the meantime, well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we look for you next week. Oh, yes. Here's something important. The horrible suffering and tragedy of a cancer death can be avoided in many instances. The American Cancer Society wants you to know that of all the people who die of cancer it is possible to save from 30 to 50 percent. Protect yourself by getting a free booklet which tells of the seven danger signals and many other important facts on cancer. Address your request for this information to the American Cancer Society, New York 4, New York. The American Cancer Society, New York 4, New York. This program came from New York. Stay tuned now for another mutual favorite, Quiet, Please, which follows in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to the year 100,080 and a world where beauty and terror live side by side as H.G. Wells describes it in his immortal story The Time Machine
Dudley. You must be mad. A time machine. Yes, my friend, a time machine. This... this thing? This very thing. This contraption? This framework made of quartz and bronze and ivory? With its levers and its dials and its seat in the middle? This is the result of three years' hard work. I promise you, Father, that on this machine a man can go wherever he likes in time. By working these levers, a man can choose his century, his year, his very day. Oh, really, old man. Time is only a kind of space. If we can move about in all the other dimensions of space, why not in time, too? It's, it's impossible. It's out of the question. Well, what are the journeys I've already taken on this little contraption? I'm afraid you've been having a bad dream. Very well. You shall have proof, my friend. How? Just climb on, Paolo. Sit in the seat beside me, face these ivory dials, and I'll take you for a little spin. Well, you... You mean right now? Right now. Or well, just, um... In case this thing should take off like the flying red horse, are there any, uh... Any preparations? Uh... No, Paolo, no. You won't need any luggage on this trip, not even a toothbrush. You'll be back here in my laboratory in less than a minute. All right. I'm on. Now what? Hold tight. It sways a good deal. I'd hate to lose you. <laughs> I can't be frightened, Dudley. Then you're braver than I am. Tell me, what time is it? It's um, just 12 noon. Before we start, I want to adjust this control a bit. Hmm. Is, uh, is everything shipshape? Tell me, did you notice anything just then? Only a noise, a humming noise, nothing else. And what time is it? You just asked me, old man. It's 12... Well, that's odd. What? Well, my watch says 11 o'clock. I could have sworn it was noon a moment ago. There must be something wrong with it. It's only that I touched the lever to you... test it, and we've gone forward a full day. 23 hours, at any rate. Yes, but... But, Dudley... Finished scoffing, Father? Yes. Yes, I believe I have. Then hold tight. This will be the real article. I'm ready, Dudley. Good man. Well... <laughs> say goodbye, Father. Say goodbye to 1950. We went off with a shattering jar, with the machine swaying under us. The walls of Dr. Dudley's laboratory suddenly fell away. And night was speeding after day like the flapping of a black wing. I saw the sun hopping across the sky, leaping swiftly across it every second, and every second marking a day. I saw the moon spinning through her quarters like a ball, from new to full, all in the twinkling of an eye. Trees grew and blossomed like puffs of smoke and then passed away. And all the while we were going faster. Now our pace was a year a second, so that second by second the white snow flashed across the world and was followed by the bright, brief spring. And still we went on, into the future. How do you feel, Paula? Very weak, very dizzy. Don't let go, don't fall off. Well, where are we? How far have we come? We're in 150. And 60. And 70. That, that's enough. Stop it, Dudley, I can't stand anymore. Stop it. Paul, you all right? Yes, I... I believe so. No broken bones. What happened? Not sure. Must have stopped too suddenly. Ooh, where are we, Dudley? Look around for yourself. A wide lawn beautiful, vast garden. No, I, I meant geographically. Just where we were when we started, where my laboratory stood. And the year, Dudley? What is the year now? 100,080. It seemed absolutely incredible. A dream. The pleasant one. For the garden in which we found ourselves was beautiful and summery, with an unexpected perfume about it, almost like platine. At some distance, we could see a large and imposing building, and everything was, was quiet and peaceful, but almost too much so. And the sense of strangeness, of incredible strangeness, sent a shiver up my spine. One hundred thousand and eighty. Father, do you want to go back? Yeah, yes, I rather think I do. Let's go back. <coughs> Dudley. From over there, in the bushes. It sounded human. Come on. Hey, it's a child. Seems to be a very small girl. There's been a beast here of some kind. Struggle with the look yeah. of the marks in her arms. Now, my dear, 
You'll be all right now. You, you won't be harmed. And of course, she won't understand English. Motioning us to go with her. Yeah. Well, what about the animal? Did you see it? No, not a glimpse. Too fast for us. Perhaps we'd better go back, Dudley. The girl seems to be all right now. Leave her like this? Yes, yes, I've had enough. Well, they haven't, old man. Because they're here. All around us. They had crept up on soundless feet to surround us. The little people of this era. And the girl we'd saved was not a child, but a full-grown woman. Well, they all stood four feet high, dressed in simple tunics. Beautiful creatures, but terribly frail, with a plump, soft kind of frailty. They were like eerie figures in a dream, and all we could hear was the rustling of their clothes as they surged happily around us, their faces wreathed in smiles. Why, why, they're not savage at all. They're very loving, gentle little people. Yes. There's something terribly wrong with them. How do you mean? Seem to have the minds of five-year-olds. Well, how do you expect them to be? Far ahead of us, of course. Incredibly ahead of us in knowledge and in science. Look at them. Children. Well, they seem happy in this huge garden of theirs. Uh, Dudley, <laughs> I've changed my mind. Let's stay. Maybe we shall enjoy spending a few days with our little friends. The little people led us home into their valley. They lived in colossal buildings, sleeping all together in one huge hall, eating in another, playing and frolicking together in the sunshine. And we lived with them for days in utter contentment. One afternoon, Dudley and I walked along the banks of the great river. The little people all wear the same clothes, the same soft, hairless skin, same feminine roundness of limbs. Yes. I wonder if it's because they're vegetarians. They're vegetarians because they have to be. You haven't run across any horses or dogs, cattle of any kind, have you? No, now that you mention it. With good reason. All extinct by now. Just as the dinosaur is with us. Dudley, there's something strange here. Something hidden away and silent here in the year 100,080. Felt the same way. I've taken the precaution of removing the control levers of the time machine, putting a master padlock on the main switches. Oh. Don't much fancy the idea of someone riding away with it into another century and leaving us here for the rest of our lives. Uh, Dudley, do you know where we are? Uh, yes, this is where we landed. Oh, I thought so. Well, I wasn't sure. But... What did you ask? What's happened to the machine? Uh, but they, they've taken it away. They've stolen it. This is where it was. It's right here. Look, follow the tracks. Here, with a dragon. Over here, yeah. come along. Down this path. Look. Right there. The monument. There's a brass doors in the base. Uh, oh, they're locked. The machine. It must be in there. Yes. Inside. We must get it. Break down the door. How? How can we? Here. Use the levers. All right. Let's try. Let's move out. No, it's, it's no good, Dudley. The solid will never break through. Never. No. Never. We can't we break through here. Stay here. All our lives You may never go home again. Fred, it must open the machine. Oh, no. Time machine. We were caught in the year 100,018. The time machine was gone. The brass doors of the monument held. Our retreat was cut off. The thin line by which we could make our way back home, back to our own time and our own people, back to 1950. We had no way of communicating with the little people, asking what they had done with the machine. There was nothing hostile in their attitude. They were more like simple, wandering children. Only one, the young woman, Weena, whose life we had saved on our first day, had become really friendly. She went with us wherever we walked, and brought us presents of garlands, of flowers, slept near us at night in the hall, and we, in turn, had taught her a few words of English. Now we redouble our efforts, like men racing against the clock, so that we might speak to her and discover the secret of our immense loss. We were talking to her one night after the others had gone to sleep. No, not these, Dudley. No. How can you be so sure your people didn't steal the machine? Aren't there any thieves among them? Are they all perfect? Mm -hmm. Not so loud, Dudley. We'll oh. wake them. Sign, she doesn't understand. The thief must be sleeping somewhere in his hall. Weena, they take machine. No, Dudley. No. Who, then? Who? Uh, we... We are our friends. Yes. We must have machine. Yes, Dudley. Yes. Who took machine? 
other people, not yours? Us, sir? Um, what about those doors, Weena? Uh, doors, open... No, no. Weena, machine, in, in there, must open. No, no, not open. Oh, all right, my dear. Go to sleep, get some rest. Yes, Daddy. to become of us, Fowler. Are we caught here in this century? We spend our lives with the little people in their secret. We'll go back to the monument tomorrow. We'll find a way of breaking in. Good night, Dudley. Dudley. Uh, did you just... <clears throat> there it was again. What? Something on my face. Cold, filthy to the touch. On my face and in my hair. It's cold as death. Dudley! Oh. You're right. There's something in here with us. <laughs> Smells of the grave. What was it? I don't know. But look at them. Look at the little people. They're all awake. It's as though they've been stampeded. Let's get out of here. I want some fresh air. We went quickly through the hall and outside, away from the frantic rustling of the little people. The moon was full, just overhead, and it was close to dawning. There was a faint sound speeding close behind us, and we turned, our nerves ragged, our muscles tensed. But it was only Weena coming swiftly to join us. Daddy, I'm afraid. Then there is dark. something. What do you mean, Weena? Dark? What? Dark thing. Dark place. Night. Why should they be afraid of the night, Dudley? It's not the night alone. Dark place. That's our cube. Perhaps it's something underground. <laughs> It was another day. We had wandered into a lovely, wooded place about a mile from the community. And suddenly, Weena screamed. Ah, Father! We stopped short. A pair of glaring eyes were fixed upon us. As we stood there, petrified, the thing, a little ape-like figure, rushed across our path and disappeared in the clearing about 30 yards away. What was it? I couldn't see it too well. It seemed to be a dull white with white hair on its head and on its back. It looked like a small ape. It was running on all fours. Oh, with its arms held very low. Weena, Weena, what was it? Morlocks. They, Morlocks. Who are the Morlocks? What are they? Weena, tell me. No, no. Let's go over there and see where it disappeared. Come along, Father. In the clearing, we found a round, well-like opening. Dudley and I leaned over and looked down a deep shaft. A small white creature was retreating down a ladder in the well, like a human spider, its large, bright eyes watching me as it went swiftly down. Then it disappeared in the shaft. Fowler, did you see it? Like an ape? Yes, but also like a man. So there are two species of men in this world. Yes. The little people above the ground and this obscene thing, this bleached monster below. That white look, common to animals that live in the dark. Like huge rats, like worms that are cold to the touch. I know, because they've touched me. Mala, you can feel the air being sucked down into this shaft. Yes. The earth must be tunneled enormously here under our feet. These monsters must live in the tunnels. I think we know now who stole our time machine. Yes. Then, then we'll go down and have a look. No, no, not go. Why not, not go. Weena? Morlocks, you'll never come back. We must have our machine, my dear, you wait for us here. No, no. And so we went down, our heels ringing on the small metallic bars that were meant for creatures so much smaller than us. Down we climbed, down, down, ever in darkness. Down, it seemed, into the center of the earth, into the core of the world. How much longer? I won't know until we reach bottom. Uh, can't be much, fella. Do you hear that? Like machinery. We're almost there. Well, thank heaven for that. All right, Father, I'm on the bottom. Come along, just a few more steps. Now, give me your hand, Father. Uh, Good. Here. Good. We're here. It's in the land of the Morlocks. Do you have a match? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, here be a large vaulted cavern at the end of this passage. Uh, what do you uh, suppose they'll do if they catch us? I've no idea. Better take care not to be caught. Ah, another match. 
Look at that, that throbbing noise. Probably their ventilating system pumping the air down. There must be thousands upon thousands of these Morlocks living under the earth. And we haven't seen any yet, except for our friend who came down ahead of us. Why, why do you suppose they wanted our time machine? I think they wanted us, not the machine. And we've come to them. We must. It's our only chance. Fowler, if that noise does come from air pumps, yeah? why is it so stuffy here, so oppressive? Dudley, that smell. Blood. Light another match. <clears throat> Dudley, look. Straight ahead. On the white metal table. Set for a meal. Yes. With a small haunch. Meat. They know that the cattle are extinct. Then, what do they feed on, these Morlocks? Don't you know? Yes, I know. Oh. Another match? Yes, I know. Oh, Dudley, I have no more. I'll use our last match. Oh. All right, we'll have to go back there. We know the secret now, anyway. These Morlocks living here, underground, are the masters of this age. And our friends up above, fatted cattle, fed by the Morlocks, clothed, supplied, and housed until the day when, when they're cut out of the herd and brought underground as food. This is the future you're looking at. This is what we men of the 20th century shall come to. Dudley! What is it? I've got hands. Cold hips. Take one of these rather Yes, Use it as a weapon. Lash out. <laughs> Against this wall, Fowler, here beside me. They're moving in. Fight them. Use the ladder, man. Use the ladder. Dudley, they're all around us this way. Over this way. Back this way. We went back in that evil darkness, fighting every step as we went. My side, back to those projecting bars, kicking and clawing ourselves loose from their pallid, grasping hands. And climbing up again, up toward daylight and freedom. Away from their stench and the eagerness of their icy hands. And they did not follow, for daylight was their enemy and their great fear. And we lived among the lush gardens of the little people like prisoners... Like men without reprieve. Like men who are dead, though they still walk the earth. For the time machine was locked away behind great brass doors. And we knew we could never force them open. Then one day, Weena told us of an old building, an ancient sagging structure that had survived through many ages and was filled with many curious objects. A museum, that's what it must be, a museum, Fowler. Perhaps from some earlier time. Now, I'm in no mood to go looking at a museum. Don't you see? Specimens hermetically sealed in museums. Perhaps there are things, weapons, machinery, something we can use. Yes, yes, of course. If we could find some dynamite or gunpowder or something. We could blast those doors, we could get in. Um, where is this place, Weena? This, this old building that no one ever goes near? I take you. It's not far. A chance, old man. A slim one, but a chance nonetheless. <laughs> All day we wandered through the great ruined halls. The building had been deserted, unused for perhaps a century. The childlike men of that time had long since ceased to care about anything but their own personal comforts. It was late afternoon and growing dark when we came upon the chemical section. We had found nothing useful to us until then, and now came the worst disappointment of all. And it's dust, all of it been dust for centuries. Another dead end. Ah, it's hopeless. We were out of our heads to hope that nitrates would retain their form for a hundred thousand years. We go now? If nothing here? Oh, wait just a moment. Something in this case. Well, you can break it with your lever. Stand back a little. Right. <laughs> Box of matches. Hermetically sealed. Oh, wait, let me see. Well, they're perfect. But they're not even damp. And what shall we do with them? Burn down those brass doors? Well, you'd better keep them. You can't tell. Oh, uh, what? On the floor, you see them? Well, Small, narrow footprints leading away into the darkness at the end of this gallery. Dudley! Uh, we'd better go. Pick Queen up and carry her. We'll have to run for it. <laughs> now, don't be frightened, my dear. It'll be all right. Go on, run! We came out of the gloom of that place into the deeper gloom of dusk. 
And suddenly we saw. We were trapped. All around us were the Morlocks. They were there by the thousand, surrounding us, and coming closer in the long, even line of deathly fight, their eyes blinking in the half-light, their tiny mouths alive with appetite. Allah, the matches! I have them dip like a fire here. Yeah. Hurry, man, the forest is dry. Hurry, man. We'll have an inferno here in a minute. Our little friends don't like light or heat. The fire leaped high to the heavens and the countryside was ablaze. The Morlocks turned in fear, blinded by the glare. Some of them blundered into the middle of the raging flames and the rest faded away like a fog. Dudley had left a narrow passageway for our retreat and we fled down a long corridor of leaping flames and blistering heat. We fled to safety toward the community of the little people. As we ran, we passed the huge monument with its great bronze doors that were locked tight in our time machine. And suddenly... In the glare of the distant fires, we saw something that stopped us short. They're open! Follow the doors! They're open! No! No, not go in! Dudley, no! It's a trap. They're there waiting for us, inside. Waiting or not, we're going in! No. Dudley, it's suicide! It'll take me one minute to screw the levers on again, then I touch them and we're away! All right, I'll try to give you your one Good minute. boy! No, no, go. Not leave me. No, you, you, my dear, you hold tight around my neck. You're coming home with us, all right? All right, let's go! We're in! i look through the machine. They haven't harmed it. I don't see them yet. Come on now, quickly. The door's Dudley. Ah, the clothes get in the seat. I'll be ready in a moment. I waited for the hum that would signal our departure. Uh, and there in the darkness, the Morlocks were finally upon us. Cold, persistent fingers swarmed over my body, tugging at me, sucking me away from the machine. I held tight to Weena as a man holds fast to life. Tried to kick them away with my feet. Hurry, Dudley, hurry! Get these levers quickly or we're done! One more turn, and it's it! There, follow, we're away, we're gone! Yes. Yes, we made it. Are you all right? I'm all right, Lord. And Weena? Weena isn't with us. What happened? They tore her from my hands at the last minute. They got her. I, I tried to save her. I, I couldn't. I still have a piece of a tunic here in my fist. A little piece of a tunic, Dudley. Nothing else. And so we came home again, back into the very minute from which we had left, back into 12 noon, October 22nd, 1950. We were in Dudley's laboratory again, motionless, sitting on the ridiculous contraption which he has called a time machine. Was it all a dream? Did any of it happen? Could any of it happen? Oh, of course not. How stupid. Then what of this? What of this little piece of thin green silk I hold in my hand? Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have brought you The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Adapted for radio by Irving Ravitch. And starring John Daner as Fowler and Larry Dubkin as Dudley. With Georgia Ellis as Weena. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, escape with us to a small fishing boat off the California coast. And a night of terror and death at the hands of a brilliant madman. As Bud A. Nelson tells it in his exciting story, Seven Hours to Freedom. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. 
A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Express. That night didn't begin any differently from any other night. At least it doesn't seem to me that it did. I left work the same as usual, and I hurried because I was late and we were having supper early again so my brother Sid could get to law school on time. I walked down to Broadway and 42nd Street and into the uptown subway, just the way I always did. I got on, pushed my way in with a crowd. There was an empty seat, and I took it. A girl in front of me was hanging onto the strap. In the other hand, she held the evening paper. I remember looking at it and reading the weather forecast. Fair and somewhat milder, it said. And I thought, tomorrow I can wear my light coat. I was tired. I was awfully tired. I leaned my head back for a minute and closed my eyes. And then... Tired, baby? I sat bolt upright. I'll make you some coffee when we get home. That'll fix you up. What was he talking about? When we get home? I looked at him. There was something I was trying desperately to remember. But I couldn't. He was in his early 30s, dark and very good-looking... But his eyes were hard and his lips were drawn back into a tight little smile. The hand clinging to my arm was large and powerful. The girl in front of me was still holding onto the strap with that paper clutched tightly in one hand. He leaned forward a little so he could see it better. Cloudy with probable thunder showers. Now, wouldn't you think we've had enough rain for one week? Rain? But the paper had said fair. Fair and somewhat milder. I looked at it again myself. And... And he was right. Then I knew I... I was really frightened. The date... The date on that paper was February 21st, 1950. <laughs> Everything seemed to blur before my eyes for a minute, and I i felt a little sick. I looked down and saw a wedding band on my left hand. A simple gold wedding band that hadn't been there five minutes before. It was almost as if I half expected to see it there. If the date on that paper was right, if this really were 1950... Then something told me that this man, this stranger sitting beside me, was my husband. And somewhere, somehow, on that Uptown Express, I'd lost five years of my life. Come on, Lindy. We get off here. We walked up the stairs and out into the street. It was raining. It hadn't been raining before. We'll have to make a run for it. It's raining pretty hard. We started to run down a long, dark street I'd never seen before. Then we turned to a narrow entrance into a dingy apartment building. We shut the rain outside, and we were alone. Never mind your key. I have mine right here. Oh, wait a minute. I think there's some mail. I looked at the name on the box. Vincent. Mr. and Mrs. John Vincent. Johnny. Johnny and Linda Vincent. That was us. Oh, this is rich. Look what it is. A political circular. Sidney Damon for district attorney. Fearless, courageous. <laughs> That's a laugh, sending it to us. Sid? For district attorney? My brother, Sidney? Yes, and it don't sound much better than it smells. Not for my money. But... Come on. It's cold down here. Let's get upstairs. We climbed the stairs to the second floor to a small apartment way in the back. I kept thinking of Sid. Less than an hour ago, he was going to City College nights to study law. And now in my hand was a circular that said he was running for district attorney. But but it wasn't an hour ago. That was in 1945. Five years ago. This was 1950. 
There. Turn on the light. It's near you. I felt along the wall and found the switch. That's better. Ah, it's cold in this dump. Never any heat when we need it. Did you speak to that lousy janitor yet? You said you were going to. Uh, I will, Johnny. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. I didn't mean to snap at you. It's just that business of your smart aleck brother running for DA. I don't like it. Why, Johnny? Why don't you like it? Oh, cut it. Don't ask silly questions. Come here and kiss me instead. Oh, Johnny, I, I... What's the matter? Nothing. Well, come here, then. You know what? Your hair's all wet and your mascara's run a little around the edges. You look awful, honey. But to me, you're still beautiful. Please, please, Johnny, don't kiss me anymore. What's the idea? I'm... I'm cold. I'm wet. I'll be all right. Sure. I understand. Go in and change and I'll fix you something hot. I went into the bedroom... On the bureau was a picture of the two of us. Me, Linda Damon, and this man I'd never seen before. I picked it up. Across the front of it was written, Atlantic City, September 1946. I looked at it for a few minutes, and I put it back on the bureau and walked over to the closet. On one side were his clothes, and on the other, what I supposed were my things. I found a light blue house dress and changed into it quickly. It fit perfectly. Ready, Lindy? Come and get it. In a minute. Here. Oh, thanks. Aren't you going to put on some dry clothes? No, I'm okay. I'll hold out your cup. And one for me. Well, what do we drink to? Even if it's only coffee, we have to drink to something. Well, what we always drink to, Johnny. All right, darling. You want to make the toast or shall I? You make it. Here goes, then. To our house. The one with the front porch, the backyard, and the attic. Okay? Okay. Do you think we'll ever have it? Have what, Johnny? That house. All my life I remember living in little box flats with walls so paper thin you could hear the guy next door yelling at his old lady or her nagging at him. Just as if there weren't enough of that stuff in your own place. And the hallways always full with dirty little kids with their faces needing washing and their eyes too old for the rest of them. And the garbage in big ugly cans in front of the buildings when it was so hot you could hardly breathe. Johnny. I guess maybe you don't understand. Is that why you want the house, Johnny? Sure. Imagine, Lindy, a house. Not a flat, not a couple of caged-in little rooms, but a big house with a front porch and a backyard and an attic. All mine. All ours, Lindy. Oh, Lindy, do you love me? Oh, yes, Johnny. I do love you very much. <laughs> hey, what got me started? I did. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be. Don't ever be sorry for anything. Oh, it couldn't be bad if it comes from you because you're good, Lindy. I'm not, and I know it. Look what I'm doing to you, making you live in a hole like this, not a decent dress to your name. I don't care, Johnny. Oh, but you'll see. It's going to be different. Maybe sooner than you expect. How would you like to move? Out into the country, to our house. Well, I wasn't going to tell you until everything was set, but here. Here, start on this. Go out tomorrow and buy yourself some clothes. You know, real high-class stuff. Johnny, all that money. And plenty more where that came from. But I don't want... I'll get it. Stay where you are. Yeah? What is it, Charlie? Who? Oh, he was. Well, what did he want? Yeah? Well, just lay low until I get in touch with you. I'll think of something. So long. Who was that? Just a friend of mine. Business acquaintance. You wouldn't know him. Oh. I'm telling you, it was nothing. Nothing important. I didn't say anything. Well, don't. And stop looking as though I just finished beating you. Don't shout, Johnny. Well, I didn't mean it, baby. My nerves are on edge, that's all. I wonder if it stopped raining. Did it? It let up a little, maybe. Not much. Why are you standing at the window? Are you expecting someone? What do you mean by that? Who should I be expecting? You've been talking to your brother, haven't you? You've been seeing him again. Johnny, you're hurting me. I told you to keep away from that family of yours, didn't I? If I'm not good enough for him, that's just too bad. Johnny, my arm. Tell me the truth. Have you seen Sid? What's he been telling you? It's a lie, but you believe me, don't you? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, please, Johnny, you're hurting darling, me. Darling, forgive me. Oh, Lindy, you've 
got to promise me you'll stay with me, no matter what. What is it, Johnny? What have you done? Oh, I'm in an awful mess. I'm in deeper than I've ever been in my life. This time, I'm afraid. Will you tell me? Maybe I can help you. I'm, I'm your wife. Oh, I don't deserve you. I don't deserve ever to have met you. Johnny. What? Tell me. Tell me again how we met. I like to hear it. You're just like a little kid, aren't you? Just a funny little kid. Tell me. Okay. It was February 21st, 1945. Five years ago. Yes. And there you were. And I saw you. Where, Johnny? On the subway. On the Uptown Express. What? What's the matter? Uh, oh, nothing. I... I have a little headache, that's all. Go on. You're sure you're all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Go ahead. Well, I saw you and I said to myself, that brother is for me. Mm-hmm. And then I made up my mind I was going to meet you. And then what did you do? I said, pardon me, miss. Am I on the right train for 86th Street? And what did I say? And you said, no, you will have to change it to the local at 72nd. And then we started to talk. <laughs> Just as easy as that? <laughs> Just as easy as that. I think you wanted to meet me, too. Who's that? Oh, I don't know. I'll open it. Linda. What? Stay where you are. Don't answer that. Who is it? Johnny, what are you doing with that gun? Who is it? Me. Sidney. Wait a minute. Your big shot brother. See it? Yeah. I guess I won't need this gun. Here. Put it on the table. See it? Now listen to me. Carefully. I was with you last Monday night. That's all you know. That's your story, and you'd better stick to it. Remember. is filled with mystery, and it was a strange afternoon when Linda Damon boarded the Uptown Express, for without warning, time jumped ahead, and the newspaper datelines read February 21st, 1950. Then she heard the man sitting next to her say, come on, Lindy, we get off here. He was her husband, and his name was Johnny. Mystified, afraid to question, Linda followed him home. Johnny spoke of how they had met five years before on the Uptown Express. And Linda listened. Then came a knock on the door. Johnny reached for his gun. The newcomer was Sid, Linda's brother, a candidate for the office of district attorney. Johnny turned to Linda and said, Listen, Linda, carefully. I was with you last Monday night, and that's all you know. That's your story, and you'd better stick to it. Remember. Yeah? Yeah, just a minute. Hello, Linda. Sid. What do you want, Damon? It's so good to see you, Sid. How's Mom? You've got kind of a nerve asking that, haven't you? Oh, please, Sid, I don't understand. Forget it, baby. Let him speak his piece and get out. What's on your mind, Mr. District Attorney? You're a little premature, but thanks anyway. Come on into the living room, Sid. Here, let me take your coat. It's wet. Linda. He'll go into that living room over my dead body. Which is just the way I'd like it, Vincent. Why, you were... Johnny! Sid! What's the matter? What is it? Linda, haven't you had enough yet? Why don't you come home where you belong? Mom's worse. Every day since you left, she gets worse. Doesn't it mean anything to you that you're killing her? Mom? What are you trying to do? Wring blood out of her? Leave her alone. Don't you care, Linda? What's he done to you? Leave her alone. That's what you came here to say. You said it. Now get out. That's not quite all, Vincent. No, we'll spill it then. Last Monday night, a man by the name of Bucky Stevens was murdered. So what? Johnny! Johnny, what's he trying to say? Be quiet, Lindy. Go on, big shot. What's it to me? That's just what I wondered, Vincent. Bucky'd been gambling, but I suppose you know the story. Sorry, I don't know nothing. No? Too bad you missed it. It's been on all the front pages, too. Maybe you just forgot, Vincent. I'll refresh your memory. Bucky'd been gambling heavily, and he won. He was pretty tight and made a lot of noise about it. Things like that get around fast. I don't like your story. Maybe it's just the way you tell it. Oh? I'm sorry. But don't worry. It gets better as it goes along. 
when Bucky left the club alone with that nice fat wallet, three men got into another car and followed him. Yeah? See, I told you it got better. Gets better still. They forced his car off the road, took his money, murdered him, and then threw his body in the river. Johnny! Then what? Then nothing. That's all there was to it. The three men escaped in their car, and the next morning, Earl Marino and his two henchmen were picked up and booked for the murder. The police thought they had a case. As a matter of fact, they still do. Thanks for the bedtime story. Are you through? In a minute. You see, Vincent, the police, the DA, everyone was convinced it was Marino and his gang. Everyone except me, that is. So? So I said to myself, I wonder... I wonder where Johnny Vincent was Monday night. Johnny and those two playmates of his, Charlie Rossi and Joe Kagan. Just idle curiosity, you understand. Get to the point. You take too much time. Okay, I will. I did a little private investigating. And I've got proof that it was you. You and your pals. I've got enough proof to send the three of you to the electric chair. There, don't say that. Why, he couldn't have. Johnny couldn't have. Why won't you believe me, Linda? I tell you, I can prove it. And I intend to. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the D.A. with my evidence. And I'm giving you fair warning, it's packed solid. They'll spring Marino and pick you up, Vincent. And the charge will be murder. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? No. Just smarter than you, that's all. Well, don't think you can get away with this. I know I can. And if you do, it won't hurt the election any, will it, Damon? Brilliant young prosecuting attorney solves case single-handed. That'll look cute on campaign buttons. Not bad. But to tell you the truth, I wasn't thinking of that so much. I've been out to get you for a long time for what you've done to Lindy. And this is once you're not going to be able to talk your way out of it. And just what do you think you've gained by coming here? I want Linda to be home where she belongs tomorrow. When the police come to get you. Thanks for the warning. Oh, you can skip if you're dumb enough. See how far you'll get. By tomorrow night, every paper in the country will have your picture plastered all over the front page. Johnny's not going anywhere, Sid. And neither am I. He'll stay here and stand trial if he has to, and I'll stand by him. Johnny was with me li- last Monday night. Linda, you don't know what you're saying. Don't I? Well, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you, Sid. Johnny couldn't have murdered anybody. Nothing I can say will make you change your mind. No, nothing. Please go, will you? Sure. Sorry I bothered you. When you need us, we'll still be waiting for you. Come home. So long, Vincent. See you in court. Oh, Johnny, my own brother. How could he? Thanks for trying anyway, baby. But this time, he means business. You don't have to be afraid, Johnny, if you're innocent. What do you mean, if... Oh, I didn't mean it that way, Johnny. Believe me. Oh, you're trying to kid. He's got the goods on me, and I know it. Johnny. You mean he was right? He was telling the truth? Johnny, did you... Don't be a little fool. Of course I killed him. No! Oh, no! Oh, cut out the dramatics. I've got to think. There must be something. You? You murdered him and threw his body in the river? And where do you think that money came from? Use your head. But murder? Johnny! I couldn't help it. He put up a fight and we had to let him have it. I didn't want to kill him. There was nothing else I could do. You know I wouldn't have killed him if I didn't have to. Don't you, Lindy? I don't know anything anymore. What are you going to do now? Do? What can I do? He made this investigation on his own. That's what he said, didn't he? Well, yes, but I... Then he probably hasn't told anyone yet. No one knows but him. At last, or at least that's the chance I've got to take. I can't be any worse off than I am now. What are you talking about? He'll never live to turn in that evidence. I'll see to that. Johnny! I'll get Charlie and Joe and we'll make sure he doesn't... No! No, you can't do that to Sid. I won't let you. Me or him, Lindy. I don't have to think twice to decide which one I'd rather have it be. No! Put down that phone. Please, Johnny. Hello. Mike? Let me speak to Charlie, will you? Is he there? Good. I said to hang up, Johnny. And I meant it. Lindy, put that gun back on the table. I said to hang up. You won't shoot. Put it down like a good girl. Hello. Is that you, Charlie? Something's come up. I want you to get Joe and help me on the job. Yeah, right away. I'm warning you, Johnny. Meet me as soon as you can, over. Meet me at... Oh. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! Johnny! I really didn't think you'd shoot me, Lindy. I had to. I couldn't help it. You know, you've got a lot of spunk for a little thing. Oh, Johnny, I'm sorry. I thought I told you not to be sorry for anything. Ever. I told you anything you did would be all right, and I... 
I meant it. No. It wouldn't have ended good, no matter what. I'd just as soon have it this way. Honest, baby. But it wasn't all bad, was it? Some of it was fun. Tell me it was. Yes, Johnny. Some of it was wonderful. In no what? What? I guess uh, maybe I never was meant to have a house with a front porch, a backyard, and an attic. Johnny! <laughs> I don't know how long I sat there, on the floor beside him, holding him in my arms and rocking back and forth as if he were a child. There was blood trickling out of the corners of his mouth, and I wiped it off with my handkerchief. I knew he was dead, but I wiped it off just the same. And I sat there, holding him. Maybe part of those years had been wonderful. Now I'd never know. After a while, I got up, took my purse, and left the apartment. The rain had stopped. I started to walk, found myself running instead, running down that narrow little street. I didn't know where I was going. I just ran. The subway station was at the corner, and I went into that. I thought maybe I'd try and find my way home again, back to Mom and Sid, and then I'd be all right. I tried not to think of Johnny. Johnny lying dead where I'd left him in a little pool of blood. I dropped a nickel in the slot, and a minute later the train came roaring out of the tunnel. I'm sure I didn't know what I was doing. I just got on and sat down. The car was almost empty. I was tired. Tired all over. I leaned back and closed my eyes. opened them again. The train was crowded. Crowded with people. And I hadn't remember stopping to let them on. Suddenly, I wasn't quite so tired anymore. I sat up straight and looked around. A girl in front of me was hanging onto the strap. And in the other hand, she held the evening paper. I remember looking at it and reading the weather forecast. Fair and somewhat milder. I held my breath. Was it possible? It took every bit of courage I had to force myself to look at the date. And the date was February 21st, 1945. I can't explain how I felt then. I wanted to laugh, but but to cry. I wanted to turn to the stranger sitting beside me and say, Listen, mister, it was a dream. I just imagined it. I didn't kill anybody. This is still 1945, and I'm going home for supper. I did turn and... And then I froze. I froze with such terror as I've never known before and will never know again. For the man sitting next to me was... Pardon me, miss. Am I on the right train for 86th Street? Well, no, you have to... Uh... That is... I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm afraid you have to ask someone else. You see, this is my stop, and I'm getting off. <laughs> Shadows and stillness. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Regan. 
I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9, and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of The Little Man's Lament. They called it Margate Mansion, but the name didn't fit. It was a pile of old cement and cracked stucco held up by a half a dozen tired palm trees. The people inside didn't fit either. A crusty old lady who talked backwards, a redhead with an urge to travel fast. But it was Junior who won first prize. He was half Einstein and half Hollywood playboy. Only when this boy played, it was with poison. It started on a Tuesday. I was headed down Taft Avenue on my way to the laundromat. I had a date with a washing machine and a blonde cashier named Gloria. That's when a cab pulled up beside me and the lion hopped out. He was blowing sparks out of a fat cigar. I could tell by the 50 cent smell that we had a new client. Oh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my boy, I'm glad I caught you. Get back in the cab, fat, so I'm busy. But I have to talk to you. I was just going up to your apartment. Have a good time. I'll be out all day. Now, Jeffrey, is that any way to talk after all I've done for you? After the many opportunities I've given you to help your fellow beings in distress? I've worked three weeks without a rest. i got to wash my socks. Wash your socks? You can talk about a thing like that when I'm here to present you with a golden opportunity? An opportunity to demonstrate our humanitarian sentiments? A chance to lift one who's in trouble? How much did you lift from him? A hundred bucks, and it's not a him, it's a her. Oh, it's really a simple job, Jeffrey. Very simple. I've just been over there. Lovely old house, fine old family. The Margates, flower of the old south. Gone to see him. Uh, well, yes. But you know how it is with descendants of old families. Fresh young growth choked back by the weeds of the old family stock. The fresh new plant smothered by decay and ruin. Try Vigoro. Regan, you don't seem to understand. We've been retained by Mrs. Margate. It's about her nephew, Hillary Margate. Strange youth, very strange youth indeed. If Mrs. Margate needs protection from him, I tell you it's a very serious matter. Well, so's my laundry. Regan, will you listen to me? There's another choice? Yes. See, Mrs. Margate, root out the facts. Get her a gardener. She doesn't need a gardener. She needs you, and don't give me any more trouble. Okay, okay, sweetheart. Here. Hey, wait a minute. What's it? My laundry. Put the shirts and socks in a washing machine. Put two bits in the slot. And stay away from the blonde. She doesn't like cigar smoke. Regan, this means you will see Mrs. Margie. Don't try to be coy. You knew I'd see her the minute you stepped out of that cab. I walked up Vine and turned right past Franklin. All the places up there are old. But Margate Mansion was old when William S. Hart was Gene Autry. A bunch of turrets made out of wood that termites wouldn't look at. But I was looking at what was standing in the front bay window looking at me. Red hair and wide eyes and a complexion like skim milk. She was what answered the door when I twisted the old-fashioned bell. Hello. I saw you from the window. Yeah, I saw you seeing me. Come in. Come in, please. Thanks. I, I hope you don't mind the disorder... I'm afraid I don't... Your name? Regan. Oh. Sit here, Mr. Regan. Please don't mind the dust on the sofa. No one nice ever comes, so it doesn't matter. I like you. I want you to stay. It shows. You're not married or anything like that, Mr. Regan. Nothing like that. Oh, that's nice. I'm not married either, Mr. Regan. I heard it was Mrs. Margate. Oh, that's my aunt. I'm not married at all. Mr. Regan, you didn't just come to see my aunt. I've got a lot of time. Oh, I've been foolish again, haven't I? Oh, sometimes I, I get so mixed up. I, I'm... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yes, Mr. Regan. What's your name? Gwethelyn. Mrs. Margate's niece. Yes. Hillary's your brother? Yes, Mr. Regan. Well, those questions. Business. Business? International Detective Bureau. Your aunt's on the line for a hundred dollars worth. A detective? Well, that's polite for it. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. You shouldn't have told me that at all. Suppose you tell me some things. I'm mixed up, Mr. Regan. 
I can't tell you. Gwendolyn. What's my aunt? Did I hear the front doorbell? Don't say anything. Don't tell her. I did hear the front door. Well, Gwendolyn, who is this man? Regan. Regan? Oh, you're the man they call the lion's eye. I've been expecting you. I'm gardening. I should have figured. What? I have a green thumb, as they say. Follow me. Go to your room, Gwendolyn. Yes, Sandy. Gwendolyn? Yes, Sandy, I'm going. She went all right, like a rabbit at a greyhound race. Only I wasn't sure this rabbit could stay ahead of the dogs. But right then I had another problem, keeping up with Mrs. Margate. It wasn't the way she walked, it was her talk that went at me. We'll go to the garden. <sighs> my niece and my nephew, problems that weigh heavily on my heart, Mr. Regan. Oh, this way. Family collapsing and falling to ruin. Just three Margates left. Myself and the two children, Gwethelyn and Hillary. Only 52 years old with such responsibilities. Hillary? No. No, myself, of course. 52. But Hillary is the real problem. You follow me? Right behind you. What? Oh, yes. Out this door. The garden. There. Do you see that pool by the date palm? Uh Uh-huh. Fish. Carp, Mr. Regan. He concocts things. Hillary brews things. Poisons. One day he fed something he had brewed to Hillary F. Margate Sr., the cop, and he turned bright green. Hillary? The cop. We found him next morning floating belly up, stock bright green. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the cop. We name our fish after the dear departed members of our family. Nice custom. Yes. Hillary poisoned the carp when he was only 146 years old. The carp? Yes, yes. Uh, Come along. (sighs) Hillary was only a boy at the time. Such a problem, Mr. Regan. Oh, here. My vegetable garden. Uh, Have an onion, Mr. Regan. Delicious. Uh, Yeah, Look, Mrs. Margie. Uh, Eat the onion, Uh, Mr. Regan. uh, George. George. George is my gardener. I'm over here, Mrs. Margaret. Oh, well, you, you can go out back and cut the weeds, George. Mr. Regan and I have some private matters to discuss. Yes, ma'am. Excellent, ma'am, George. Excellent. And be sure you get them all, George. We must be rid of the weeds. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. <sighs> now, we're alone, Mr. Regan. The onion, go on, eat it. No. Uh, as I was saying, Hillary, that boy, such a problem. Yeah, as you were saying. Yes, yes. Good, aren't they? Mrs. Margate, what is it you want me to do? Do? I want you to look after Hillary. I was told you wanted protection. Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? No. Hillary needs a nursemaid. That's not our line. No, see here, Mr. Regan. International Detective Bureau has already agreed to handle my case. Mr. Lyon himself accepted my check. He'll accept anyone's check. But he promised to help. Well, then talk to him. I'm talking to you. I'm explaining. You're explaining nothing. You've given me a lot of double talk, and I have a feeling that's all you want to give me. Now, make sense. All right, all right, all right. You're going to force me to say what I hoped never to say to anyone. Not anyone. My life is in danger. I can believe that. My tea. Yesterday, I noticed the odor of almonds. I'm listening. No, I didn't drink it naturally. 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 Hillary brewed that tea, Mr. Regan. My nephew. Now you've said something. Where is he? Ocean Park, the shooting gallery. Shooting gallery? Yes, he's strange, very strange. He pulls things, collects guns, practices shooting. You won't like him. I uh, suppose I'd go talk to him. Well, you'd better. As I've said, Mr. Regan, I don't wish to be murdered. I headed the car down La Brea to Olympic and then out to the Ocean Park Pier. It was afternoon business, popcorn and sailor style. The shooting gallery had one customer... A kid in a corduroy sport coat with a face like a cantaloupe out of season. He was taking shots at the little swinging targets. You didn't need the family album to figure him for Hillary Margate. I walked over, but he didn't take the gun from his shoulder. Leeks. Come again? Leeks. Scallions. My name's Regan. Allium Ascalonicum, Mr. Regan. Onions. You've been eating them. So? This suggests you're the private detective hired by my aunt. Bullseye? You read palms, too? I fancy myself an amateur detective, Mr. Regan. I seldom miss. I notice. As a matter of fact, Mr. Regan, I'm interested in hiring you myself. Oh, that's a switch. I think there's going to be a murder. Anybody I know? Yes, my aunt. Who plays the heavy? The heavy? Who's going to kill her? I am. Practicing? I don't need practice, Mr. Regan. Even experts get the chair. 
Possibly. All right, Junior, let's start making sense. Very well, Mr. Regan. My aunt is a domineering autocrat. Actually, I should hate to kill her. But I feel I must. Uh, to protect myself, you understand. From what? <laughs> you know, I dabble in poisons, Mr. Regan. I am empoisonné, as the French say. Poisoner. When I was 15... I heard that one, yeah. Hillary F. Margate Sr., the carp. Oh, he died a horrible death. My regrets. Now, get to the point. Ours is an evil household, Mr. Regan. The last of the Margates, a decaying race. My aunt, for example, in Wethelin. I met her. Then you understand that something must be done. This is an urgent matter, Mr. Regan. It would be wise to take my case. One Margate for a client's too many. Very well, Mr. Regan. But you want information. Perhaps I'll give it to you tomorrow. I'll phone you. As they say on the radio, you may save a life. Possibly... You're on? It made a real funny joke the way he said it. Only I wasn't laughing. And neither was he. I got in my car and started for town to tell the lion he'd been underpaid. All the way in, I kept getting a picture of a mechanical rabbit going around a track. I tried putting Grethelin's face on it, and Mrs. Margate's, then Hillary's. The others didn't fit. Grethelin's did. I was still thinking about it when I parked on Hill Street and got out to walk. And that's when I put another face on the rabbit, my own. The guy who fell in behind me and started following was no greyhound, but he had squeaky shoes that slowed down when I slowed down. We stayed together for a block, and when I turned left toward the office, he turned left. I wondered if he was an amateur. I found out when I sidestepped into an alley and pulled him in after me. All right, Buster, uh, this is where you get off. Hey, say, what the devil? Come on, come on, who hired you? Let me go. Give me some answers. I... Talk. I, you want muscles, huh? Muscles, all right. I got it. He had him, all right. And he knew where to use him. He had a bald head and he used that, too. Right in the middle of my stomach. I shouldn't have bent double, but I did. It was a setup. The next blow sent me around the fender of the truck parked in the alley. I went to my knees. When I came up, it was too late. The bald head was gone. But someone else was there. Mr. Regan. It was Grethel and Margate. Mr. Regan, you should be careful. You all right? He was following me. No, Mr. Regan, no, he wasn't. I was going to your office. He was following me. She was ready to talk, but the fog in my head wouldn't let me listen. I got her around the corner into a bar. She waited until the waiter brought the drinks. Two bourbon straight, Mr. Regan. And if I may say so, this is a lovely tomato you are escorting to my humble palace. You said so. Ah. And may I say, Mr. Regan, I'm also partial to redheads. On account of my first love was a redhead. She played second fruit in our orchestra. Sure. Keep the chain. That was when I was with Stokowski. Ah, the Hollywood Bowl, how well I remember. Me and my fiddle. We made together beautiful music. Me and the fiddle, you understand, not the redhead. She gave me nothing but a cold shoulder and account she was hot for a guy that played bass. Come on, you told me this story yesterday. You don't wish to hear the story of my life, Mr. Regan? Well, it was the same way with Mr. Stokowski. The artist is lost in the world of today. All right. Now we can talk. I don't know, Mr. Regan. Who was following you? It doesn't matter. I'm used to it, Mr. Regan. Who was the mug? It doesn't matter, Mr. Regan. It's too late anymore. I thought... You thought what? I thought you'd help me, Mr. Regan. I was on my way to your office. Why? It's going to be trouble, Mr. Regan. Serious trouble. What says so? Everything. Hillary, my aunt. They're all acting so strangely. And those people who come to the house... People? Who? I don't know. The man who was following me is one of them. Well, something strange is going on, Mr. Regan. Something terrible. You still haven't told me anything. Don't you see? It isn't anything I can tell you. It's a feeling. A terrible feeling. Everything's wrong. I've got to have facts, lady. I don't... Wait. There's one thing. Yeah? The gardener. Mr. Hendricks. George? Yes. My aunt knows him, Mr. Regan. Better than just a gardener. Something else. What? George has been in prison. I know he's been in prison. I heard him say something once on the telephone. To who? I don't know. There's so much I don't know. 
That makes two of us. You don't believe me. You've got to believe me. Something terrible's going to happen. Sure. Hillary's going to kill your aunt. Hillary? Oh, no, no. That's not it at all. It's me they're going to kill, don't you see? They're going to kill me. After that, I couldn't get anything out of it that made sense. I loaded her in a cab and then walked over to Pershing Square to feed the pigeons. Maybe something would come to me. Nothing did, except the pigeons. After a while, I went over to the examiner morgue to look up George Hendricks. There was nothing, not a word. But the lion has ways of finding those things out, so I went back to the office. The lion had information, all right, but not the kind I expected. Regan! Regan, where have you been? I've been calling every saloon in the city. You got the wrong one. I often wonder why I hired you. Okay, Fatso, why the steam? I'll tell you why, because you were supposed to be on the Margate case, that's why. What do you think I've been doing? I know what you're going to be doing. You're going to get out to Margate Mansion right now and fast. They just found Hillary Margate in his room. He's been shot through the head. This is CBS, and you're listening to the story of the little man's lament. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Here's a special word for those of you who are interested in setting up a retirement fund. One that will permit you to have some of the good things of life before you're too old to enjoy them. Join the payroll savings plan where you work and invest in United States savings bonds. Under this plan, your firm sets aside whatever sum you name from each paycheck and uses the money to buy savings bonds for you. Buy United States bonds and keep them. And now, back to tonight's story of the little man's lament and Jeff Regan, investigator. Nothing made sense. There were three Margates. The old lady, her nephew Hillary, and his sister, Gwethelyn. And all three of them wanted to hire me to stop a murder. Then the lion tells me Hillary Margate has just been shot. Well, one thing was sure. With three people to work for, one of them was bound to turn up dead. I put the lion to work looking up the gardener, George Hendricks. Then I hopped in the car and headed out to the Margate place off Franklin Avenue. By the time I got there, it was turning dark. Out front, a black and white gnash said, Police, in big letters. But when the old lady opened the door, she acted as though she'd never heard of police. Oh, Mr. Regan, please come in. I'm sorry you didn't get to meet him. Hillary, strange boy. I met him. You did? Oh, this way, Mr. Regan. Well, it's no matter. It was inevitable. Hillary's uncle, my husband, before he died, warned me something like this would happen. He was a young fool, Hillary. How did it happen? Happen? With a gun, of course. How else could one shoot oneself except with a gun? In here, Mr. Regan, we won't be bothered by them. Sometimes police can be so nosy. Oh, do sit down. We shall have tea. With or without almonds? I know what you're thinking, Mr. Regan, but I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. What did? Just a moment, Mr. Regan. There's someone at our door. Well, Gwethelyn? I was just coming to see you, Andy. I thought you'd want me to tell Mr. Regan about Hillary. Mm. Yes, a good idea. Uh, Mr. Regan, I'll let Gwethelyn tell you. She was here at the time. Oh, she was a lovely woman. Gwethelyn's mother, my late sister. Well, go ahead, child. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I got home about five. Uh, better sit down, child. No, 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 not there. Here. Yes, Andy. Well, Mr. Regan, Hillary was in the gun room reading. I went in to talk to him. But he ordered me out of the room. He said he didn't want to be disturbed. He was concentrating. Go on. I left the room. A couple of minutes later, I heard a shot. When I went back, he was there. Hillary. On the floor, dead. Then you called the police. I told Angie. She called them. They've been so nice, the police. They promised not to disturb me any more than necessary. Wasn't that nice? They're um, in his room now? With Hillary. Dear Hillary. Well, you won't need me anymore. I think I'd better be going. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Gwethelyn, uh, see Mr. Regan to the door like a good girl. Yes, honey. And come again sometime soon, Mr. Regan. We should have tea together. Thanks. This way, Mr. Regan. Mr. Regan, I've got to talk to you this way quickly. What's on your mind? It's about Hillary. Something he did tonight. Like what? 
When he came home, before he was... Before that, he had a book. A big book. He was reading it when it happened. Why would he read a book and then shoot himself? You got me. What was the title? I don't know. But when the police came, the book was gone. Where did he buy it? I don't know that either. But I'm sure it's important, Mr. Regan. I'm sure of it. You don't think it's important? I don't know. I reach for answers. Sometimes they come up air. I know something else, Mr. Regan. It's about George. George Hendricks, our gardener. Yeah? He disappeared this afternoon after it. Go on. And he sent for him when the police arrived, but he wasn't in his room. The police were angry. They think he might have done it. And you think so, too? I'm not sure, Mr. Regan. I'm not sure of anything now. She turned and ran into the house and left me with a lot of night air and cool breeze. If Hendricks had taken a powder, the police would check that angle. That left me with a book. A very big book. I walked down Franklin toward my car. Up ahead, I saw a small man in a black suit locking up a shop door. Over his head, a sign said Franklin Avenue Bookshop. That did it. I caught him before he closed up. I beg your pardon. Do you know a Hillary Margate lives up the street? Yes, I know him. Why? Was he in today? He's a regular customer. Was he in, yes or no? Uh, yes. Did he buy a book? No. You sure? Uh, positive. He asked for a volume we didn't have. What volume? I don't remember the title because we didn't have it in stock. It was a textbook. Textbook? Uh, yes, on horticulture. Uh, plants. Pla plants? Plants? Does that mean something to you? Yeah. It could explain why the Margate family has gone to seed. It was crazy, but it was beginning to untangle. I headed for my car up the street. Before I touched the starter, I found out I had company. All right, Regan, drive. The gun in my back told me he meant it. One look in the mirror told me he was George Hendricks. Well, you're calling him. Where to? Your apartment. I want to talk. Have a chair, Regan. It's your house. Thanks. I talk. You sit and listen. I can stand. I say sit down. It's your party, Hendricks. There's been an accident at the Margate house. I heard. Hillary shot him, sir. That right? Well, you think different? Changed my mind. I didn't kill him, Regan. Who said you did? I never could get used to confinement. Oh. San Quentin? Oh, sandstone. Sandstone, Minnesota. Tell me more. Listen, Regan, the police don't like guys with a record. What was your rap, Hendricks? Checks, something like that, forgery. So why tell me? You're moving in my direction, Regan. I don't like it. Is that why you ran? There's something else. Yeah? The name. It isn't Hendricks. It's Margate. What's that? Freehold Quincy Margate. No wonder you changed it. There were several reasons. Yeah, Old South family. Listen, Regan, you got to believe me. I didn't kill Hillary. I didn't have anything to do with it. You know a big guy, bald head with a stupid face? Morley? He works at the Margate place part-time. What's his job? Flunky. He works in the garden with me. When he isn't tailing the girl. Leave me out of that part of it. Well, do I answer that? Yes, but watch what you say. Regan. Regan, I expected to hear from you sooner. What's happened to you? Regan, are you there? Uh, yeah, just got here. What's the matter? Someone with you? You're a genius. Well, I just found out about Hendricks. You guessed it. You mean he's there? Go on. Listen, that's not his real name, Regan. He's a Margate. Freehold Quincy Margate. Age 46, height 511, weight 180. Get to the point. Well, about that prison record, quite correct. It was eight years ago, charge. Narcotics violation. Oh, yes, but be careful, he'll hear you. No, he won't. He just went out the door, fast. I had what I needed. I averaged 50 down Franklin and pulled up in front of the Margate place ten minutes later. It was dark and it looked empty, like a beer can after a picnic. I found an open window and crawled in. It was the gun room. And that meant I didn't have to go much farther. But somebody changed my mind for me when the door suddenly opened and a hunk of orange lightning stabbed in my direction. I ducked in the chair next to be toppled over. I couldn't wait for the next one. Let me go. Drop it. You're hurting my... That's better. Now some lights. Mr. Regan. I thought you were one of them. I'm not. That book Hillary was reading. What? I'm in a hurry, baby. You already know, don't you, Mr. Regan? 
all right. I didn't see it closely. It had pictures of plants. Like the ones in your backyard? Yes. I didn't know what it meant until... Until Hillary got it, and then you were too scared to talk. Why? Mr. Regan, Hillary didn't poison my aunt's tea. They only said he did so they could kill me and then blame him for it. That way they'd be rid of both of us. Yeah, but Hillary caught on too quick. That's why they killed him, Mr. Regan. Oh, don't let them know I know. It won't matter now, baby. I circled around the house in a hurry. Empty. Then I tried the garden. That's when I saw it. Fifty yards behind the house. A strange light at first. Then something red that began to grow. Then smoke and more smoke. I ran for the back of the garden and the flames. She saw me coming. Stand back, Mr. Regan. Maybe tomorrow, Mrs. Margate. I warn you, Regan. Stand back. You hired me, remember? Take one more step, Mr. Regan, and Morley will kill you. You figured he'd be around. Put that gun down, Morley. The smoke's getting in your eyes. No, no. Shoot him, Morley. Shoot him. You're too late for that. I drove across the column of smoke and caught his arm as he tried to find me with that gun. I got to him first. I owed him something for what he'd given me in that alley, and I paid him back with interest. The old lady just stood there and glared at me, the fire reflecting in her eyes. It took me ten minutes in my best sport coat to stop the blaze. But the price was cheap, because where the fire had been was a nice pile of Exhibit A. It looks just like an ordinary plant, but the police call it marijuana. Somebody spotted the smoke and called the fire department. The police were right behind them and loaded the last of the Margates into the wagon. And it was like Gweth said. She was scheduled to turn up poison, and I was supposed to testify that Hillary had done it. Only Hillary caught on too fast, and they gave him a bullet for his trouble. And after I finished up at headquarters, I went to the office and filled the lion in. He was disappointed. And this fellow the police picked up at the depot, this Hendricks, he, he wasn't the culprit we were looking for? He was under the old lady's thumb like the rest of the family. She blackmailed him into growing the stuff. With his record, he couldn't afford to squawk. He couldn't afford to squawk? How do you think I feel? You got a check for a hundred bucks, didn't you? Uh, <clears throat> well, yes, I did. Uh, well, that she is... did pay you, didn't she? Well, you see, Jeffrey, uh, that is, she, she gave me a check when I first went out there for one hundred dollars. You said that. Well, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but, uh, well, you see, her brother-in-law... You mean... Well, that is, Hendricks did have a prison record for narcotics violation, but, uh... Well, it seems upon examining the records more closely, there was an earlier sentence for, uh... Bad checks. Uh, yes. It seems to run in the family. I don't get paid this week. Uh, go on. Quit me. Pick a man when he's down. Oh, stop it. You know I never withhold payment when I have it. Right now, I don't have it. Maybe next week... If you I... wait two weeks, it'll be Thanksgiving. What's that mean? You can have the end of the turkey I've been getting. Jeffrey, you're not being kind. <laughs> you remember my heart. I'll try. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Now, oh, here's 25 cents. For what? Go over and pick up your laundry. I forgot to wait for it. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written, written by William Frug and William Fifield, directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Regan Investigator is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again next Wednesday at 9 for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan Investigator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
death is so permanent. But to the murderer, the glaring memory of living, red blood oozing its ghastly stain, dying eyes that hold a look of shocked bewilderment, the grotesque sprawling of the body becomes a growing terror. The murdered do haunt their murderer, diabolically filling each moment, waking or sleeping, with an ever-building, distorted desire that mounts into an all-encompassing obsession. And so, this is our story, starring John Loder. Turning homeward from a day of hunting. A hunting party that had set out that morning with the express desire to legally kill. A desire that oft times becomes an obsession. Here, come on, boy. Lloyd? Yeah? I wonder where Martin is. He went ahead to see if he could locate that path that leads out of here. Lloyd, do you think we'll ever bag anything? Of course. We just had a run of bad luck. Why, last winter I... Hold on. What is it? There, ahead. Did you see those branches move? Where? Is your gun loaded, Christine? Yes. It's that shot we've been waiting for. <gasps> Go ahead. You take first crack. But I don't see it. Shh. The bush. That bush to the left of the big tree. Oh. Hurry up. All right. I think you got it. Come on. Oh, God. Wait, wait for me, Lloyd. Come on, Christine. Here we are. We... Lloyd! Oh! Oh, Lloyd! It's Martin. Good afternoon. I came to inquire about... I'm this. sorry, we're not interviewing reporters. This has all been a terrible shock to Mrs. Holliday, and she's unable to see anyone. Wait a minute, I'm not a reporter. No? No, I'm answering the ad in the newspaper. In regard to your selling the house. Oh, oh, well, come in. Thank you. We've been swamped with snoopers and reporters all week long. It's been rather difficult. I'm Dr. Foster, Mrs. Holliday's physician. Glad to know you, Dr. Foster. I'm Norman Marshall. Not Norman Marshall, the writer. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Well, this is a pleasure, Mr. Marshall. I'm one of your most devoted readers. Well, thank you very much. Now, um, as to the estate, I believe I can tell you all you wish to know. Well, there's scarcely much I need know. I've seen innumerable pictures of the Holiday House and the Sunday Rotary Reviewer. Now, regarding price... The price is as advertised. Mm Mm-hmm. And servants. Would they be available to a new owner? I'm sorry, no. You see, since Martin Holliday's death, I've had to discharge them. Mrs. Holliday is in a very delicate condition requiring absolute quiet. It was imperative that no one remain in the house who might disturb her in any way. Oh, breakdown? Um, Something of the sort, yes. Well, that's a shame. The entire affair has been quite tragic. But to get back, Mr. Marshall... Hmm? Oh, yes, of course. (laughs) The uh, library here, Dr. Foster, this was Mr. Holliday? Yes. He appears to have quite a number of rare works. This one here, for example, I don't believe I've seen this in... I should prefer you not to handle the books, please, Mr. Marshall. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think the library is not for sale. None of the furnishings. Perhaps if we discuss the uh, satisfactory price in a few of these editions? I've just told you, Mr. Marshall, the furnishings are not for sale. And Mrs. Holliday's instructions. Did you call me, Lloyd? Christine, what are you doing here? You're not well enough to be up and around just yet. Don't you think you'd better go back to your room? No. No, it's so warm there. I wanted some fresh air. Who is this? This is Norman Marshall, Christine. How do you do, Mr. Marshall? I'm Mrs. Holliday. Very happy to know you, Miss Holliday. Well, Mr. Marshall is considering buying the estate. Yes, yeah, seems to be an ideal place for a person in my line of work. Line of work? Mm-hmm. I'm a writer. A writer? Oh, that's very nice. You know, it's funny, I used to wish I were a writer. 
I think I still do. There's so many things I could write mm, about. Christine? <laughs> Christine, I'll help you back to your room. No, no, it's quite all right. I, I, can, I can manage. Good day, Mr. Marshall. Uh, uh, good day, Mrs. Harvey. You must forgive some of the things she says, Mr. Marshall. She, uh, she doesn't realize. Well, she didn't seem to say anything wrong. Yes? Well, nevertheless. Now, about the house. The house? Oh, yes, the house. <laughs> well, I'll take it. Oh. <laughs> well, fine. I'll draw you up a check. And by the way, I'll have to ask a favor of you. Well, certainly. What is it? I had a bit of car trouble down the road, and there doesn't seem to be any service stations out this way. I wonder if you'd mind driving me back into town. Oh, I'd like to, but I'm afraid I can't. We haven't a car on the estate. No? No, they're in storage. Oh, I see. Well, I hate to ask, but do you think you could put me up someplace for the night? Oh, I'm afraid it's impossible. Oh, well, I'm sorry, then. Oh, that is, uh, I didn't quite mean it in the way I said. After all, we couldn't very well turn you out when you practically own the house, could we? I don't know, could you? You'll find a guest room at the head of the stairs, Mr. Marshall. You're welcome to stay. Good evening. Good evening to you. Oh, good morning, Miss Holiday. Oh, good morning, Miss... Oh, I'm sorry. It's Marshall. Norman Marshall. Of course. Forgive me. <laughs> That's one of my worst habits. I never can remember her name. Fine morning, isn't it? Yes, it's beautiful. I thought I'd pick some roses for my room. Do you like roses, Mr. Marshall? Very much. I planted them myself. Martin used to like roses. Martin... Uh, can, I, can I help you? No, no, thank you. I'm, I'm unfinished. I think I'll go in now. Uh, wait. Mrs. Holliday. What is it? I wanted to talk to you. There was something... Oh, I'm sorry. Lloyd says I'm not well enough to talk to anyone yet. Oh, it's my position. Yes, I know. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Look, uh, couldn't we take a little stroll? Lloyd might not approve. He might say it's bad for Oh, me. I'm sure it'll be all right. Well, all right then. We can walk in the garden if you like. It's a very attractive garden. I like the forest out there, too. It seems to add something. Forest? I despise the forest. Oh? We were hunting. We were hunting. Lloyd said it was there in the clump of trees. It wasn't that I meant to. No, I didn't mean to. Much was with us, and he kept barking. Well, look now, Mrs. Harvey, I wouldn't... There, there, you hear it? I can hear it. Well, of course, it's there. the dog. I can hear it. It's a plane. I can hear it. Hey, Mrs. Holliday, don't run off. Mrs. Holliday. Mrs. Mr. Marshall. Oh, Dr. Foster. Hello. Mr. Marshall, I've tried to show you every courtesy, and I'd appreciate it if you'd at least grant me the same consideration. Something wrong? Mrs. Holliday and I have made arrangements to turn over the estate to you by the end of the week at the latest. Until then, I must ask you to leave. Well, pardon me for asking, but why the bums rush? If you mean the reason for my asking you to leave, I think that's pretty obvious. I've already explained to you that Mrs. Holliday is a very sick woman desperately in need of complete rest and relaxation. She doesn't seem so terribly ill. Confused, I believe, is a better word. I believe as a physician I'm better qualified to diagnose Mrs. Holliday's condition. It so happens that she is suffering from a rather complex neurosis brought about by the shock of her husband's death. I don't know what you were discussing with her in the garden this morning. However, I do know that since then she has suffered a complete relapse. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I didn't mean to upset her. It's my duty to see that you don't have another opportunity. Oh, oh Martin. Oh, Martin. Christine, stop it. Stop it, you hear me? Go to sleep now. Just go to sleep. Hello? Cedar Grove Sanitarium? May I speak to Dr. Cameron, please? Hello? Oh, hello, Arthur. I'm sorry to bother you this time of night. Yes, I'm afraid it's happened. I'm bringing Mrs. Holliday to Cedar Grove tomorrow evening. You can expect us at six. Thank you, Arthur. I knew you would. 
Uh, good night. Foster. What are you doing here? Foster. You wouldn't take her to Cedar Grove. I've just made the arrangement. But that... That's an asylum. We doctors prefer to call it a rest home. Good night, Mr. Marshall. In the best of definitions, the word asylum means a place of rest, of safety. But in the case of Mrs. Holliday, we can only wonder about Dr. Foster's definition of the word. And yet, he has made no outward move that could imply anything but the best of uh, intentions. And yet, in the mind of Norman Marshall, and in that Holiday house, there is a static something, a strange undercurrent that can only result from some sort of an obsession. Returning now to the mystery starring John Loder. Norman Marshall spent a wakeful night in the guest room of Holiday House a night through which marched a parade of disturbing thoughts, like tickets in a fence. And always the question, like the beat of a pulse, why, why, why? And then, as the gray shroud of dawn presaged the coming light of day, Norman Marshall watched Dr. Forrest drive away from the holiday house in a car that should not have been there. A car that was in storage. And again, thoughts raced through his mind. And he knew that somewhere within this house was the answer to some terrifying problem of obsession. Miss Lloyd, come in. Lloyd, I didn't sleep very well last night. I wish... Oh, Mr. Marshall. This is Holiday. I'm not supposed to talk to you, Mr. Marshall. Lloyd said I'm not... I'll only take a moment of your time, Mrs. Holliday. There's something I'd like to ask you. There's nothing I can say to you. I'm not well. I wish you'd go. Who said you weren't well? Lloyd's trying to help me. You're not trying to help me at all. Mrs. Holliday, where did Dr. Foster get the car he drove away in this morning? Car? Lloyd has his own car. Has he had it on the estate? Did he have it the day before yesterday? Of course. He uses it to go into town for groceries and to get medicine for me. But what medicine? These tablets here? Yes, they're sedatives. Well, they're strange-looking sedatives. You mustn't take those. Why are you tasting them? They're for me. Lloyd gives them to me to quiet my nerves. Really? These are soda tablets, Mrs. Holliday. I, I don't understand. Neither do I. But I believe I'm beginning to. What do you mean? Frankly, Mrs. Holliday, I'm inclined to think that your Dr. Foster is doing you considerably more harm than good. I wouldn't say but, that, Mr. Marshall. Foster. Oh, Lloyd, I, I was I just... believe that will be enough company for you this morning, Christine. You'd better go back to bed. Yes, Lloyd. I'm... As for you, Mr. Marshall, it appears to be getting quite a habit with us, my asking you to leave. Uh, yes, I suppose it is. Get out, please. Uh, Foster, I... Get out! <laughs> Marshall, what are you doing in here? And what are you doing with that gun? I've, uh, just been looking through Mr. Holliday's collection. He seems to have been quite a connoisseur of firearms. This is a fine gun here. Yes. Now, will you be good enough to put it back where you got it? Uh, this, uh, wouldn't happen to be the gun that caused the accident, would it? I couldn't say. It has Mrs. Holliday's initials on it. Really? Oh, surely you should remember what... My memory is excellent, Mr. Marshall, thank you. And if it will help to satisfy your curiosity, yes, that was the gun used by Mrs. Holliday when the tragedy occurred. Well, how interesting. Perhaps this will interest you more. Mrs. Holliday and I are leaving this afternoon. Cedar Grove? Yes. And in regard to your purchase of the estate... Mm-hmm. What about it? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be rather tied up for the next few days... I doubt if I'll have the opportunity to draw you up a bill of sale, and so I thought you'd like to have your check back until we can work out the details. All right. Well, I'd better go along upstairs and get a few things together. 
I trust you've been able to have your car repaired. Uh, yes, yes, I have. Oh, and I noticed this morning that uh, you got yours out of storage. Yes, yes, I'll have to drive Mrs. Holiday. Well, drop back after the weekend, Mr. Marshall. I believe we'll have the house in order for you then. Oh, and uh, please don't forget to replace that gun before you leave. Goodbye. Goodbye, Foster. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Marshall. Open the door, please. I... It's very important. Please open the door. Quick. I, I can't. Lloyd locked it. I'll come around through the garden. Meet me at the window. All right. Can't you understand? I'm trying to help you. Cedar Grove is an asylum, you say. I'm not insane, am I? Oh, of course not. But he's a physician. He'll say things about you that, well, they'll be difficult to deny. Why would Lloyd want to do a thing like that to me? He's been so kind and understanding. <laughs> Except what? Well, some night he comes to my room and talks to me about Martin and the accident. I've asked him not to because, I don't know, I just go all to pieces. But Lloyd says it does me good to hear about it, but eventually it will make me forget. Is that why you screamed last night? Did I scream? Oh, I didn't know. I, I never know anything after he's finished talking. He talks about the dog barking and the way Martin looked. And, and then I can hear the shots again, just as though I... The shots? Yes. There was more than one shot? Oh, please, I can't. Mrs. Holliday. Mrs. Holliday, how many shots were there? Two. You're certain of that? Yes, yes. Do you have more than one gun with your initials on it? No. Were you using that particular gun at the time? Yes, yes, I was. Why do you... I was just looking at that gun. Only one barrel's been discharged. That was the shot I fired. You fired one shot, yet you heard two. Where was the other shot from? Oh, I don't know. Lloyd was standing. Lloyd. Where was he standing? Behind me, I think. How was your marksmanship, Mrs. Holliday? Well, I was just learning. It was my second time out. I see. May I use your telephone? I thought you'd gone. Well, I, I was waiting for you. I wanted to talk to you. I'm sorry, I haven't time. Mrs. Holliday and I are late now. I see you've taken that gun down again. Will you kindly put it back? Uh, not just yet. You know, I have a suspicion. Oh, it's only a suspicion, you understand, that, that this may not have been the gun after all that caused the untimely death of Mr. Holliday. Mr. Marshall, I'd like to stay and chat with you, but... And then again, there's the possibility that Mr. Holliday's untimely death wasn't untimely at all. Well, that's very interesting, I'm sure. And now, Mr. Marshall, if you will forgive me, I'm afraid I must Only be one barrel's been discharged from this gun. There's another shot left. You wouldn't happen by any chance to be threatening me. I might be. Dr. Foster, I believe you killed Martin Holliday. Well, of all the ridiculous... Mrs. Holliday tells me two shots were fired. She only fired one of the shots. Who fired the other? Mrs. Holliday is not responsible for what she said. Perhaps made. you might give her a soda tablet to help her remember. How did you... Perhaps you might reconstruct the accident for her every detail. Remind her the way Martin Holliday looked after he was shot. Really, Mr. Marshall, you don't think... I don't think anything, Foster. I'm going to leave that to the police. The police? They're on their way here now. Oh, I see... You've been quite thorough about this thing, haven't you? I hope so. Huh. Well, in as much as I'm being held captive, would it meet with your approval if I smoked? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, do you happen to have a match? Here you are. Thank you again. Tell me, Mr. Marshall, with your evidence, do you believe the police will be able to um, convict me of murder? I think so. Well, that's odd. So do I. You... You did kill Holiday? I'm afraid so. Why? It's rather a long story. Well, we... We have plenty of time. All right. This house here... It was once mine. I built it. Every dollar I could get my hands on went into the building of it. The library, the collections, everything. I bought them. 
By the time it was finished, most of my money was gone, but I had what I wanted. Something I'd worked all my life for, the Foster House. It was mine, every inch of it. The only thing I'd ever owned. Then I met Martin Holliday. He was in charge of a stock and bond company. We became great friends. I had a little money. The market was doing exceptionally well at the time. And he advised you to yes. invest? Yes. I used my savings to buy some shares of stock at his suggestion. The stock failed. Martin assured me I'd be able to recover my losses if I bought on margin. I took his advice. Borrowed on my house and everything in it. But to no avail, the stock was worthless. How did he come to buy the house? He took it in exchange for my debts. My house. I was penniless and it hadn't cost him a thing. He stole the house from me. That's why I killed him. Uh, here, what are you doing, Foster? Give me that gun. Uh, no, Marshal. Stand back. There's one more shot, remember? Your cigarette. You've set fire to the draperies with it. Yes, a moment ago. And you're going to give that fire a chance, Marshal, do you hear? No. Let me put it out. Christina, help me. You can't stop it. Either of you. I'd rather see my house burn to the ground than let anyone else have it. Good be... In smoke. Yes, Norma. We've been lucky to escape. What's that? Oh, just a scrap of paper. But an idea for a story. A holiday house. By Norman Marshall. Oh, well, couldn't have been a very happy story anyway. Is that what you want to write about? Something with happiness in it? Yes. Where will you go to find it? I knew a place once, almost halfway around the world from where we are now. It's a beautiful place. The most beautiful I've ever seen. I'd like to show it to you. The fire? It's gone out? Yes. Forever. Come along, Christine. Please. Don't ever look back. Listening to Obsession. facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Murder, it's a gift. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Stange is my stock and trade. If you're ready to throw in the sponge without giving the deal another whirl, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear Mr. Valentine, no doubt you'll consider this transaction stale, flat, and unprofitable. I wish to bestow a beautiful and precious gift upon a member of my family, the worthiest one. The rare Wittenberg Bible. I want to see it bring to someone else the happiness it brought to me. You can help me. The address is 715 Warren Road. Kindly call Sunday morning when I can be sure all my little family will be at home. Signed, uh, Wesley Hart. Mm -hmm. Brooksy, when was the last time you did something ennobling and spiritual with your Sunday morning? You mean beside getting up before noon? Yeah, exactly what I mean. Now, here's a chance for both of us to make atonement come this Sabbath. 
So let's get up early and see that the right person does get Mr. Hart's rare and precious gift. Oh, but George, a father should know his own family. Which one is, to quote, the worthiest? Oh, you'd be surprised how often Papa knows very little about his own brood. Oh, maybe you're right. Hmm? The night of my first dance, my father did believe I was going out to get the milk instead of trying to tiptoe in with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Angel, you've had a lurid past. But seriously, we have a date for Sunday morning. Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, most people like to leave what they consider their fortune in a will to be used only after they die. That's the usual routine, Mr. Hart, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to be different. Uh, here, sit down, Miss Brooks. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, just how are you going to be different, Mr. Hart? I'm going to give someone my only treasured possession while I'm still alive, so I can see him enjoy it. Oh, that's a pretty fine notion. I believe you're a better citizen on Earth if you don't wait for your citizenship in heaven. Again, a happy notion, but... Uh... About this valuable Wittenberg Bible of yours, doesn't your family know it's going to be left to them? Not to which one, and not that I'm going to leave it to him right now. Oh. Uh, that's why I wrote to you, Mr. Valentine. I want you to investigate each one of them, look into their past. What's that? Well, now, surely in your own family you ought to know enough Early about... Early again this morning... I need some black coffee, Pops, and fast. Uh, what's the matter, son? You seem nervous. I wonder why. I can always run 50 balls in a game of straight pool, but last night my hands were shaking. And just when it would have really paid off. No, Sam, you shouldn't take your recreation so seriously. It's only a game of billiards. Only a game of... Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, oh, Sam, uh, uh, these are two friends of mine. They'll, they'll probably be staying here with us. Oh, oh but Sam, really... Well, that's well, Pops. If you can't get any food here before 10 o'clock, I'd better go in the kitchen and see if I can't make Edie give me some coffee. Yeah, you'd better do that, fella. If you expect to maneuver any ham and eggs to your mouth. What's that, mister? Just an observation. Oh. You must let that leave me cold so early in the morning. Why are you rushing off, Sam? You're your usual self, aren't you? Well, that's called a wonderful girl. You couldn't ask for a finer daughter. You came in even later than I did. Who was it? Did you make the grade? As a matter of fact, I... Well, at least I have you three for an audience. Oh, Carla, these are two friends of mine. They'll probably be staying here with us. Hello, Well, Carla. I don't... How delightful. Isn't anybody interested in the fast-talking gentleman who tried to convince me that under my strict and starchy nurse's uniform there beats the feminine heart? Oh, I'd love to hear all about it. As long as it's in the family. Uh, Carla's a nurse, you know. She spends all her life trying to take care of people. <laughs> Thank you, Fox. Anyway, this Casanova I was out with last night was the subtle type. He didn't just talk about fur coats and bracelets and stuff like that. He actually had them with him. <laughs> he was so amazed I don't play that way, Pop. <laughs> Good girl, Paula. See you at breakfast. Well, that's uh, quite a family you've got here, Mr. Hart. <laughs> yes, I don't think. Breakfast is ready, Mr. Hart. Uh, oh, Miss Purdy, uh, these are the two friends I told you about. Uh, how let's you... not go through that again, Brooks. Well, there's oh. room for them at the table. Now let's not waste any more time. Oh, of course. I know when you run a boarding house, everything must be on a schedule. Boarding house? You know I don't consider it that, Mr. Hart. You and the others are just paying guests. A proud woman, Miss Paddy. I always think of her as my sister, another member of my family, taking care of me when I'm not well, bringing me hot tea and... Hey, hey, just, uh, just a minute, Pops. Uh, yes? A wayward thought just occurred to me. If Miss Purdy, who runs this boarding house, is your sister, perhaps those other two characters are unrelated to you in the same way. Oh, oh did you think we were related by blood ties? Well, now, I... I wonder where we could have picked up that wild notion. I see what you mean, Miss Brooks. Oh, I'm not really related to any one of these people, but living with them for these last three years, shedding their hopes and frustrations, I've begun to think of them as my own flesh and blood. Oh, that's just fine. Perhaps that is hard to understand, young man, but when you're alone in the world and as old as I am, you sort of need that sense of belonging, of having a family. Oh, it's of course we understand. Yes, I guess we do. But uh, look, Mr. Hart, if there is no family, maybe there's also no Wittenberg Bible. So maybe we ought to call this a Sunday morning excursion. Oh, no, I had the bus. It's worth more than $20,000. I just had it appraised last week. Uh, 
Well, there aren't any more members of the family, are there, Mr. Hart? No, just these three. Uh, but, Mr. Valentine, you will do this for an old man, won't you? Well, uh, I... Miss Purdy has two vacant rooms. You and Miss Brooks can stay on his borders. <laughs> of course, I'll be careful. Mr. Hart, please. Let's just to say. All right, Doc, that's the win. I don't like to go to work on an empty stomach. I've been watching you the last few days, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, I know, Cora. I wouldn't be a man if I weren't aware of it. Let's be ready to be nice. You make things easy for yourself. All you have to do is ask me. Well, let's clamp down on the double talk. What's on your mind? Everybody in this house knows why you and that girl are here. All right, suppose you can. Pop's hired you to find out which one of us three should get the bottle after he dies. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a general mm-hmm. idea. But I didn't think we discussed it over a public address system. Oh, you get around. Or haven't you ever lived in a rooming house? Anyway, uh, here's a hint. Uh-huh. The maiden... Antoinette Purdy, our esteemed landlady. The date? January the 3rd, 1949. Look it up in the papers. What you'll find may not make you healthier or wealthier. Yeah, I know. But it will make me wiser. Okay, I'll take you up on that, sir. Miss Brooks. Yes, sir? Let's hope we can pass along to Valentine. Cora Steele Nurse is an awful starts up to be. He's also quite a girl, and he knows it. All right, so Cora always ends up one step ahead of the world. What about it? Nothing. But one of them to work on that angle. It may pay off. Mr. Valentine, one can't run a guest house without getting to know a great deal about one's guest. Yeah, I know what you mean, Miss Freddy. In your business and mine, it only makes good sense to keep your eyes and ears open. You never heard it from me, Mr. Valentine. But there's a parole officer downtown by the name of John Higgins. Why don't you talk to him about Sam Keith? Yeah, it's surprising, isn't it, Angel, how much information you can get when people are so happy to supply it about someone else? Yeah, and such choice information. Miss Purdy is really Mrs. Herdine, whose husband died on January 3rd, 1929. The verdict of accidental poisoning was never completely satisfactory to anybody. And Mrs. Herdine was not only acquitted, but inherited this rooming house, among other things. And our friend Sam Keith was involved in a small-time robbery when he was only 18. Spent three years in jail for it. Which may account for the young man's bitterness. And Cora, the only blank mark against her is having too many boyfriends. Well, as far as I know, no state in the Union has declared being human a crime. Well, we may as well tell Pops what we found out and let him decide what he wants to do. Good. Confidentially, darling, I've been thinking yearningly of my little apartment. Yes, I just wasn't made for a rooming house. Uh-huh. In fact, I often think I really belong in a suburban cottage with a white picket fence running all around it. Not to mention children doing the same thing. <laughs> well, with everything running around like that, it doesn't look like there's going to be any room for me. Oh, you're just reeking with sentiment today, aren't you? Valentine, I want to talk to you. Sure, Sam, I'm always available. You don't mind if I try to kill you, do you? <laughs> oh, I might protest slightly. Well, that's what I'm going to do if you tell Pops anything about oh, me. Oh, now, take it easy, kid. Sam, don't be a fool. Okay, Brooksy, stay where you are. Oh, you've been looking me up, Valentine, and I don't like it. If it's not the parole officer, it's you or somebody else. Well, I don't have to live that way, hunted like an animal, just because I, I made a mistake. Nobody's hunting you, Sam. Slow down, will you? Don't tell me what to do. I'm telling you. George, I... don't. He doesn't know what he's doing. I'm sorry, this is self-defense, Brooksy. Oh. oh. All right, all right. Come on, kid. Let me help you up. Put your hands off me. I don't want to do that. Now, you better put something on that chin. Don't pamper me, bud. I know how to take care of myself. You better learn to do that, too, the next time. Well, things happen in this rooming house, don't they? Yeah, Brooksy. Hey, let's get through with the benevolent Mr. Hart before Miss Purdy decides to slip us a poisonous Mickey Finn so she can keep her secret. It's 
seems I did know a lot of things about my little family. Well, Mr. Hart, when you start digging, you can find the darndest things about the smallest family. And the facts we gave you this afternoon are those you hired us to find out. So we just came up to your room to say goodbye. Uh, one more favor, young man. What's that? I got the Bible out of the safe deposit box. Here it is. Yeah? I made up my mind. Who gets it? I wrote the name on the flyleaf. Well, I'll be honest enough to admit I'm curious. I'm more than curious, Mr. Hart. Well, what do you want me to do? Stay here just a little while longer. Uh, till tonight. Uh, you see, each one of them, Miss Purdy, Cora, Sam, knows that you've looked them up and told me all about them. Well? Well, what they don't know is that the lucky one doesn't have to wait till I'm dead. I'm going to present the Bible tonight at dinner. Okay, we'll stick around, Alan. Thank you. Here, Mr. Valentine, take this Bible, but promise me you won't open it till dinner tonight. If that's the way you want it. I'm going to shave, change my clothes, take a bath. I, I want to look my best for this very important day in my life. Something's happened to Mr. Hart. What? what are you talking about, Sam? Come up here and see yourself. He's dead. Dead? But how could he be? We just left him a little while ago. He's there in the bathtub, Valentine. Look at him. Lying there like that. Yeah, stay out here in the hall, Brooks. Yes, George. I came in here to shave. I, I didn't know Pops was here. Then I saw him. Yeah. He's dead, brother. All right, dead. The one thing you don't want to be from the day you're born. But there's no sign of a struggle. And just six inches of water in the tub. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about safety. If you're planning a trip, better get those worn tires inspected tomorrow at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. That's where you'll find your best value, Atlas Tires, famous for giving more mileage and safer mileage. Besides having more rubber to grip the road and a road-tested design for safer stops, Atlas Tires give you greater riding comfort, too. And each new Atlas passenger tire is backed by a written warranty. For a whole year, this warranty covers damage to the tire from ordinary road hazards and guarantees the materials and workmanship for the life of the tire. Best of all, your Atlas Tire Warranty is honored by 38,000 dealers coast to coast and in Canada seven days a week. For safer, better driving, go on Atlas Tires. And for expert tire care, rely on standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, a good and pious man decides to leave his one valuable possession, a rare Wittenberg Bible, to the person most worthy of it. Furthermore, he wants to leave this legacy while he's still alive, so he can share in the happiness of the one who receives it. That's the plan, but this good and pious man is found dead. Which leads to all kinds of questions. Questions which annoy you no end if you're anything like George Valentine. You see, you're not too sure you're getting the right answer. Valentine, there's only one answer. The one the medical examiner gives. Well, now look, I don't want to be a character, Lieutenant, but suppose I don't go along with that conclusion. Well, then, Pally Chum, you can just go please, and... Please, please, Lieutenant, don't be too specific in your direction. Huh? Well, I'll just leave what I mean to your imagination. Now, I have every respect for the medical examiner, and I can't tell you just why I'm being stubborn. But I think Wesley Hart was murdered. Well, now at least everything is out in the open. Valentine, maybe the good doctor used words that are too big for you. Suppose I break them down. Yeah, do that for me, will you? Wesley Hart was a hale and hearty old fellow, as sound as a russet apple. Remember, I met the gentleman first, Lieutenant. No one could drown a man like that in a half a tub of water without him putting one heck of a scrap. Why, you'd have to hold his head under for quite some time, you know. George, just on general principles, I'd like to be on your side. But there were no signs of a struggle at all. No water on the floor, no scratches, no bruises. Yeah, I know. It's just like the doc says. The old boy either faded or he had a heart attack when he sat down in the tub. All this excitement about him giving away that Bible at dinner tonight. Uh, but still, the timing was so bad, Riley. That's what keeps bothering me. Well, he'll live through it. Now, let me have that Bible. We'll find out whose name's on the fly leaf. Give it to him and call this case closed. 
Would you still do that if I proved this was murder? Ah, for Pete's sake. There he goes again, Miss Brooks. Well, don't look at me. I've always told you it was stubborn. Oh, may I come in, Lieutenant? Ah, sure, sure, Miss Purdy. The sergeant outside said you might be here some time, so I took the liberty of making some coffee. Oh, well, thank you. fine. Glad somebody feels fine. I feel lower than anything you can name. I was merely using a figure of speech, Miss Steele. Here you are, Lieutenant. Maybe I would feel you, so Brian. rotten about Pops if I weren't a nurse. Well, there's nothing you could have done about it, Cora. Well, I was home in my room. Pops had only cried out, made any kind of noise. I'd have been there to help him. But he's gone so quickly, I... I don't understand it. Mr. Hart was a truly good man, Lieutenant. He trusted everybody. I could never teach him to keep the door to his room closed. Okay, Miss Birdie, we're all sorry about the old gentleman. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter with us, Lieutenant? We must be slowing down. What are you talking about? Yes, George, what is it? It just hit me like a sneak punch with brass knuckles. I'd like to try an experiment, Lieutenant. What kind of an experiment? Well, now, ordinarily, I'm not an exhibitionist. But if I could get into a pair of swimming trunks... Swimming trunks? ...and into a tub half full of water, I think I may be able to prove a very important point. Okay, that does it. I think that's the about amount of water heart drowned in. I should say so, Oh, yeah. you better hurry up, George, or you'll catch cold. <laughs> Sam's swimming trunks are a little snug on me. Don't we no. get to see this remarkable experiment, Lieutenant? You people stay out there in the hall. We've got a full house as it is. Okay, Johnny Weissmuller. Let's see what's on your mind. The same old thing, Lieutenant. Murder. All right, all right. Come on, let's see you drown yourself. Well, I gotta have some help, Lieutenant. <laughs> Glad to oblige. Name your person. I think I could use Sam. Oh, Mr. Keith, will you come in here, please? What do you want with me? What's this supposed to prove? You don't mind cooperating with the law, do you, Sam? No, but I don't like being framed, either. Mustn't be so suspicious, friend. I just want you to do a little job. Yeah? Yeah. Now, lean over the tub. That's right. I'll lie down like this. And when I give you the signal, pull my feet up suddenly with a jerk. Keep them up. This is a screw. Do as you're told. Okay, now. Well, you can come out from under the water now, darling. Hey, what is this? Valentine. Put his feet down, you fool. Sure, George. I, dude, just he's out like George. a George. Here, come on, give me a hand. Give me your hand. Get him out of this tub. Hey, nurse, get in here and hurry up. He ought to be coming out of it in a minute. Maybe we still ought to call the emergency squad, Lieutenant. Oh, he'll be okay now. Oh, I hope so. What happened? He certainly couldn't have drowned in a few seconds like that. He was out to set a new world's record. <clears throat> Got him breathing regularly now. Oh, George? I still heard him. He, he told me to do it. It was Valentine's own idea. Oh. And you sure went at it with a right good will, Sam. Oh. Are you all right, George? <sighs> isn't, isn't this the spot where I'm supposed to say, where am I? Here, fella. Get up. Come on, uh, come on. I'll give you a hand. Oh, that's... Oh, uh, that worked a little too well, didn't it? Is that what happened to Mr. Hart, George? Yeah, but with him it really worked right, Booksy. Then that poor old man was murdered. And after all, Mr. Valentine means one of us to do this, How well you read my mind, Cora? It's just like putting a finger on me because I got in trouble one oh, Quiet, all of you. Listen to me. This was murder, all right. And Valentine, while Miss Steele was working on you, I called up the medical examiner. And... Under the hair on the back of Mr. Hart's head, there's a slight bruise. They couldn't see it at first. You've got an exact duplicate, Valentine, when you hit your head on the bottom of the tub. Okay, I'll take your word for it, Lieutenant. But that's not what knocked me out. What do you mean, It was the water suddenly rushing up my nostrils that knocked me out. Better than any left hook. Well, uh... And if Sam continued to hold my feet up in the air a while longer, I would have drowned without making a sound and without a struggle. Yeah. And the three of you were all home when the old man was taking his bath. Yes, Lieutenant Riley, and, but I... And, uh, Miss Purdy, you yourself mentioned his cute little habit of not locking doors behind him. You all would have known that. Well, but Lieutenant, I'd Sorry. like a word with you alone. Okay. Sergeant? Yes, Lieutenant. Take these good people downstairs and keep them amused. I'll be right there. 
Oh, now. Now, before we do anything else, Valentine, let's go and take a good look at that Bible. The person whose name is on that fly leaf certainly has a motive. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to talk to you about. Lieutenant, let's not look at it. Not until we're all seated around the dinner table. What? May I express my amazement, too? Well, that's the way the old fellow had it planned. Why not carry out that last wish? You mean just out of sentiment? Half and half, Brooksy. Half sentiment and half the satisfaction of seeing a murderer put his own neck in a noose. I can't say I'm enjoying this meal. Why, I think it's delicious, Cora. Compliments to the cook, Miss Purdy. Hardly the time for light conversation, Miss Brooks. Mm, sorry. Look, Lieutenant. Yes, Sam? You having trouble digesting your food, too? If you think you've got anything on me, do something about it. I've got a date. I want to leave. I think the pool room will still be there. Sit down. All right, folks, we can get to the point now. Thank you, but not too much. All of you know that Mr. Hart had decided to leave this Bible to one of you. A decision he reached mostly on the basis of my investigations. Don't you mean you're snooping, Mr. Valentine? When you get paid for it, Miss Purdy, it becomes investigation. <laughs> Your moral support is highly appreciated. Anyway, this afternoon, Mr. Hart removed this Bible from the safe deposit box and placed it in his bureau drawer. While he was taking his bath, you all had a chance to go in there and see whose name is on the flyleaf. Yeah, uh, once again, the little matter of leaving doors open. Well, right now, the lieutenant and I are going to take a look at it. You see, ironically enough, the lucky beneficiary is going to be saddled with a fat, juicy motive. He's going to get one hefty shove toward the gas chamber. An assist from beyond the grave, you might uh, call it. Well put, lieutenant. Now, suppose we have a look-see. So, wait a minute. Yes, Cora? Just because Pops decided to leave it to me, or to any one of us, it doesn't mean we'd kill him for it. What right do you have to assume that? Hey, our Lieutenant, you can read the inscription. Okay. <clears throat> uh, after careful thought, I give this Wittenberg Bible to the person for whom it can do the most good. I give it with all my love to Sam. That's not true. He'd never leave it to me. He knew all about me being in jail that time. You told him, Valentine. You found out all about me. Well, don't all of you look at me that way. I like the old guy, and I kind of think he liked me. Save it, Sam. Save it. We'll have a lot of time to talk about that. If you're making the trip downtown, Lieutenant, why not take along the right person? Right what do you mean? Person. I mean you, Cora. Me? Just what do you have against me, Mr. Valentine? Nobody could have seen that Bible today after I came home with Pops. I never left it out of my sight. Well, what of it? But Cora was so sure it was left to her, she began to protest. A little too quickly and much too much. That's right. We didn't hear Miss Purdy or Sam say a word. You gave us the motive after all, Cora. Oh, really? You naturally thought the only one to whom Mr. Hart in all his saintliness would leave his precious Bible would be you. Miss Purdy and Sam had blemishes on their past. Well, you're just guessing. You can't... As a nurse who's given plenty of baths to her patients, you'd know how a little deal like this would work. Just because I'm a nurse, that doesn't Miss Purdy mean... isn't strong or young enough to kill in just that way. Well, what about Sam? It was his name in that Bible. That's why I chose him for that little experiment. He wouldn't have done it so efficiently if it meant tipping his mitt. Well, you seem at a loss for words, Miss Steele. But uh, that makes sense. Yes, Cora. It could only have been you. <laughs> Now, let me get this straight, Sam. This Wittenberg Bible is worth what most people would consider a small fortune. Just the same, Valentine. I'm not going to sell it. I'm just going to hang on to it. Well, the money might be the thing to put you back on your feet, Sam. It's worth more than that, Miss Brooks, knowing that a man like Pops had faith in me. I thought people stopped passing that stuff out. That's what was keeping me behind the eight ball. Well, I suppose now you'll be thinking of getting married. Maybe, but... First, I guess I'll have to, well, make good. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it doesn't always work, Sam. I've been trying to make good with George for a long time. And just look. What? <laughs> Never mind, Sam. Uh, that's a private joke. How many women drivers do you think there are in the West? One million? Two million? Well, conservative estimates tell us there are two and a half million in California alone. With so many women driving in western states, let's hear what one of them says about RPM motor oil. There's Mrs. Jerome Barline of Spokane, Washington, and she says, quote, I don't know much about cars, but I do know I haven't had to spend one cent for repairs since I started using RPM, unquote. And from that, I'd say Mrs. Barline knows plenty about car operation. Other users of compounded RPM motor oil say they have gone seven and eight years without engine repairs. That's not so surprising when you know that RPM actually fights off your car's worst enemy, internal engine rust. It stops carbon trouble, too, clings to engine hot spots, and prevents bearing corrosion. So why not give your car a new lease on life starting tomorrow? Get your crankcase drained and refilled with RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George off on another case, starting with a letter that reads... Dear Mr. Valentine... Any sane person knows that a room can't murder a man. Yet after living in a certain room, I have a definite feeling that's what's going to happen to me. I need your help. So meet me at Farewell Lodge as soon as possible. Signed, Burton Hilliard. Next Monday night, another case for George Valentine. The Room That Killed. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Pedro de Cordoba as Hart, Don Diamond as Sam, Betty Lou Gerson as Cora, and Ann O'Neill as Miss Purdy. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Her announcer, John Easton. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. This Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. The best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's the big show. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of the case of the dear dead lady with that brilliant eccentric private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs>
Nero Wolf had just come downstairs, having tended to his precious orchids. He was, as usual, seated in the library, which served as the office. He had just dialed a phone number, and with his eyes closed, was leaning back in his specially built chair, which was big enough for two, but not two of him. Market, domestic and imported delicacies. Mr. Halsbrecher, this is Nero Wolf. Oh, oh, yeah, Mr. Wolf. I was just about to ring you. Well, when... I have need of two pounds of duck liver. Uh, I do not, of course, refer to the commercialized Strasbourg pate. Well, I appreciate the order, Mr. Wolf, but... Uh... Next, my cook, Fritz, informs me that we require three fine fat geese. Look, Mr. Wolf, there's a little matter of an unpaid... You bill. might add 12 cases of beer, a bushel of Vermont apples, green for stuffing, and a gallon of Marquisa Patrisa Roman oil. Mr. Wolf. In addition, I... Fritz has listed six dozen eggs, four braces of Sussex woodcock, and a few pounds of Westphalian ham. You have all that? Well, I, I can get it, Mr. Wolf, but my bookkeeper... Thanks te- very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Now. <clears throat> now then, Archie. Yes, boss? You seem to be worried. Oh, I am. This means naturally that I'm supposed to handle Halsbracker's delivery boy when and if he shows. I had thought of leaving that simple matter to you. And what about the simple matter of the money? Money? I I hate to bring up a vulgar subject, but where is it coming from? Oh, of course. You're right, Archie. I should have said... Said what? Charge it. Boss, look, you don't realize, I know, but we're into that truffle broker for 500-odd bucks and change. All right. All right. Then give him a check. Okay. Okay, I will give him a check. And I hope they'll let you keep the orchids in your cell. You're a wit, Archie. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I'm on the bank's mailing list. We got a notice this morning. You don't mean... Oh, but I do. Again? Yeah, you just can't take money out of an account, boss. Sometimes you got to put some in. This is the only way to deal with the man I work for, and if I hadn't thrown him that scare, he wouldn't have been willing to listen when the door buzzer rang. And a prosperous-looking young guy in the kind of clothes that don't grow on trees came in and stood in front of the boss's chair, fiddling with the brim of his pork pie. My name is Oliphant, Mr. Wolf. Oliphant? Uh, Yes, sir, Oliphant. I am the spiritual leader and guiding head of a small religious group known as the Seekers of the Inner Power. Ah, I see. Also a man addicted to marrying neither wisely nor well, but often. You read the papers. I do. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I am as aware of my sin-ridden past as anyone else is. The point is that I'm no longer that kind of man. Even a person such as I can see the light in time. Good. Might I ask why you've come to see me, Mr. Oliphant? I need your help, Mr. Wolf. Concerning? A certain young lady with whom I'm deeply in love. Oh, I beg you not to confuse the present emotion with any of my earlier escapades. What I feel for Miss Dana is the pure and righteous glow of an upright seeker of the inner power. I promise to look on you as thoroughly redeemed, Mr. Oliver. Proceed. Oh, by the way, do I recognize the name of your young lady as a Park Avenue socialite, an amateur swimming champion? Yes. Oh, but she's sweet, wonderful, beautiful. I've asked her to marry me, and she's given me some hope. In time, I fully expect to make her my wife. Well, then where's the problem? The problem is the presence of another man in her life. I'm sorry, sir. I'm a detective, not a matchmaker. This isn't a question of making a match, Mr. Wolf. I have much too much respect for your talents to think of offering you such an assignment. Exactly. What do you want me to do? I want you to save Ilsa Dana's life. Her life? Mr. Wolf, this other man I spoke of is insanely jealous. Not only of Ilsa's present, but of her past as well. He has threatened to kill her. I don't doubt your earnestness in this matter, Mr. Oliphant, but how would you know... I was listening on an extension in Miss Dana's apartment a few days ago when Hunter called. Hunter? Yes, sir. Jack Hunter. Known as Jack the Babe Hunter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know that canvas back. Huh? Sure. He's a coffee and cake prelim waltz. Oh, he's not. He's a boxer. Archie is being fancy. Overlook it, Mr. Oliphant. Is Hunter in love with this lady of yours? I doubt it. He's a man of complete moral and spiritual corruption, I believe. Naturally, you would. But what are the facts? In my opinion, he's after her for her money. She has money? To burn. And you, Mr. Oliphant? Me. Can you also afford to burn? How much do you want? The answer to that would be astronomical. 
However, if you leave a check for, say, $7,000, I shall look into your matter the very moment I have completed a little research into the nutrition of the Polynesian orchid. Elephant's check gave our bank account a slight blood transfusion. I think it was the boss's plan to spend a week or two in the plant room before he got busy on the case. And he'd have done it, too, if that phone call hadn't come in about a little after nine, just after Wolf had polished off one of Fritz's dinners and was settling back with a stein of beer in his hand. Don't disturb yourself, Archie. I'll get it. Now, well, look out. You don't strain yourself, boss. You got to straighten out an elbow to reach that receiver. You have an unfortunate flair for mixing humor with impertinence, my friend. Hello, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Elsa Dana, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, Miss Dana? We were discussing you only this morning. So I've heard. Through whom? Ted Oliphant. I see. The young man seemed to be quite worried about you. The young man should tend to his own affairs. He said you were in some danger. I know what he said. And not one word of it was true. Oh? Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure it'd be an immense pleasure. Where do you live? I have an apartment at uh, 22 Blanton Street. Could you be here soon? I could be there in a quarter of an hour, Miss Dana. By proxy, of course. The proxy, naturally, was yours truly. Ten minutes later, at twenty past nine, I walked up to Ilsa Dana's door with a nosy elevator boy giving me the double O. The reason for his interest was that her door was open and the room inside was empty except for a little twisted pile of pale pink satin, which at close range turned out to be a woman. Which woman turned out to be Ilsa Dana? And Ilsa Dana was dead. She used to be pretty. She isn't now. Yeah, strangulation doesn't help any girl's look, son. Make anything of it? Well, the position of her body and the bloodstains on her pointed fingernails... Tells me that she put up a tough struggle before somebody succeeded in smothering with a pillow from the sofa over there. Yeah, that figures. When did it happen, I wonder? Yeah, the last 15 minutes, I'd guess. Say, who's been up in the elevator this evening? Nobody for her. Well, somebody came up. Well, who says not? They could have used the stairs, you know. Yeah. How well do you know Miss Dana? I know exactly zero about Miss Dana. How could you write her up and down every day and know nothing about her? It's a rule of the house to keep your mouth shut. The rule also goes when being questioned by a cop. A cop? Who's a cop? Oh, I guess you're a cello player from the Philharmonic. Look, I happen to work for a guy named Nero Wolf. Oh. Heard of him? Maybe. Well, if your memory comes alive, son, I might see my way clear to uh, spend a few dollars with you. Understand? I'll keep you in mind. Going down, mister? I spent time trying to get sense out of the superintendent and a set of chambermaids, but they were as quiet as a ballpark on Christmas Eve. Then I called the cops and told them about Oliphant and Hunter. By the time I got home, the house was dark and Nero Wolf was sleeping. Next morning, I gave him the details while he drank three bottles of beer. When I finished, he sat for a long time and then started another bottle. The prize fighter. What about the prize fighter, Archie? Hunter? Well, I, I phoned the hotel he lives in before you got up. And? They told me he wasn't in. Hmm. You know, I begin to think that Mr. Oliphant brought us a more absorbing case than he suspected. You know, I'm glad you like it. I don't like it. I don't like work of any variety. But this thing has its points. Well, what do we do next? Next, we investigate my client. What? Merely because a reformed playboy employs a detective doesn't exempt him from suspicion, Archie. Oh, now who's that? I'm afraid we have no choice but to open the door and see. My name is Young. Basto Young. It's nice meeting you, Mr. Young. What do you want? I want to see Nero Wolf. About? uh, About a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. What? Will you repeat that? I want to see Mr. Wolf about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. Mm -hmm. Her name, please? Ilsa Dana. Is it possible that you entertain plans of making her your wife? Why, I... Yes, but uh, there's a problem involved. Another man? Uh, Yes. Well, do come in. Do come in. I think we've been waiting for you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Here's another one. Ah, 
Mr. Wolf. You've come to me about Miss Ilsa Dana, sir? I have come to you, more specifically, about a man who has threatened her life. Hmm. How unusual. He's the treacherous kind. Mild-mannered, you know. As we say in my profession, he underplays it. Your profession, then, is the stage. It is, sir. Go on, you interest me deeply. I was present recently when he told her that he would certainly kill her unless she mended her sinful ways. Sinful? No one denies that Ilsa has had, uh, shall we say, a checkered career. But the man's attitude is totally fanatical. What's his particular brand of fanaticism, Mr. Young? Theodore Oliphant is a religious maniac. Well, what do you know? He's come to give Theodore a bad report card. I don't understand. I, I've come to ask Mr. Wolf to prevent his murdering Miss Dana. Am I allowed a direct question, sir? Why, of course. Where were you between 9 and 9.20 p.m. last night? 9 and 9.20? Why do you ask? You said I was permitted a direct question. Oh, well, I was walking in the uh, park, as I remember. Do you make a habit of walking in the park? I have lately. I'm preparing for an important role in the forthcoming production. What's so important about last night? From your point of view, a great deal, sir. Well, what do you mean? Last night, Miss Ilsa Dana was murdered. What? Mr. Goodwin here discovered the body. No. I'm afraid I must insist, Mr. Young. Uh, oh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, are you accusing me of a... I have uh, accused you of nothing, my dear sir. Well, now, look, you're making a mistake. Oliphant killed her. You may be sure of that. I have your word. I know him. He was trying to reform her. I wanted to make her a devout follower of his cult, the Seekers of Power. I heard him tell her to her face that if she refused redemption, he would see to it that she didn't live on in her wickedness. You could produce other witnesses? Do you know... In your own smug way. You're as detestable a character as I have ever had. All right, all right. Let's everybody take five. Yeah? Gerald Wolf? He's busy. This is Archie Goodwin. You'll do, Goodwin. This is Jack the Babe Hunter. Oh? Uh, how are you? Great. Except the cops seem to want to talk to me about some murder fandango because as I get it, you name my name. You got it wrong. I doubt it. And I'm coming over there to set you straight. <laughs> Why'd you ring me in on this mess, Wolf? You knew the girl pretty well. Me and how many more? Besides, what time was she murdered? Last night, between 9 and 9.20. I see. So if you would inform the police where you were at the time, that should be that. Yeah. By the way, Mr. Hunter, where were you at the time? I don't see your badge, Wolf. I was only wondering. I haven't been near the Dana woman for over a month. But if you're really interested, I'll give you the name of the killer. Please do not keep us in suspense, Mr. Hunter. A couple of years back, Ilsa financed a guy in a big and lousy Shakespearean play that closed like a clam and nothing flat. Go on. It was money down the drain. The guy's got nerve. When he was in love with her, he figured she'd do anything for him. So he comes back to her to finance him again. This time in Hamlet, no less. I see. I don't have to tell you what a flop that would be. You needn't tell me the actor's name either. You know? Mr. Barstow Young just left here. Yeah? Well, he's your man, Wolf. He got so sore when she told him she wouldn't toss any more moolah into his broken-down career, he went off his rocker and tore it down. Your reason for thinking so? I met him on the street one day, and he started beefing to me with blood in his eyes. So I could do not to punch him. The results might have been less fatal if you'd followed your instincts, sir. Uh, I couldn't. Guy's built like a broomstick. He's weak as a cat. Get him once, he'd crack like dry plaster. I see. Mm -hmm. What's on your mind? This man you're accusing of Miss Stainer's murder, Mr. Hunter, he was very much in love with her. She was thinking about marrying him, he said. He said? Yes, he did. I heard him, too. He was talking through his skullcap. Ilsa wasn't going to marry anybody. No? No, she couldn't. Why couldn't she? Well... But she just couldn't, that's all. So long. Well, 
Now we got a perfect circle with everybody pointing at everybody else and nobody able to prove a thing. What Hunter says isn't impossible, Archie. You think Young did it? I don't think at all yet. But if there's anything more dangerous than a woman scorned, it's an actor scorned. We have another visitor. Yeah, who are you expecting? At this point, anybody. Hi. Oh, you. Yeah, I told you you might hear from me. Come on in. Who's this? A uh, fellow runs the elevator at 22 Blanton Street. What do you got for me, kid? Postcard. Postcard? Yeah, the cops missed it, but I spotted the edge stuck under a rug. Nice of you to have delivered it. Or maybe he was just being curious. Curious? It's not every elevator boy who has a chance to see Nero Wolf in the flesh. Oh, him? <laughs> Come off it, High Pockets. I'm here because you mentioned something about spending a few bucks. Oh. I wouldn't cross the street to see the best gumshoe that ever breathed. Look, gumshoes don't breathe, and how would you like a sock? Archie, a... pay him and let him go. Yeah, pay me and let me go. Sure, Mr. Wolf. Here you are. Thanks. Don't mention it. Anytime, pal. Anytime. How do you like that fresh little punk? Archie, the lad has done us nobly. Yeah? A typewritten card addressed to Miss Ilsa Dina. Well, what's it say? Rather peculiar message. Have you prayed tonight? It's signed with the single letter O. Have you prayed tonight? Yes. Signed O? Exactly. Weird, isn't it? Well, what's weird about it? What could be plainer? Have you prayed tonight? Now, I ask you, who is the man in this deal who's interested in praying? All of us, I hope, are God-fearing. All right, all right. But I ask you again, what does O stand for? It could stand for O'Brien, Obituary, Omaha. What about Oliphant? Oliphant, too. Uh, wh what's with this indifference? The case is cracking and you slough it off. You remember what Young said? Oliphant threatened to kill her because she wouldn't join that cockeyed movement of his. Don't exhaust yourself, Archie. We have a hard night ahead. Yes, but I don't understand. But I don't mean to stifle your imagination, my friend. But if you'd reserve your deductions for a little while, you could lend me some much-needed assistance. What do you want? I want you to become a burglar. A burglar? I want you to hurry over to the dead woman's apartment on Branton Street and ransack it. For what? How do I know? We need help. Anything may help us. Go through the place with a fine tooth comb. I tore the late Miss Dana's apartment to shreds, but I saw nothing. Then, just as I was about to give it up as a bum job, I noticed a little writing desk in the living room. Pride loosed the lock and spotted something among a pile of papers that belonged to no well to do flat. It was a pawn ticket, lot 8N046. And the address was a pawn shop around the corner on 6th Avenue. It wasn't more than 90 seconds later that I walked into the joint and tossed the ticket across the counter. Oh, oh yeah, this, uh, want to redeem it. And fast, up, Pops? Yeah, it's nothing that's worth much, mister. No? No. Oh, what is it? This small steel filing box. Oh. Anything in it? I don't know. Come to me locked, never been able to get it open. We got it open, Wolf and I. Smashed the front end with a poker. There were some odds and ends inside. Old earrings, some thumbtacks, a cigarette lighter. Just trash. Then the boss stuck his fingers in and pulled out a plum. This is it. What do you mean, this is it? You fail to recognize this classic document? Huh? A marriage license, Archie. A marriage license. Yeah, well, whose marriage license? The wording is self-explanatory. Listen. This is to certify, etc., etc., thus licensing on this third day of May, 1946, the marriage of Miss Ilsa Dana to Mr. Johan Jaeger. Johan Jaeger? Exactly. Well, who in the world is Johan Jaeger? Well, you'll soon see. I don't get it. I can understand. It's a befuddling little puzzle. It'll be very easy for one to make a fatal mistake here. But, of course, you won't. I won't. Three hours later, I'd herded all the suspects into the office, and he sat in his chair and glared at them. Oliphant, Young, and Hunter. It was tense and tight, and the boss let it stay that way, saying not a word to anybody while he calmly sipped his beer. It was Oliphant who cracked first. I didn't kill Ilsa. I couldn't have. Jealousy is a very compelling motive, Mr. Oliphant. And you came to me, remember, complaining that there was another man in Ilsa Dana's life? Whatever I complained about, and, and jealous as I was, 
I didn't kill her as the sacred power as my holy judge. Being unacquainted with your sacred power, I'd have to ask you for a better authority. Sacred power? Oh, it simply wouldn't have been possible for me to have done it. Why not? Yeah, why not? Because I... I was at Mickey's Night Owl Club last night from 7 until 4 a.m. Contemplating the sacred power, no doubt. That can be proved, Mr. Oliphant? Let me call now. Let the head waiter tell you. Hmm. Well, you take your embarrassment as an indication that you're telling the truth. Hey, wait a minute. You you can't let him off like that. Don't be bothersome, Archie. Yeah, but we got that card he wrote, the one about have, have you prayed tonight, signed with his initial. He didn't write that card, Archie. Now, look. And the O is not his initial. Is it, Mr. Barstow Young? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand. On the contrary, I am afraid you do. But for the record, I'll explain. Oh, Archie. Yes, boss? Hand Mr. Young that large red volume off the shelf behind Mr. Hunter's head. This one? That one, thank you. Now then, Mr. Young, you will favor me by opening the volume to page 1133. But why? Open it, sir. Good. You are now count six lines down from the top and read what you see. Impossible. Have you prayed tonight? Thank you, Mr. Yang. What the devil is going Mr. on? Mr. Yang has just given us a reading from a tragedy. The line, have you prayed tonight, is spoken by the hero to the heroine just before he murders her. The name of the heroine is Desdemona. And the hero, as I'm sure you all know, is Othello. Othello. Yeah, the O was not Oliphant, Archie. Othello, I think, was a Shakespearean play which Miss Dana financed for our Mr. Young. And knowing she would recognize the quotation as well as the threat behind it, he sent it to her to warn her that he meant to murder her. You won't have the unmitigated gall to deny that, will you, Mr. Young? No. No, I don't deny it. Do I call the police? But I didn't kill her. The fact that I sent the car doesn't mean I killed her. Well, it'll do for my money. But not for mine, Archie. What? Mr. Young couldn't have killed Miss Dana. Why not? Because he lacks the strength to strangle such a healthy young woman, a champion athlete. Wide awake and full of fight. He's rather a frail person, as we know. And smothering Miss Dana with that pillow was no easy task. She struggled. Therefore, she clawed the wrists of the murderer. I'm sure that if you examine Mr. Young's wrists, you will find no scratches or scars. Here, let me see that. Go ahead. Well, Archie? Ah, you're right. Nothing. I was sure there wouldn't be. The person who actually killed Miss Dana was a powerful physical specimen. Yeah? Yes, Mr. Hunter. In all probability, a professional athlete. A muscular man in good condition. You pointing at me? Seems quite likely, doesn't it? You're out of your head. Am I? Yeah. Yes, Sir Dana. Var ihr Frau? Nicht wahr? Jawohl. I... I mean... You said yeah, Mr. Hunter. And you meant yeah, yes. I asked you in German if Elsa Dana was your wife, and you in the heat of emotion answered me yes in your mother tongue. Look, what's going on here? Allow me to present Mr. Johann Jaeger, Archie. Him? I've known it since we first saw that marriage license. You see, Jack Hunter is the English translation of our friend's real name back in Germany. Where he comes from, Mr. Johann Jaeger. Oh, what do you know? So you proved nothing. Yeah, I was married to Ilsa. That's why I said she couldn't marry anybody else. But I didn't kill her. She was my wife. I loved her. Olivan told us you were insanely jealous of her. What if he did? You know better. Do we? Sure you do. You also told yourself over the phone that every word Olivan said was a lie. Interesting. What is? How you could possibly know what Ilsa Dana told me over the phone. I haven't mentioned it to you or anybody else. Oh, well... Well, you see... It... I see most clearly, Mr. Yeager... That you must have been in the apartment with her listening on the extension phone, or you couldn't possibly have that information. And it was only a few minutes after that telephone call that Ailsa Dana was smothered to death. And I see it's about time I said good night. Wait a minute, Jaeger. Wait a minute. Good work, Archie. I advise you to sit still, Mr. Johan Jaeger Hunter. I was right. I told you he threatened to kill her. But why? I've only guessed at the story. Reconstructed it, so to say. But I think you and Mr. Young are to be congratulated. On what, sir? On not having won your fair lady. 
You've always thought of her as a sweet, demure society girl. But actually, she was a vicious person, as bad as the man who killed her, if not worse. She tortured him cruelly for four long years. How can you say that about her? How can you doubt it, Mr. Oliphant? There must have been a great many men in her life. We know at least two definitely, you and Mr. Young. But she was in love with me. She was in love with me. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but she was not in love with either of you. She was using you for her purpose. What was her purpose? Cementing the man she married. That was her preoccupation day and night. She delighted in tyrannizing over him. As one might in breaking a bull or taming a wild mustang. Do I come near the truth, Hunter? Yes. Until I couldn't stand it any longer. May I ask then why you married her? Why? Because I couldn't help myself. I crawled for her. I married her on the terms that nobody should ever know I was her husband. She was too good for me, she told me. That to my face, over and over. But we belonged to different worlds. But I was crazy about her, so I took it. What I've taken you wouldn't believe. Oh, I am sure I would, Mr. Hunt. I am a very understanding man. The question is, will a jury believe you? And that we must begin to learn immediately. Archie. Yes, sir? Phone for Inspector Kramer. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Herb Ellis as Archie Goodwin and Lee Millar, Marna Keneally, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hausner. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Headless Hunter. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> And don't forget, this Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's the big show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, drama, and the best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Theater Guild on the air this Sunday presents Judy Garland in Miss Alice Adams. So don't forget, Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show Sunday on NBC. Obsession. from the insane, a line over which many stumble while groping from the ever-elusive shadows of a mad obsession. Fears, hates, jealousies, loves, these are all kindred things of human emotion, as we are about to prove in this story starring Philip Terry, the story of a man who crossed the line from whence there is no returning in his mad flight to escape the horrors of his own obsession.
lucid moments in the tortured life of Norton Roberts. Times when the brilliant glare of reality stabs through the haze of his mist-enveloped mind. And during these times, he has but one desire. To repeat over and over again with a terrible urgency the ironic story of a retribution that destroyed him and everything he possessed. The story of a nameless terror from which there was no escape. For no one can escape the swift, clinging tendrils of a mad obsession. Yes. Yes, I want you to hear my story. I've told it several times now. I, I believe I can repeat it and without leaving out any details. I know I won't omit Claire. She meant so much to me. So very much. Why, it seems only yesterday that she came walking down the corridor at the investment company and into my office. Claire! Oh, hello, Norton, dear. Hope you don't mind my walking in on you. Well, you know I don't. Busy? The president of an investment firm is never busy. With a big company behind him, he can well afford to hire good assistants to do all the work. Well, you've certainly hired all the experts on Wall Street, then. What do you mean? First that I've read the semi-annual report of Worthington and Company. There seems to be no end to the amount of money you... Or rather, your hired assistants are earning for the firm. That's our job. But it's not your job to kill yourself working so hard. It's not that bad, Claire. Yes, it is, Norton, and you know it. This job killed my father. And I don't want the same thing to happen to you. What would you suggest? Why don't you retire? You mean you want someone else in this position? It's not that I have anybody in mind, Norton. It's just that I think you've worked too hard all your life and you're entitled to a rest. At my age, Claire, I'm only 35. Of course, to a 26-year-old girl, that must sound quite elderly. That's not what I meant, Norton. Then what are you driving at? I'd like to sell out. Sell out? That's right. My father's been dead exactly one year. You've already increased the seven million dollars he left to me to more than ten. Is that bad? That's just it. It's good. I've got more money than I'll ever need. And you, you're a millionaire in your own right. It isn't the money, Claire. A man has to have something to do. And you insist on working? Call it that. All right, then. Sign these papers. What's this? New incorporation papers. You know, I thought you'd be stubborn and not want to retire, so I had these drawn up. Just put your name on the dotted line, and then the firm of Worthington and Company becomes Worthington and Roberts. Oh. But, Claire... No I... buts about it, Norton. As long as you're going to run this business, then by everything that's right, you should be a full-fledged partner. <laughs> Not just a figurehead of one of the oldest investment houses in America, but an active partner. That meant I had prestige, power, everything. That is nearly everything I wanted. That night, celebrating the merger of Worthington and Roberts, Claire joined me at my penthouse. After dinner, we stood on the terrace looking out over the city. I never knew that... that New York could be so... <laughs> well, finish it. So empty... Oh, Norton, you're teasing. Look at the city. The lights, the people, the traffic. It's anything but empty. You're wrong, Claire. Look at me. You call your life empty? Yes, dear. Without anyone to share it. Without you to share it. But, Norton... And Claire, you must have known. Yes, I've known. For a very long time. But... But What? I feel so differently toward you. Like... like a brother. Is that why you were so interested in my welfare? Oh, it's more than that, Norton. I wish I could explain my feelings. Is there someone else? Oh. I see. I should have known. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you, not for the world. But for the longest time, I didn't know which one I loved most. Then that makes our merger purely a business one. Yes, Norton, I'm afraid so. When it comes to the heart, you are second choice. Second choice. Norton Roberts, the most eligible bachelor in New York. Second choice with the one girl he wanted. 
suddenly the thought struck me. Who was first choice? I... I couldn't help thinking, what if such a person had never come into Claire's life? What if such a person didn't exist? Yes? Hello, Claire? Oh, hello, Norton. I called you to say goodbye. Goodbye? I'm going on a vacation. Oh. Well, it was your idea. You said I was working too hard. Well, where are you going? Hunting in Montana for one whole month. Will you write? <laughs> Not a chance. I'm going off with a guide away from civilization. But how can I get in touch with you if anything important comes up? Oh, don't worry. Nothing will come up. I've attended to everything. Change will do me good. But, Norton, want I see you tomorrow? I'm afraid not, Claire. I'm leaving tonight. Yes. I was going hunting, all right. But not for mountain lions or bears or coyotes. I was going hunting for a man. Murder was my game. Just as I'd hired men to do my other work, I planned to hire someone to commit that murder for me. Three days later in San Francisco, I learned that the man I wanted to see was Victor Corrin. Come in. Are you Victor Corrin? Who are you? My name is uh, Walter Bradshaw. That's not your name. But never mind about that. What do you want? I want you to murder a man. Yeah? Look, this is a legitimate business deal. My assets happen to be cash. Yours happen to be, shall we say, brawn. Who sent you here? Nobody. I've been around. I know you're a front man to break up strikes, start riots, to do anything for whichever side pays you most. You know a lot for a stranger. I know the stakes are high. And I'm willing to pay $15,000 for a man's life. Who's the man? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, mister. I don't know what your game now, is. Now, wait but... a minute. Let me explain. Somebody is going to marry Claire Worthington and... You mean the heir to the late King of Wall Street? That's the girl. I want you to kill the man who marries her. And you don't know who he is? No. But no matter who he is, kill him. Why do you want him murdered? You'll be well paid for eliminating the man, not for knowing the reasons why. Is it a deal? Well, how am I to know? It'll be in all the newspapers when she gets married. The method of murder and the time I'll leave to your discretion. Well? It'll cost you another 15 grand. 15,000 more? That's what I said. This 15 is my share for giving the orders. The others will be for the killer. I see. And who will that be? That'll be my business. Yes. Yes, of course. Suppose I pay you, say, after the murder has taken place? In this line, we always get paid in advance. Especially when we deal with guys like you who hide their identity. But I don't have that kind of money with me. Well, then get it. <laughs> Very well. Here you are. Well, had it all along. Smart business, man. I've been called that. Anyway, there you are. Another 15,000, five tens, and twenties. Yeah, good enough. Okay, mister. It's a deal. How will I know that... That I've carried out my part? You'll read it in the papers after Claire Worthington gets hitched. Unless you want a written receipt for one murder paid in full. night I was on the train. Before we got to Chicago, I, I knew that if Victor Corrin sent one of his thugs to trail me for a bit of blackmail, I'd successfully eluded him. Not too long afterwards, I was safely back in New York. I went to Claire's apartment. Norton, of all people, Norton Roberts. Claire, dear, remember me? Oh, a sight for lonesome eyes. When did you get back? This minute, haven't even been home. Oh, it was sweet of you to come here first. Well, come on in. I was just going to have some coffee. <laughs> now, sit down. Tell me all about your trip. Well, it was very dull. Slept, ate, walked. Catch anything? No. Set a few traps. That was about all. Oh, you're too chicken-hearted to kill a rabbit. You can't fool me. It was a good change of scene, anyway. You know, I'm glad you went away, Norton. It was your suggestion. No, I didn't mean that. I'm glad you went away because... It made me realize how much I depend on oh, you. Oh, don't be silly, Claire. Anybody could carry on the business. I'm not talking about the business. I'm talking about me. Claire. It's the truth, Norton. I knew after you left how much you meant to me. And how much I loved you. But... But this other fellow, the one who was first choice... There never was another fellow. I just had to be sure, that's all. 
Your first choice, Norton. If you still want me. But, darling, of course I want you more than anything or anyone in the world. But then let's not wait. But, dear, we can't jump into this. Well, why not? Are you trying to stall oh, me? Oh, don't talk that way, Claire. You know I want to marry you only... Only right now... Oh, what can possibly stand I, in our way? I, I've... I've got to go to San Francisco on business. Wait, it's so important that he can't wait until we get married? Yes, yes, it's very important. It can't wait. I've got to dash off to San Francisco. I'll fly there tomorrow morning. We go together, Norton. No, no, we can't do that. I... Darling, you can't put me off. What do you say? Do we get married in the morning and go to San Francisco together or... Very well, Claire. We'll get married in the morning. <laughs> Afraid, Norton Roberts? The man Claire marries is to be murdered. Remember? Murdered for a price. The price you paid. And tomorrow, the headlines in San Francisco will put the finger on the man you wanted dead. Think fast, Norton Roberts. And outwit, if you can, the clever scheming of your own obsession. In just a moment, we return to our story. twist in the life of Norton Roberts and his now imperative obsession to change the outcome of our story starring Philip Terry. It is the rightful privilege of a woman to change her mind, but in so doing she oft times causes the undoing of the best laid skeins of plans and schemes and sometimes the undoing of the schemer himself. It was a grim bargain Norton Roberts made. A bargain with death itself. And in his mind, the panic grows and builds, becomes insurmountable. He must live. He must escape. Life, his life, must be bought back at any price. Living now is his only obsession. My bargain and murder had taken an ironic twist. You see, I had arranged for the murder of the man who was going to marry Claire Worthington, never dreaming that Claire would change her mind at the last minute and, and marry me. Now, combining a honeymoon with what Claire thought was business, I had to hurry back to San Francisco to try to change the pattern of my design for murder. It... It wasn't easy making explanations to Cleo when I dropped her at the hotel, but I managed it, and then I told the cab driver to take me to a waterfront address. That's it. Over there, driver, on the other side of the street. Uh, this the place, mister? Across the street, I said. Well, if you take my advice, you'll stay away from that joint. It's being watched. By whom? With the cops. They're hot after the killer. Somebody murdered? Somebody murdered, he asked me. Victor Corrin was bumped off this morning. Victor Corrin? Yeah. And they got away with $15,000 that he was carrying. Do they know who did it? And the cops don't. But the grapevine has it that it was one of his own men pulling a double cross. You better stay clear of that joint, sir. There may be fireworks. Uh, back to the hotel? Yes.
so Victor Corrin was dead. And since he had only $15,000, that meant he had already paid off the murderer. The murderer who was after me. Somebody was going to kill me. Somebody, it could be anybody, like the taxi... Yes. Yes, it could be the taxi driver. Why are you stopping here? Traffic light. In San Francisco, the red light means stop. Oh. Uh, boy, oh. Uh, give me a morning paper. Yeah, thanks. That taxi driver. He knew too much about corn and the money. He, he didn't want me to go up there. How do I know Victor Corn was murdered? How do I know that the taxi driver wasn't plotting against me? I watched him closely, and then I noticed through the rearview mirror that he was looking at me. But I was ready for him. Yes, I was ready when he suddenly half turned and said, Say, you're Norton Roberts, aren't you? No, no! Hey, 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 look out! Don't, don't, John, don't! Jump, don't. How do you feel now, Norton? Fine. That, that taxi driver, he tried to kill me. Oh, that's nonsense. Then what am I doing in this hospital? Darling, you were hit by an automobile. I was. Not hard, thank goodness. The car's crashed to save you. Let's get out of here. Well, it'll be a day or two before you get over your shock. Then you'll be perfectly all right to attend to your business. I've finished with my business. Let's go back to New York. All right, Norton. We'll go back to New York tomorrow or the day after. Who's that? Well, take it easy, darling. It's probably the doctor or a nurse. I'll see. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Oh, hello, driver. Won't, won't you come in? Uh, thanks. Uh, how do you feel this morning, Mr. Roberts? How did you know I was Norton Roberts? Well, your picture. It was in the front page of the morning paper. Oh. Oh, I was afraid of that. And then next time somebody recognizes you, you don't have to jump. Yeah, especially on a moving taxis. It's bad business. Is your car wrecked? Yes, ma'am. The other driver really smacked it up trying to keep from running over Mr. Roberts. Well, we'll handle the expenses, of course. You don't have to worry. Oh, gee, th thank you, ma'am. You can drive me to the hotel and I'll give you a check. Darling, now you just rest comfortably and I'll be right back. Oh, you can't leave me here alone. The hospital is well staffed with doctors and nurses. Where are you going? To arrange for our trip back to New York. Claire. What is it? Will you... Will you charter a private plane for just the two of us? Yes, Norton. I'll charter a private plane. I didn't trust anyone. Before we left San Francisco, I made them change the pilots. For all I knew, one of the pilots might have been my killer. The only thing I was sure of was that somebody was going to murder me, and I had to get to him before he got to me. Cleo, why do you look at me like that? I was just thinking... Thinking what? How much you've changed since you went hunting that... Nonsense. It's excitement coming back, getting married, flying across the country. A man doesn't do that every day, you know. I should hope not. Now, don't you worry about me, as soon as we get back to New York, I'll... I'll be myself again. Norton, I want you to do me a favor. Anything. I want you to see Dr. Armstrong. What for? Your nerves. There's nothing wrong with my nerves, nothing. You're as jittery I'm not as... jittery. Yes, you are. Besides, you promised me you'd do whatever I ask. For heaven's sake, Claire, don't treat me like a child. Well, I'm only thinking of you, dear. It's up to a wife to make her husband happy, you know. That was a fine week. She... She only wanted to make her husband happy. <laughs> if I hadn't married her, I'd have been all right. Perfectly all right. What is it? Mrs. Roberts? Yes? I am Sperber, the new butler, ma'am. Oh, yes. Uh, come in. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Come along with me. Yes, madam. Uh, can you cook by any chance? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, but I don't as a rule, ma'am. Well, uh, I met just for tonight. You see, we're hiring an entire new household staff, and the others won't be here until tomorrow. I, I understand, ma'am. There'll be just the two of us, Mr. Roberts and myself, for dinner. 
Uh, think you can find everything? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just leave everything to me. You're not eating very much, Norton. I'm not hungry. There must be something troubling Nothing's you. troubling me. Who's the new butler? His name is Spurgeon. Yes, I know, but where does he come from? Hannah Barbara, I think. The West Coast? Well, what's so terrible about that? How can you let a strange man in the house without even knowing one little thing about him? Well, darling, he had references. They checked on him at the agency where I always get my servant. Oh, shh. Here he comes. The soup was very good, Spurger. Oh, uh, thank you, ma'am. What's that? This, sir? Why, it's meatloaf, sir. What's in it? Brown sirloin, breadcrumbs, onions, tomato sauce. What else? Well, just salt and pepper, and sir. Poison? No, I didn't. I, I don't understand, it's sir. Very simple. I ask you a question. Is there any poison in that meatloaf? No, sir. Of course there isn't. Then eat some of it. Well, begging your pardon, sir, I've already had my dinner. Well, you see, you're afraid to taste it. Then it is poison. Oh, Norton, Norton, please. Answer me. It is poison, isn't it? was wrong about that butler. But I couldn't take any chances, not with him or any of the other servants. It was the same way at the office. When my secretary left me, I interviewed a dozen girls before I hired one I could trust. Because my killer could be a woman. That, that's the way it was with me for days, weeks, months. I didn't know what to do until... Until I saw him... A man trailing me. In the morning, when I got into my limousine, he was lounging nonchalantly across the street. If I looked out of my office window, I could see him down by the main entrance. The killer had found me at last. Someday, very soon, he would strike. I had to get away anywhere. I took all the cash I could find in the safe, walked out of the office in the middle of the day. I went down the back stairs, didn't use the elevator, came out in the street at the rear of the building, and there I yelled for a cab. Taxi! Taxi! Look, I want you to take me to... Oh. You have a passenger. It's okay. I don't mind sharing the cab. Get in. No. No, I know who you are. Get in. I'll drop you off. Where do you want to go? The... The... To Wall Street. But you just came from there. How do you know? I know a lot about you, Mr. Roberts. Then... Then you know that I'm married to Claire Worthington. I should. Look, I'll, I'll give you money. Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. Here I have a lot of cash. There's more. If you leave me alone. But, Mr. Roberts, I'm not trying to do... Leave me alone, do you hear? Leave me alone. Mr. Roberts. Leave me you. alone. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Thank you very much for your services. I'll have the check sent to your office. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Roberts. Oh, uh, that's the Coronet Detective Agency. Yes. Sir. Will you need any further reports? No. The doctors say there isn't any doubt that my husband's insane. I... I guess not. Does he still keep telling that ridiculous story? Oh, to everyone who will listen. He just finished telling it to his nurse again. The... the poor devil. Yes. And it makes it doubly hard because... Norton was such a good man. Such a good man, Claire? Perhaps. But the punishment fits the crime as it always must. The escape was made, but into a shadowy realm from which there is no further escape. A realm created from his own device, the tortured labyrinth of a mad obsession. In just a moment, I'll be back with a preview of next week's story.
next week, we'll tell you the story of a man whose life meant less to him than his house. A man with an obsession so overpowering that he was willing to murder his best friend. Drive the woman he professed to love insane rather than lose a monument he had built to himself. You will live every moment of next week's story as you follow John Loder in the role of Norman Marshall through the twisting, devious pathways of a homicidal maze when you listen to... Obsession. Starring Philip Terry was produced and transcribed by C.P. McGregor in Hollywood. Vincent Price, who is usually heard at this time as the saint, has been delayed in Paris. Tonight, by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, you'll hear Barry Sullivan in the role. Mr. Sullivan can currently be seen with Lana Turner and Ray Milland in A Life of Her Own. Adventures of the Saints, starring Barry Sullivan. The Saints, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Barry Sullivan as The Saints. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir, or madam, as the case may be. Young man. Uh, yes? I saw you. Well, I'm never invisible in September. You kicked that bird. Oh, no, I didn't. He or she was uh, browsing, browsing on the park path. Do you and... realize what our native wild bird life means to America? Oh, no. Think of the ruby-throated warbler, the scarlet tanager, the great crested green. They come to think of it, I used to know a great crested... Uh, no, no, the man I knew was a Greek. He wrestled. The bird life of our country must be protected at all costs, young man, at all costs. Madam, I assure you, I would not deliberately kick a bird, not even a bullfinch. Well, all right, I'm ashamed. I suppose that henceforth I'll be known as a man who has an offended friend in the world. The beat of tiny wings will never brighten the declining years of Simon Templer's life. Did you say your name was Simon Templer? Not exactly, but it is. You're the saint? After our unfortunate introduction to each other, you may find that hard to believe. But, but... I was on my way to visit you. Oh? I wanted to ask you to help my brother. Your brother? He kicks birds? Or perhaps birds kick him? Warburton has nothing to do with birds. Warburton. His trouble is, well, a little different. What is his trouble? He's haunted. Madam, I have a feeling James Thurber is the man you want. Don't be irreverent. Oh, I beg your pardon. Warburton is haunted by a ghost. Well, that sounds reasonable. Uh, this Warburton, he's older than you are. If you're implying by that, is he senile? The answer is no. He's a year older than I am, but perfectly sane. Nevertheless, he's haunted, I know. But how do you know? I've heard the ghost myself. It giggles. Giggles? Giggles. I'm strongly tempted to murmur happy haunting, but I'll resist temptation. And what is even more dreadful, Mr. Templer, and of course you're coming with me at once to investigate the matter, not only is my brother haunted, but he likes it. <laughs> My name, I suppose I should tell you, is Prue Thacker. Uh, how do you do? 
And my brother is, of course, Warburton Thaxter. Uh, how does he... Uh, no, I guess he doesn't do so well. Miss Thaxter, what is his occupation? Uh, Warburton has been a banker all his life. Uh-huh. It is not proper for a banker to be haunted. Except perhaps by certified public accountants. Mr. Templer, I shall want you to take immediate steps about the matter. Well, I'm not at all sure that I'm qualified to, although I should like to help. Something will undoubtedly occur to you. Something always does. Yeah, perhaps. But in these latter years, it's usually been something more substantial than ghosts. Something blunder. Mr. Templer. Mm-hmm. Your arm, if you please. No, of course, lady. Charles will put the card away. Charles must have been listening closely. Uh, Miss Baxter, are you and your brother wealthy? Modestly so. Why? It satisfies a private curiosity. I've noticed that ghosts tend to haunt only the wealthy. That's either a characteristic of ghosts or of the wealthy. Well, I'm not sure I approve of your speculations on the subject. We'll go at once to the drawing room. Which is where the ghost ghosts? It is where Warburton may possibly be. The door to your left, Mr. Templer. Hmm. Warburton is not here. And Mr. Templer, this is the room where we spend most of our evenings. It's where we've heard the ghost. Uh, something's been bothering me. You said it giggles. He giggles? She giggles. Uh-huh. And does she do anything else? Plank chains, for example, or utter blood curdling moan? No, apparently not. Uh. Warburton and I heard her on a number of occasions. Mm-hmm. The sound seemed to come from the study. The door on the right wall leads to it. And you investigated? Well, Warburton did, naturally. He went into the study. He felt a man should look after such matters. I see. He went in and shut the door behind him mm-hmm. to spare me. He stayed on each occasion some little while. I heard the giggle again and insisted on being let into the study. You were perfectly right, I imagine. Warburton let me in. There was no one there. I was momentarily unnerved, of course. Of course. But Warburton seemed quite undisturbed. Hmm? As a matter of fact, he seemed positively happy about it all. Did you ask him why? His reply was frivolous. He said that at his age, it was flattering to be haunted by a ghost whose giggle was so youthful. This happened how many times? Perhaps half a dozen. I wonder where Warburton is. Uh, Perhaps in the study. (laughs) That wasn't a giggle, but it did come from the study. Yes, we must see at once. Warburton! Warburton! It's tense with the door's locked. Do you have a key? No, there isn't any. Never kept locked. Let me in! Miss Max, the ghosts don't generally go about opening doors. Must be latched from the inside. Is there any other way of getting into the study? Oh, there's a window overlooking the garden. Then suppose we try the garden. All right. It's this way. Oh, Mr. Templer, I'm frightened. What are we going to find in there? <laughs> I don't know. I've never believed in ghost things. You needn't start now. Whoever it was that screamed, it wasn't a ghost. You're sure of that? Yes. In a way, I wish I weren't, but... I, I don't think I quite understand Well, it. let's wait and find out before... Now, this would be the window of the study. Yes. And it's quite a bit higher than my head. Concrete walk directly underneath the window. Oh, oh what on earth does it matter if the walk is concrete? There wouldn't be any footprints on concrete. Well, perhaps not, Mr. Templer, but... Do ghosts leave footprints? I suppose not. However, is there a ladder about? The gardener's shed over there. Yes, yes. Is it open? I think so. We can try. There's a ladder. A ladder. Oh, yes, here's one. Now, back to that study window. Oh, hurry, Mr. Tinsel, hurry. Okay. Ladder against the window. Now. You know, I've always envied firemen climbing up and down ladders all day long. Mr. Templer, why are you delaying? Mm, uh, all right. Up the ladder it is. Can you see into the study? Yes. What? You better stand out of the way. I'm coming down. My brother is in there. He is. I think perhaps we'd better go inside. We have a couple of phone calls to make. Phone calls? Yes, to a doctor and the police. A doctor? I suspect from what I could see that a doctor won't be too necessary, but your calling him will at least show the proper solicitude. Something happened to Warburton. He... he's dead. I'm afraid he is. Oh, no. Here, here, you'd better take my arm. No. Thank you very much. I, I don't need help. We had better make those calls. All right. By the way, Miss Thaxton. Yes? While the police are on their way here, if I were you, I'd try to think up something to tell them besides a ghost story. 
What do you mean? Ghosts aren't generally capable of beating a man's head to a pulp. The police will be here, they said, quite soon. Now run along then, Miss Baxter. But, Mr. There's Cooper... nothing I could tell them that would be of any help to anyone. I suppose not. I'll ring for Tom. You don't bother, Miss Baxter. I'd rather walk. Very well. Thank you for having come home with me and listening to my ghost story. Good night, Mr. Tensler. Good night. Here you are, sir. Huh? Huh. I ride whether I want to or not, eh? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Hello, Charles. I... I I beg your pardon. I I seem to be sitting on you. Not entirely, of course, but enough to know that you're not a ghost. (laughs) Uh, Look, I don't like to seem inquisitive, but you can speak. Of course I can. Uh, What's your name? Simon Templer. Oh, do saints often go around sitting on girls' laps? I am not sitting on your lap. No, but you didn't miss by much. As a matter of fact, I am now at the opposite end of the seat. Afraid? What's your name? Lorraine. Hmm. I think Prue Faxter thinks you're a ghost. Do you? Now, you needn't slide any closer to me. I already have sufficient evidence that you're not. Are you glad? Uh, I'll admit that you have a delightful way of not being ghostly. However, I would like to know why Miss Baxter thought that you were. Oh, that's because she hoped I was. Huh? Or would be. Is that right? I'm not very good on grammar. Well, what are you good on? Uh, no, 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 ignore that, please. Uh, why does she dislike you? I make Warburton laugh. Oh. You'd have a difficult time making him laugh now. I know. You were in that study with him? Your silence, fear, or discretion? I wish you wouldn't say things like that. I mightn't like you if you do. I'll survive. Will you? Oh, now you're threatening me. Yet if you hadn't waited for me in this car, I'd never have known who you are. And somehow it doesn't hang together. Because then I couldn't have been of any danger to you. You couldn't have been of any help either. Now how can I help you? By handing it right over. Handing what over? The key. The key, of course. The key to... Please, don't be difficult. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, but actually I don't know enough to know if I'm being difficult or foolish. Let me search. Oh, no. Why not? Uh, I'm ticklish. If you don't let me search you, I'll scream. You didn't bother. You forget, I've already heard you scream. Maybe, but Charles hasn't. He'd stop the car and come charging back here probably with a wrench. But he hit you on the head with it. And it's the only head I have to my name. Uh-huh. Lorraine? Yes, Simon? Search me. Lorraine, you look like you'd lost your last giggle. Naturally, you didn't have the key. But I told you that before you uh, uh, searched me. But didn't you like it anyway? I refuse to answer that. And besides, we're at my home. Oh. Lorraine, I would suggest that immediately after I leave you, you visit the police and... Kick them? And now, you tell them of your presence in Warburton's study tonight. I can't. Because you murdered Warburton Thaxter? Because of who I am. I didn't kill Warburton, but they might not believe me. Because of who I am. Who are you? What? Mrs. Warburton Faxter, of course. Your feet are on my sofa. What's wrong with that? They're too big. Oh, you're an observant kid, Templar. Have you observed this? Oh, dear. You know, I wish for once that someone would threaten me with a machete or a Malayan crease or an original Australian Sunday boomerang. I get so tired of revolvers. That's maybe because you ain't been shot by one yet. People have tried and tried. 
Are you going to shoot me with your revolver? No, God. Let's see, act nasty. Oh, no, I was the pride of Mrs. Thrushbottom's dancing class. My manners are favorably known throughout the length and breadth no, of this kid. If Lord Chesterfield's son had had a son of his own... He probably would have been me. Oh, stop this. I can't contain my joy. Besides, I got something to ask you. Be careful. Remember, I'm not your best friend, and I might tell you. Don't you get tired of making wisecracks? It's a living. Who are you, anyway? The name is Galloway. And the feet are large. Proceed, Mr. Galloway. Where is it? Where is what? The key. What key? Key. You know as well as I do. Yeah, perhaps, but what makes you think I have it? You went to the house with Miss Thaxter, didn't you? Yes, I did. And how did you know? I'm psychic. You mean you were following us? I'm a bad boy. And you think my purpose was to procure the key from Warburton? That's yeah, very interesting. One of us who didn't know before now knows the key was Warburton's. He also knows that obviously Warburton no longer has the key. Otherwise, <laughs> yes, he's very interesting indeed. Mm-hmm. Except, old boy, haven't you realized yet that you shouldn't know Warburton is now minus key? Why shouldn't I? Because Warburton is now also minus life. That is a very interesting fact, but it don't get me the key. It may get you the chair. I missed something. You certainly did. Warburton Thaxter, and we'll pretend you didn't know, was murdered. I don't like that. Neither did Warburton. Hey, wait a minute. I, I didn't bargain on no death sentence. Templar, how good are you at forgetting things? Things like what? My visiting you. No, oh, no, no. I could never forget that. There'll always be a warm face in my heart. Oh, oh, oh my heart. Hey, what's wrong? Uh, I think I'm going to have an attack. Uh, help me to the sofa. Yeah, yeah. Here, hold, hold on to me. I shall. Uh, hey, you nearly busted my wrist. I better to take your revolver away. What happened to your attack? I decided to postpone it. You know what? I think you lied about it. I'm afraid I did, but I have the gun now. Keep it. Galloway, stay where you are. Not to you. I got to get out of here. I'm likely to shoot you if... In the back. Stop being foolish. Heroes never shoot guys in the back. <laughs> Lieutenant Cool, I'll bet you never knew I was a hero. Go away, Templar. I was just about to take my nap. Oh, it can't be. They must have put you on the Thaxter case. I'll tell you all about it next spring. Uh, were any keys found on his body? Well, sure. So? Was a safe deposit key among them? Mm-hmm. Your sister wanted to know the same thing. And? No safe deposit key. I see. Cool, did you leave a policeman in the house with Miss Thaxter? This may come as a shock to you and the readers of mystery stories, but I did. I'm bracing myself. One more question, Cool. Huh? If I had a key to somebody else's safe deposit box, would the bank let me get at the box? Just because you had the key to it? No. Uh, in that event, why have people threatened me, assaulted me, tickled, well, that is applied pressure, and involved themselves in a murder case for something that can be of no earthly use to them? Templar to telephone him. Yes? Yeah, Miss Baxter. This is Simon Templar. I hope I haven't waked you. Oh, I haven't been asleep. Not this night. I thought perhaps you might still be up. Miss Baxter, I've had a visitor who, among other things, carried about a good deal of earth on his shoes. Do you know a man named Galloway? Of course I do. Who is he? My gardener. <laughs> Taxi! Taxi! Uh, 14 Mallorca Drive, if you please. That's a high-class neighborhood. What are you going to do there? Louis! Louis? Hey, I'm glad to see you. Yeah, huh? Certainly took your time getting me into this. Oh, look, I'm sorry, Louis, but, well, I didn't have an occasion to call a cab before now. Is that so? Oh, of course, Louis. Well, I accept your apology. Yeah. And now that we're friends again, who's dead? <laughs> The scene of the tragedy. Mm-hmm. I wait. You wait. About how old is this Miss Thaxter? Middle 50s, I should think. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know how long I'll have to wait. Middle 50s? Not long. Mm. <laughs> yeah? Uh, my name is Simon Templer, officer. Miss Thaxter's expecting me. Oh, yeah. In the drawing room. Thank you. Over here. Yeah? I've been in there. 
I'm perplexed. Why? No drawings. <laughs> uh, till later, officer. Come in. Hello, Miss Baxter. Sorry it's so late. It's kind of you to come and ask me questions. It may keep me from... What did you want to know? First, how long has Galloway been with you? Oh, a good many years. Where does he sleep? Garden house. And I can stop and see him on my way out. Miss Baxter, did you know your brother had been married? The police told me about it tonight. Uh-huh. I hadn't known before. You didn't really think your brother was meeting a ghost in his study, did you? No. I would have preferred it to be that, however. You've never met Laureen Anderson. She's cheap, Mr. Templer. Cheap and grasping. And you told the police about hearing her in the study before we discovered your brother's body? I told them nothing. It might have been safer, too. Do you know where she lives? A theatrical hotel. Which one? I'm not sure. Well, you've got to remember, and quickly. Why? Because I'm afraid there'll have to be another death before this is over. Oh. I think it was the... Yes? The Exbrook Hotel. The Exbrook. Thank you. Good night, Miss Baxter. Good night. Good night, officer. Good night. Louis? Huh? Get out of that cab. Come with me. Where are you going? Around the house, to the gardener's place. Want him to pick you a few flowers? No, I want a witness with me. Oh, that gate ought to be oiled. You ought to speak to the gardener about it. Yeah, yeah, this is the place, all right? Hey, shouldn't you have not? Unnecessary, unless I'm mistaken. And I wasn't mistaken. Oh, 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 you mean you expected him to be dead? <laughs> Perhaps you'd better come with me, Louie. Okay, but I'd just as soon not meet near the corpses tonight. They depress me some. Oh, beautiful lobby. Yeah, arms decaying like mad and... <laughs> that place to sleep. However, mailbox pigeonholes. Yes. That. Marine's room number is 111. That would be... Down the corridor, towards the back of the hotel, I imagine. This lady we're going to visit, she ain't in her middle 50s. Good heavens, no. Then I don't understand it. Why do you want me along? To stand... Oh, yes, this is the room. To stand outside the door. To stand outside the... Mr. Templer, you think you can trust me with such an important assignment? Who is it? Simon Templer. Oh, that's the name. Hey, you forgot to mention me. Intentionally, Louis. Oh, well, then I accept your apology. Huh? Get to one side. Simon. May I come in? Of course. I'm not dressed for company. Well, we'll pretend I'm not company. Simon, did you come because you wanted me to search you again? No, no, no. This time, I'm going to do the searching. Simon? Yes, in view of the hour, you obviously wouldn't have it on you. Therefore, I shall look elsewhere. You think I have the key? Uh Uh-huh. I'm glad you have such a small kitchenette. It takes a long time. Simon. Oh, I'm so sorry. What did I break? A bottle of real lemon juice. Oh, well. I'll come back in the morning and squeeze you some more. Oh. Mm. Well, the hiding places in here are entirely too obvious. Where's your bedroom? Now, just a minute, Simon. Well, <laughs> that's a beautiful bed you have, Lorraine. Thank you, kind sir. But Old-fashioned kind. Bed post with ornamental heads which, which come off. Hmm? Simon, what? A hollow bedpost, a string tied to the inside of the head, and at the end of the string, this. That's a key. Oh, so it is. A key to a safe deposit box. Warburton's safe deposit box. Lorraine, did Warburton keep his money largely in cash? I don't. It's a little late for lying, honey. Well, I don't know why, short. Yes. He's mm. recently cashed a lot of bonds. Oh, maybe $50,000 worth. May I use your phone? Yeah. Who are you going to call? The police. Oh, no. Please, Simon, don't call us. I don't like cops. Oh, you like Lieutenant Cool. He's real cute. He looks just like Willie the Penguin. Walt's like him, too. And he parts his hair in the middle at... Lieutenant Cool? Uh, Simon Templer, Lieutenant. What did you find in Warburton's safe deposit box? Oh, I knew. <laughs> I'd given you hints enough earlier. I was pretty sure you'd get a court order and... Oh, you did. And... Thank you. Bye. Simon? The police opened the box. And? It was empty. 
I don't like the way you're looking at me. Irene, your window overlooks the alley running back of the hotel. So? So get me a pillow and a blanket off the bed. Um, all right, but... Now I'll I... shove this chair in front of the window. Draw the blind down. Here. Ah, thank you, darling. Now, now if I fold the blanket into a roll... Plop the pillow on top of it so it extends a bit above the chair. Mm. Yeah. If you were blind from the outside, it would look as though you were sitting in that chair. Maybe it would. Now, you put a coat on. But... Come with me. Aww. We're going to bowl in a different kind of alley. I'm cold. Why do we have to stand here? Because from where we are, we can't be seen. But we can see your window with a silhouette on the blind. And if anyone comes up the alley... Simon, I don't understand at all. Suppose you were an aging woman who owned nothing but an old house. I... Suppose you spent all your life with your brother who had all the money. I... I... Suppose your brother then met and married a pretty girl. And then he cashed in all his money and was preparing to leave you. How would you feel? Well, I'd be unhappy about it. You'd kill your brother if you were half insane with pride and anger. <laughs> you'd try to have his wife convicted of a murder. You'd call in somebody. Somebody like me to be around when you discuss discovered your brother dead. You'd plant a safe deposit box key someplace in your brother's wife's room. You'd hire your gardener to threaten me about the key and then kill him before he could get frightened and blow up the whole scheme. Simon! But then, then when you realize the man you'd been using as a blind had stumbled onto a part of the truth, what would you do? You'd try to wind up the case quick. I wouldn't. You'd try to shoot your brother's wife then make it look like suicide, huh? Now, Louis is at the door of your room, so that won't be tried, but the alley here... Oh! Box. Yeah, yeah, she's coming down the alley. Yeah. Stop it outside your window. Haven't you ever gone? She's left me. That's all we needed now. There. I'll take that gun. Oh. It's a pity that your brother and Galloway weren't birds, Miss Thaxter. What do you mean? They'd be alive. You were so fond of birds. <laughs> See, Lorraine, that, that safe deposit key couldn't have been of any use to Galloway or yourself. No. But Miss Thaxter, she had two uses for it. First, she rented a safe deposit box at the same bank, next to her brother. Mm. She was known to the guard at the bank, therefore she could go down into the vault and by working quickly, empty Warburton's box, which she did. <laughs> and then she planted the key on you. Mm. I'm so grateful to you. Oh, nonsense, Daddy. Brian, I, I, I don't know how I can repay you. <laughs> You? Well, uh, as children say when they don't know something, it's me. You've been listening to another transcribed adventure of the Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here's our star, Barry Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, ten years is an awfully long time to be hungry. For us in America, it's an unbelievably long time. But for millions of people in Europe and Asia, it's not very hard to believe because they've lived hunger, they're living it right now. But there's at least one family abroad that can experience once again the strength and vigor of proper nourishment. That family is the one you help by sending a personal care package. Your compassion can be turned into material aid by sending a food gift through non-profit care. For instance... Care's $10 food parcel will supplement the diet of a family of four for a whole month. It contains 24 pounds of nourishing meats, fats, sugar, and other foods high in vitamins. This or any other Care food package will be sent to the person you specify. Or if you wish, Care will select a suitable recipient for your gift, and either way you'll receive a signed receipt upon delivery and probably a heartfelt letter of gratitude. All you have to do is send your money order to Care, New York. Care will do the rest. Remember the address, it's CARE, New York. And now this is Barry Sullivan inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night.
by Lewis Vitties. Our cast included Lorene Tuttle, Irene Tedro, Hal March, Joe Duval, and Larry Dodkin. Music was composed and conducted by Von Dexter. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charters, is a James L. Sapio production and is directed by Helen Mack. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's Hope. There's Gaucho. They're both returning soon to NBC. Yes, Bob Hope returns October 3rd, and you bet your life it's Gaucho Marks beginning October 4th. Listen where you hear the chimes for Top Comedy by Bob Hope and Gaucho Marks beginning soon on NBC. Now Sam Spade and Ginger Rogers and Theater Guild on NBC. In just a moment, sleep no more, but first... Hello? Oh, hello, Martha. No, no, just finishing my housework and enjoying NBC Bandstand on the radio. Oh, it's just fabulous. This week they have Burt Parks, of course, and the Glenn Miller Orchestra under the direction of Ray McKinley. But why am I telling you about it? Tune it in yourself. And enjoy the Glenn Miller Orchestra and singing star Bill Hayes live weekday mornings on most of these stations. Now stay tuned for Sleep No More on NBC. This is Nelson Olmsted. Sleep No More. No more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Olmsted on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmsted, tell us about this evening's story. It's called The Storm by McKnight Melmar, who incidentally is a woman. It's a story about a woman who comes home one night to a big empty house to find a pinpoint of light where there should be no light. That sounds chilling. So let Nelson Olmsted tell us about the woman alone at night and the storm. She inserted her key in the lock and turned the knob. The march wind snatched the door out of her hand and slammed it back against the wall. It took strength to close it against the pressure of the gale. (sighs) She breathed a sigh of thankfulness of being home again and in time. In rain like this, the crossroads always were flooded. Half an hour later, her cab couldn't have got through the rising water. And there was no alternative route. There was no light anywhere in the house. Ben wasn't home then. As she turned on the lamp by the sofa, she had a sense of anticlimax. All the way home, she had been visiting her sister. She had seen herself going into a lighted house to Ben, who would be sitting by the fire with his paper. She had taken delight in picturing his happy surprise at seeing her home a week earlier than he'd expected her. She had known just how his round face would light up, how his eyes would twinkle behind his glasses, how he would catch her by the shoulders and look down into her face to see the changes a month had made in her and then kiss her resoundingly on both cheeks like a French general bestowing a decoration. Then she would make coffee and find a piece of cake, and they would sit together by the fire and talk. But Ben wasn't here. She looked at the clock on the mantel and saw it was nearly ten. Well, perhaps he hadn't planned to come home tonight, as he wasn't expecting her. 
Even before she had left, he frequently was in the city all night because business kept him too late to catch the last train. Well, if he didn't come home soon, he wouldn't be able to make it at all. She began to walk through the house, turning on lights as she went. Ben had left it in fairly good order. There was very little trace of an untidy masculine presence, but, but then he was a tidy man. She made coffee. The wind hammered at the door and the windows. Listening, she wished for Ben almost feverishly. She never had felt so alone, and he was such a comfort. He had been so good about her going for this long visit, made because her sister was ill. He had seen to everything and had put her on the train with her arms loaded with books and candy and fruit. She knew those farewell gifts had meant a lot to him. He didn't spend money easily. To be quite honest, he was a little close. But he was a good husband. She repeated it to herself firmly as she sipped her coffee. He was a good husband. Suppose he was ten years older than she and a little set in his ways, a little, perhaps, dictatorial at times and moody. He'd given her what she thought she wanted, security and a home of her own. If security were not enough, she couldn't blame him for it. Her eye caught a shred of white protruding under a magazine on the table beside her. She put out a hand toward it, yet her fingers were almost reluctant to grasp it. She pulled it out nevertheless and saw that it was, as she had known instinctively, another of the white envelopes. It was empty, and it bore, as usual, the neat typewritten address, Benjamin T. Wilson, Esquire, Wildwood Road, Fairport, Connecticut. The postmark was New York City. It never varied. She felt the familiar constriction about the heart as she held it in her hands. What these envelopes contained, she never had known. What she did know was their effect on Ben. After receiving one, and one came every month or two, he was irritable, at times almost ugly. Their peaceful life together fell apart. At first, she had questioned him, had striven to soothe and comfort him, but she soon had learned that this only made him angry, and of late, she had avoided any mention of them. This one was postmarked three days before. If Ben got home tonight, he would probably be cross, and the storm wouldn't help his mood. Just the same, she wished he would come. She tore the envelope into tiny pieces and tossed them into the fireplace. As she straightened, a movement at the window caught her eye. She froze there, not breathing, still half bent toward the cold fireplace, her hand extended. The glimmer of white at the window behind the sheeting blur of rain had been, she was sure of it, a human face. There had been eyes. She was certain there had been eyes staring in at her. The wind's shout took on a personal, threatening note. She was rigid for a long time, never taking her eyes from the window. But nothing moved there now, except the water on the window pane. Beyond it, there was blackness, and that was all. The only sounds were the threshing of the trees, the roar of the water, the ominous howl of the wind. If only Ben would come home. If only she weren't so alone. She shivered and pulled Ben's coat tighter around her. And told herself she was becoming a morbid fool. Nevertheless, she found the aloneness intolerable. Her ears strained to hear prowling footsteps outside the windows. She became convinced that she did hear them, slow and heavy. Well... Perhaps Ben could be reached at the hotel where he sometimes stayed. She no longer cared whether her homecoming was a surprise to him. She wanted to hear his voice. She went to the telephone and lifted the receiver. The line was quite dead. The wires were down, of course. She fought panic. Now, the face at the window had been an illusion, a trick of light. And the sound of footsteps was an illusion, too. Actual ones would be inaudible in the noise made by the wild storm. Nobody would be out tonight. Nothing threatened her, really. The storm was held at bay behind these walls, and in the morning, the sun would shine again. The thing to do was to make herself as comfortable as possible and settle down with a book. There was no use going to bed. She couldn't possibly sleep. She would only lie there wide awake and think of that face at the window, hear those footsteps. 
She would get some wood and build a fire in the fireplace. She hesitated at the top of the cellar stairs. The light, as she switched it on, seemed insufficient. The concrete wall at the foot of the stairs was dank with moisture and somehow gruesome. And wind was chilling her ankles. Rain was beating in through the outside door to the cellar because that door was standing open. The inner bolt sometimes didn't hold, she knew very well. If it had not been carefully closed, the wind could have loosened it. It took her a long minute to nerve herself to go down the steps and reach out into the darkness for the door latch. The wind helped her and slammed the door resoundingly. She jammed the rusty bolt home with all her strength and then tested it to make sure it would hold. She almost sobbed with relief of knowing it to be firm against any intruder. She had only to get an armful of wood. Then she could have a fire. She would have light and warmth and comfort. She would forget these terrors. The cellar smelled of dust and old moisture. The beams were fuzzed with cobwebs. There was only the one dim bulb. The wood pile was in the far corner, away from the light. She stopped and peered around. Nothing could hide here. The cellar was too open. The supporting stanchions too slender to hide a man. She almost ran to the wood pile. What was it? Not a noise. Something she had seen as she hurried across the dusty floor. Something odd. She searched with her eyes. What? Why, it was the spark of light she had seen where no spark should be. Her eyes widened, round and dark as the frightened deer's. Her old trunk that stood against the wall was open just a crack. And from the crack came this tiny pinpoint of reflected light to prick the cellar's room. She went toward it like a woman hypnotized. It was only one more insignificant thing, like the envelope on the table, the vision of the face at the window, the open door. There was no reason for her to feel so smothered in terror. Yet, she was sure she had not only closed the lid of the trunk, but clamped it shut. She was sure because she kept two or three old coats in it, wrapped in newspapers and tightly shut away from moths. But now, the lid was raised perhaps an inch, and the twinkle of light was still there. She threw back the lid. For a moment, she stood looking down into the trunk, while each detail of its contents burned itself on her brain. Each tiny detail was indelibly clear and never to be forgotten. She could not have stirred a muscle in that moment. Horror was a black cloak thrown around her, stopping her breath, hobbling her limbs. Then her face dissolved into formlessness, and she slammed down the lid and ran up the stairs like a mad thing. She was breathing again. In deep, sobbing breaths that tore at her lungs, she shut the door at the top of the stairs with a crash that shook the house. Then she turned the keys. Her old trunk had held the curled-up body of a woman. Her first impulse was to get out of the house. But in the time it took her to get to the front door, she remembered the face of the window. Oh, perhaps she hadn't imagined it after all. Perhaps it was the face of a murderer. A murderer waiting for her out there in the storm, ready to spring on her out of the dark and the rain. <sighs> she fell into the big chair, her huddled body shaken by great tremors. She couldn't stay here, not with that thing in her trunk. Yet she dared not leave. Her whole being cried out for Ben. He would know what to do. She closed her eyes, opened them again, rubbed them hard. The picture still burned into her brain as if it had been etched with acid. Her hair, loosened, fell in soft, straight wisps around her forehead, and her mouth was slack with terror. She had not seen the face of the woman. The head had been tucked down into the hollow of the shoulder, and a shower of fair hair had fallen over it. 
The woman had worn a red dress. One hand had rested near the edge of the trunk. And on its third finger, there had been a man's ring. A signet bearing the raised figure of a rampant lion with a small diamond between its paws. It had been the diamond that caught the light. The little bulb in the corner of the cellar had picked out this ring from the semi-darkness and made it stand out like a beacon. She would never be able to forget it. Shudders continued to shake her. She bit her tongue and pressed her hand against her jaw to stop the chattering of her teeth. She drew the coat closer about her, trying to dispel the mortal cold that held her. Slowly, something beyond the mere fact of murder, of death, began to penetrate her mind. Slowly, she realized that beyond this fact, there would be consequences. That body in the cellar was not an isolated phenomenon. Some train of events had led to its being there and would follow its discovery there. There would be policemen. At first, the thought of policemen was a comforting one. Big, brawny men in blue who would take the thing out of her cellar and take it away so she never need think of it again. Then she realized it was her cellar, hers and Ben's, and policemen are suspicious and prying. Would they think she had killed the woman? Could they be made to believe she never had seen her before? Or would they think Ben had done it? Would they take the letters in the white envelopes and Ben's absences on business and her own visit to her sister, about which Ben had been so helpful, and out of them build a double life for him? Would they insist that the woman had been a discarded mistress who had hounded him with letters until out of desperation he had killed her? Well, that was a fantastic theory, really. But the police might do that. They might. Oh, her craving for Ben became a frantic need. If only he would come home. Come home. And take that body away. Hide it somewhere so the police couldn't connect it with this house. He was strong enough to do it. She crouched there, shaking. It was as if the jaws of a great trap had closed on her. On one side, the storm and the silence of the telephone, and on the other, the presence of the prowler under that still cramped figure in her trunk. She was caught between them, helpless. As if to accent her helplessness, the wind stepped up a shriek, and a tree crashed thunderously out on the road. She heard glass shatter. Her quivering body stiffened like a drawn bow. Was it the prowler attempting to get in? She forced herself to her feet and made a round of the windows. All the glass was intact. Nothing could make her go down into the cellar to see if anything had happened there. The voice of the storm drowned out all but the sound of the clock. Yet she couldn't rid herself of the fancy that she heard footsteps going round and round the house, that eyes sought an opening and spied upon her. A kind of numbness began to come over her, as if her capacity for fear were exhausted. She went back to the chair and curled up in it. Eleven midnight. She huddled there, not moving, not thinking, not even afraid, only numb for another hour. Then the storm held its breath for a moment, and in the brief space of silence, she heard footsteps, firm and quick and loud. A key turned in the lock, the door opened, and Ben came in. He was dripping dirty and white with exhaustion, but it was Ben. Once she was sure of it, she flung herself on him, babbling incoherently of what she had found. He kissed her lightly on the cheek and took her arms down from around his neck. And he said, here, here, my dear. <laughs> you get soaked. <laughs> I'm drenched to the skin. Oh, I had to walk in from the crossroads. What a night. She tried again to tell him of the past hours, but again he cut her short. No, oh, now, wait a minute, my dear. I can see you're bothered about something, but just wait till I get into some dry things, and then I'll come down, and we'll talk things over. Now, suppose you rustle up some coffee and toast. Oh, I'm done up. The whole trip out was a nightmare, and I didn't know if I'd ever make it from the crossing. No, I've been hours. Yes, he did look tired, she thought with concern. Now that he was back... She could wait. The past hours had taken on the quality of a nightmare. Horrifying, 
but curiously unreal. With Ben here so solid and commonplace and cheerful, she began to wonder if the hours were a nightmare. She even began to doubt the reality of the woman in the trunk, although she could see her as vividly as ever. Perhaps only the storm was real. She went to the kitchen and began to make fresh coffee. The chair, still wedged against the kitchen door, was a reminder of her terror. And now that Ben was home, it seemed silly. And she put it back in its place for the table. He came down very soon, before the coffee was ready. Oh, how good it was to see him in that old gray bathrobe of his, his hands thrust into its pockets. She was almost shamefaced when she told him of the face in the window, the open cellar door, and finally of the body in the trunk. None of it, she saw quite clearly now, could possibly have happened. Ben said so, without hesitation. But he came to put an arm around her. He said, Well, now, you poor child, the storm has scared you to death, and I don't wonder. It has given you the jitters. She smiled dubiously. She said, Yes, I'm almost beginning to think so. Now that you're back, it seems so safe, but... But you will look in the trunk, Ben. I've, I've got to know. I can see her so plainly. How could I imagine a thing like that? Of course I'll look, if it'll make you feel better. Well, then I'll do it now. Then I can have my coffee in peace. He went to the cellar door and opened it and snapped on the light. Her heart began to pound once more, a deafening roar in her ears. She could not have imagined it. It was incredible that she could have believed for a minute that her mind had played such tricks on her. In another moment, Ben would know it, too. She heard the thud as he threw back the lid of the trunk. She clutched at the back of the chair, waiting for his voice. It came in an instant. There's nothing here but a couple of bundles. Come take a look. Nothing? Her knees were weak as she went down the stairs, down into the cellar again. It was still musty and damp and draped with cobwebs. The light was still dim. It was just as she remembered it, except the wind was whistling through a broken window and rain was spattering in on the bits of shattered glass on the floor. The branch lying across the sill had removed every scrap of glass from the frame and left not a single jagged edge. Ben was standing by the open trunk, waiting for her. His stocky body was a bulwark. He said, You see? There's nothing. Just some old clothes of yours, I guess. She went to stand beside him. Was she losing her mind? Would she now see that crushed figure in there, see the red dress, the smooth, shining knees when Ben could not, and the ring with the diamond between the lion's paws? Her eyes looked almost reluctantly into the trunk. Why, why, it is empty. There were the neat newspaper-wrapped packages she'd put away so carefully, just as she had left them deep in the bottom of the trunk, and nothing else. Why, she must have imagined the body. She was light with the relief the knowledge brought her. The actual physical danger did not exist and never had existed. Why, the threat of the law hanging over Ben had been based in a dream, and she said... I dreamed it all. I must have. Yet it was so horribly clear, and I wasn't asleep, and I thought... Oh, Ben, I thought... What did you think, my dear? He stood looking down at her with an immobility that chilled her more than the cold wind that swept in through the broken window. She tried to read his face, but the light from the single bulb was too weak. It left his features shadowed in broad, dark planes that made him look like a stranger and somehow sinister. And she said, I... What was it you thought? She backed away from him. He moved then. It was only to take his hands from his pockets to stretch his arms toward her, but she stood there for an instant staring at the thing that left her stricken with a voiceless scream forming in her throat. She was never to know whether his arms had been outstretched to take her within their shelter or to clutch at her white neck. For she turned and fled, stumbling up the stairs in a mad panic of escape. He shouted, Janet! Janet! His steps were heavy behind her. He tripped on the bottom step and fell on one knee and cursed. Terror lent her strength and speed. She could not be mistaken, although she had seen it only once. 
she knew that on the little finger of his left hand, there had been the same, the unmistakable ring the dead woman had worn. Oh, the blessed wind snatched the front door from her and flung it wide, and she was out in the safe, dark shelter of the storm. This is Nelson Olmstead. The story you heard tonight was written by a woman and was about a woman. In the moments that remain tonight, and while you're in such a wonderful, sleepless mood, I'd like you to hear the famous poem Edgar Allan Poe wrote about a woman, his wife. Here is Annabel Lee. <laughs> many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, this was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide... I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. <laughs> Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. That Hemsley Affair. A cold gray blanket of fog caressed the English coast. 
the village of Hemsley wore it like an ominous shroud. And Sarah Bolton, standing at the window of her home on the crest of the cliff, pulled her shawl closer about her shoulders as she listened to the distant baying of dogs. Minutes later, the sound grew closer. Closer. And then she heard the footsteps along the fieldstone path. Hurrying again to the open window, she could see the outlines of a burly, heavily dressed man approaching the house. In the crook of his arm rested a rifle. Sarah trembled at his knock on the door, hesitated, then opened it slightly and peered out. Why, good evening, Constable Harwood. You're so far from the village. What, what brings you out this way? Well, there's no cause for alarm now, Miss Sarah. But there's been a robbery in London this very afternoon. Oh, indeed? The bandit was wounded. We know that. A Bobby's bullet caught him. Well, he's been traced to this neighborhood. No. Just wondered now if you'd heard any noises, seen anyone strange prowling about. No, no, Constable, goodness. No cause for alarm, you say. I must disagree. You alone? Yes. Yes, Enid's gone to the cinema with our boarder, Mr. Pembroke. Oh. Well, he'll no doubt see your sister back safely, Miss Sarah. But you know, you'd best lock up the place. Keep all the doors and the windows tight shut. I will, I will. And stay indoors until your sister and Mr. Pembroke return. Oh, believe me, Constable, I won't stir out of this house. Mercy, no. You watch as the constable walks off down the path, rejoins his men near the front gate. The dogs begin an impatient, annoying baying as they're led off into the night. A shiver runs through you, doesn't it, Sarah? And you tell yourself that you must fix some hot tea at once. In the kitchen, your hand trembles nervously as you go about it. And then as you sit down to drink it, there's a sound at the front of the house. You stiffen, wait nervously, until your sister Enid appears, accompanied by Mr. Pembroke. Sarah, Sarah, have you heard the news? A bandit. He took 10,000 pounds from a bank in London today. And now he's wounded and they're searching for him out here on the cliff. Now, now, Enid, don't upset your sister. It's not pleasant news that a criminal's about. I should say no, not pleasant, but it's exciting. Oh, you you fixed the tea, Sarah. Uh, Mr. Pembroke, you were saying you were chilly. Yes, that I was. Well, that, that was thoughtful of you, Miss Sarah. Help yourself. Did you enjoy the cinema? Yes, very much. Very much. Um... You hear any sounds about the place, Miss Sarah? Anything unusual? Nothing, nothing at all. Oh, dear, now who could that be? I'll get it, Enid. Yes? Sarah, that you, dearie? Oh, Mrs. McMurtry, how are you? Have you heard, dearie, about the bandit? I mean, right here in Hemsley, the constable said, imagine he stole 10,000... It's only one of the villagers, Mrs. McMurtry, excited, eager to chat about the bandit. You're hardly listening to a word she's saying, Sarah. You let her talk on and on. And finally, you manage to break away from her. And as you return to the kitchen... Oh, Mrs. McMurtry, all excited. She'd have talked for... Enid, where's Mr. Pembroke? Oh, I, I sent him down to the basement to fetch a jar of your marmalade. What? Why, anything wrong, Sarah? Uh, no. No, but, but he might have trouble finding it. I, I best get down there myself. Oh, oh, Miss Sarah, where well, you didn't have to come now. Oh, no bother, Mr. Pembroke. Well, I was just about Here, to... Here, not the closet. I'll find the jars for you. Oh, well, now you're, you're very kind, looking after our welfare and appetite. It's this of... cupboard. Oh. Yes, yes, here we are. Oh, yes, uh, fine. Well, back we go, hmm? To the hot tea. After you. Mind the stairs. <laughs> Ah, well, Miss Sarah's marmalade, crumpets, and tea. Now, what could be more perfect? Ah, I say. Now, suppose... Supposing we found that bandit. Just we three. Ten thousand pounds would be nice now, wouldn't it? Hmm? Oh, you'd have to turn it in, Mr. Pembroke. It's stolen. Oh, <laughs> I'm just supposing, Miss Enid. He's talking, Enid, that's all. And supposing. Certainly, that's all. Oh, but how nice. Ten thousand pounds. That's almost worth the chance the poor chap took. It wasn't. It was wicked. I I hope they catch him. Don't listen to him, Enid. He's saying it all for your benefit. Well, I'm saying it for all our benefits. I've got it all figured out. Yes. A uh, 
A shallow grave, Miss Sarah? Plenty of quicklime and whoosh, no trace of the blighter. Quicklime? Does it do that? Oh, beautifully, my dears. Ah, uh, so I've been told. Sarah, make him stop. <laughs> but wouldn't it take a great deal? Oh, no more than I suggested you ordered to fix that garden bed, Miss Sarah. But, uh, but then we, we, we haven't found the carcass now, have we? Or the ten thousand pounds. I, I'm going to bed. You two are talking dreadfully. Mr. Pembroke's just in a talkative mood. Quite. But only talking, Miss Enid. Please forgive me. Oh, speaking of quicklime in the garden, Mr. Pembroke, you did promise me that you'd... Yes, I did. That I'd fix it beautifully, but uh, not without the material, Miss Sarah. You'd better get it tomorrow, right? Yes. Yes, I, I'm going into the village in the morning. I, I'll speak to the storekeeper about it. Perfect. Perfect. And your garden will be even more so. Now, in spite of all dreadful warnings, I've simply got to have my evening stroll. I'll not go far, ladies. Not far at all. Good night. <laughs> Well, well, good morning, Miss Zara. What brings you to store today, hmm? We slip up on your order? No, Mr. Hart, it was quite correct, thank you. I've come for some quick lines. Oh? Our boarder, Mr. Pembroke, suggested it. He's going to be kind enough to renovate the garden soil. Oh, yes, it's excellent for that purpose. Hey, hey, would you like a full bag? I think that would do it nicely, Mr. Hodges. We'll deliver it out this afternoon, Miss Zara. That's fine. Good day. Good day to you, Miss Zara. <laughs> You've other things to do in the village, haven't you, Sarah? And you spend about an hour shopping, browsing. And then upon your return to the house, you're startled at the distinct sound of someone moving about. Downstairs, you hurry quickly to the basement door and stare down in surprise at Mr. Pembroke. But what are you doing, Mr. Pembroke? Isn't this rather an odd hour for you to be home? Yes. Yes, Miss Sarah. Uh, come down, won't you? I, uh, I think you'll agree to an odd circumstance. Yes. My, uh, my curiosity has simply had the best of me all day. Here. You see? What are they? The cufflinks. I found them last night near the basement door when I returned from my walk. Cufflinks? I, I, I don't understand. Oh, I... don't you? Don't you really, Miss Sarah? Well, here now. Look at the initials. C.L. I'm sure they mean nothing. C.L. Chester Loomis, Miss Sarah. The name of the bandit. Our London bank robber. He of the missing 10,000 pounds. What? Oh, now, please, please, Miss Sarah. You're not the actress you fancy yourself. Come over here, my dear. The closet. No. Yes. The one you kept me from opening last night. Now, let's see what we shall see. Hmm? Ah, not marmalade, not even the ten thousand pounds, but quite unmistakably a strange guest. Yes, Miss Sarah, it's Chester Loomis, and he is quite dead. I, I don't know a thing about it. I... Oh, come now, Miss Sarah. Chester Loomis, wounded, hiding, crawled into the house and locked himself in your closet? <laughs> Hardly. Now, do tell me, in what neat spot did you hide his loot, the... Uh, Ten thousand pounds. Shall we discuss it over tea? Sarah? Now that vacations are over and school days are here again, most of us are settling down to some serious thinking about economy. And economy, that's where Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, shines. Yes, if you've lived out west any length of time, you already know that throughout the Pacific Coast states, from Canada to Mexico, Signal Gasoline has an enviable reputation for mileage. But mileage, mind you, is only half of Signal's story, and it's easy to see why. After all, in order to give you such good mileage, today Signal Gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quick starting, peppy pickup, and smooth, quiet power. More of the things that make driving more pleasure. 
That's why we say mileage and performance are like birds of a feather. They go together. You're sure of both when you power your car with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. The secret is out in the open, isn't it? At least as far as Mr. Pembroke knowing. And upstairs in the kitchen, you face him across the table. Watch as he sips the tea you made at his insistence. Wonder what he's going to do. Puzzle at the strange smile that moves across his face as he seems to enjoy both the tea and your discomfort. <laughs> it's all right, Sarah. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> Clever of you, you know. What do you intend to do about the matter, Mr. Pembroke? Oh, now, now, don't lose your warmth, my dear girl, your friendly consideration of me. Oh, no. No, indeed. No, it's a simple matter. We're partners now, that's all. Partners? Mm Mm-hmm. We share the secret. The secret of Chester Loomis' demise. And, of course, the 10,000 pounds. You will tell me where you put it now, won't you? I can scarcely do otherwise. That's correct. Now, tell me, how did it come about? Did he just wander in, or did you go out and corral him, Sarah? Last night, early, I heard a sound at the basement door. I investigated. It was Loomis, almost done in. You? You finished him off? No, it wasn't necessary. He'd scarcely made it down the basement stairs when he collapsed. I saw the money in a small black bag. Ah. I took it and shoved his body into the closet. Shortly afterwards, before I had time to think, the constable happened by. A stout girl, and you didn't give him a sign? No, I did not. Ah, noble partner. Well, now I'll let you into a little secret, Sarah. Um, why, why do you suppose poor Chester Loomis picked this particular house? I'm sure I don't know that. No, but I do, my dear. He was no doubt looking for me. Yes, me. <laughs> His old partner. What? Yes, it's your day for surprises, isn't it, Sarah? Oh, yes. Loomis and I used to cook up many a delightful doings together. I've often wondered about you, Mr. Pembroke. Mm, but uh, as long as I paid my keep... Hmm? Yes, I'm afraid that was as far as my concern went. Well, that's a good thing for both of us, my dear. We'll do nobly together. Beautifully. Oh, but there's work to be done. Some digging. Hmm? I, I haven't the quick line. It will be along this afternoon. That's fine. Fine. I'll go down to the basement and start the preparations, my dear. Uh, first, <laughs> the uh, shallow grave. Pardon? Hmm? I wasn't just supposing last night, after all. Upstairs, you pace the floor of your room. It's unfortunate, isn't it, Sarah, that Mr. Pembroke made this discovery, that you must share the 10,000 pounds. Of course, he will be a help. You can hear him hard at work all afternoon. You wonder when the quick line will arrive. And you're startled when you receive a phone call from the storekeeper that they're out of quick line, And it won't be along until tomorrow. You hurry down to the basement and tell Mr. Pembroke. Well, no matter. We'll do without, that's all. We'll jolly well do... Without. But you're... You're certain it'll be all right? Oh, of course. It'll have to be all right. Oh, <coughs> is it devilish hard work, this? I could do with a brace on the girl. I don't suppose you'd have a drop about the house, hmm? No. No, I didn't think so. How long before you're finished? Oh, I'd say about another hour. Oh, this stuff's as solid as concrete, nearly. Well, I never ran into anything quite like that before. Wait. Hmm? Listen. Yes, someone's moving about upstairs. It's Enid. She's back from work. Oh, that time already? Well, we can't go on with this now. That's certain. She's bound to hear. You can finish tonight after she's gone to bed. Better she were out of the house, don't you think? Yes. Yes, all right. I'll see what I can do. It's a simple matter, isn't it, Sarah, to arrange for Enid to be out of the house that night. Dinner over, you ask her to take some sewing work you've been doing for Mrs. McMurtry to her house at the other end of the village. Then when Enid's gone, you hurry upstairs to Mr. Pembroke's room. Now, coast clear, is it? Yes. You'd better get to work. Yes, in a minute. 
Um, come in, Sarah. Well? You know, I've been thinking about that money, the 10,000 pounds. You'll get your share, as soon as the job's done. Half. That's what we agreed on, hmm? Yes, half. Good. I'll be wanting it tonight. Oh? Yes, that's right. Not that I don't trust you, you understand. It's just that I've been thinking about it, as I said. Rather turning it over in my mind. I, I've been thinking it would be rather a smart move for your Mr. Pembroke to do a bit of traveling, and the sooner the better. Why? Oh, well, I'm the restless type, you might say. And besides, the police are still looking for old Loomis, you know. So? So they've traced him to the village here, and that's where the trail ends. Now, they'll have to start wondering about that. Start checking up on some of his old pals. So I planned on driving up to London tonight, as soon as we split the swag. Any objections? No, none at all. As I said, you'll get your share as soon as the work's finished. Yes, I will. Right. Well, i better hop to it now, hmm? He's right, isn't he, Sarah? It wouldn't do at all to have the police coming around, asking questions of Mr. Pembroke. Downstairs again in the kitchen, you pace the floor, occasionally stopping to glance out the side window. You can hear him down in the basement, the dull thud of the pickaxe. The minutes drag by, and finally you step to the cupboard, take down a bottle, and pour a drink. Your hand is trembling as you take it downstairs to Mr. Pembroke. <sighs> well, well, well. What have we here? I thought you might need it. I forgot we had it. Ah. Ah, I could uh, I could do with a spot. Uh, when's the Enid expected? Not for another hour, I'd say. Mrs. McMurtry's a bit of a talker. That's good. I will be in the cure by then. Friend Loomis safely tucked away, neat and proper like. Mm -hmm. Everything back in its place. Well, I'll have a go at it again. You move slowly. Circle around Mr. Pembroke never taking your eyes off him for a moment as he bends to his work. Finally, your hand comes to rest on the hammer lying on top of an old trunk. And then you're standing directly behind him as he straightens up and stops to mop his brow. You lift the hammer high and then bring it down. This is Sarah, Mrs. McMurtry. May I speak with Enid, please? Of course, dearie. Just a moment. It's for you, Enid, my dear. Uh, yes, Sarah? Enid, Mr. Pembroke's just received a phone call. He's leaving in a few moments for London on business. Oh? Well, I was just thinking I'd drive up with him. I haven't been to London in some time. Yes, of course, Sarah. It would be nice for you. I might do a bit of shopping tomorrow and then come back on the evening train. Mm -hmm. Do go, Sarah. All right. I, I just wanted to be sure you wouldn't mind. No, of course not. Run along. I I'll be home in a bit. Well, Mr. Pembroke's bringing his car around now. We'll be leaving in a few moments. Uh, have a nice time, dear. I will, Enid. See you tomorrow night. <laughs> You hurry back down to the cellar. Make certain everything is in order. The old trunks move back over the spot where Mr. Pembroke was digging the grave. The grave he now shares with his old partner in crime, Chester Loomis. Then you slip into your hat and coat. Hurry outside. Slide in behind the wheel of Mr. Pembroke's car. And drive off into the night toward London. <laughs> It's almost midnight when you arrive in London. Ab abandon Mr. Pembroke's car on a quiet side street. Take a cab and drive across town to a fashionable hotel where you spend a comfortable night. The next day in London is just as you dreamed it would be. The smart shops, the expensive restaurants, the matinee at the Regent Theatre. You plan to do it all again, Sarah, many times. And that night, after an exciting day, you board the evening train for Hemsley. It's almost 10.30 when you arrive. And as you approach the house, you're rather startled to see that all the lights are on. Sensing that something is wrong, you hurry up the front steps. Sarah! 
Oh, Sarah, it's you. What? Sarah, Sarah. Why, Enid, what is all this? Oh, dear, I, you don't know what we've been through. We thought you were dead. Dead? Oh, good evening, Miss Sarah. Why, Constable, what in the world are you doing here? Well, it's about your boarder, Mr. Pembroke. Only he isn't Mr. Pembroke at all. Mr. Pembroke isn't Mr... Oh, now, what are you talking about, dear? Perhaps I'd better explain. I wish someone would. You see, we got word from the police in London about Mr. Pembroke. Seems he's really a chap named Brooks. Harry Brooks. Gentle Harry, they call him. Gentle Harry? A murderer, Sarah. They say he's killed three women already. What? That's right, Miss Sarah. You see, we got wind of this Harry Brooks several months ago. Scotland Yard asked us to be on the lookout for him. Told us to warn all shopkeepers. Asked them to report all purchases of quicklime made by women. What's that? Usually operates in the same manner. Somehow he gets to be quite chummy with the ladies. Then gets her to buy quick line for the garden, he always says. Next thing you know, the lady disappears. Quick line? Now, wait a moment. He asked me to... That's oh. right. And when you ordered it, the storekeeper told us about it right away. Stalled on the delivery. We immediately sent a description of Mr. Pembroke to Scotland Yard. And the answer came back this afternoon. The description of Mr. Pembroke fits gentle Harry Brooks to a T. Oh, how horrible. Then when I came here to warn you, Miss Eney told me you'd gone motoring with Mr. Pembroke. Well, that fit the pattern, you see. All the other ladies went on trips with Mr. Pembroke, too. Only as it turned out, they hadn't gone at all. Oh, I see. When did you see Mr. Pembroke last? Why, uh, uh, when we arrived in London last night. I'll better put in a call to the yard right away. Tell him to keep an eye out for Pembroke up there. That'll be the end of it as far as we're concerned. Unless he decides to come back. I, I don't think so, Enid. Oh? No, you, you know, Constable, he acted rather strangely last evening. Seemed nervous, jittery. Do you suppose he suspected the police were closing in on him? That's possible. Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. I'm sure he did. No, Enid, under the circumstances, I, I don't think we'll ever see gentle Harry Brooks Pembroke again. <laughs> You probably think boiling water is hot. Actually, it's 212 degrees, practically cool as a cucumber, compared with the 2,700 degree temperatures that exist in certain parts of your car's engine. That's heat enough to make ordinary motor oils break down chemically and form harmful varnish that clogs up important engine parts, causing your car to lose pep and power and eat up gasoline and oil. That's why Signal Oil Company brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an extra-duty lubricant scientifically engineered to protect your car against varnish troubles. And Signal Premium does this important job in not just one way, but two ways. First, Signal Premium can't break down and form varnish, even under extreme heat. And secondly, Signal Premium actually dissolves out harmful varnish that other motor oils may already have deposited. That's why a change to Signal Premium Motor Oil is today's best way to keep your car's performance up and repair bills down. And, of course, the place to change to this extra-duty Signal Oil that does so much more than just lubricate is at a Signal service station. It's all over now, isn't it, Sarah? And you're certain you're in the clear. The police will be looking for Mr. Pembroke in London, where you told the constable you saw him last. Yes. And they'll never know he's buried in the cellar of your house here in Hemsley. Buried along with Bandit Loomis in the grave he dug. Now your secret is safe. And the money you took from Loomis, the 10,000 pounds stolen from the bank, it's all yours. After the constable has completed his call to London... He joins you and your sister Enid as you walk into the kitchen. And then suddenly a sound reaches your ears. And you stop dead in your tracks. Why, what's that? Why, what's the matter, Sarah? That's that noise. It's coming from the cellar. Eh? Hey? Oh, oh, I almost forgot about the boys. The boys? Well, what do you mean? Well, you see, Miss Sarah, this Pembroke chap, he always disposed of his victims in the same manner. And always in the cellar. 
Now, when we thought he'd killed you... That's the first place the constable thought to look. I know you. That's right. I've had some of my boys digging up your cellar. I hope you don't mind, Miss Sarah. I'll tell them to... Oh, uh, Stan was just coming downstairs to tell you to quit. We found Miss Bolton safe and sat. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, I'm thinking you'd better come down to the cellar, Constable. We just found the body of that Loomis chap. Loomis? Yes, and Pembroke too. Both of them? That's right, sir, in the same grave. What does it mean, I... I'm afraid there's only one person who can answer that. How about it, Miss Sarah? That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, you get so much more pleasure out of driving when you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and don't take chances. That moment you try to save might be your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Sarah Selby, and Ben Wright. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Off. X minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, X minus 1. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story: No contact. It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the great galactic barrier. In the past ten years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, at an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987, that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now hear this. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Well, Lewis, this is it. I don't suppose you'll be needing the ship's doctor up here on the bridge during blast off. I think not, Smitty. There's little chance of acceleration bends in these new overdrive ships. I'll be in my office then, counting vitamin pills if you need me. It's only a few steps. Good luck, Lewis. Thank you, Smitty. Uh, Lieutenant Collier. Uh, yes, sir. 
If you're relieved, you'd better get down to navigation control and take over. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? We've never flown together before. This is your first flight in a space vessel as big as the Star Cloud. Yes, sir, but I was trained in oversized jobs at the Naval Academy. Well, if you're half as good a navigator as your father was, you'll do fine. Thank you, sir. Did you ship out with my father? I served under him on one of the first rocket runs to the moon. I see. I almost went along on his last trip to the barrier. Um, too bad about that. Yes, sir. That's all, Collier. Lieutenant Paulson. Get me the ground control tower on the field. I want to talk to Colonel Harrison. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. I patched in the bridge speaker. Colonel Harrison? Yes, Captain? We're standing by for takeoff in 30 seconds. Good. The field's cleared of all personnel. We'll try to reestablish radio contact immediately after takeoff. In any event, there'll be a 24-hour ground monitor. Fine. Good luck. Hope you make it. Thank you. Bridge to navigation control. Nav control, call you at. Ready, Lieutenant? We're ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right. Stand by for blastoff. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 20 seconds. 19. 18. 17. 16. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? Paulson, sir. We've uncovered a stowaway. Stowaway? Where? Hiding in sick bay. Dr. Smithson found it. Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room. Kill your rockets and stand by. Thorson, this is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's a stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this base. What's the All matter right, with you? Captain, take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, takeoff can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take Don't to... bother for me for a while. I'm busy. Stupid idiot. Captain Thorson? Yes, come in, Smitty. Here's your stowaway. Now, Port Marshal... The... Oh... Charlie. Can you use a good radio man, Skipper? Well, I see you two have met. I met. Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Skipper? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They they turned me down. Well, what's wrong with you? Acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, Skipper. I, I got one more good trip in me. Listen, Skipper, you... You you know that these green kids, they don't know the first thing about space radio operation. Now, you, you put a man like me on and I'll, I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. Charlie, you know the regulations as well as I do. I can't take you much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. Well, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'll have you put a ground. I'll tell you what, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact. And it'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. Well, he'd better. I'll have him busted to Corporal for letting you sneak aboard. Look, Charlie, you... Look, you'd better be off. Uh, Paulison. Yes, sir. I'm sending this man to ground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. I'm... I'm sorry. Good luck, Skip. I thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. If it had been anyone else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, he's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command when we began the regular run to the moon. And if he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Captain Dawson, nav control, call you. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, how badly are we fouled up? Can you recalculate the course, or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. If we take off in exactly 30 seconds, we'll need to correct for only a one-degree deflection. I can do that before we breach the stratosphere. That's quick work. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Positive, sir. All right, Collier. I'm putting it in your hands. We'll blast off on your signal. Bridge to engine room. Prepare to blast off on navigator's signal. <laughs> How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. That's four, three, two, zero. We've intersected the course vector. Good work, Collier. Course is corrected, sir. We're ready to go into atomic overdrive any time you say. All right. Stand by. Yes, sir. Now hear this. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. 
Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Withdraw your dampening rods. Mission chamber ready. Blast tubes cleared. All generators operating at capacity. Take it over, sir. Go into overdrive at the count of zero. Three seconds, Mr. Collier. Three, two, two, one, one, zero, zero. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. My compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit, and he was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Oh, thank you, sir. Start your gyros. Put her on robot control. All right, the bridge is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. Well, Lewis, I see you got us off the ground. You can thank young Collier for that. Chip off the old block. Uh, you knew his father? As a matter of fact, I knew him very well. First-rate spaceman. Oh, is he the one yes, who... Yes, yes. He was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Volta. Lewis, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Oh, your guess is as good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's a nit? How about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space? That the ships reach it and slip into another dimension? I think that's a lot of rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. Why do you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. And we know that it destroys our ships and crews in some way. There's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it, Lewis? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. The entire hull of this ship is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Now, who are you trying to convince? <laughs> Well, myself, I suppose. Lewis, you've had your share of glory. First skipper to reach the moon back in 1962, you could have retired. Why are you risking this trip? Five ships are missing. Men like Prentice, Margotson, young Collier's father. I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going to Volta? We haven't any choice, Smitty. We're in a race, the kind of race where men and ships are expendable. According to the Interspace Code, the first nation to reach Volta can claim it. Well, personally, I want no part of it. Now, Doc. I'll have to play physician, morale builder, and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. And your morale doesn't sound too good, Doc. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction, it is terrible. And something tells me as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Well, I see they haven't court-martialed you yet. No, sir. Thanks to you. Well, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. All right. Now, how's our signal? Strong. Clear as a bell. Now, here's our log report for Colonel Harris. You ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running through. No radiation. Operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. How's the morale, Smitty? The men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. Oh, how's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Ah, I was afraid of that. Are they bad? Same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. Eyes are sensitive to infrared. Uh, I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blues. Well, now there's a theory it's caused by the terrific acceleration of atomic overdrive. Change in gravity affects the circulation. Hmm. What do you think? I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's just an occupational disease of space navigators. Uh -huh. 
Do you think it's just uh, nerves, then? Well, young Collier's got a bad case. I I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not a panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Sir, I understand that you've relieved me from duty. Well, Dr. Smithson says you aren't looking very well, Collier. I'm giving you a rest. Sir, I feel perfectly able to continue. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. Captain, I'd like to remain at my post. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. Do you think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I, I I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading policy? Uh, we're getting a plus five radar bounce now. Coming off the barrier almost as fast as we sent it out. What's the interval? Two seconds. Shortening steadily. This rate will hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right. Alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now, hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Uh, policy. Yes, sir. The radar bounces up to plus six. We'd better try to make final contact with Earth. Is Spark still trying to raise the base? Uh, yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. Huh? Seems to be some interference. Oh, that's the radio room now. Yes? You got him? Well, cut in on the bridge speaker. Captain will take it from here. Hello? Star Cloud to Earth. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. We're getting heavy static from sunspots. That's not sunspots, Charlie. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Getting a plus... Si no, a plus seven radar bounce. Expect to hit the barrier almost any second now. Good luck, Skipper. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece, I'll try to get back to you on the high frequency band. Gotcha, Skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, Star Cloud. Must be getting awfully close now, Captain. Echo's bouncing back so fast it's almost beating the signal. Well, when they go inside, hold on to your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Well, here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain. <laughs> nothing happened. We, we made it. We made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. Now, the, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They've earned it. Doc, can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can, Lord. This calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? It couldn't be better. How's yours? It couldn't be better. What's Condition red. Condition red. Condition red. Radiation detectors. Condition red. Radiation detectors. Holy mackerel. Look at the needle on that indicator. Hollison. Hollison. Yes, I see it, Captain. Picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? Well, it's a strong impulse. What kind? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray, too short for UHF. Whatever it is, sir, the ship is lousy. Well, track it down, triangulate it, and make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is the fission chambers? No leak here, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? Well, keep at it. Paulison, how are you doing? Uh, I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? Well, I'll have to recheck my figures. Well, hurry it up. Angle is correct, but now, I... Come I on, don't... man, for Pete's sake. Where's the radiation coming from? Sir, it's... It's coming from inside the ship. Oh, that's impossible. No, sir, I've checked it twice. Well, it's got to be the engines, then. If it is, sir, we're finished. Engine room. Yes, sir. That radiation must be in the overdrive pile. No, sir, it isn't here, sir. Are you certain? Yes, sir. All right, keep checking. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing this ship inch by inch. Yes, sir. All right, turn it on. Yes, sir. All right. Ready, Captain. We'll check the atomic guns first. Come on. 
We'll uh, cut through the officer's quarters here to ordinance. I'll turn here. Oh, well, wait a minute, sir. Huh? What is it? The signal's weaker now. Yeah. Let's go back. Hold it. Hold it. Seems strongest right about here. Oh, it doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is this? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier? Oh, he's down in the nap control, sir. Oh, I'll try the door. It's not locked, sir. Oh, it's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked, oh, sir. Oh, smash it. Shut oh, off that Geiger counter. Now, what do you make of this, Paulus? Oh, it looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufacture. I, I, I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. I, I've never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Paulison. Get down to nav control and bring Collier up to the bridge on the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? Uh, I know a way. <laughs> Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with a transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? Oh, you know nothing about it. Oh, no, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir, unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? I suppose so, if someone had a key. I found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I meant a key to the wall cabin. I... I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, I... Uh... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? Well, I just assumed, sir. Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie. Having known and respected your father. Having observed the way you handle your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Paulison, turn on that Geiger collar. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter, how do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? Well, I... I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom were you sending those signals? Condition red! Condition red! There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approach! Alien spaceship approach! Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk! Very well, Captain. My mission seems completed. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. Oh, what? The government of the planet of Voltan. You're crazy. Are you so stupid, Captain? Did you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information? Your language, your culture, family background. Uh, your appearance, you, you, you look like... Like Commander Collier? Well, is that so surprising, Captain? You see, Captain, we had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish, Captain. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship now coming in water frame. I'll deal with you later, Collier Paulison. Yes, sir. Put this man in irons, take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Captain, drop him. Gunnery. Gunnery Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters. They're closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on the bearing. Fire. Fire, Richardson. Richardson, did you hear me? Fire! What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no what? use to shout, Captain. Collier, how did you get loose? Where's Paulison? Lieutenant Paulison is dead. All stations! Lieutenant Collier has escaped! Seize him, men! Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. You're lying. No, Captain. 
Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. No? Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Robinson, Haley, report. You see, Captain? Cap... Carpenter! Robinson! Haley! It's quite useless, Captain. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. Very well, Collier. You beat us. What now? The ship will be taken to Volta for, shall we say, further experimentation. I see. Of course, there's one thing you hadn't counted on. Just what is that, Captain? Listen! <laughs> Are you in there, Lieutenant Carpenter? We can't all be dead. There must be one alive. Smitty, Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty, what have they done to him? Lewis, oh, I... dirty. I, uh, I, don't talk. I must lean, lean closer. It's not much time. Lewis, space blues. Space blues? What is it, Smitty? What are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues. Blues. Voltans. Then, hello, let me help you. Oh, Lewis, get message back to Earth. Voltan, fifth column. Watch out for space. Blues. Smitty. Oh, Smitty. Captain Thorson. Captain Thorson, you can't hide from us now. Come back to the bridge and surrender. All my men will come and get you. Hello. Hello. Star Cloud calling Earth. Oh, please, God, let me get through. It was too late. Hello. Star Cloud to Earth. Come in, please. Come in, please. Earth. Captain Thorson calling. Charlie, come in, please. Hurry. Hello. Oh, hello. Can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. Oh, my God. Now, look, Charlie, listen to me. Not much time. Get word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Fultons. What? Fultons. Spell that. V O L. Fultons. That's right. They're from the planet Volta. Skipper. Skipper, are you all right? Now, Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now, listen, they have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You mean it? Of course I mean it. Tell Harrison, posing as humans. You can detect them by space blues. You got that only Fultons get space blue. Charlie, did you hear me? Space blue. I get you. They're breaking in, Charlie. I'm defending you. Warn everybody. Captain. They, they open the door. So long, Charlie. Tell her. Captain. <laughs> Captain Thorson. Hello. Hello, Star Cloud. What's the trouble, Sergeant? I was just trying to raise the star cloud, Colonel. I had any luck? No, sir. No contact. No contact, eh? No, sir. Mm, nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get a message back. No, sir. Neither do I. Oh, all right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, you you do that, sir. It's all yours. Right. Oh, and Charlie, uh, you better go out and get yourself some coffee. You look a little blue around the gills. Tonight, X-1 has brought you No Contact, written by George Lefferts from an original story of Lefferts and Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Captain, Donald Buca as Collier, Wendell Holmes as Charlie, and Bill Griffiths, Bill Smith, Matt Crowley, and Ken Williams. Your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week... When you want to take over a world, you naturally look for its weak point, some way to catch its people off guard. 
We live in a world where everybody loves a parade, a world of press agents and publicity stunts. But who would ever dream that invaders from outer space would take advantage of that weakness and actually hire a press agent to advertise their coming? Who would believe it was anything but just another publicity gag? At least, not until the terrible moment when it was already too late. The moment of... X... Minus... From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bert Major, Masters Insurance and Trust. Oh, hi, Bert. What's up? Poor little rich girl in California wants to take out a $200,000 straight life policy on her husband with herself as beneficiary. A lot of dough, but not too unusual, if you can afford it. Effective in two weeks and hush-hush. A surprise. But who'd want to... Why? Exactly. Nice piece of change for the company in commissions or for her in payoff if she's playing that kind of a game. You talk like you don't know her. Name only. Deal was arranged pending through her lawyer in Los Angeles. Hmm. You could be out there in the morning, Johnny. All right, Bert. Who gives me the filling? Our agent out there, Roger Hackey. He'll meet you at International Airport. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Masters Insurance and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the poor little rich girl matter. Expense account item one, $280, round-trip plane ticket and incidentals, including sunglasses, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived, rested, ready, and right on schedule. Also on schedule was Roger Hackey, Masters Los Angeles agent who turned out to be a repressed comedian, become insurance salesman. Yep, I said to myself, that's Johnny Dollar, I said. You are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? In person. You Roger Hackey? In person. <laughs> you got the old feel, haven't you? Simpatico, we call it out here. <laughs> uh, have a nice trip? Yeah. Good, good. Airplanes scare me. Don't like being up there in the wild blue yonder. Terra Burma is my dish of tea. <laughs> Slow but sure, they call me. Yeah, well, look. Now, I... if you just follow me, we'll jump in my jalopy, and I'll have you at the Beverly Hilton before you can say happy hooligan. You said. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, here we go. Cloud of dust and all that. The ride from the air terminal to the hotel was hot, silent on my part, and unproductive so far as the case was concerned. Roger Hankey kept up a running commentary on everything from bad actors to the Zodiac. It wasn't until I was settled in my room with drink in hand and shoeless feet propped up that I could get him to switch to the $200,000 surprise. Her name is Cynthia Durbin. Now, how much do you know about her? Nothing. Bert Major said you'd give me the background. Now, well, she's a strange one. You know what a chameleon is? Well, sure, a lizard that changes color, so what? So, that's the kind of a gal Cynthia Durbin is. At least she is now. You're losing me, Roger. Begin at the beginning. Now, you're the doctor. As the Siamese twins said after the operation, what's missing? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How did you meet Cynthia Durbin? Well, she came into the office yesterday. No call, no appointment. There she was. Oh, what's she like? A trim. Real trim. And expensive. Just casually announced she wanted to buy $200,000 worth of insurance, huh? Well, not exactly. She started asking about various policies, you know, endowments, straight life, etc., and how and when they paid off. And she kept giving me the big eye and cross-leg routine. Hmm. She tell you anything about herself? Oh, didn't have to. I already knew. She's practically a fixture in the society section of the Sunday papers. Garden parties, opening nights and all that. Yeah, but only lately. Her husband? Peter Durbin. He's been a public figure ever since they got married about three years ago. But she has No, no, just the last couple of months or so. Uh -huh. How old is she? Oh, around 25. Blonde, blooming, and gorgeous, if figuratively speaking. <laughs> I take it she has the money, huh? Yeah, right. He was a well-torsoed movie bit player with a champagne appetite. I see. Now, uh, what about this surprise angle? Well, she came right to the point. Said her husband had just had a complete physical. Asked if his doctor's report would be acceptable. If so, okay. But she didn't sign her up. Why? 
But she didn't give me the chance. What do you mean? All of a sudden, she reached in her purse and pulled out a piece of paper with a name and address on it, announced this was her attorney. See him, she said, smiled big, and walked out. Did you go and see the attorney? Right away. A guy by the name of uh, Crane Collins has big plush offices downtown, old senior partner type. What did he have to say? Oh, nothing except routine questions about filling out the forms, uh, expediting the procedure, importance of secrecy for the surprise. Oh, why didn't you ask a few questions? Couldn't. What do you mean, couldn't? She was there. Doing what? Sitting back in a corner, all huddled up like a mouse, waiting to be pounced on. Didn't say a word. While Collins and I filled out the papers. Hmm. Yeah, she signed them as if they were a death warrant. Went back to the corner and stared at the wall. Now I see what you meant by that comedian remark. Yeah, she's too much for me. Yeah. A leopard can change its spots, too. <laughs> Expense account item two, $3.25 taxi fare to the offices of Crane Collins. So far, all I knew was that the wealthy young woman wanted a pot full of insurance on her husband. If it hadn't been for the surprise request, it would have been routine. Now it wasn't. And the people involved, one of them at least, were not routine. I was ushered into an oak panel office high above the streets of Los Angeles. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Collins. Your card identifies you as an insurance investigator, Mr. Dollar. I don't believe I understand. Cynthia Durbin is your client? Why, yes. You represented this client yesterday in the signing of an application for a $200,000 straight life insurance policy on her husband. Yes? I represent the company. Everything is in order, is it not? Insurance is a, a lot of things, Mr. Collins. A surprise to the insured is one of the things it isn't. My client is adamant in this respect. Call it a, a quirk, if you will. You expect the company to issue a $200,000 policy on a quirk? <clears throat> well, How long now, have you known Mrs. Durbin? Since she was born. Then you know her father? Knew him. I am his executor. Uh-huh. Mother? Also deceased. Both parents died when Cynthia was 17. I was her guardian and have been her legal advisor since she came of age. Was she well provided for? Very. What kind of a man is her husband? Young, about 30. Tall, good-looking. No, no, Mr. Collins. Not statistics. Your impressions. He plays an excellent game of golf. Gets along well with people when he wants to. But you don't like him, do you? In this profession, Mr. Dollar, I neither like nor dislike people. I represent them, and that representation is based on fact. Well, in my profession, we go by feel as well as fact. Well, tell me candidly, Mr. Collins, do you think there's anything strange about this request for insurance on her husband? As I said, I deal in facts, not feelings. As a client, she sought professional assistance. Ergo, I supplied it. <sighs> Where do the Durbans live? I'd rather Oh, not. now, look. I can get it from any society editor in town. My secretary will give you the information. All right, thank you. By the way, don't tell Mrs. Durbin or anyone else that we've had this discussion. If you do, there will be no insurance issued. Interference with investigative procedure. Fact, Mr. Collins. I understand. <laughs> Expense account item three, $2.60, phone call. Then taxi to Roger Hackey's office. A neat one-story building in the Miracle Mile on Wilshire Boulevard. Purpose? To borrow Roger's company car. The Durbins lived in one of those colonial mansions out in Beverly Hills, surrounded by curving driveways, spacious lawns, swimming pool and cabanas, all of it enclosed by thick high walls and electronically controlled gates. The mention of insurance on the intercom got me in. Cynthia Durbin was everything Roger said she was. The first time he met her, that is. Please excuse my appearance, Mr. Dollar. I've been swimming. Oh, uh, I, uh, I don't mind at all, Mrs. Durbin. <laughs> really, you shouldn't have come here to deliver the policy. What if my husband had been home? No surprise. No, and that would have spoiled everything. Well, may I have it, please? Uh, the uh, paperwork has not been completed yet. Then what are you doing here? What do you want? Get to the point. Well, just a few questions, Mrs. Durbin. My colleague, Mr. Hackey, should have handled these details yesterday, but he was somewhat uh, rushed. Oh, then there's nothing wrong with... Would you care for a drink, Mr. Dollar? Thanks. The bar's out by the pool. Shall we? Mm. 
She was wearing a bikini and high heel beach sandals, and she led the way. I was hoping it was two miles to the pool instead of the 75 yards it turned out to be. I mixed the drinks, and we settled down in a couple of sun lounges. Ah, oh, those details, Mr. Dollar. Mm, just formalities, actually. You ought to be the beneficiary? Yes. That was discussed yesterday. Ah, oh, yes, so it was. What does your husband do, Mrs. Durbin? He doesn't work, if that's what you mean. He doesn't have to. I have enough for both of us. Johnny. Yeah? Freshen my drink, will you please? Oh, sure. <laughs> so tell me, did you ever contemplate divorce? Divorce? What if I make you ask a question like that? Well? Of course not. We've had our differences. Minor ones. But couple hasn't. Yeah, I suppose you got a point there. Here you are. Thank you. Johnny. Why did you pick two weeks from today to be the effective date of the policy? Isn't that my business? His birthday, Mrs. Durbin? What? Your husband, the surprise. Well, yes, yes it is, but all these questions... Plan to throw a big party for him? Yes. No, I don't know. Johnny... Your husband would be worth a lot more to you dead than alive, wouldn't he, Mrs. Durbin? Hand me that robe, please. Sure, sure. There you are. But you haven't answered my question. I'm sorry, you... You'll have to excuse me. I have a headache. A terrible headache. Something was definitely wrong here. A girl of her age should have flared at my questions. Should have snapped back at me instead of blindly running away. Yeah, something was wrong, all right. But I'd seen what I'd come to see. Both facets of Cynthia Durbin's personality. And was one of them actually thinking in terms of murder? My job, find out. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. An interesting parallel hit me the other day. When a baby takes its first three steps, everybody is happy and gives a cheer for its progress. The same thing happens when a country takes important steps toward lasting world peace and freedom. That great American patriot, Benjamin Franklin, outlined three important steps in the drive toward a lasting world peace and freedom of mankind. The last and most important of these steps was, and is, to get the people of the world to talk to each other and to help each other. This is the essence of the people-to-people -people program that Americans have put into operation all over the world. It has been such a great success that it is beginning to work both ways. Not too long ago in Korea, Tom Lawrence, a yeoman in the United States Navy, lost his wallet on a street in Seoul. The wallet was found by a 15-year-old Korean boy who gave it to his father. The father promptly returned it to Lawrence with nothing missing. Tom Lawrence decided that this kind of honesty should pay off. He visited the seven members of the Korean family and gave them 80 pounds of rice. He then promised to bring the family 50 pounds of rice each month he remained in Korea. The Korean father said, I think this is much more than I deserve. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. But who can put a price on better understanding among the peoples of the world? For through better understanding of each other comes an understanding of freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the poor little rich girl matter. <laughs> I sat beside one of the plushest swimming pools in Beverly Hills, alone. I finished my drink slowly. Cynthia Durbin was a strange one, all right, but her actions seemed compulsory rather than natural. If she really was thinking about murder for $200,000 in one chunk, she was pretty crude about it. If she was trying to impress her husband for some unknown reason, she'd selected a mighty offbeat way to do it. If she was going off her rocker, well... The extension phone hung on a post beside the bar. I don't ordinarily listen in on other people's conversations, but this one. Anything wrong, darling? Eric. Oh, Eric, I've got to talk to you. Something has happened. I, I think nope, I... No, Cynthia, not on the phone. Meet me here in half an hour. But Eric... Half an hour. Here. Goodbye, Cynthia. 
Hello, Eric. As I strolled to my car, nobody asked me to come back again sometime. Not that I expected it. I parked a block down the street, adjusted the rearview mirror, and got comfortable. A cigarette later, she came zooming out in a CAD convertible and headed my way. I've tailed a few cars in my time, but this kid was either scared silly or she'd learned her evasive tactics from Bull Halsey. I lost her in the first ten blocks. So I drove Roger Hackey's car back to his office and prepared for the horse laugh I had coming. It came. <laughs> she lost you, huh? Oh, that's a dandy, a real dandy. Hey, tell me, do you always <laughs> laugh when you're about to lose the commission on a $200,000 policy? Yeah? No. No. Well, uh, what are you going to do now, Johnny? Who is Eric? Well, he's not a brother, that's for sure. Oh, I don't know. You know, for two cents, I'd turn in a negative report and go on back to Hartford. Oh, wait now. You can't do that. This is a big deal. For you, for me, it's a pain in the neck. But you can't turn in a negative report just because she's got an extracurricular boyfriend. You don't even know who he is. And what about her husband? Yeah, what about him? Here, here. I got the dope right here. Today's paper, and it's a good picture of him. Read what it says. Peter Durbin, one of Los Angeles' better amateur golfers, plays out of Silver Oak Country Club, where the state open is being held this week. He's expected to finish in the top. Roger, what time is it? Uh, 4.30. Thanks. Huh? Hey, where are you going? I'm going to try my hand at being a reporter. What? What are you talking about? Roger, I'm going to interview Mr. Peter Durbin for the, uh, the Interstate Publicity Press Association. Huh? Expense account item four, $2.40, cab fare to the Silver Oak Country Club, which nestled in a big ravine north of Sunset Boulevard, some 15 minutes from Roger's office. The last players were coming in for the afternoon round when I got there, and Peter Durbin was among them. I waited until after the radio and TV boys had got through, and then caught him in a corner of the locker room. Yes? Who are you? Johnny Dollar, Interstate Publicity Press. I'd like to ask you a few questions, please. Well, I've already given my interviews. Well, sure, I know, but this is uh, feature stuff. Best part of the day. There's the gallery body and stuff like that. Oh. Oh, all right, but make it quick. Yes, sir. Is your wife here? No, she never watches me play. Oh? Where is she now? Well, at home. Where else? But now, see here, don't uh, you... Think... You're playing a great game, Mr. Durbin. You figure you're going to win this tournament, huh? Why, yes, I think so. McMahon has turned into 69, of course, but I'm still three strokes up on him. I, um, I play a much steadier game than he does. Oh, yeah, sure. This is your home club, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's one of the best in the country. Yeah, mighty fine course. You must be pretty well healed. Well, I... Uh... <laughs> That's none of your readers' concern. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, you have a birthday coming up soon, haven't you? How did you know? Oh, well, you're a prominent personality, Mr. Durbin. We keep a file on this sort of thing, on important people like you. Oh, oh I see. Oh, sure. I suppose you're going to have a big affair. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, the annual Western Road Races fall on my birthday each year. Uh, as a reporter, you should recall that I won both last year and the year before. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, happy birthday, Mr. Durbin, and uh, good luck. Well, is that all you want? That's all I need to know. Thanks. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. No folklore could be all boastful and dynamic. Some of it is about the man at the bottom of the pile. Like the one they tell of the traveler who just had to get across a river. He argued with the boatman, but that boatman wasn't about to move. Nope. Not with the spring thaw making it a mighty ugly river. The traveler was insistent. Finally, the boatman agreed. But it was going to cost a whole quarter to get across. But I ain't got but 15 cents. You gotta take me for that. Your regular fare's only 10 cents. The boatman stood firm. I ain't going, that so. Anybody that ain't got but 15 cents, it just don't make no difference which side of the river he's on anyhow. <laughs> Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past. And I guess we Americans have our share of some good ones. Like the one about... Ah, but we'll have to save that one for the next time we travel your way. See you then. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Poor Little Rich Girl Matter. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Taxi fare to the office of Attorney Crane Collins, with whom I could now agree on one point. I didn't like Peter Durbin either. It was 6.15, after hours, when I entered the office of Collins, Douglas, Walsh, Hanley, and James. The senior partner was still there. His door was slightly ajar, and I heard voices. 
which stopped abruptly when I entered. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Rather late in the day, isn't it? I don't keep office hours, Mr. Collins. I'm very busy. Then I'll wait. Very well, as you wish. I wished, so I waited. But not for long. Because about three minutes later, Collins came out, carefully closed the door of his office behind him, and strode easily toward me, oozing his most charming professional smile. Now, Mr. Dollar, what can I do for you? Why didn't you tell me the first time I was here that Peter Durbin, in addition to being a first-class golfer, was also a racing enthusiast? Why, it just didn't occur to me. Do you know any insurance company in the world that would issue a $200,000 policy on a man who risks his life in a racing car? Then your company will not issue the policy? What do you think? Now tell me something. Who is Eric? Eric? That's right. Well... The name is not familiar to me. Now, look, Mr. Collins, I have a feeling that even you will admit that withholding information in connection with a possible murder is punishable by law. Fact. I am fully aware of that, but I fail to see what that... What are you doing? You didn't invite me into your office. I just wondered why is all. Have you no ethics, man? Cynthia Durbin was in there a few minutes ago, wasn't she? Mr. Dollar. Wasn't she? If it is the intention of your company not to issue the insurance to my client, I will so inform her, and that will end the matter so far as you are concerned. Now, please be good enough to leave. You really don't know or care what's going on, do you? You are so wrapped up in the letter of the law that preventing a possible murder doesn't even occur to you. Another one of your feelings? Well, I don't have the remotest idea what you're talking about. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mr. Collins. Expense account item six, nine dollars and fifty cents. Cocktails and dinner. I should have written my report negative and hightailed it back to Hartford. But when you see in your mind's eye the possibility of a racing car careening off the road at 125 miles an hour exactly two weeks from now, you don't just stick to business and call it quits. Eric, wherever he tended bar, was the key. But how to find it? I was on dessert in the evening paper, giving my subconscious mind a chance to work it out when all of a sudden I was looking at it on the society page. Expense account item seven, nineteen dollars including taxi fare to Los Angeles police headquarters, where I had a pleasant chat with the captain on duty. Then a tuxedo rental in the same taxi to the Statler Hotel. A special pass let me in as guest at a crowded and bejeweled society benefit. Enjoying the party, Mr. Collins? Dollar! What are you doing here? Enjoying the party, too. Have Mr. and Mrs. Durbin arrived? You are the most annoyingly persistent individual I please, have ever... Please, no compliments. See you later. After a few minutes, I spotted her, dressed to the teeth. She turned suddenly and saw me. I expected surprise, chagrin, fear, most anything but what I got. Mr. Dollar! Johnny, I am glad to see you. I was such a bore this afternoon, forgive me. Well, your exit was rather sudden. <laughs> My headache's all gone, isn't that wonderful? Fine. Will you dance with me? Pleasure. Dollar, that's such an exciting name. Is your husband with you tonight? No, poor dear. He's playing in a golf tournament and has to get his rest. You came along? Yes. Don't you find it warm in here, all these people? Let's go out on the terrace, hmm? Sure, why not? Once more, I was following her. And it was just as interesting as the first time. But my mind and eyes were elsewhere. Somewhere in this crowd was the Eric I was looking for. He had to be. Then I spotted him. 35, big and broad, hawk nose, circling toward the terrace from the left. She threaded her way to a potted palm in a far corner of the terrace, turned and looked at me. Her eyes were feverishly bright in the moonlight. She was beautiful. You're a very charming man, Johnny. I wish. You wish what? Mm. Do you find me interesting? You haven't answered my question. Oh, I find you interesting, Cynthia. Who is Eric? Eric. The man you went to see this afternoon after you left me. The 
have to do. You know who I'm talking about. Because you and Eric, I don't know how, were planning to kill your husband two weeks from now and collect $200,000 insurance. Two weeks from now in the road race. Make it look like an accident, no doubt. No, Eric! No! I ducked and whirled around as a fist grazed past my ear and brought up one from the floor with all I had. Cynthia stood there a moment, then quietly folded up and lay on the floor in a heap, sobbing. (laughs) Oh, there you are, Della. What have you done to this poor girl? And that man? Very simple, Collins. I've been combining feel and fact. The house dick and I got them out of there. Hawk knows to police headquarters, Cynthia to a hospital. Eric turned out to be a quack psychiatrist who preyed on unstable rich women and who was wanted in both New York and Florida. He had a perfect setup in Cynthia Durbin until he went for murder and the big money. Mrs. Durbin, well, the doctors tell me she ought to be normal mentally in a couple of years with proper psychiatric treatment. Expense account total, $317.75. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. North Carolina state flag bears the initial of her name on either side of a white star. Above, on a yellow scroll, is the date May 20th, 1775. Below, on a similar scroll, is the date April 12th, 1776. The 1775 date stands for an early declaration of independence, known as the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. April 12, 1776, was the date of the first constitutional convention held in Halifax. The Halifax Resolve was a document that placed the old North State in the front rank, both in point of time and spirit, among those colonies which demanded unconditional freedom and absolute independence from any foreign power. North Carolina state flag, the flag of the 12th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 9, 1885. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful yacht, a beautiful, charming girl, and a man who wished he'd never heard of either of them. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Alan Botzer, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Frank Nelson, Marvin Miller, and Peter Leeds. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bud Sewell speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
hair tonic and Cremel shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Draw up your chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. I see that you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, Dr. Watson. I deduced that you were going over your notes on tonight's case. Elementary, my dear boy. And <laughs> among the records, I came across some notes of cases that I'd almost forgotten. The shocking death of Crosby, the banker. The Adelton tragedy. And some data on the unusual contents of the ancient British barrow. Those stories sound pretty intriguing, Dr. Watson. I shall tell them to you some other evening, Mr. Bell. Tonight, I'm going to recount an adventure that took place in the heart of the beautiful English countryside. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Well, that story began in the small country village of Carnforth. Holmes had recently brought to a successful conclusion the affair of the barrow and furnace wheelchair murders. And we decided that a few days' rest in nearby Carnforth would do us both good before returning to our arduous life in Baker Street. We were staying at a small but comfortable inn. Early on the morning of the third day, I remember, Holmes and I were in our bedroom waiting for those two essentials without which an English country gentleman could not start his day. The early morning cup of tea and a jug of hot water for shaving. As we sat there at the open window... A nearby church bell was tolling a funeral knell. There must be a funeral in the village home. An astonishing deduction, Watson. There's no need to make fun of me. Pressing sound, isn't it? I suppose so. Has it ever occurred to you, Watson, that the history of bells is full of romantic interest? Well, I can't say that I've thought much about it. Almost every historical event has been accompanied by the sound of bells. They summoned soldiers to arms as well as Christians to church. They sounded the alarm in fire, tumult, and invasion. And many a bloody chapter in history has been rung in and out by bells. You seem to be a mine of information on the subject. Yes, Watson. It's a fascinating subject. Come in, come in. Good morning, my dear. Morning, gentlemen. I brought you tea and your shaving water. Mrs. Nicholas said to say your breakfast to be ready in half an hour. Splendid, Mary. Oh, uh, Mary, the church bell is tolling a funeral knell. Do you know who's being buried? That I do, sir. I wish it was me. It'll be my turn soon. Poor little thing. I wonder what's the matter with her. I have no idea. Perhaps her father or mother just died. Or a young man. Yes, I bet that's it. She's a pretty girl. She'd obviously have been crying when she came in. Perhaps that's her fiancé they're burying now. And Watson, you have the sentimental imagination of the true storyteller. But we've come here for a holiday. You must give your imagination a rest, too. So drink your tea, remove your whiskers, and we'll go downstairs and investigate those kippers. <laughs> You like your kippers, gentlemen? Excellent, Mrs. Mickle, excellent. Never eaten better. Yes, indeed. Uh, by the way, Mrs. Mickle, we heard the funeral bell tolling earlier on. Do you know who was being buried? Yes, I do. Two souls are being buried. And one of them was a murderer. A murderer? Good Lord, in this peaceful village? What happened, Mrs. Mickle? Poor old Threadgold, the corn merchant, found out his wife had been gallivanting around with a young fellow from Bolton. Cut her throat, he did, and unhanged himself. More tea. Thank you. That's shocking. So the peaceful countryside is not as peaceful as it's made out to be, Holmes. A fact that I've frequently had occasion to point out to you, Watson. Has the morning post arrived yet, Mrs. Mickle? Here comes old Gilly up the path with it now. I'll see if he's got anything for you. The murder? What do you make of it, Holmes? What is there to make of it, Watson? A jealous husband murders a faithless wife and then commits suicide. A tragic story, but uh, a simple one. Top of the morning to you, gentlemen. Good morning, Gillian. Any letters for me today? Oh, Mr. Holmes, two letters. One of them's got some newspaper clippings in it, I think. And you've got a postcard from a Mr. Lestrade. He wants you back in London. Bad, Mr. Holmes. Here you are. Upon my soul, Gillian, you've been reading Mr. Holmes' private correspondence. Bless your heart, Dr. Watson. If I didn't read other people's correspondence, how would I know what's going on in the village? Mm, you were right, Gillian. It is newspaper clippings. 
Uh, by the way, you heard about the murder of Mrs. Treadgold, I suppose? Heard about it. I told the bell this morning at the funeral. You mean to say that you're the bell ringer as well as the postman? Bless your heart, yes, Doctor. President of the Coral Society, too, as well as being on the Paris Council. Mm, you're a busy man, Gillian. That I am, sir. Take this afternoon now. I'm to ring those bells again. Not another funeral, surely? Uh, no, sir. A wedding this time. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Young Sam Perrin is marrying the Slater girl. And you might say I'm responsible for bringing them together. Got some of their letters mixed up, I did. They looked each other up to exchange them, and I pressed them. Before you know what's happening, they're getting married. <laughs> Regular Cupid, you might say I am. Be off with you, Gilly. Other people want their letters. Mr. Holmes doesn't want his kippers spoiled with your idle chatter. All right, Mrs. Crabapples and Vinegar. Uh, one of these fine days, you'll smile. And the world will come to an end. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, good day, good day. Talkative old busybody he is. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Lachlan's in the old. The poor old lady's most anxious to talk to you. Mrs. Lachlan? She has the sempstress shop in the I Street. Her only son and on her way from home a few months back. I think that's what she wants to speak to you about. Oh, but uh, my friend's here for a rest, Mrs. Mickle. I told her that, Doctor, but she won't go away without seeing Mr. Holmes. Oh, very well. Ask her to come in, please, Mrs. Mickle. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, why do you bother to see her, Holmes? Sounds like a trivial matter. The disappearance of an only son can never be a trivial matter. Well, I meant trivial for you, not for her. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. Thank you, Miss. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Please sit down, Mrs. Lackland. That's it. Now, what's the trouble? It's Tom, sir. My only son. He left me four months ago, and I've not seen any nor either of him since. You've had no message from him since he left? Not one word, I'm fed out of my mind, sir. Have you any idea of his reason for leaving the village, Mrs. Lackland? None, sir. He was a good boy, and he worked hard, and he didn't fool around with those flippity gibbet girls in the village. I think he's met with foul ply, gentlemen. And I want you to find out about him for me, Mr. Holmes. I've heard say in the village that you're the greatest detective in England. Uh, Mrs. Lackland, I'd be glad to help you, but uh, you'll give me no clues to work with. I'm afraid if that I can... If it's money you want, I've got 20 pounds in my postal savings. It's all yours if you can bring my Tommy home to me. But at least tell me you're safe. Mrs. Lackland, I wouldn't dream of accepting a fee. However, I shall give your problem some thought. If I arrive at any conclusions, I'll get in touch with you at once. God bless you, Mr. Holmes. Good morning to you, sir. A good day. Good morning, Mr. Lackland. Poor old thing. I don't see how you can help her, Holmes. Nor do I, at the moment. But a young man who has grown up in a small village like this may have led a life that his mother is totally unaware of. You said that you had to work on one of your stories today, Yes, Martin. I had a letter from the editor of the Strand magazine yesterday requesting a manuscript as soon as possible. Splendid. Then you stay at the inn and work on your latest masterpiece while I scour the village to see what may be found out about the missing young man. <laughs> I was beginning to think you got lost. Hello, Watson. I trust you had a profitable session with pen and paper. Well, I've done about half a chapter. I would have done more if it hadn't been for those infernal bells. Mm, the wedding ceremony that the worthy Gilly told us about this morning. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, well, what did you find out about Mrs. Lackland's son? Among other things, that he had a secret love life unknown to his mother. And the object of his affections was none other than the maid who brought us our tea this morning. Mary? Can we talk to her? No, it's her half day off, and I was unable to find her. However, I shall question her when she brings our tea tomorrow morning. Come in, Mary. Oh, Mrs. Mickle. Good morning, gentlemen. Here's your tea and shaving water. Where's Mary this morning? She didn't come to work. Must be ill again. Unreliable girl. And no better than she ought to be, if you ask me. It's no job for me to be carrying tea and hot water upstairs. I hear the village bell tolling for another funeral. 
Does Carnforth have a burial every morning? I really don't see how the population can run to it. It's another suicide, sir. Another suicide? Good Lord. Old John Larrabee, the baker. He was expecting some money from his son in Australia. It never came. And they foreclosed on his shop. And he hung himself. Will you be wanting a couple of boiled eggs to your breakfast, gentlemen? No, no, I haven't much of an appetite, thank you very much. Yes, sir. That woman seems absolutely heartless. She almost smacks her lips when she tells us about these tragedies. Yes, Watson, I noticed it. This peaceful village is beginning to seem strangely sinister to me. And since you have no appetite for breakfast, perhaps you'll join me in a little excursion as soon as you're dressed. Of course. Where are we going? To see the maid, Mary. I'm anxious to talk to her before another funeral bell begins to toll. <laughs> This must be the cottage, Holmes. They said it was the one with honeysuckle over the gate. Yes, and there's Mary sitting on the porch. Oh, she's got up. She's coming. She's coming up the path to meet us. Good morning, Mary. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, why have you come here? Not to ask about my health. Why should a servant girl matter to gentlemen not you? Oh, you must judge us, my dear. I assure you no, that No, we... Watson. Let's be honest and admit we didn't come here because of our concern for Mary's health. And why did you come here, sir? Mrs. Lackland asked me to try and find her son, Tom. Tom? Yes, Tom Lackland. I thought you might be able to help me, Mary. I could help you, Mr. Holmes. I'd be helping myself, too. Here come Gilly, the postman. Gilly? Gilly, is there a letter for me to die? No, lass. There's nothing for you again. There must be, Gilly. There must be there. No, lass. If the letter would come, I'd bring it to you as fast as my legs would carry me. You know that. Oh. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Left some letters at the inn for you, Doctor. You had a letter from a lady. Oh, uh, how do you know it was from a lady? It reeked with a smell of violets, it did. And it was written in green ink on grey paper, sir. Amazing deduction. That sounds like your young friend from Daly's, Watson. Oh, how did you know that? Well, I mean, I don't have a young friend from Daly's, Watson. Quite. Gilly. You told another funeral bell today, didn't you? Aye, sir. And a tragic thing it was. Fate, you might call it. Old Larrabee hanged himself because he didn't get money from his son in Australia. I found him, I did. I was the one to cut him down. And right in the post bag was the letter he was waiting for. The letter that had saved his life. Great Scott, what a ghastly piece of irony. That it was, sir. That it was... Well, gentlemen, I'll be on my way. Good day. Good day, Mary. Perhaps that letter will arrive tomorrow. No. I'll never hear from Tom, never. He's ashamed of me. That's why he deserted me. Deserted you, Mary? You speak almost as if you were his wife. I am his wife. What? We were married secretly in Rochdale five months ago, come Tuesday. And he never told his mother? He was afraid to. She thought I was beneath him. Tom said he'd go away and get a good job and then return here and fetch me back with him. He went away all right. But he never came back to say me word. Uh, when he left, uh, did he give no clues to his destination? No hint of any kind, Mary? Well, we did want to say, Mary... I'm going to clear out to this puddle and make my fortune, even if I have to bury it. The minister said, bury me fortune. <laughs> That's a joke, isn't it? But I don't know what he meant by it. I think I do, Mary. Watson, we're taking a short train journey as soon as possible. Oh, where are we going, may I ask? We're going to the town of Bury in search of this young lady's husband. What makes you think Tom might be in Bury, Mr. Holmes? Because the famous fortune cotton mills are in Bury. It would seem possible that when your husband joked of burying his fortune, he was talking of going to the mills there. Wherever he's gone, he won't be coming back to me. I know that. No, 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 no. Don't talk like that, my dear. Remember, you have friends. Mrs. Lackland. <laughs> How much longer is home going to be? 
Leaves me standing outside the factory gates as if I were a blasted coach. Ah, oh, there he is. There he is. Home. Home. Hello. Hello, Watson. Permit me to introduce you to Mr. Tom Lackland. Tom, this is Dr. Watson. How do you do, Dr. Watson? How do you do? Never mind how I do, young fellow, my lad. How do you do? Your behavior's been absolutely shocking. Shocking. Now, what are you talking about? Leaving your dear old mother and deserting your pretty little bride because you're ashamed of her. You're a scoundrel, sir. You deserve a good horsewhipping, and I have a good mind to give it to you. I don't know what you're talking about, Dr. Watson, but I don't like the words you use. And if it's violence you want, I don't mind telling you I'm amateur heavyweight champion of the county. You are? Oh, well, no need to come aggressive more. No, let's waste time on being acrimonious, Watson. Let's get back to the station as fast as we can. The return of the prodigal is long overdue. We must give them every opportunity to kill the fatted calf. Hi, there's Mary's house. I'm dying to see her. And after this reunion, Tom, I suggest that you both go over and see your mother. I'm sure she'll forgive you. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, I'll do that. Well, perhaps we should have warned her. Your sudden appearance may be something of a shock. I think it's a shock that Mary can handle. <laughs> She must be out. Door's locked. Knock again. If you don't mind, she, she may be asleep. Great heavens! That was a revolver shot. Come on, Watson. Help me break in the door. Now, Dr. Watson, that was a fine place to break off your story. You left me right on the edge of a cliff. Had the young girl shot herself? She'd shot at herself, Mr. Bell. But fortunately, a last-minute lack of courage had made her shot go wild. Holmes and I and the young bridegroom burst into the house and wrested the smoking revolver from her hand. I must confess that the union between the two young lovers was a touching sight. In fact, I felt considerably older than I was as Holmes and I stood there listening to, uh, to Tom reassuring her. Mary, darling... Oh. It's all right. I'm here. Oh, Tom, you are. You did come back to me. I thought you never would. I tried to kill myself, but I hadn't the courage. Oh, there, there, Mary. Everything's going to be all right now. It will be, Tom, will it? I'm so tired. And now, Tom, I think the time has come to reassure Mary that you did write to her. Oh, of course I did, Mary, darling, and... I sent you money and told you that I'd be back here to take you to Ferry as soon as I'd saved up enough. You wrote to me, Tom? Well, twice a week. And I wrote to Mother, too. Then why didn't I get the letters? And the answer to that should be obvious, my dear. Gilly, the postman, deliberately withheld them from you. Gilly? Quite heavens. Why? I have my suspicions. Strong suspicions. But I have to get proof. Tell me, Mary, the day before yesterday, Mr. Treadgold murdered his wife. Do you know how he learned of her infidelity? Well, I'm not sure, but... Well, didn't Mrs. Nichols say that it was through some letters that got mixed up? The letters addressed to her were delivered to his office instead of at the house. Gilly again. Precisely. Surely the whole terrible pattern begins to take shape. Tom. Yes, Mr. Rome? I'm going to lay a trap. To spring it, I shall need your assistance. Of course, Mr. Holmes, I'll do anything. Wait here with Mary until darkness falls. Then muffle yourselves up and go to your mother's house. Wait there in hiding and let no outsider see you until you hear from me. Uh, since you two lovebirds have been separated for four months, I don't imagine that'll be too unpleasant. Quiet, Watson. You understand, Tom? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Good. Then come on, Watson. Well, what's your plan, Holmes? I'll tell you as we go. One thing I can promise you. Before the sun is very high tomorrow, I shall free this village from one of the most subtly evil powers I've ever come in contact with. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Mickle. Good morning. I always said that Mary was a no good girl, and now she's killed herself. But of course, I had to come to her funeral. It's very charitable, Mrs. Mickle, I must say. In any case, the vicar says that the poor girl was of unsound mind. Yes, madam, you can't blame her. Well, I'll be getting into the church. Holmes, this farce is beginning to get on my nerves. What are we accomplishing by burying an empty coffin? You'll soon see, old chap. Come on, let's slip into the vestry. This way. Oh, 
Where are we going, Holmes? Up the stairs that leads to the belfry. Here they are. Well, supposing Gilly turns master when he finds out we know his secret. Then we must handle him to the best of our ability, Watson. Oh, I must say, I do not relish the thought of a tussle high in the belfry of a church. The man must be insane. Obviously. That's why his power must be destroyed. This door apparently leads to the belfry. Keep your wits about you, Watson. Good morning, Gilly. Uh, Mr. Holmes! Dr. Watson! You've come to see me at work. That's nice of you. Not often I get company up here. We haven't come up here to see you at work, Gilly. We know your diabolical work only too well. Yes, Gilly, we know your secret. What secret's that? You're mad with power, Gilly. You've tried to control the destiny of this village. In your position as postman, you will have the power to give life and death. That I am, sir. And it's a great power. It makes the man feel good. Almost like a god, you might say. That's sacrilege, you scoundrel. You were responsible for the murder of Mrs. Treadgold. Aye, sir, that I was. And for the old man agony, sir. You were responsible for John Larrabee's suicide, weren't you? Aye, that I was. Larrabee tried to vote me off the village council. I swore I'd make him pay for it, and I did. Your reign is over, Gilly. You'll never toll a bell again. The only one you'll hear will be a prison bell. You can't touch me, Mr. Holmes. You've got no proof. There's nothing you can do. Don't be too sure. I've enough influence to take your job away. You... You... Take me away from me, bells. I... I live for these bells. You wouldn't take me away from them. You couldn't live without the power they give you, could you, Gilly? You're trying to destroy me! You are destroyed, Gilly. Yes, you've already failed. Mary's alive. Uh, uh, alive? But the coffin they're burying down there... Is full of stones. You'll be the laughing stock of the village, Gilly. They'll never laugh at Gilly! You can't catch me, Mr. Holmes. I'm beyond yesterday. He's running up the ladder leading to the bell car. Come back, Gilly. Come back. He, he, he's mad as a hatter. Right. Well, what's he going to do up there? He might set fire to the steeple. Commit any madness. I'm going to fetch him, Holmes. No, Watson. He drew a knife as he fled. And with that rickety staircase and the narrow opening leading into the bell chamber, you'd never stand a chance. He'd get you on the first ledge. How are we going to get him down? There's only one way. He's in a tiny loft containing his beloved bells. We'll see how much he loves them at close quarters. I doubt if even he can stand the noise in that confined space. Where's that bell rope? Come down, Gilly. Come down from there. Stop! Stop ringing the bell! Not until you come down, Gilly. Stop ringing them! I can't stand it! You're driving me mad! You are mad, Gilly. Mad with power. Come down here, I say. I'm coming! Great heavens, he held himself out of the belfry. Holmes, he hasn't a chance of surviving that fall. I have no intention of causing the unhappy man to jump to his death, Watson, though I cannot help but feel that his poor demented mind may find a happy oblivion this way rather than in the confines of an asylum. Yes, you're probably right, Holmes. It's been a shocking case, Watson, shocking. And once again it proves the old saying that violence does in truth recoil upon the violent. And the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see what's left of you. Um, next week... I think I'll tell you a rather gruesome story about how Sherlock Holmes saved the life and the sanity of a certain Count Romagni. I call it The Adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Golden Pants Nay. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway, by permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell, 
speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Dead man control. Yes, we have that crime club story for you. Come right over. chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Dead Man Control by Helen Riley. The very absorbing story of a murder in which Cupid held the hand of death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. It was late morning. And in the library of a mansion on East 67th Street, multimillionaire Fenimore Kingston was standing before the wall safe he had just opened. He smiled. And then as he reached in... Two hours later, Inspector Christopher McKee was in his office at police headquarters on Center Street when the telephone rang. Inspector McKee talking, Homicide Bureau. Good morning. This is Catherine Kingston. Yes? This is Fenimore Kingston. Oh, yes? My husband's been murdered. Can you come? Where? Our home is on East 67th Street. All right, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Yes, sir. Cassidy, order my car. We're going uptown. Uh, yes, sir. And how will you... F- and don't stop to ask about anybody's health. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> Please go on, Mrs. Kingston. Well, Inspector, as soon as I saw that open wall safe, I thought my husband had been killed by a burglar. Mm-hmm. So while I was waiting for you, I checked the contents. The money and the bonds were still there. But... Yes? The diamond ring that Fenimore gave me after our wedding three months ago. That's gone. That wouldn't be the well-publicized Kingston diamond, would it? It would, Inspector. And it's worth a half a million dollars. Yes, but the cash on those negotiable bonds... I can't understand why they weren't taken to... Very unusual thief, to say the least. Now, where were you when the miracle happened? Out. I went out early this morning. I was restless. Why? I was tired of doing nothing. So I took the car and drove until I was tired of driving. Alone? Inspector McKee. Don't be a lie, Mrs. Kingston. I'm not insinuating... But your tone... Merely professional. Now, according to the medical examiner, your husband was shot in the back and death was instantaneous about two hours ago. Who was in the house with him then? I don't know. What about the servants? Did they go out driving too? We have no servants. In this big house? They quit last night. Oh? (laughs) Don't let it surprise you, Inspector. Fenimore was not an easy person to get along with. Mrs. Kingston, for your special information, I don't let anything surprise me. Uh, Excuse me, sir. What is it, Cassidy? It's about the murder weapon. Did you find it? Uh, No, sir. There ain't a trace of it in the house. Uh, Me and the boys have looked in every nook and... All right, Cassidy. Uh, All right. Yes, sir. Oh, my. What's the matter? Over there, Inspector. Peep it out from under that corner of the window drape. It shines like a diamond. It is a diamond. Well, if it is, then the saints preserve us. It must be as big as an eyeball. Yes. Well, Mrs. Kingston? My ring. No burglary, huh? It doesn't seem so, does it? But how did that ring get under the drape? The law of gravity. It fell when your husband fell, after he was shot. And it either rolled or bounced. You can take your pick. I'll take the ring, if you don't mind. Later. Right now, it's evidence. But it's mine. We'll take good care of it. Come on, Cassidy. Well, I'll be finished here, sir. For the time being, goodbye, Mrs. Kingston. Goodbye, Inspector. Cassidy. Uh, Inspector McKee, if it's one question I might ask... Go uh, ahead. 
What's the ring got to do with the cadaver we carried upstairs? I think it killed him. The deputy, say. Don't lead me on, Sergeant. I have no time to explain. Ed, if you say so, Inspector. Going back to my office. I want you to go to the telephone company. Get a list of every call that's been made from or to this house in the last two days. Report to me at headquarters. Yes, sir. But there's one thing that... Now you... what? But it's that girl in there, Mrs. Kingston. Uh -huh. Now, I've been on the force for 32 years, and it's a fine education I've got about the good and the bad in Not people. Not now, Cassidy. When a girl, young and beautiful, marries a man twice her age and a millionaire... She didn't marry him for love. Hello? Oh. Is this Michael Dolger's apartment? Yes. Who is this? Amy Clarberson, why? Oh, this is Catherine Kingston. Let me talk to Michael, please. You might ask me how I'm feeling. Please, Amy. After all, you did get what I wanted. I want to speak to Michael. I'll ask him how he feels about it. Hold the wire. And don't wind it too tightly around your neck, dear. Hello, Kathy. What's she doing there? Oh, she just dropped in for a cocktail. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I want you to meet me right away. Where? Central Park, inside the 72nd Street entrance. I'll pick you up in my car. All right. What's the rumpus about? Fenimore's dead. What? what did you say? He was murdered this morning. Good grief. Maybe, uh, maybe I'd better come over. No. The police are here. Dozens of them all over the place. Meet me in half an hour. And come alone. <laughs> How'd you manage it? I didn't. What? I couldn't get out without being seen. Michael, I'm in trouble. But if the police followed you... Is that all you care about? Your precious hide? Well, it's the only one I've got. Well, you don't have to worry. I wasn't followed. Are you sure? Yes, look for yourself. Is there a police car behind us? No, but... Michael, really, I'm in serious trouble. How was Fenimore killed? He was shot. And the police think I did it. You? Have they said so? Well, not in words, they haven't. That Inspector McKee, he thinks he's very clever. Well, you should have left me alone, Kathy. I couldn't. I had to speak to you. Now, why didn't you do it on the phone? I, I didn't want to incriminate it... you. What? Suppose one of those policemen had been listening at the door. Well, suppose. He'd have heard me asking you about that appointment you had with Fenimore this morning. That I had? Just about the time he was killed. Now, wait a minute. I had no appointment with Fenimore. That's not the truth. He phoned you and asked you to come over. Did he tell you that? No. Then how do you know so much? I was listening in on the upstairs extension. Oh. How much did you hear? He wanted you to meet him at the house at 11 o'clock. It was very important. Anything else? No, I put the receiver down. It was half past 10 and I wanted to be out of the house before you arrived. Really? I didn't know what he was going to talk to you about. I was afraid it might be us. So you ran away. That's too bad. Why? Because if you'd stayed, you'd have learned something. Didn't he talk to you about us? No, dear. Well, then what did he? I don't know. I wasn't there. What? That's right. Fenimore wanted to see me, but I didn't want to see him, and I told him so. You told Fenimore? Yes, I did. <laughs> the great mammoth. <laughs> well, wasn't it about time... I'd like to believe that, Mike. Then do. I got tired of being my cousin's errand boy and of running to him every time he beckoned. But you're allowed. I told him what to do with that, too. But it doesn't make any difference now, does it? No. You're free. And we'll have all the money we both need. That's putting it very bluntly. Why not? He never cared for anyone. Including you. You were the most beautiful thing he ever saw, and he wanted you. It's just as simple as that. I, I know all about all it. All right. Mark. All right. I'll shut up. Kathy. Yes? Did you really go out this morning? 
I said I did. Of course. But I was just thinking, what a wonderful opportunity you had, alone in that house with him. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Good work, Gordon. Let me know when she gets back. Can I come in, Inspector? Help yourself, Cassidy. Well, I checked with the telephone company, sir, and it's big news if I don't mind saying it myself. Yes? Anything like Catherine Kingston going out to meet a man? Uh, A what? You've heard of the species, Cassidy. And I'm sure you've heard of Central Park. Is that where she went with him? Mm Mm-hmm. In broad daylight? (laughs) There's no topping an Irishman, is there? (laughs) (laughs) Well, not if he comes from the county cock, sir. (laughs) Who's the man? We don't know yet, but he's being tailed. Now, what did you find out at the telephone company? Oh, wait, wait, here's a list of all the cars that came and went from the Kingston house in the last couple of days. Right. Uh, but but uh, it's them last three that was made this morning. Yes, all outgoing. One at 10.30, one at 10.35. And Kingston was killed at about 11. And this one at 1.45. Oh, a few minutes after we left Mrs. Kingston. That's right. Who were these calls made to? Yes, uh, oh, yeah, but I, I got that on another slip of paper. Now, where the... Dip- oh, yeah, here it is. Now, 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 the first one and the last one to Michael Dolge. So that's the man. Mm-hmm. Now, go ahead, Cassidy. I'm just checking. Uh, he was the dead man's cousin. How do you know? Well, I remember seeing his name in the papers after the Kingston wedding. Seems to me he was either the best man or one of the ushers. Uh, but, but it's not him I'd be worrying about, sir. No? Why not? It's that woman. The one who got the call at 10.35. What woman? Amy Clowbertson. Ah, uh, no answer. Michael Dolge, most likely out with Captain Kingston. Yep. Uh, what what did you say about a woman? No, uh, Amy Clowbertson. Well, what about her? Well, see, you know how I read the newspapers every day. I know. Well, after I get through with the sporting pages, I always turn to the society page. Mm. It's an old habit of mine. I acquired it 32 years ago when I was a rookie on that Fifth Avenue beat. <laughs> you know Fifth Avenue uptown where Central Park lies opposite them glorious mansions with the beautiful... Sit down, Cassidy. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Ah, oh, me, them were fine old days. Yep, people used to come from all over just to look at the Woolworth building. Don't let me interrupt you, but you were telling me about a woman. Uh, a woman? Yes, in connection with a murder. The, of those, yes. uh, Amy Clarbertson. Well, so seeing her name again draws to mind a society page item of about five months ago. To the effect that Amy Clarbertson and Fanny Moore Kingston were engaged to be married. Cassidy, are you sure? Yes, I am, sir, because the diamond ring was mentioned in the same article. How? Where she was at the formal reception. I see. And not two months later, Fanny Moore Kingston married Catherine. It's the old story, Inspector. Not another one, please. The woman scorned. There's no fury like a woman who expects to marry a millionaire and mm. gets jilted. Yes. Yes. There's no doubt about it. All right, I'll pick it up on the way out. Well. Oh, bad news, Inspector. For someone, that was a lab just phoned. The ring we found is a phony. A perfect imitation. You mean it's made of glass? Not quite. Somebody had a good job done for a few hundred dollars, and the original, valued at half a million... Well, it would... might be somewhere in a vault, maybe. Uh, lots of people wear paste and keep their valuables yes, locked yes, up. Uh, oh, no, I... Yes, sir. Phone the Kingston house. Tell the men to turn that place inside out. Yes, sir. And when you get through, take as many men as you need and contact every diamond cutter in town, especially the ones around Maiden Lane. Yes, sir. Now, where's that slip of paper with the names on it? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, it's right here, sir. The address is too. Give it to me. I'm going out to pay Amy Culbertson a visit. Excuse me. I don't want any. Inspector McKee, police. I still don't want any, but you can come in. I have a scotch on the table. Cigarettes, if you didn't bring your own. No, thanks. Sit yourself. What do you want? Sit down, please. If you're here to ask a lot of questions about Fenimore Kingston's murder, don't waste your bet because I don't know any of the answers. How do you know about his murder? Radio told me. Not today. Not today, Miss Robertson. Why don't you sit down? Maybe I don't want to. 
Would you have any reason to protect Catherine Kingston? Not one. Well, here's to you. Michael Dole's? <coughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Why'd you mention his name to me? This pack of matches with his name on the cover. You're pretty smart, aren't you? I have a weakness for matches that are left on tables. All right, so he told me about Fenimore's death. I was at his apartment when Catherine phoned. She told him. Anything else you'd like to know? What time did you meet Fenimore Kingston this morning? I did what? He phoned you at 10.35. How'd you find out about that? You just told me. What? Why, you wheedling wheedling. Shall we talk now? Pitch curves and have me swing at him. I'd like to know about you and Fenimore Kingston. I'm through talking to you. Are you? Then suppose we go down to headquarters. What for? We're very lonesome. Now, wait a minute. Let me go. I haven't done anything. What about you and Kingston? We were engaged. And then he jilted me and married that... Yes? Catherine and I were in the same show. I met Fenimore at a party and he fell for me like a ton of diamonds. And then, like a fool, I introduced him to Catherine. Why did he phone you this morning? One today. Now, look, Miss Blanton. That's the truth. He told me he was going to divorce Catherine. He found out about her and Michael. He thought I knew something, too. And, of course, you rushed over to Michael's apartment and told him. Oh, not exactly. I tried to make it casual. Three hours later? Mike and I were in the same boat. Both of us had been kicked around by Fenimore. That was a common bond. So you waited from 10.35 until almost 2. Oh, still pitching curves, aren't you? Was it because you tried to get his apartment in the morning and couldn't? No. Or didn't you even try? What do you want from me? I didn't kill anybody. Fenimore didn't call you to talk about his wife. Then I don't know what he did call me he for. He asked you about this ring. What? What did you... You wore it for a while, didn't you? Yeah, but I gave it back. This one? Look, mister, there's only one of its kind in the world. Why did he call you about it? Because he thought... Yes? Nothing. He thought you'd know a good imitation from the real thing. You mean that diamond's a fake? We'll find out soon enough, if you're really surprised. Goodbye, for now. Oh, you going? Sorry? Oh, I'm collapsing. Drop in again sometime. Anytime. Thanks. And let's hope I don't have to return that invitation. Hmm? Hello, Michael. Amy, what are you doing here? I figured she'd drive you home. She was always the lady... Get back in the car. Now see here, Get Amy. back or I'll make a scene that'll turn you both into mummies. Better do as she says, Michael. All right, Kathy. I'll be right behind you, kiddies, in the back seat. Now, Catherine, who told Inspector McKee about me? What? About Fenimore having phoned me this morning. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know he phoned me, don't you? No. Oh, you couldn't tell the truth if you had a mouthful of it and it was choking. Wait a minute, Amy. She's trying to frame me. And she'll frame you, too. What was Fenimore talking to you about? Ask her. She was tuned into the extension. Were you, Kathy? No. She had to be. How else... She, she said no, Amy. All right, so she said no. How did Inspector McKee know that I talked to Fenimore and about the diamond, too? The diamond? Yes. Maybe you didn't know that beautiful thing was just a hunk of glass. What? That's a lie. Well, it wasn't when Fenimore asked me about it this morning. He wanted me to return the original. Oh, is that why you killed him? Oh, I knew that was coming out of you. You'd like the police to think that, wouldn't you? Maybe they already do. Well, that wouldn't put you in the clear, Kathy, darling. I returned the original to Fenimore. Can you prove it? Can you prove that I didn't? Wind her up, Michael. She seems to have run down. I think you've said enough, Amy. I'm through. And so is she. For good, I hope. <laughs> Inspector McKee, homicide. Cassidy Talkin, sir. Go ahead. I think I found him, Inspector. Who? The diamond cutting fella. Good. What does he say about the Kingston Diamond? Well, sir, it might be the man and it might not. What? Well, I found him in a small room on the top floor of a small building just around the corner off Main and Lane. There was no name on the door, just the words diamond cutting. But I took a chance Cassidy. anyway. And it's a good thing I did, Inspector. No. For there was that poor old fella stretched out on the floor, dead. 
Oh, no. A little fellow he was, too. And beaten around the head unmerciful. What's the address? Uh, oh, oh yeah, but I, I, I got it written down on a piece of paper. Now, with it, if, oh, 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 yes, here it is. It's up here, Inspector. All right, Cassidy, I'm doing the best I can. But I, I, I got some information, sir. I checked with some of the neighbors on this floor. Where's the body? Uh, well, I'll take you to it, sir. Well, as I was saying, I checked. And the fellow's name was Rudolf Liebnitz. What else? Well, that's all, sir. Hmm. He came over from the other side a few years ago. A victim of war and oppression. And to think that his only reward for minding his own How business... How do you know he was minding his own business? Uh, well, his reputation in the trade, the inspector, was good. He was known to all his neighbors as an honest man, a good worker, and a fine, upstanding character. And, 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 and when your competitors have only Is praise the room, for you, Cassidy? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, there he is. Yeah. A little old fella. Why didn't you tell me his files had been opened and dumped? Well, I was going to, well, Chief. Well, it I doesn't didn't... matter. Somebody wanted a record and they took it. Uh, you uh, think this can be an outcome of the Kingston murder? Maybe, 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 maybe. Let's have a look at the body. Uh, he didn't have a chance. Struck on the back of the head and then beaten until he was... Uh, uh, yes? This man's been dead since this morning. Late this morning. Would you be sure about that? Rigor mortis takes at least six hours to set in. It's just beginning. Ah, then it'd be about the time Fennimore Kingston was murdered. A little later, but not much. The killer came right from the Kingston house to this place and... All right, Cassidy, there's no point in searching the room. No, sir? We won't find anything. Oh. Hello. Hello, operator. Uh, give me police headquarters. Have you got a plan, sir? I hope so, Cassidy. I... Hello. Uh, give me Murphy and Homicide. Inspector McKee. I hope so, Cassidy. If it works, it'll be a miracle. It will talk of the Hello, miracles. Bert. There was a... I want you to have the following three parties picked up. All right? Catherine Kingston, Michael Dolge, and A.B. Cloverson. You'll find the addresses on my desk. And keep them in my office until I get there. Now, as for you, Cassidy... Yes, sir. You stay here. Phone the medical examiner's office and look after the usual details. I'm going out for a long walk. Yes, sir. Those people will wait even if they don't like it. And let's hope they don't like it enough to burn. Inspector McKee. Well, company. How are you, Mrs. Kingston? Why did you have me brought here? And Miss why... Robertson? I'm cheerful enough to break your neck. And taking two from three, you must be Michael Doe. We've been waiting for two hours, Inspector. Yes. Why have you had me arrested? It's a habit of mine, Mrs. Kingston, when a murder's been committed. Well, then we are under arrest. For the time being, Miss Robertson. Now, if you'll excuse me for a moment, uh, I've been working on another case, and there's some papers on my desk that I... You've no right to keep us here. Please, Kathy. Well, he hasn't, Michael. Not without charges. Then wait and try to be calm. Hmm, very interesting. There's nothing incriminating in what I said, Inspector. Oh, no. I, I wasn't referring to that. It's this memo. Good news. Well, I'm not going to wait here and let you waste my time. Mrs. Kingston, this building is full of policemen. Pity's sake, Kathy, stop being so nervous. If he has anything to say to us, he... I does. have. One of you killed Fenimore Kingston this morning. I wasn't home. You were out driving. But who saw you, Mrs. Kingston? What? It takes at least two to make an alibi. But surely you don't think that I... Well, you're out of your mind, Inspector. She married him only three months ago. And then she changed her mind. She thought how nice it would be to marry you. Inspector... It's all right, Kathy. He's just fishing. But that wasn't the reason Kingston was killed. What? Mm, look out for him when he pitches curves. You uh. know the reason, Miss Clubberson. Oh, no, I'm it, huh? Kingston found out that his famous diamond had become an invitation. My ring? This morning, he took it out of the wall safe. The thief, the person who had made the substitution, was in the room with him. And Kingston was shot in the back and killed. Don't look at me, Inspector. I wasn't there. How about you, Mrs. Kingston? I told you. Yes, yes. And you, Mr. Dolge? I didn't know anything about Fenimore's death until Catherine phoned me. Then you admit that she phoned me. Of course, it's no secret. I was Fenimore's cousin. And you were making sure that Catherine stayed in the family. Now look here, Inspector. Excuse me, please. Yes? All right. In a few minutes. I'll call you. Now, this memo becomes very important. 
May we go now? Don't rush me, Mrs. Kingston. But if you're going to work on another case... I'm not. An imitation of the Kingston diamond was made. And by a strange coincidence, shortly after Fenimore Kingston was murdered, the workroom of a diamond cutter was robbed. What's that got to do with us? Miss Clarbertson, tell me what you know about Rudolf Leibniz. What I know? Look, I may get around, Would but Would you that... like to see him? All right, if it'll make you happy. I'll ask him to come in. What? He's in a room down the hall, Mr. Doge. I had him brought here from the hospital. From the... The hospital? He wasn't dead. You're lying. Murphy, bring Leibniz in no. here. No. 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 Never mind. Send in a stenographer. We're going to take a confession. Hello. Inspector McKee, I'm sorry to be bothering you at your home, but when I return to headquarters this evening... What is it, Cassidy? Well, it's about that fellow Michael Dole. He killed his cousin, Fenimore Kingston. Well, that's what the boys told me, but I... He took the diamond and had the imitation put in. You don't say. Mm-hmm, about three weeks ago. How did he get hold of it? That was very simple. Catherine wore the ring at a house party. Dole's mentioned to Fenimore that the diamond needed cleaning and that he could take care of it for him. Oh! So he took the stone down to Leibniz and had an imitation made. That's right. It was so good that Fenimore didn't notice it right away. But this morning... Ah, yes, this morning. It's all in the confession, Cassidy. Ah. Oh, then Kingston knew right away who had stolen the real diamond, didn't he now? Yes, he did now. Oh, Inspector, get along with you. <laughs> then why did he bother to phone that Amy Clarkson girl? We'll never know, Cassidy. Maybe he was anxious to turn the clock back. Uh, to better times. And so closes tonight's crime club book, Dead Man Control, based on a story by Helen Riley. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation... Roger Bauer, produced and directed. Ted Osborne played Inspector McKee. Alice Frost was Catherine Kingston. Elspeth Eric was Amy. Sherling Oliver was Michael Dolge. And Barry Thompson played Cassidy. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. We have a very unusual story of a will that had the power to kill. It's called Silent Witnesses by John Stephen Strange. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there is a new Crime Club book available this week and every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. Oh, yes. The United States Merchant Marine is offering this opportunity to young men between the ages of 16 and a half and 21. If you are an American citizen and a high school graduate, you are qualified to take the test for enrollment in the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. Graduates of the Corps are qualified for a license as deck or engineer officer in the Merchant Marine or to a commission as ensign in the Naval Reserve or in the Maritime Service. Discharged veterans of the armed services and the Merchant Marine are eligible for the test up to their 24th birthday. They are also allowed five additional points on the test. The test is competitive and will next be held on April 4th. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. In just a moment, sleep no more. But first... Summertime. Sounds like Charlie Spivak. Oh, yes, NBC Bandstand. Earth Park, Vaughn Monroe, Freddie Martin this week. Hmm, sure helps the morning along. That finishes the dishes. Now, let's see. Better get some shopping done. I can listen to NBC Bandstand in the car. 
Anywhere, everywhere, it's NBC Bandstand. And now stay tuned for Sleep No More on NBC. This is Nelson Olmsted. Sleep No More. No more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror, told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmsted, tell us about this evening's story. Once again, Ben, we have two stories for the price of one, and this time both are by the same fine writer, Michael Fessier. The first one is Over the Hill, and is about a man who lives in his imagination for three glorious days. I guess it was imagining things that brought it about. I mean, imagining some things and not imagining others. Not even daring to think about them. Oh, I'd always like to imagine about going over the hill and finding everything changed, but I never let myself imagine the other thing at all. Just the same, I must have been thinking about it or it wouldn't have happened. I suppose I must have been thinking about it and didn't know I was. Oni, my wife, had been getting on my nerves and it got so that even when I was away from her, she bothered me. When I was home, she nagged me. And when I was away, I thought about her nagging, and it was just as bad thinking about it as it was hearing it. And she cried, too, and that's what I hated most, her crying. She would cry, and I would try to get away from the sound, but I couldn't. I would go outside, and if I couldn't hear her crying, I, I would think about it, and it was as bad as hearing it. Nagging and crying. Oh, it's a wonder I didn't go crazy. The only times I had peace was when I'd think things to myself. It was hard not to think of Oni and her nagging and her crying, but sometimes I managed it, and then I was happy in my way. I liked best to think about that hill. It was about halfway between San Ramon, where I lived, and the city. It would be nice, I would think, if sometime I would drive over the hill, and on the other side, everything would be different. The service station and the nursery and the dairy farm would be gone, and something different would be there. There wouldn't be any job to go to, and there wouldn't be any home to come back to. I was thinking this on that day, and when I drove over the hill, I found everything was different on the other side. The service station and the nursery and the dairy farm were gone, and it seemed like a park. The sun was shining, and there were a lot of colored flowers in the grass, and the water in the creek was blue. And there were probably a lot of children, I thought. And then I said, oh, my Lord, this is the other side of the hill, and it is different. And then it seemed quite natural, and I wasn't amazed or frightened. I just took it for granted. I don't remember getting out of the car, but I realized that I was walking through the grass and smelling the flowers, and the flowers were beautiful, and their odor was sweet. But what I liked best was the smell of the grass and the earth. The earth smelled as if there had just been a rain. I wasn't surprised at all when I saw the children. It was as if the flowers had come to life. They wore bright clothes, and they moved about as if the wind were playing with them. And they called out to me and smiled at me, and... I felt that they knew me and weren't a bit surprised to see me walking among them. I walked as if I knew where I was going and what I would find. I took a path that branched off from the one I was following and I came to a house that was white and had flowers growing around the base. The stream flowed through the yard and the water was blue except where the sun shone on it and made it gold. 
A woman came out and smiled at me, and I smiled at her and said hello. She was beautiful, and I knew how her voice would sound even before she spoke. It was soft and kind and happy, and she sat on a white bench that had vines around the legs and back, and she motioned for me to sit down beside her. I sat down and took off my hat and threw it in the grass, and I felt the breeze blowing through my hair, and I said, I've been a long way off, and I've come a long way back. I I didn't know why I said it, but she understood, and she nodded and smiled. I said, you're beautiful and kind. And she said, everything is beautiful. You're beautiful. And I thought a while, hmm, I guess I am in a way, but I didn't know it. You forgot. Yes, I forgot. It has been a long time. Yes, it has been a long time. But it isn't anymore. No, it isn't. There were two children playing in the grass, and I called to them, and they came over to me, and they smiled and sat down beside me, and I thought, I'm remembering again. I'm remembering something I didn't know. If I were to ask them who they were, they would tell me. But I don't have to ask them, because I remember. The woman went into the house, and we followed her. She sat at a piano and she played tunes that I had never heard but that I knew. It was music that rippled and flowed and then laughed and bubbled. I watched her hands as they moved over the black and white glistening keys and I thought it wouldn't matter if there was no piano and no music. Just watching her hands would be enough. It was night and then it was day again. And I woke up feeling that it didn't matter that the night had gone because the day would be wonderful too and then night would come again and night came again and day came again and the woman and the children and I were together. We walked and we talked and we rested and the walking was fun and the resting was fun and the talking was fun. But I don't know what we talked about or even what I thought. I don't believe I thought. The woman was beautiful and kind and happy, and the children were happy, and I was happy. But I didn't think she's beautiful and kind and happy, and the children are happy and I am happy. Because that was what should have been. It always was what should have been and always should be. Over the hill and on the other side, things were as they should have been. Things were as they always should be. It's hard for me to describe the change. I guess it wasn't a change at all. The thing was, and then it wasn't, and because it wasn't, it never had been. You can't change from something that never was to something that is. I had a dream last night, I thought, and I remembered it a while back, and now it's gone. I was over the hill and on the other side, and I was driving my car to work and thinking about my wife, Oni, and her nagging and crying, and I was thinking about how the crying was even worse than the nagging, and I thought it'd be nice to think about the dream, but I can't remember it. Then I was in the office, and I was wondering why the others looked startled when they saw me, and I wondered why some of them looked startled and frightened, and it was time for the conference to start, and I went to the boss's office. He looked startled, too, and he said, Good Lord, what are you doing here? Why, I came in for the Monday conference. He said something to his secretary, and she left the office. It isn't Monday. It's Wednesday. And even if it were Monday, what made you come to this office? Didn't you know they were looking for you? Two days, I thought. Two days. This morning I got up and it was Monday. But while I was over the hill and on the other side, it became Wednesday. And then I remembered and I thought, it wasn't a dream. This is Wednesday. It isn't Monday at all. It's Wednesday. The boss's secretary came in, and with her was a policeman. And she pointed to me and then ran across the room, and she was frightened. The policeman grabbed me by the arm and hurled me against the wall, and he put his hand in his gun, and he said, You better come quietly. Well, why should I go with you at all? Now, don't play innocent. Well, I'm not playing anything. I just don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about your wife, and you know darn well I am. My wife? My wife? Why? Because you killed her Monday. And you know that darn well, too. This isn't Monday, I thought. 
It's Wednesday. It isn't Monday. It's Wednesday. And it seemed I should laugh at the policeman or become angry or shout to Niles, but I didn't. I felt I had to say something just to break up the silence in the room. I... I didn't kill my wife Monday. Well, maybe it was Sunday night then. My Lord, you're dumb. You didn't even change your clothes. Why should I change clothes? The policeman pointed at the sleeve of my gray suit. Why shouldn't you have changed? That's why. What's that on your sleeve? I looked at it, and remembering and thinking ceased to be. And I said, Oh, yes. I see. It's a blood stain. Nelson Olmstead again. That was the first one of our duet of strange stories by Michael Fessier. Number two is a haunting narrative about the very unusual man in the black hat. I uh, had no money in the black and the stock market stopped on red, so after holding me upside down and shaking the last dime out of my pocket, they turned me loose. Well, San Francisco isn't such a bad place to be broke in. You walk around and look at things and you forget your troubles. This day I was uh, walking along Van Ness Avenue. Second-hand dealers had cars parked halfway across the sidewalk. Signs on the windshield said, This car for $100, this car for only $25 down. And <laughs> I laughed to myself thinking how I was broke and couldn't even buy gasoline for a motorcycle. Still, I read the signs and wondered which car I'd buy in case I had the money. All of a sudden, I noticed a sign that didn't make sense. It said, this car free. Inquire upstairs, room 402. Other people glanced at the sign and kept on going. They figured it was some kind of advertising gag. Well, so did I, but I didn't have anything else to do, so I stuck around looking at the sign. It was on a brand new luxury 12 you couldn't touch for less than $4,000. Well... I'm curious, like all other gamblers, and I walked up a flight of stairs and knocked on the door of 402. Somebody told me to come in. I stepped inside, and a small man with a gray goatee raised his head. He wore a black hat of soft felt, like I used to wear when the horses ran right, or the stock market chart didn't look like a cross-cut saw. And I said, are you the fella that put the sign on the Luxury 12 downstairs? And he said, yes. Well, what's the gag? No gag at all. He was uh, looking at me out of eyes that didn't see me. They were solid gray, no iris or anything, just gray. Oh, they gave me the willies. I said, well, then in that case, I'll take it, if you don't mind. Not at all. And he handed me a pink slip already signed. Well, what else is there to this? Nothing. Thank you. I couldn't think of anything else to say. Uh, don't mention it. Then I wasn't there anymore. I mean, I was standing in the room, but so far as he was concerned, I was a million miles away. He ignored me so completely, I felt I wasn't there myself. And I left. Well, the key was in the car, and I backed it over the curb and drove it to the luxury agency. And after a lot of haggling, they gave me $2,400 cash for the car. I took the money and played the stock market again. And this time I played the red, and I couldn't lose. The old man had changed my luck. The funny thing was, nothing seemed strange to me. Oh, I'd make words with my mouth and tell myself that the old man wasn't real and that the goofiest thing that ever happened was me getting a car for nothing like that. But the words didn't mean anything. Something inside me took the whole business for granted. I took my winnings and bought a trip for myself. I went down to Florida and cleaned up a few thousand shooting dice and betting in the races. And after that, I went to New York. One night, I turned a corner and almost bumped into the old man. I, I wasn't surprised, and I knew it. It seemed perfectly natural to see him, except that he was broke. I could see he was. And I said, hello, remember me? His gray eyes turned toward me with about as much expression as marbles. Certainly, he said, how are you? Boy, it's Jake, it's Jamaica Ginger. You mind walking a ways with me? He fell into step with me, and I led him around the corner to where my car was parked. It was a $5,000 Imperial I'd bought a couple of days before, and I said, this car is free. 
His eyes didn't show any feeling, but his lips smiled a little, and he said, What's the gag? No gag at all. Then, in that case, I'll take it if you don't mind. Not at all, I said. And I took the pink slip out of my wallet and held it against the windshield while I signed my name, and I handed it to him, and he said, Thanks. Don't mention it. And he got in the car and drove away. Three months later, I was in Monte Carlo. Oh, I did pretty good for a while. And then the little ball started ducking my numbers and colors, and I lost steadily for three weeks. And finally, I stood at the table and watched a croupier rake in my last franc note. I turned away, trying to grin, but it felt like a fuzzy worm was crawling around in my stomach. It's one thing to be broken in the States, but another to be broken in a foreign part. The worm tasted of quinine. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder. The old man, black hat, gray goatee, and expressionless eyes was standing there. I didn't feel a bit surprised, not a bit. It seemed I'd been expecting him, and he said, You uh, dropped something? He held out a roll of notes to me. Huh. Careless of me to drop something I didn't know I had, wasn't it? Quite, he said. And I took the notes. Uh, thanks. Don't mention it. And if I were you, I'd play the black 13 and 9. All of a sudden, he was gone. I played the black 13 and 9, and I played them heavy and one heavy. I walked away from the table with enough money to last me a year, and I don't live in second-class hotels. I didn't think about the old man. I was afraid to. You look at the stars, and you don't think about them, and they're beautiful. You look at them and try and figure out how come they buzz around and never bump into each other, and pretty soon they get you locked up. That's the way I felt about the old man. If I took him for granted, he was just a quiet old fellow with a gray goatee, a black hat, and funny eyes. If I started figuring out how come, I'd go out of my mind. I took my winnings and went to Paris and got bored. I wondered why I'd come. And then I knew. It was in what they call a Latin Quarter. A mob had gathered on the sidewalk. In the middle was a gendarme. He had the old man by the collar. His black hat was mashed and his goatee was must, but his eyes were expressionless. It seems the old man just walked up to a fellow in a high silk hat, pulled out a gun, and let him have it. They said the guy in the silk hat was a government official. Well, the next day I went to the American consul. He's an American, I said. You gotta do something. He agreed to investigate. The next day he reported, I don't even know that he is an American. He says he hasn't any nationality. Even if he were an American, I couldn't do anything. He admits he killed a deputy. But why, I asked. The consul shrugged like a Frenchman. He says he didn't have a reason. That's all the police can get out of him. Except that he didn't know the man he killed, hadn't seen him before, and hadn't even heard of him. Well, the thing didn't surprise me. The old man gave away an automobile to a stranger for no reason whatsoever. Why shouldn't he kill a stranger for the same reason? That added up. It made sense, but I couldn't get anybody to see it. They listened to my story and threatened to have me thrown in jail, too. I didn't know what to do. They wouldn't let me see the old man. They said he claimed he didn't know me and didn't want to see me anyway. I don't know if they were telling the truth. I suppose they were. I had to give up. I hung around Paris for three months and then caught a boat for home. I went down to the bar and ordered a whiskey sour as we left the dock. And just as I finished it, the old man in the black hat appeared again, and he said, Have one on me. Now, if you put your finger in boiling water, you'll get scalded. But if you put it in molten metal that's a hundred times hotter, you don't feel anything. Surprises that way. If I'd seen anything that was merely terrifying, I would have shrieked like a woman. But I saw the man in the black hat, and I was calm. Maybe I was too stunned to be frightened or alarmed. Anyway, I spoke calmly. You, uh were being taken to jail the last time I saw you. I escaped. Uh, what will it be? Uh, whiskey sour. How did you manage it? Two whiskey sours. Why, I just walked away from there. I, I took my drink and I started to lift it to my lips. And then I set it down carefully so as it wouldn't spill. And I said, now look here. This can't go on forever, you know. One of us is out of our mind. And if it's a tie, I don't like it. Now... His head was turned half away from me, but his gray marble eyes swung around and stared into mine. And he shrugged, and his eyebrows lifted. Is something the matter? Good Lord! Something? Why, well, they executed you! 
they cut their head off with a guillotine. So? Yes, I read it in the papers. That's their notion of it. Have another. Give me the bottle. I took a drink and kept my hand on the bottle. He took it from me and poured himself a drink, and he tossed it down without taking his eyes off me. Now, they, they did execute you. They cut your head off and you died. I know they did. Now, don't tell me they didn't. All right. Have it your own way. I, uh, I took another drink and I thought a while and then I gripped the bar with both hands and I said, All right, I'm ready. I've got to know sooner or later, so let's have it. Who are you? Don't you know? I'm asking. All right. I'll tell you. A drunk came by and lost his balance and he threw his arms around me and almost dragged me down. And when I got rid of him... The man in the black hat was gone. I couldn't find him anywhere on the boat. I'm in the United States now. I keep traveling around, but I know it isn't going to do me any good. Someday, someplace, I'm going to meet the man in the black hat again. And I know he'll tell me who he is. And I don't want to be told. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Olmstead, and tell us about next week's story. Well, next week, Ben, we have a story of breathtaking suspense by a past master of it. It's called Three O'Clock. Its author is William Irish. You'd better be there. You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week. When Nelson Elmstead will again be here in person. This is Ben Grauer bidding you good night. Our life expectancy average could be even more impressive than it is if it weren't for the high accident rate on our nation's highways. Would you be willing to drive carefully so today's children will have a better chance to live out the long life? medical science has made possible